Hello, my dear future chartered accountants. Welcome to indirect tax marathon session. In this video, I would be covering the entire revision of the GST syllabus applicable for CA Inter under new syllabus for May and November 2024 exams, guys. So I would also be covering the amendments applicable for the exams. So whenever I am explaining the provisions, if there is any amendments, I would also be mentioning that so that you guys can just give little extra importance to the amendments. Also coming with respect to the material. So this material, whatever I am using for the revision, I have updated as applicable for May 2024 exams guys. Now coming to your paper and the question paper pattern. So taxation is a paper three, which is a part of group one. The paper pattern is like this guys. Direct tax is section A for 50 marks, which I have already done with. So direct tax marathon video is already available on Arivo Pro YouTube channel. So you can just have a look into it if you are not yet done. Then coming to indirect tax, which is completely GST customs. You guys would be learning it only at final level. So indirect tax, which is section B, which will be for 50 marks in that multiple choice would be for 15 marks and descriptive would be 35 marks guys under descriptive. The first question would be mandatory out of the remaining question. You can choose one of the question as an option, but you have to make sure that once you choose any question, all the sub questions has to be answered guys. Then coming to multiple choice questions, there can be few questions for one marks. There can be few questions for two marks and there is no negative marking guys. There is no negative marking. So please make use of it guys. Try to attend all the questions, whether it is the indirect tax or indirect tax as there is no negative marking. If by chance at the end, even if if you don't know any answer better you take a chance nothing to lose there clear yes guys so now coming to the syllabus of the indirect tax totally there are 15 chapter guys there are totally 15 chapter everything is the part of gst only totally 15 chapters are there everything i would be doing it in the order of whatever i have arranged in my material only small change with my material along with ICA material is this two chapters guys that is First in ICI material place of supply chapter would be there and after that exemption, but I have just interchanged this position as per my sequence. So I would be doing it as per my study material guys. Clear? First I would be doing exemption and then place of supply. And whichever chapter I have violated in green color is a new additions guys. Under the old syllabus, these topics were not there. But now under new syllabus, they have added this topic. So I feel somewhere this topics would be important guys as it is completely a new topic for inter syllabus. So I feel it is important for especially the May attempt. That is the place of supply provision, accounts and records. E-way bill it was there previously also but now they have made it as a separate chapter then TDS and TCS. So these are the new topics which they have brought from final and they have added at inter level. So please be careful with this topics guys Let, give little extra importance to this chapter small small topics only place of supply is a bit lengthy whereas the other topics and all very small topics guys clear so each of this chapter i would be covering in in detail in the order however i have given it here guys so it would be completely revision time i hope you guys would have already studied this because syllabus that is the gst already in the regular classes or you would have already done the regular study so here i would be going in little fast and also, I assume that you guys would have already put your efforts to study this subject, guys. Now, <clears throat> coming to before I start with, guys, this is the data released by ICI with respect to the number of members and students. I thought I would stay, share this information with you. So you can see the number of members who is having COP, who is not having COP, that is who is, means whoever is supposed to practice, they should have certificate of practice. If not, they can just take the membership of the institute. So totally as on the end of the February, there are 3,96,836 members guys in the institute. So let us take it as 4 lakh. So you just imagine in a country of 150 crore people, there are only four qualified chartered accountants and you will be one among them in the future. Obviously, by the time you guys qualify, the number would have gone up, but still assume it is 5 lakh also. Still, it would be a great guys. So you would be in that less crowded place where very minimum people are there guys with respect to the qualified chartered 
accountants so you can see also the students data has been released in foundation there are around 272000 students and in intermediate 392000 and at final level 196000 students guys so totally the number of students are 862225 and for you now it's i time you guys you will move now currently you are at this level so next you will move towards the final level <clears throat> in next few months then you guys have to move to the next top table guys so time is very near for you guys to move from student category to the qualified chartered accountant category for that guys you have to put your efforts from your end definitely you can do it is what i can say okay. and also the firm's data is given with respect to whoever has set up the practice this is not so important for you as of now but i feel this is important guys just see the numbers how what is the population of india and what is the number of people who are doing ca and how many are qualified this numbers should motivate you. this numbers should motivate you to be there guys clear yes sir and also i have in my regular study material i have given the section numbers in the first two pages of the study material that is revision study material guys i have given the section numbers of both CGST Act as well as IGST Act. Maybe all sections are not covered for you at inter level. You can see wherever I have given section title, there I would have mentioned not covered in red color. Means it is not covered at inter level guys. But just for your reference, I have given all the sections in the order so that it becomes easy for you. Guys, now at inter level, please study this tax paper very well, both direct tax as well as indirect tax because as I told you, now you guys have to move from where to where intermediate to final and when you move to final there are two papers in taxation direct tax for 100 marks indirect tax for 100 marks so if you put a proper base now at inter level you guys can definitely prepare well and score well in taxation paper at final level guys because whatever you study now the same act you will learn even in final level but in a little advanced way and few more topics will get added there fine guys so this is all about the introduction part so before i start the revision i just want to tell one important thing guys sir what is it e salaka namdo same way you guys should be like e attempt namdo no matter what this year will be the golden year for us we are going to clear it sir fine so with this we will start the revision sessions guys all the best hope you guys enjoy the session yeah now we'll start with first chapter that is gst in india and introduction completely a basic chapter like why gst was introduced what was the deficiency under the previous indirect tax regime what is the advantages under gst or after implementation of gst is what is covered with this guys and also what is direct tax what is indirect tax what is the difference between them and all now guys in this chapter even though we don't learn much about gst from exam point of view still they may ask questions with respect to either mcq or even descriptive for three or four marks they may ask so please don't neglect this chapter even though it is very simple students may consider it ah, questions will not come on this chapter no guys so they are asking questions on this chapter also so please be very careful with it with this we'll start guys Sir, what is tax? Tax is a compulsory payment which every person has to make to the government. It is an obligation of every person. Whenever he is liable to pay tax, he has to pay to the government. Guys. Sir, why do government collect the taxes? To meet public expenditure, to undertake the development activities, to pay salary to the government employees, to develop the infrastructure or public welfare. All this expenditure are incurred by the government by collecting. One of the major source of the revenue to the government is what? tax collections guys now sir who has given the power to the government to collect the taxes the constitution we'll see it later so there are two types of taxes which is direct tax and indirect tax so we have also learned this in income tax guys sir what is the difference between direct tax and indirect tax income uh, direct tax is the one where the impact and incidence is on the same person what is incidence the liability to pay tax what is the impact who is ultimately suffering the tax means from whose pocket the tax is going to the government whereas indirect tax is the impact and incidence is on two different persons guys is on two different person normally it will be on the supplier 
whereas he will shift it to the recipient. So incidence will be on some person, whereas the impact will be on another person. The example is GST and customs. But what is covered for you in your syllabus is only GST at inter level. So let us see some important differences between direct tax and indirect tax. Incidence and impact. The impact and incidence is on the same person in case of direct tax, whereas in indirect tax it is on different persons, guys. Then viability of payment. Direct taxes are lesser, lesser burden than indirect taxes to the people as direct taxes are based on the income earning ability of the people. If I have an income, I will end up paying income tax. If not, no. Whereas indirect, is, indirect tax is not like that, guys. You can see. Indirect taxes are borne by the consumers of commodities and services irrespective of financial ability as the MRP. MRP means maximum retail price already includes the taxes. Now, if I am buying any products or if I am availing any services on which GST is applicable, no matter who I am, how much income I have earned or what is my income, still I have to pay the tax only then I will be able to consume that goods or services guys. Whereas in income tax, it is not like that. If, only if I have income more than basic essential limit or now there is something called as rebate also. Only if I have income more than 5 lakh or 7 lakh, I will end up paying tax. If not, no tax. Administrative viability. The administrative cost of collecting the direct taxes is more because it is based on self-assessment. And many people will be having that psychological resistance telling why should I pay tax? I am the one who has worked hard and have earned the income. Why should I give a part of my income to the government? So it becomes difficult for the government to collect the taxes and make the people to pay tax. But still now government is coming out of with various initiative to make that people will pay tax promptly. Then cost of collecting indirect taxes are very less guys because the responsibility of collecting is with the supplier. He will make sure that he is collecting with the recipient. If not, supplier has to pay out of his pocket. So at least to avoid that, Supplier will collect it from the recipient and remit it to the government. Then tax liability. It is levied on the assessee. That is on the person who has earned the income. That is the example of income tax. Whereas indirect tax is levied on whom? Supplier of goods or services. So incidence is on supplier. But he will try to shift it to whom? To the uh, recipient. So the impact will be ultimately on the recipient guys. Even if I am talking about customs. The Li uh, tax liability of customs would be either on the importer or exporter. Then coming to nature, direct tax is progressive in nature. That is higher the income, you will end up paying more tax. You will, you have seen, especially slab rates, higher the income, higher the tax. Even in case of flat rates also, higher the, obviously the amount of income if you have earned more, even though it is 30% or 40% flat rate, you will end up paying more taxes. And even if your income is more than like 50 lakh, 1 crore, 2 crore and all, in addition to income tax, you will end up paying surcharge also. Then indirect tax is regressive in nature. It doesn't depend on the income of a person. It depends on whatever the value of the goods or services the recipient is getting. Goods and service tax was rolled out in India with effect from 1st July 2017 guys. So it was being effective from 1st July 2017 and it is applicable to entire India guys. It is applicable to entire India, including Jammu Kashmir. So some important highlights about the GST, which I have given you. GST is a consumption based tax, which is levied on the basis of destination principle. The concept relates to taxing the supply of goods or services at the point of consumption. So ultimately who will end up paying GST is the consumer tax. Because if I am further, if I am a wholesaler or a trader and all, whatever tax I have paid on my inward supply, I can claim the credit of that when I am paying the tax on my outward supply. And I can also collect the taxes from my recipients. So who ultimately end up paying GST is the consumer. So that is why we will call it as consumption based tax. And also the GST revenue will always go to the destination state, especially with respect to interstate supply guys. It is applicable all over India, including Jammu Kashmir. Then it adopts dual taxation model where both central government as well as state governments will levy and collect the taxes guys both will get the revenue with respect to gst whereas income tax is completely central government revenue under gst both center as well as state will be getting the equal revenue guys then it ensures seamless flow of our input tax credit to the large extent input tax credit means whenever i have paid tax on my inward supply that is purchases it is available as credit for the tax which I am supposed to pay on my outward supply, that is sales. We, what tax we pay on our outward supply, we call it as output tax. 
what tax we already paid on our, on our in, inward supply is called input tax when i can claim the credit of whatever tax i have paid on my inward supply we call it as input tax credit we can adjust it against my output tax example is guys everything we will discuss all this we have a separate chapter altogether for it assume on my inward supply just a second on my inward supply i have paid 10000 gst we call it as input tax guys okay sir now on my outward supply assume i am liable to pay 25000 tax we call it as output tax on my sales or outward supply i am liable to pay 25000 gst guys we call it as output tax against this this 25000 we will collect it from the recipient now whatever tax i have paid on my inward supply subject to conditions and restriction if i have satisfied all the conditions i can claim the credit of that 10000 and remit only the balance to the government 15000 rupees is that clear yes sir so this credit benefit is given under the gst law whereas this was not available under the previous indirect tax regime guys because there were various taxes like vat service tax excise duty and all the tax like if i have paid service tax i cannot adjust it against excise duty or if i have paid excise duty i cannot adjust it against vat one tax was not allowed to be adjusted against the others so that credit part was missing under the previous indirect tax regime next a i power federal body called gst council has been established under article 279a of the constitution of india to decide policy matters formulate principles for administration and implementation of gst any decisions under gst will be taken by gst council guys they will conduct the meeting and they will take the decision and the same decision whatever they have taken they will recommend it to the government what is gst council who are the members of gst council and all we will learn it later under article 279a they have set up the gst council then if the essence of gst is in removing the cascading effects guys whenever the tax what i have paid on my inward supply if i am not eligible to claim credit of it automatically it becomes cost for me then i will try to do what i will try to shift it to my customers so the cost of the goods will automatically go up and at the end we will end up paying tax on tax that is on one tax only we will end up calculating another tax and we will pay it to the government this will lead to increase in the cost ultimately which is borne by the consumer but there, but under gst to some extent it has been ruled out clear because the credit is available on whatever tax has been paid on inward supply so hence there will not be any cascading effect guys the tax on tax of both central and state taxes by allowing seti setting off of taxes throughout the value chain right from the original producer and service provider's point of to the consumer level means throughout the chain when manufacturer sell the goods to assume wholesaler wholesaler sell to retailer and retailer ultimately sell it to the consumer consumer cannot claim any credit because he is not further supplying it whereas the remaining three people manufacturer wholesaler and retailer whenever they are selling it to the next person whatever tax they have paid on their inward supply they can claim the credit of it so under gst there is no cascading effects guys so these are some advantages of the gst guys there is no cascading effect then even compliance burden is reduced because under previous indirect tax regime there were various laws applicable to the same person guys like service tax excise duty entry duty then uh, vat cst and all so there were multiple laws which were applicable for him multiple taxes he used to pay and the compliance burden was more he has to file returns under each of this law and he has to collect the taxes and pay it to the government if not he has to pay out of his own pocket so all this was had increased the compliance burden for the person who is doing the business but now under gst only one okay so we have to pay gst and file gst returns when compared to previous indirect tax regime now under gst it has become easy to do the compliance yeah <clears throat> then it is a dual taxation model then credit is available all these are the advantages of the gst guys all this were the deficiency under the previous indirect tax regime or disadvantages and now under gst these are the advantages fine sir now coming to guys see any tax can be levied by the government only if they have given the power under the constitution without the power being given to the government they cannot levy any tax guys 
So before 1st July 2017, the government didn't have any power to levy GST. First, they have to take that power. To take this power, they amended the constitution itself. So in order to make laws with respect to GST and all, the constitution was supposed to be amended. So they have amended the constitution and they've added few new articles only with respect to the GST guys. Clear? And those three articles are important from your exam point of view, which I have given here. You can see significant amendments made by constitution under the first amendment act are discussed below. Article 246A inserted power to levy overrides Article 246. So 246A overrides 246 because previously there was no power to make laws with respect to GST. Now government is taking that power by adding a new article called Article 246A guys. Yeah. <clears throat> Overrides Article 246, grants power to center and state governments to make laws with respect to GST. Only parliament can levy tax on what? Interstate supply, guys. Interstate supply means supply outside the state or outside the union territory. Who has the power to levy the tax on interstate supply? Only central government. Okay. And with respect to that, they have added a new article that is with respect to interstate supply. Article 269A which talks about interstate supply parliament to levy igst on interstate supply even on import or export it is deemed to be interstate supply even on that igst would be levied then igst distributed between whom center and state guys they are distributing equally means whenever igst is levied and collected by central government half of it central government will keep and the another half they will give it to the destination state it's clear yes and actually guys, I, we have discussed that import and export both are deemed to be interstate supply. But under GST, export is like treated as zero rated supply. What is zero rated supply? What do we do with it? And all? We will understand later going forward. Whereas on import, yes, import duty also will be levied. In addition to import duty, even IGST would be levied guys. Even IGST would be levied, which is liable to be paid by importer. Then parliament to determine the place of supply. So to decide whether the supply is an intrastate supply or interstate supply, one of the important criteria is place of supply. Guys. If laws pass, that is location of supplier and place of supply is in the same state or union territory, we call that supply as intrastate supply. And in case of intrastate supply, what do we leave you guys? CGST plus SGST. CGST will go to central government and SGST will go to the respective state, wherever the supply has taken place. Whereas if the location of supplier and place of supply is in two different states or two different union territories or one union territory and one state in simple outside the state or outside the union territory, then we call it as the interstate supply. And in case of interstate supply, central government will levy and collect IGST. But half of that will belong to central government. The another half will go to the destination state, guys. Okay, for example, I am supplying the goods from Karnataka to you, assume you are from Tamil Nadu. In that case, it is an interstate supply. Who will pitch in here? Central government. Central government will levy and collect IGST. They will keep off and the another half they will give it to the Tamil Nadu government. That is Stalin. Okay. Sir, what if it is a supply within union territory? We call it as even that is called intrastate only in the law, but I have just named it as intra-union territory supply. We levy CGST plus UTGST guys. Even union territories are administered by central government only as of now because they don't have any state legislature, but separate tax will be levied called UTGST. And this will be used only for the development of respective union territory guys. Okay. Coming back. <coughs> to article 279a very important guys important article article 279a gst council it talks about gst council a federal body constituted by the president on 15th september 2016 that is before implementation of gst gst was implemented on 1st july 2017 obviously when it has to be implemented how do we implement it and all decisions has to be taken for that there should be a federal body and that body was set up by whom president when on 15 september 2016 sir who are the members of this body who will head this body union finance minister is the chairperson or the head of this body guys or council then union minister of state even that person is the representative of central government only then all state finance minister all state finance minister are the members guys guys see in india for gst purpose 
for gst purpose please listen here guys 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 there are actually actually not for gst i'm talking about actually there are 28 states and 8 union territory in india 28 states and 8 union territory but for gst purpose 31 states and 5 union territory guys why because three union territories that is delhi puducherry or pondicherry and jammu kashmir this three union territory have their own state legislature and they will have their own chief minister and government so for gst purpose we are treating them at par with state and whenever there is a supply within this union territories like delhi puducherry or jammu kashmir within that guys we always leave as gst and not utgst clear and other than that whatever five union territories are there it is like Andaman, Nicobar Islands, Lakshadweep, Dadra, Nagar, Aveli and Daman and Dube. This is actually now one union territory. Previously it was two different union territories but now one. Then Chandigarh and Ladakh. So in this places if there is any supply within the same union territories guys. UTGST plus CGST would be liberty. UTGST plus CGST. Is that clear? So for GST purpose come on guys how many states are there? Come on come on repeat with me. 31 states and five union territory 28 actual states you know including our south, south states everything 28 states are there we are always cgst plus sgst would be limited but special thing is three union territories with state legislative is also treated as state for gst purpose is that clear so now how many members will be there in gst council i have given here you can see union finance minister one union minister of state in charge of revenue of finance both this people belongs to whom guys central government which i have highlighted in red color whereas whatever i have given in the state, uh, green color state state finance minister how many will be there 31 for each and every state whatever finance minister are there or taxation minister is there that one member will be there in the council so totally how many members will be there in gst council 33 guys fine sir then coming to the quorum of meeting so any decisions with respect to gst will be taken by gst council by conducting a meeting sir what should be the quorum of that meeting even in law you guys would have learned the quorum in agm and all how much it has to be same way guys for gst council meeting what is the quorum sir one half of the total number of members guys so what is the total number of members 33 in that half will come as what 16 point change but we cannot ask member you bring only half of your body remaining you leave at your home and come no no so even if it is 16.5 we have to round it up to next member so at least 17 members has to be present in gst council meeting guys 17 members it will come to 16 point something but still we should round it up to 17 members at least quorum means 17 clear yes sir so half of the total number of members please be careful fine sir what is the voting power for central government only two words are there huh? that is union finance minister and union finance minister of state in charge so both put together one third weightage whereas for all states put together all the state members put together how much two third weighted votes so you can see i have given the explanation here so from exam point of view is it so important guys so vote calculation and all they may not ask but still good to know na? <clears throat> because it is a part of article 279 here vote of center is having weightage of how much guys one third one third means what 33.33 so how many members are there from center two so divided by two each member has how much vote 16.17 percentage of voting weighted votes clear yes coming to the state members totally how many state members are there 31 what is the weighted votes for them two third which comes to 16.67 yes sir what is the voting weighted vote of each member sir 2.15 percent guys from state from state you can see the voting power of central member uh, central ministers and what is the voting power of state ministers okay next sir for taking any decisions in gst council meeting what is the majority majority of not less than three fourth of the weighted votes of the members who are present and voting if there is someone who is not voting or who is not present at all in the meeting we will not consider them so whoever is present and voting at least 75 percent of that weighted votes should be in favor of the decision guys should be in favor of the decision hope you guys got it okay sir then as per article 279 4 sorry 279 a 4g guys there are 11 special category states they have named 11 special category states which are those guys easy to remember 
थ्री टॉप मोस्ट स्टेट प्लस एट नॉर्थ ईस्टर्न स्टेट का थ्री टॉप मोस्ट स्टेट विच आर दो सर जम्मू एंड कश्मीर उत्तराखंड हिमाचल प्रदेश जम्मू और कश्मीर आई टोल्ड यू इट इज अटेट एक्चुअली इट इज अनियन टेरिटरी विद स्टेट लेजिस्लेचर बट स्टिल गाइज फॉर जीएसटी वी आर ट्रीटिंग दट एज वॉट दी स्टेट ओके जम्मू कश्मीर उत्तराखंड हिमाचल प्रदेश टॉप थ्री स्टेट ओके सर देन ऑल एथ नॉर्थ ईस्टर्न स्टेट गाइज दट इज अरुणाचल प्रदेश असम मेघालय मणिपुर मिजोराम नागालैंड सिक्किम एंड त्रिपुरा so these are the 11 states which have named as special category states as per article 279a guys clear yes so next <clears throat> there are totally five laws which has been passed under gst guys four laws have been passed by the central government whichever i have violated in red color that is the first four they have been passed by the central government whereas the last one yes gst act is been passed by each and every states okay so so which are those laws why it has been introduced or brought into power or brought into the field what are those we will see central goods and service tax act 2017 which in short we call as cgst act to levy and collect cgst on intra state supply then integrated goods and service tax act 2017 igst act to levy collect igst on inter state supplies then the union territory goods and service tax act 2017 that is utgst act to levy collect utgst on intra union territory supply actually they are not named intra union territory in the law but whenever there is a supply within the state sorry within the union territory i am just calling it as intra union territory for exam purpose you can use the word intra state only in the bracket you can mention supply within the union territory okay yes then the gst compensation to states act 2017 okay and this is important guys why because see previously it was passed only for 5 years and now it has been extended till 31st march 2026 yeah and sir why they have not covered in detail about this compensation and all guys when gst was implemented many states protested telling we will lose the revenue the central government assured them sir under gst if you lose any revenue we will compensate for you in the form of compensations so compensation cess will be levied by the government on some luxury and sin goods over and above gst they will collect it from the people and they will com compensate it to the states which are losing revenue under gst they will compare under previous indirect tax regime what was your income that is tax collection under indirect tax now under gst what is your revenue and there is certain growth rate also which will be considered or added if there is any shortfall for you in tax collection under gst when compared to previous indirect tax regime that shortfall will be compensated by the central government in the name of compensation guys clear and this has been extended till march 2026 that is 31st march 2026 guys okay you can see there to compensate the states for the loss of revenue if any due to introduction of gst then the last one is states goods and service tax act 2017 in short we call it as sgst act to levy collect sgst on intra state supply and this act will be passed by each and every states means in total how many sgst act we will have 31 guys so this i have already discussed then coming to sir which are those taxes which were levied before 1st july 2017 but now subsumed under gst that is after implementation of gst this taxes are no more levied guys so whatever i have given in red color that is central taxes this taxes were levied by central government before 1st july 2017 but now subsumed under gst and whichever i have given under state taxes in green color this were the taxes which were levied by the respective state government before 1st july but now subsumed under gst guys important they may ask question on this so please be careful guys and you should also know the differentiator that is which are the central taxes which are uh, subsumed under gst now and which are the state taxes which are subsumed under gst so wherever i have given in something in red color that denotes central government guys wherever in this chapter wherever i have given something in green color that denotes state government only in this chapter i am talking about okay which are those central taxes we will see central excise duty and additional duties of excise central uh, excise duty under medicinal and toilet preparation excise duty was something which was levied on the manufacture of the goods guys so the manufacturer before his goods leaves the factory gate he was supposed to pay excise duty 
which was levied and collected by central government. Service tax was levied on the service rendering, that is the supply of service, then which is again levied and collected by central government. Additional duties of customs, commonly known as CVD, countervailing duty. Special additional duties of customs, SAD, these were levied on the import and export, especially imports. Central cesses and surcharges in so far as they relate to the supply of goods or services which were levied by central government. Now coming to state taxes, state VAT, that is whenever that goods were sold within the state, VAT was levied. Central sales tax means whenever the goods were sold outside the state, CST used to be levied. It is to be levied by central government, but it is always a revenue of state governments. Clear? Huh? Yes. Then purchase tax, luxury tax, entry tax of all forms, entertainment tax, except those levied by local bodies. Now, except levied by local bodies means even now, whatever entertainment tax which are levied by local bodies are still there. Only the entertainment tax which were levied by any person other than local authorities or local bodies are subsumed under GST guys. Okay. Taxes on advertisement, then taxes on lottery betting and gambling, then state cesses and surcharges insofar as they relate to supply of goods or services. All these taxes have been subsumed under GST guys. Now coming to, sir, what is GST? They have defined in Article 366.12a. Goods and service tax as a tax on supply of goods or services or both. So it is a tax on supply of what? Goods or services or both. Guys, what is a taxable event under GST? Supply. They are not using the word sale. Supply. Which has been covered in section 7 of CG, CGST Act, guys. We will learn it in the next chapter in detail. Okay. Except what? Supply of alcoholic liquor for human consumption. So in the definition itself, they have told GST is not applicable for alcoholic liquor for human consumption. So that means alcohol is completely kept outside GST, guys. Even in the future, the government doesn't have the power to bring alcohol under the GST bracket. Clear? Now, sir, under for alcohol, what is limit, sir? On manufacturing excise duty, which is under the power of states, state excise duty will be limited only on alcohol. Whereas all other excise duty was levied by central government, but for alcohol, excise duty was levied and collected by states and on sale of alcohol, VAT or CST would be levied, guys. Clear? Which is purely state government's revenue. Oh, okay. Then as per Article 279A5 of the Constitution, five petroleum products, that is petroleum crude, high-speed diesel, motor spirit, aviation, turbine fuel and natural gas, which I call in short PhD man. I have temporarily have been kept out and GST council shall decide the date from which they have they shall be included in GST. So this five petroleum products have been kept temporarily outside the GST. Even today they are outside the GST guys. But they have told somewhere in the future when GST council decide they will bring these items under GST. Under GST. So even on petroleum products whatever was levied before GST same thing is continued to be levied guys. Now. <coughs> PhD man stands for what? Sir, first one. P stands for petroleum crude, high speed diesel, HD. Then M stands for motor spirit. Then A stands for aviation turbine fuel. And N stands for natural gas gas. So PhD man will never have an alcohol. So you can keep like this. So PhD man and alcohol. So all this are outside the GST. Okay. The following subject matters have been kept outside the purview of GST. Alcoholic liquor for human consumption, petroleum crude, diesel, petrol, aviation, turbine fuel and natural gas. Entertainment tax levied by local bodies, motor vehicle tax, property tax such as stamp duty, electric, electricity duty. All this have been kept outside the GST guys. So this taxes means whatever were levied before GST, same taxes have been levied on these activities. Whereas on tobacco and tobacco products which are subject to GST, means on the supply of this GST is applicable. Whereas on the manufacturing of this, even now, excise duty is limited. So they are trying to increase the cost of it by adding two two taxes on it. So, so in order to discourage the people to have it. Okay. So government is trying to levy more and more taxes in order to discourage the people to have it. Even on alcohol also, it is indirectly like that. The amount of taxes levied on alcohol is very huge. Fine guys. So on tobacco, even GST is also applicable. Excise duty is also applicable guys. On manufacturing, excise duty is levied. Whereas on the supply of goods or services or on tobacco, GST would be levied. Clear? Yes. So 
so this is all about the revision of chapter one guys so in the first two pages of my revision material i have given the section numbers so you can see first i have told you short title sir what is the short title central goods and service tax act na? so in short we call it as ccst extent it is applicable to entire india including jammu kashmir then commencement from 1st july 2017 guys and section 2 talks about definition of various terms used in the cgst act say see guys first and second section number of any act normally talk about this only even in income tax we have seen section 1 and 2 of income tax act also same story clear then section 3 to 6 which talks about administrative aspects which is not a part of your inter syllabus guys then in the coming chapter we will learn section 7 and 8 which is very important especially 7 is very very important which talks about the supply and the taxable event under gst is supply guys clear yes sir yes guys now we will revise chapter 2 which talks about supply under gst guys what is the taxable event under gst is supply very important it is covered in section 7 we will be learning in this chapter section 7 read with three schedules that is schedule 1, 2 and 3 and section 8 guys which talks about the taxability of composite and mixed supplies. So these are the things we would be covering it in this chapter two sections along with three schedules. Is that clear guys? Yes. And before I continue guys if you want to have, refer the soft copy of this material it is available in my telegram channel you guys can just look into it and download and use the same guys so the name of my telegram channel is ca vikas gowda that is my full name you can make use of the same fine we'll continue meaning and scope of the supply section 7 modes of supply forms of supply that is 7 1 a so there are various sections and clause under this guys so which of them is important let us see one by one 7 1 a what is it telling Supply includes all forms of supply of goods or services or both such as sale, transfer, barter, exchange, license, rental, lease or disposal means they have just given few transactions name that doesn't mean that this is the end list they have just given some examples like for a consideration in the course or furtherance of a business guys for an activity to be covered under section 71a as supply there should be a supply of goods or services plus for a consideration. Sir, what if it is for free? It is not covered here. And it should be in the course or furtherance of business. Means, if I am selling this pen to you, is it in the course of furtherance of business for me? No, I am not into a business of selling pen. In that case, is this activity covered under this section? No, guys. Assume I am running a stationary business. I sold my pen to you. Is it in the course or furtherance of business? Yes, guys. Only when all these three criteria are met, then only the activity or transaction as per section 71a will be a supply price. And sir, we two important activity which is covered here. What is the difference between the barter and exchange? Barter means I give one goods, you give me another goods. Or I give you a service, you will give me a service. Or I give you a service, you give me a goods. In that case, for both of us, it will be a supply. And as there is a goods involved, which is exchange, there is no money involved. We have to apply the valuation rules guys and valuation rules is not a part of your inter syllabus so when there is a barter or exchange and all we have to dis determine the value of supply as per the valuation rules okay sir what is exchange sir guys i exchange my old phone for a new phone now assume the cost of a new phone is fifty thousand they are offering me the exchange value for my old phone of ten thousand so i have to pay remaining forty thousand uh, yes so for the supplier, what is the value of supply? It will be 50,000 only guys. It will be 50,000 only. It's clear. So exchange and barter look like same, but exactly they are not same guys. Clear? Huh? So in exchange, there will be a money involved. May not be in full, but a part of the consideration at least will be in money. Whereas in barter, it is there, there is it is completely exchange of goods or services. There is no money involved there. Clear? And the supply also includes like normal sales transfer in income tax we have learned what is transfer under capital gain set same way sale transfer and all is a part of the activity here fine now they have told supply of goods or services sir what is goods what is services they have defined under gst guys goods means every kind of movable property means sir what if it is immovable like land or building or if anything attached to the land is it a goods no guys 
<laughs> okay other than money and securities means money and securities is not a goods okay but it includes actionable claim so goods includes actionable claim means any claim towards the money or unsecured debt guys like sir insurance claim or i am supposed to receive a rent for three months or six months so all this are actionable claim then growing crops or grass or things attached to or forming part of the land see guys whatever is attached to the land is an immovable but still if you have agreed to sever that cut it or remove it and sell or you have agreed to supply it in the future or you are supplying now only then is it a good sir yes so if anything which is attached to the land which you are agreeing to sever or to cut and sell it then that is a goods clear up please be careful goods definition will not include immobile property like land building and all guys okay then coming to services services is defined in section 2102 whereas goods in 252 services means anything other than goods anything other than goods is a service but it will not include money and securities so money and securities is not goods also it is not services also sir so on money and securities will gst be levied no because gst is on the supply of goods or services if something is not a goods if something is not a services then gst is not at all applicable on the same guys clear up yes sir so anything other than goods but it will not include money and securities but it will include so services it will include what activities relating to use of money money is not a services but activities relating to use of money or conversion of money by cash by any other mode from one form or currency denomination to another for which a separate consideration is charged guys assume sir i wanted to convert my indian rupees into foreign currency i went and approached the bank or authorized dealer to convert it and to convert converting indian rupees into foreign currency they are charging me assume a commission of ten thousand. is gst applicable on it yes because they are providing services conversion of one currency into another currency your separate consideration they are charging that is ten thousand for their service so is it supply of service yes guys is that clear same way sir i went to bank to take a dd in my name or someone else name so in that case i i wanted to take the dd for assume one lakh so i deposited one lakh and i took a dd so they are just converting the money into dd for which assume they are charging me 100 rupees or 1000 rupees bank charges or dd charges in that case as they are charging a separate consideration for their service is it considered as service guys yes guys so will gst be levied yes so on whatever amount they are charging that is either 100 or 1000 whatever they are charging as bank charges or dd charges on that gst would be levied guys is that clear yes sir so this is as per section 71a guys next moving towards <clears throat> 71aa activities or transaction by a person other than an individual to its members or constituents or vice versa for cash or deferred payment or other valuable consideration guys what they are telling here is supplier is not an individual is not an individual and they are giving services to whom their own members or members are giving services to their suppliers okay and who is supplier here any association club any association or club they are giving any services to their members for which consideration is charged means from their members they are uh, taking the money or they are charging some amount whether now or in future it is considered as supply guys it is considered as supply between the association and members so you you would have seen there will be various association like Kannada association or even in apartments or flats and all we have a concept of association in that case whatever assume they are organizing an event Kannada Rajya Sabha or any festivals for which they are collecting the money from the people so they are giving some services even this uh, maintenance and all what they collect in the <clears throat> apartments or flats for their regular maintenance for the payment or for whatever they are doing throughout the month for cleaning security services and all so assume there, an, uh, there is an association who is managing it for whatever services they are giving to the residents of the apartments they are collecting some money sir is it a supply yes guys it is a supply provided consideration is charged provided consideration is charged oh okay. next if there is an import of services for a consideration 
whether or not in the course or furtherance of business section 71b so if there is any import of services for which amount is paid by the recipient then is it a supply sir as yes guys as per section 71a 71b it is a supply clear huh? but 71b is not specifying anything with respect to in the course or furtherance of business guys assume i have imported a services for my personal purpose from an architect outside india or from a legal advisor outside india even though it is for my personal purposes and i have paid consideration i have paid the fees for it in that case is it a supply as per section 71b yes guys it is a supply as per section 71b so here the business element is not there even if it is imported for a personal purpose still it is a supply still it is a supply as per section 71b guys is that clear and one thing which i would like to note here is guys see in case of import recipient is the one who is liable to pay tax under reverse charge mechanism as per igst act okay because import is an interstate supply so igst act is talking about this so whenever there is an import <clears throat> the recipient is the one who is nothing but importer is the one who is liable to pay gst under reverse charge mechanism if at all if it is taxable okay next guys important thing 71c <clears throat> 71c section 71 is c is telling even without consideration the following four activities are deemed supply even without consideration the following four activities are deemed supply actually section 71c is giving reference to schedule one even without consideration activity is a supply as per schedule one so schedule one list out the four activities so this two has to be read together guys so even whenever you are explaining any answer with respect to this please mention both clear up that is as per schedule over 71 sorry as per schedule one read with section 71c then start your explanation clear up yes guys so supply without consideration deemed supply section 71c read with schedule one as per schedule one in the following four cases supplies made without consideration will be treated as supply under section 7 of cgst act so you can see whenever you are answering any descriptive answer with respect to this you can start your answer like this guys you can start as per section 71c read with schedule one or else <coughs> vice versa also also is possible as per schedule one read with section 71c of cgst act 170 then start your explanation here yeah. please try to mention both guys Okay. Which are those activities, sir? Para 1. <clears throat> Permanent transfer or dispose, disposal of business assets where ITC has been availed on such assets. That is, guys, assume I have purchased an asset. I have purchased an asset. So, it is a what for me? Inward supply. It is an inward supply for me. On asset purchase, I have paid input tax of 10,000. And I have claimed the ITC of it. Then tomorrow or in the future, if I am selling this asset, if I am selling it for a consideration, it is a supply as per section 71A. It is a supply as per section 71A if there is a consideration. But here what they are talking about in para 1 is, you have purchased an asset, you have claimed the ITC on it and in the future you are disposing it or you are giving it free of cost. In that case, even though the outward supply is for free, still it is considered as supply guys and whenever there is an activity which is supply as per schedule one the value of the supply will be determined as per the valuation rules guys which you will be learning at final level clear so you need not worry about sir what is the value of supply on which gst would be limited just understand that is the activity or transaction is it a supply as per the respective para or not clear yes so if this asset is given free of cost or if it is disposed free of cost then it will be a supply as per para 1 of schedule 1 read with section 71c guys clear sir what if this assume i had purchased a car motor vehicle on which it is blocked so i paid gst but i couldn't claim credit now i am giving this car free of cost to my employee or someone else or i am just disposing it free of cost is it a supply as per 71c read with schedule 1 guys no why because when i purchased i didn't claim itc it was blocked for me. clear so the condition here is when you have purchased you should have claimed itc only then when you are giving that asset free of cost 
it will be a supply as per para one clear so you can see permanent transfer or disposal of business asset plus itc has been availed on such asset whatever i have given in green color guys that are the criteria to be to be satisfied for an activity to be supplied as per the respective section you can see for 71a three criteria were there same way 71b <clears throat> two criteria were there clear yes so wherever i have given something in green color in, and input in between them i have added plus symbol that means all this has to be satisfied not any one or two okay so <coughs> next guys second para okay note for first para transfer of entire business as a going concern is not a supply guys means taxation of business sir i have sold my business to another person and he will continue the show i am not selling my business sorry i am not closing down my business i am just selling it so show will continue but not by me by the person who has purchased it so there is a succession of business so in that case it is not a supply as per para one guys next supply between related person or distinct person made in the course or furtherance of business so there should be two condition to be satisfied here what is it supply between related person or distinct person plus it should be in the course of furtherance of business sir what if it is not in the course of furtherance of business but it is given for free between related person or between distinct person then it is not a supply it should be in the course of furtherance of the business guys and it is important for us to understand who is related person who is distinct person sir related person as per explanation to section 15 section 15 talks about value of supply guys of cgst act if such persons are the officers or directors of another business, if I am the officer of your business or if you are a director of my business, we both are related guys. Okay. Then, they are re legally recognized partners or employer-employee. Employer-employee will always be related even though they are not blood relative. Only not blood relatives are covered here. Others are also covered guys. Okay. Employer-employee are always related. Then, one of them controls directly or indirectly the other together control directly or indirectly a third person a third person controls own directly or indirectly more than or equal to 25 percent of voting stock or shares of both of them that is equity shares or they are members of the same family or one of them is the sole agent or sole distributor or sole concessioner of the other guys let me explain now assume a and b a is controlling b or b is controlling a they both are related either way a is controlling B or B is controlling A. They both are related. Next, sir, Z is controlling both of them, sir. Common control. Z is controlling A and B. In this case, Z and A is related. Z and B is related. And also, A and B are related. Why? Because they are under the same control. They are under the same control. Hope you guys understood. Next, assume, sir, A and B, they both put together is controlling C, sir. They both are controlling C. So, A, C related? Ha? Yes, sir. B, C related? Ha? Yes, sir. B, C related now. Is A and B related? Yes, guys. They both are also related person. Clear? Because they both together, they are controlling one more person, third person. Clear? Ha? Come on. I will repeat it. A controlling B or B controlling A. They both are related persons. Okay. Next. Z is controlling both A and B. Common control is there. So, in that case, Z and A are related, Z and B related, even A and B are related. Okay, same way. Sir, A and B together controlling C. A and C related? Yes. B and C related? Yes. A and B related? Yes. Next, if I am acting as an agent only for one person, in that case, means sole agent, guys. In that case, principal and agent, they are both are related. Okay, sir. Then, they are the members of same family, bread relative. I told you only blood relatives are not covered here. Others are also covered. Along with blood related. Sir, they are the members of same fam family means who and all are considered. Okay, spouse and children all are always covered in family. Whereas parents, brother and sister. I repeat, parents, brothers and sister are covered under family. Only if they are only or mainly dependent on the person. Only then they will be treated as the members of the same family for GST purpose. I repeat, who and all are covered in the family, sir, for GST purpose, spouse and children, always family. Whereas parents, brothers and sister, guys, only if they are only or mainly dependent on the person, they both 
appi means this people would be considered as family for gst purpose then who is distinct person sir as per section 25 whenever a person has taken a registration separate registration with whether within one state or more than one state under gst registration is state wise in whichever number of states you are operating for each state at least one registration you have to take within the state sir can i take more than one registration yes it is optional but one registration is minimum now assume within the states only you have taken five registration each registration is treated as distinct person or else sir i am having businesses in 10 states in all 10 states i have taken registration and in that case each registration will be treated as distinct person wise when a person has taken registration under gst you would have taken under one pan but separate registration so different registration under single pan will be treated as distinct person means separate person for gst guys each registration is treated as distinct person so if there is any supply between one branch to another branch which is registered supply Oh, sorry, which is registered separately, even if it is without consideration, still it will be a supply. Still it will be a supply. For example, assume I have registered business in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. I have sent my goods from my Karnataka branch to Tamil Nadu branch without consideration. In that case, will it be a transfer, sir? Yes. Sorry, will it be a supply, sir? Yes, guys. It will be a supply because it is in the course of furtherance of business and it is a supply between distinct person. Then there is something called as establishment of distinct person what is it guys where a person who has obtained or is required to obtain registration in a state or union territory in respect of an establishment as an establishment in another state or union territory then such establishment shall be treated as establishment of distinct person for example as you guys i have a textile business in karnataka i have registered it under gst and i also have an alcohol business in andhra pradesh sir alcohol is not covered under gst still this two are considered as an establishment of distinct person. Clear? Even though the business in Andhra Pradesh that is alcohol supply, still not covered under GST. For GST, we are treating it as the establishment of distinct person. Nice. Clear? Yes. Then coming back. <clears throat> so employer and employee related. Huh? Yes, closely related, sir. They are serving each other. Okay, especially employee to employer for which employer is paying the amount. Gifts up to 50,000 by an employer to employee in the financial year is not a supply. Guys, in income tax, we already learned. What is it? Gift given by employer to employee is taxable for employee under the head salary. If the gift is in the form of cash or money, entire money will be taxable. If it is in kind, the value of the gift is less than 5,000, nothing is taxable. If it is more than 5,000, then what value of the gift or the fair market value of the gift would be taxable in the hands of employee under the head salary. This is from the receiver point of view. Now from the giver point of view, employer, he gave the gift. So is it a supply, sir? He is giving obviously gift means without consideration. If the value of the gift is up to 50,000, guys, the employer, whatever he is giving, it is not taxable under GST. It is not a supply. If the value of the gift is more than 50,000, then the entire value would be subject to GST. Entire value. Assume the value of the gift is 60,000. Entire 60,000 will be subject to GST. Please be careful. This is not connected to section 56.2.10 because 56.2.10 will not cover the gift given by employer. Gift given by employer is taxable to the employee under the head salary. And here under GST, we have to think it from employer point of view. Employer, employee relative. If employer is giving anything, so they will fall under what? Related person. So employer gave something without consideration to the employee so to a related person so if it is up to 50,000 they are telling not a supply if it is above 50,000 entire value will be subject to GST guys to the employer who will be the supplier in that case uh, employer who will be the recipient in that case the employee so in that case the employer if he is liable to pay GST he can charge the same to the employee and collect it and remit it to the government guys okay so then paragraph 3 supply of goods by a principal to his agent and vice versa without consideration or where the agent undertakes to supply such goods on behalf of the principal and invoice is issued in the name of the agent so what are the criteria to be met here is supply of goods by a principal to an agent or vice versa plus invoice should be issued in the name of agent guys listen here let me go to the other side assume principal agent and the customer is there See, if principal 
is selling the goods to the customer through agent through agent guys so agent has helped the principal to find the customers and principal has sold directly the goods to the customer and the invoice is in the invoice they have given the supplier's name as whom principal who is the recipient customer in that case there is only one supply as per section 7 1 a as per 7 1 a guys clear yes sir. next sir what <coughs> principal has appointed the agent and the agent has found the customer and the agent has sold the goods to the customer and the agent has issued the invoice in his name in his name means in the invoice who is the actual supplier agent clear so invoice to the customer is issued in whose name agent's name so in that case this will be a supply as per section 71a because there is a consideration whereas whatever goods have been given by principal to agent to further sell it to customer this will be a supply as per what 71c red with schedule 1 para 3 para 3 of schedule 1 hope you guys are able to get it so if agent is issuing the invoice in his own name then there will be a two supply one is between the agent and customer the second one is between principal and agent as per section 71c hope you guys understood clear yes next another scenario i will take this is with respect to purchase assume guys principal want to purchase the goods he doesn't have any contact with the suppliers so he appointed the agent <coughs> he appointed the agent to purchase the goods if supplier is directly supplying the goods to the principal and invoice is issued in the name of supplier so who is the supplier here this person and who is the recipient principal so in that case there is only one supply that is as per section 71a there is only one supply as per section 71a guys clear yes sir so invoice in the invoice who is the supplier this guy who is the recipient principal clear and agent obviously for his services he would be charging some commission for it and that again commission whatever is charging that will be a separate supply of service guys now assume this didn't happen sir agent purchased the goods from the supplier and supplier is issuing the invoice in the name of agent in that case who is the recipient agent who is the supplier this guy so is it a supply yes as per which section 71a okay sir then further whatever agent has purchased is giving it to the principal so is it a supply yes so this will be as per with section 71c guys 71c read with para 3 para 3 of schedule 1 hope you guys are able to get it so only the basic criteria or condition here is if invoice is issued in the name of agent whether it is a purchase or sale through an agent then there will be a two supply one is as per section 71a where there is a consideration and one will be as per 71c that is between the principal and agent where normally there won't be any consideration clear guys so in whose name the invoice is issued is important i have explained in both the ways okay if invoice is issued directly in the name of like principal then what same way clear in both the cases that is purchased as well as sales both scenarios i have explained it <coughs> then fourth fourth para always steady along with guys 71b okay because there is, will be a connection between both of this you may also get confused so please be very careful i have also given the chart later i will cover it first let me see what is there in para 4 import of services without consideration by a person from a related person or from any of the establishment outside india in the course or furtherance of business guys simple i am importing services without paying anything and who is the supplier outside India? Na? So he is my related person or it is an establishment outside India, like my branch office or my holding company or subsidiary company, anything like that. Clear? Yes, sir. And it should be in the course of furtherance of business. So see the conditions here. Import of service should be there from a related person or establishment outside India and it should be in the course of furtherance of business. Guys, here I have imported some legal, assume I have imported a legal services from my brother or father outside India. They are practicing as a lawyer outside India and it is for my personal purpose. Is it a supply as per para 4? No. 
because it should be in the court or furtherance of business. Next, assume I took some legal services for, from them for my profession or for my business and I didn't pay anything for them, my brother na, or my father. Na. So in that case, what they're telling is it will not, it will be a supply. As it is in the court or furtherance of business, it will be a supply. And here, when we are checking the import, for the importer, we have to see whether it is in the course or furtherance of the business. Because who is the person who is liable to pay GST? The importer and the reverse charge mechanism. So we have to see whether for the recipient, is it in the course or furtherance of business, guys? Is that clear? Yes, sir. So you can see with respect to import of services, as there are two points covered, guys, please be very careful with it. There are, there are chances that they may confuse you in the question. So whenever there is an import of service, first check whether consideration is there or not. If it is for a consideration, then you should always check 7.1b. In 7.1b, there is no condition that it should be in the course or furtherance of business. Even if it is for a personal service or if, even if it is for a personal purpose, still it will be a supply. Sir, I imported some legal services or architect services or professional services for my personal purpose, but I paid the fees for it. Is it a supply? Yes, 7.1b. Clear. Sir, what if, it was, what if it is for my business or professional purpose? If you have paid consideration, it will always be a supply as per 7.1b. Next, if it is without consideration, then you have to check para 4. Clear? Yes. There you have to check additional condition also. Is it from a related person or is it from an establishment outside India? And is it in the court of furtherance of business? If yes, then it will be a supply as per para 4 of schedule 1 read with section 7.1c guys. If not, it will not be a supply. That is like, sir, I have imported, I have imported the services without consideration from my friend, sir, from my friend or from my ex, assume. So who is not related, who is not covered under related definition. In that case, <coughs> in that case, and just for example purpose, I am giving, in that case, will it be a supply? No, guys, it will not be a supply. Is that clear? Yes. And easy to remember guys, 7.1c, c is talking about what? Without consideration. C, without consideration. 7.1c, without consideration. Is that clear? Yes. And here, 7.1a, all forms of supply. It starts with what? A, all forms of supply. Clear? Yes, sir. Then A and B, you can arrange. And B, please be careful. 7.1b, always try to study along with para 4 of schedule 1, guys. Okay. So, 7.1c is like, Without consideration, read with schedule 1 and easy to remember the paras also guys. Para 1 talks about what? Permanent transfer or disposal of business assets. Assets. It starts with A. A is the first alphabet. So, para 1. Next, para 2. Supply between related person. At least 2 person should be present in order to be related. Correct? No? So, at least 2 person should be there. So, para 2. Then, para 3. Supply of goods between the principal and agent. So, totally how many people are there guys? In all this example, you can see principal agent or customer or principal agent or supplier so, so totally how many people are involved in this transaction three people so para three clear and para four is with respect to import is that clear easy to remember guys please remember it along with the section please it is very important guys and even schedule one along with the para if you remember that would be great if in your answer if you are writing section para schedules and all definitely your answer will have more weightage when compared to other students guys so please make sure that you have a you will cultivate that habit of remembering the sections fine Chalo. <clears throat> and i am to the extent possible i am trying to cover the provisions in the section order itself guys so that it becomes easy for you to remember the sections in the order or in the sequence fine let us move on <clears throat> activities to be treated as supply of goods or supply of services section 71a red capital a please be careful red with schedule 2 so now sir we have decided whether the activity or transaction is it a supply is it a supply if it is not a supply there is no question of deciding whether it is supply of goods or supply of services because it is not at all covered under gst if by chance if it is a supply, now we have to decide whether it is a supply of goods or supply of services. Yes, sir. because the rates and all will be different under GST. For goods, different rates are there. For services, different rates are there. So, classification is important. Yes, sir. So, now once we decide whether the activity or transaction is a supply, as per section 
that is 71a a a b and 71c once we decide the activity or a transaction is a supply now we have to decide whether it is a supply of goods or supply of services as per section 71a read with schedule 2 guys 71a is giving reference to schedule 2 schedule 2 so the CGST Act contains the list of activities or transactions which have been classified either as supply of goods or supply of services which are as follows. Very easy guys. Okay. Just by seeing the transaction you can tell ah this is supply of goods or yeah this is supply of services. So transfer. Whenever there is a transfer of title in the goods means the ownership is transferred. Risk and rewards is transferred. Then it is always said supply of goods guys. Then any transfer of right means ownership is retained by the transferor. But he is giving only right for you to use it for few months or few years. Any transfer of right in goods or undivided share in the goods without transfer of title in the goods, it is always a supply of services because the ownership is not transferred. Title is not transferred. So if title is transferred goods, if right is given services guys. Then any transfer of title in the goods under an agreement which stipulates goods that property shall pass at a future date. This is with respect to EMI or the higher purchase transaction guys. Now assume you have purchased a mobile phone or you have purchased a vehicle on EMI or higher purchase basis. In that case, sir, you will start using the uh, goods from the day you pay the down payment and take the delivery. So possession you will start enjoying, but when will you get the ownership? Only when you pay the last installment. In that case, sir, is it a supply of goods or services? Supply of goods. Even if the title will be given in some other date in the future, still it will be considered as supply of goods, guys. Because the title will be given only when you pay the last installment even then even the title is moving to you on a future date still when it is supplied when it is sold by the uh, supplier it is a supply of goods guys okay sir then land and building any lease tenancy or easement license to occupy land services it is always supply of services like renting guys simple then any lease or letting out of building that is again renting always supply of services then treatment or process any treatment or process which is applied to another person's goods services like job work and all assume sir i bought a cloth and i went and gave it to the tailor to stitch it and give it to me so whatever services is giving obviously it is what supply of services sir he is giving shirt and pant to you now obviously i gave the raw material to him in that he test whatever i wanted in as per my size and he give it to me in that case it is not a supply of goods he gave just the services even whenever you guys give your clothes for ironing or washing and all, all that are supply of services guys. Whatever service they do and they will give back your goods. You gave your goods to them and they are performing their uh, services on that or they are giving some treatment on it and they are giving it back. Even if you take your vehicles for a repair shop, they will do the service and give it back. What is it? Supply of services. <coughs> yeah. Next, transfer of business assets guys. Goods forming part of business assets are transferred or disposed of by or under the direction of a person carrying on the business. It is always a supply of goods. Means it is given free of cost or whether for a consideration. If it is sold for a consideration, it will be a supply as per 71A guys. Sir, what if it is given without consideration? Check whether ITC is claimed. If yes, then it is a supply as per para 1. And supply of what? Supply of goods. Sir, what if ITC was not availed? Then it is not at all a supply. When it is not at all a supply as per section 7 subsection 1, then no need to check whether it is a supply of goods or supply of services, guys. Yeah, yes. Next, goods held or used for business are put to private use or made available to any, any person for use for any purpose other than business by or under directions of person carrying on the business. Like business assets used for personal purpose. You guys would have seen in your accounts and all drawings. Okay, drawings of money or drawings of goods and all. Same way, your the business asset is used by any employees or the owner for personal purpose. In that case, assume even though it is a temporary three months or four months, it will be considered as supply of services. Assume guys, the assets owned by the business are given to the employee for a rent for three months or six months when it is not used in the business. In that case, sir, will it be considered as supply? Yes, supply of services. Next, goods forming part of the assets of any business carried on by a person who ceases to be a taxable person shall be deemed to be the supply by him in the course or furtherance of his business immediately before he ceases to be a taxable person. So whatever goods I am having on the day, I am closing down my business. I am not transferring my business to other. I am closing down, shedding down, liquidating. So in that case, on the date of liquidating my business, whatever goods I have with me, 
it is deemed to be supplied by me and it is supply of what supply of goods exceptions are there where it is not a supply business is transferred as a going concern it is not closed down it is transferred to someone else in that case it is not a supply even in para one also they have given this yes then business is carried on by personal representative sir my business i am not closing down i am taking the rest so my business assume is uh, inherited by my son or it is like he will carry on okay i'm still alive so assume he will my personal representative will carry on the business or my legal heirs will carry on the business or my son want to continue the show in that case will it be considered as shutdown of business no guys if there is a complete shutdown of the business whatever goods i have is deemed to be supplied if it is continued but not by me or by the purchaser or by my personal representative show will go on show will go on maybe i am not the hero someone else is taking over me because i am aged in that case yes it will not be a supply guys next renting of immobile property always supply of services then it is already covered here but again they have repeated it later because land and building is nothing but immobile property only <laughs> next construction or sale important connected to schedule 3 also construction of a building for a sale before the construction is completed that is nothing but sale of pre-constructed building services important guys please listen here guys if the building is sold that is pre-construction building pre-construction building or we have to check whether it is a post-construction building post-construction building <clears throat> Okay. Sir, when we will decide whether the building is a pre-construction or post-construction is like this. Guys, assume there is two things given, two dates. That is the date on which completion certificate is obtained. The person who is constructing the work, whom we call it as promoter or real estate person, he has to obtain completion certificate from the local authority. He has to obtain completion certificate from local authority. Assume you got it from 1st October. He got completion certificate. Yes, property is ready to occupy. And the first occupation by the buyer of this house was done from 1st December. Okay, first occupation. First occupation was done on 1st December. Guys, whichever is earlier we have to take. Whichever is earlier is which date? 1st October. 1st October. The date on which completion certificate is obtained or the date on which the property is first occupied clear up whichever is earlier so in my example it will be first october so what they are telling is in gst if seller has collected even a part of the consideration before this if seller has collected even a part of the consideration not entire even part of the consideration assume the house is sold for one crore you have collected even five lakh one lakh ten lakh before first october before 1st October, then it is a supply of services, construction service you are giving. So it is a supply of services liable for GST, liable for GST. Is that clear? So even if the part of the consideration is received on or before 1st October, it will be considered as pre-constructed building. And what is given by the builder? Service and not goods, supply of services. Clear? Sir, what if entire consideration is received? after 1st October, entire consideration, not even 1 rupee was received before it. In that case, we call it as post-construction building. Post-construction building and it is not a supply as per Schedule 3 guys. If the building is sold after the construction is completed, when the construction is said to be completed guys, come on. Sir, the date on which completion certificate is obtained or the date on which the property is first occupied, whichever is earlier. So see, whether at least a part of the consideration is received on or before that date, if yes, pre-construction building. No, sir, entire amount is received after that date, then post-construction building. So, if it is a pre-construction building, guys, it is a supply of what? Supply of service as per Schedule 2. Sir, what if it is a post-construction supply? It is not a supply. Post-construction sale or post-construction building, it is not a supply as per what? Schedule 3. Schedule 3. Is that clear? Yes, sir important this has to be studied together so construction of a building for a sale before the construction is completed when the construction is said to be completed guys please remember the date on which completion certificate is obtained or the date of first occupation whichever is earlier clear sir what if it is vice versa okay normally 
occupation will happen only after the completion certificate is obtained by chance. Assume, sir, what if this is a scenario? <coughs> Property is first occupied on 1st July and completion certificate is obtained on 30th July. Very rare, but still, what if it happens? Then construction is said to be completed whichever is earlier, 1st July. See whether a part of the consideration is received on or before this by the seller from the buyer. If yes, pre-construction building. If not, post-construction building. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Come on, sir. Chalo, guys. <clears throat> Next, intellectual property right, like patent, trademark, copyright. Temporary transfer or permitting use or enjoyment of any intellectual property right to supply of services. Information technology software, that is like I am taking your help, assume you are a coder or the website developer. In that case, whatever service I am taking with from you, development or design, programming, customization, adaptation, upgradation, enhancement, implementation of IT, that is information technology, not income tax. Information technology, supply of services. Then action, important guys, if I have agreed to do something, if I have agreed not to do something, I have agreed to tolerate something. All these are what? Supply of services, guys. You can see here. Agreeing to an obligation to refrain from an act or to tolerate an act or a situation or to do an act. So, in short, I have named it as ART. Agreed to do an act, A. Refrain from an act or then tolerate. ART. Art. Tolerating is an art. Okay. Patience is the key. Clear? Yes. <coughs> Now, fine guys, and with respect to this, there is also a circular released by ICA, which I have already updated the video on that, on the app. So, this is important guys, circular means there should be an agreement to do something or not to do something or not to do something is nothing but refrain from doing, okay, or to tolerate something. Oh, then right to use the goods, transfer of right to use the goods, again, which is a repeated supply of services. Then composite supply, this is interesting guys, actually in case of composite supply, both the components will be there, goods as well as services, but an, under GST, they have given clear cut clarity telling both of this is a supply of services. What is it sir? Works contract services, that is nothing but like construction services and all. Here both actually goods like bricks, sand, cement and all will be involved, plus services, con construction services or architect services also will be involved. In that case, if breakup is given good. If not, both put together, if single consideration is charged, we will consider it as what? Supply of services only. Then restaurant services also, both food as well as goods will be involved. We will treat it as what? Supply of services, guys. Is that clear? Yes. <clears throat> this soft copy is already available in my channel. So please, if you want to refer, please, you can make use of the same, guys, as I already told you. Then coming to negative list as per schedule three. <clears throat> Again, an important thing. Schedule 3 negative list means even though if there is any activity which is a supply, but if that supply is covered in Schedule 3, guys, then it is not taxable under GST. We will call it as not a supply. It is neither a supply of goods nor a supply of services. Guys, as per Section 71A, it might be a supply. It might be covered under 71A, 71B or wherever. And please be careful. We have to check whether the activity or Transaction is a supply as per all the subsections or clauses 71A, 71AA, 71B. If not, we have to check under 71C. If in either of these sections, if it is covered, then an activity or transaction will be a supply. Guys. But now, when we are sh covering Schedule 3, if there is an activity which is covered in Schedule 3, even though it was a supply as per 711, still it will not be taxable under GST because as it is covered in Schedule 3, they are telling it is neither a supply of goods nor a supply of services. Hence, it is not taxable under GST, guys. Sir, which are those? We will see it. Yes. Activities or transactions specified under Schedule 3 in CGST Act. Activities or transaction which shall be treated neither as a supply of goods nor a supply of services one by one. I have just arranged here in my shortcut guys that is learn A, B, C, D, E. Clear? I have arranged in that order. First, sale of land and sale of constructed building that is after the construction is completed. I explained you here only. Post construction building that is after the construction is completed if the 
building is sold it is not a supply as per schedule three guys okay sir land is always outside whether when it comes to building we have to check whether it is pre-construction or post-construction sale of land is always outside the gst guys and on that stamp duty would be limited which is outside gst okay actionable claims other than specified actionable claims this is the new addition made or amendment made please be careful actionable claim is a goods but they are including actionable claim in schedule 3 but other than specified actionable claim means other than specified actionable claim means sir is specified actionable claim is this is it a supply yes is it covered in schedule 3 no any other actionable claim other than specified actionable claim is covered in schedule 3 so what are those we will see specified actionable claim means important guys it is an amendment means the actionable claim involved in or by way of betting casinos gambling horse racing lottery or online money gaming previously only lottery betting and gambling was there but now they have added few things what are those casinos gambling or online money gaming these are few additions guys so please be careful on this is gst applicable sir on this items yes guys gst is applicable any other actionable claim is outside the gst because they are covered under schedule 3 so please be careful specified actionable claim is not covered in schedule 3 they are excluding it from schedule 3 any other actionable claims yes it is a part of schedule 3 yes gst will not be applicable good yes so then services by way of funeral burial or crematorium or mortuary including transportation of deceased this is in case in case of death so in case of death if you are taking any funeral burial or crematorium services then it is outside the gst person or the family is already in the feelings you are going and asking them sir for whatever services you have taken you have to pay a gst of 18 percent or 28 percent how bad they will feel about our country so that is why they have kept this services under negative list we will call we will also call the schedule 3 as negative list guys fine sir then services by any court or tribunal which is under set up under a law then functions performed by the members of parliament that is mp elections are coming <clears throat> members of state legislature members of panchayats members of municipalities and members of other local authorities so any services what all if they give okay so you know what services they will give or what services they will offer and if at all if they give any services or whatever functions they perform they get paid by the government clear so whatever this mp mlas and all will earn where is it taxable under income tax law guys under the head other sources why because that employer employee relationship is missing clear so will they fall under the employer employee relationship no so still for them it is taxable under the head other sources now for whatever services they are giving so they are the supplier is it covered under gst sir are they liable to pay gst no next duties performed by any person who holds any post in pursuance of provisions of the constitution in that capacity like president vice president speakers and all guys then duties performed by any person as a chairperson or a member or a director in a body established by central government or a state government or a local authority like cbdt chairperson or gst council chairperson cbic chairperson or any body set up by the central or state government or local authority then services by an employee to an employer in the course of employment now employee whatever employment services is giving to employer he get paid for it salary so employee is the person who is giving the service service provider is he liable for gst no because it is covered in negative list but yes obviously for whatever income is earning from the employer under the relationship of employer employee is taxable under the head salary in income tax but under gst it is not liable for gst guys is that clear so the shortcut is learn a b c d e okay so next there are two more list here activities or transaction notified by the government <clears throat> services by way of an activity in relation to a function entrusted to a panchayat under article 243g of the constitution or municipality under article 243w of the constitution see guys panchayat is with respect to rural areas whereas the municipality is with respect to urban areas clear I means they are local authorities or local government we call it as any services given by a panchayat or the municipality as assigned to them under the articles of the constitution they are not covered under gst guys please be careful here what is covered is the members of municipality and 
like you guys would have seen members of gram panchayat or taluk panchayat or in municipalities we call it as corporators whatever services or functions they are giving is covered in this list clear huh? now whatever services directly the municipalities or the panchayat is giving that is covered in this list not the members directly the panchayat or municipality okay yes then services by way of grant of alcoholic liquor license by the state government so whenever you want to do any liquor business or sell liquor or alcohol you have to obtain the license from the state government and for that you have to pay crores together sir is that covered under gst no guys but only the sale of alcoholic liquor license the government will sell many other licenses also like fire mining and all but those things are not covered here only the grant of alcoholic liquor license see even if you manufacture alcohol or if you sell alcohol it is outside the gst completely outside the gst so that is why they are told okay if license is given by the government for the person to do alcohol business or to sell alcohol in that case whatever the government is charging for that license is outside the gst is outside the gst plus please be careful only the grant of alcohol license guys not any other license because government whether central or state government they issue many other types of licenses also but those things are not covered here next non supplies clarified by way of circular third item if there is interstate movement of various modes of conveyance guys that is let us see interstate movement of various modes of conveyance between distinct person including trains between distinct person means we already seen the person who has taken the registration separately under gst but under the same pan under the same pan whether within the state or outside the state but here they are talking about interstate movement means sir assume i have a registered business in karnataka and tamil nadu i am transporting the goods from my karnataka branch to tamil nadu this two separate registration has been obtained in two separate states so is it a distinct person yes guys so in that case if there is a interstate movement of various modes of conveyance that is the vehicles between distinct person including the train buses trucks tankers tra trailers vessels containers aircraft carrying goods or passengers or both or for repairs and maintenance so if i am sending any of my bus trucks from my bangalore branch to the assume chennai branch for carrying goods or passengers or for repairs and maintenance and they are not liable for igst guys they are not liable for igst except in case where such movement is for further supply of the same convenience means on the movement of convenience they are telling there is no igst obviously for passenger and goods whatever you are charging for that there will be a gst sir now vehicle is moving bus is going from here to there truck is going from here to there on that will gst be levied no no because we discussed supply between related person or the distinct person even without consideration it will be supplier yeah. yes we discussed so now if conveyance is moving that is bus or truck from one branch to another branch sir will igst be levied on that no except in cases where such movement is for further supply of the same conveyance guys assume tata motors they have a manufacturing plant assume in gujarat and they are manufacturing the cars there and they are distributing to all the dealers or the distributors throughout the country so that is for what further supply further supply where in the showrooms or in the distributors place will that be considered as supply yes guys and obviously when it is further sold by the showroom or distributor whatever tax has been paid when the manufacturer sent okay let me explain this interesting as a manufacturer who is the manufacturer here tata motors they manufacture and send the goods for all the states for all the dealers sir is it a supply yes because it is for further supply so it as it is a supply between the distinct person even though tata motor is not charging any amount to their distributors because it is not actually a sale they are just giving it they are just transferring it to the distributor so that they can sell it in their showrooms but as per para 2 of schedule 1 is it a supply yes sir so all the showrooms one showroom two showroom three showroom or showroom five oh so this people whenever the tata motors are sending tata motors are liable to pay gst as a supplier they will collect it from the dealers or showrooms and they will remit it to the government and when they supply it to the customers when they supply it to the customer they will charge gst to the customers and whatever tax they have paid on their inward supply 
from Tata Motors, they can claim the credit of the same. They can claim the credit of the same. So this will be a supply as per section 71C, para 2 guys, para 2 of schedule 2. And this will be for the customer, obviously this will be as per 71A, as there will be a consideration. Clear? So in simple, they are asking you, when you are sending the vehicles for the further supply, please pay GST on it. And when it is further sold to the customer, you can claim the credit of the same. Whatever tax you have paid here, you claim the credit of the same as input tax credit. Okay. Next, interstate movements of rigs, tools and spares and all goods on wheels like cranes, except in cases where movement of such goods is for further supply of the same goods. Same like, if it is for further supply, yes, IGST would be it. If it is not for further supply, and consequently, no IGST would be applicable on such movements, guys. If it is interstate movement, that is, you are moving your rigs, tools, and all from one state to another state. Clear? Ah? Yes. However, you can see this is for both common one and two common dialogue. However, applicable CGST, SGST, or IGST, as the case may be, shall be liveable on repairs and maintenance done for such convenience or goods. Yeah. So, whatever repairs and maintenance service will be given for that conveyance or goods, obviously on that GST would be levied because it is a supply of service. Clear? Just a movement is not liable for GST they are telling. Clear? Yes, guys. So, this is all about section 7, guys. So, we are read what all section, guys? 7, 1. <clears throat> okay, let me just go back quickly because this is very important. I am going back and telling you. 71A, 71A, what is it? All forms of supply for a consideration in the course of furtherance of business. They have given some example also. Sale, transfer, barter, exchange and all. Yes, sir. And what is goods definition is given in 252? What is services? 2102. Okay. Then, activities or transaction by a person other than individual to their members or constituents for a consideration, whether paid now or in the future. 71AA. Then import of services for a consideration, whether or not connected to business or profession, guys. Yes. Then 71C, activities even without consideration will be treated as supply. We call it as deemed supply. Guys, this can be asked for explanation and a descriptive. Please be very careful. Try to remember it along with the paragraph, schedule and section. 71C, read with schedule 1. Para 1, 2, 3, 4. Yes. All this are considered as supply even without consideration but please be careful with the conditions whatever i have highlighted in green color all the conditions has to be satisfied yes so and import of services please be careful whenever there is an import of services first check whether it is without consideration or with consideration accordingly decide whether it is a supply as per 71b or as per para 4 of schedule 1 guys okay then schedule 2 will tell okay if an activity is a supply as per section 71 we will tell now whether it is a supply of goods or supply of services as per section 71 capital A red with schedule 2. Okay. Then there are few activities which are in negative list. Means they are neither the supply of goods nor a supply of goods. Sorry, neither the supply of goods nor the supply of services. Hence, GST will not be levied on the same. We call it as non-taxable supply. Guys. We call this all these items whatever is covered in this schedule 3 along with whatever 2 and 3rd point we have seen. We call all this as non-taxable supply. Non-taxable supply is something on which GST is not applicable, including alcohol and PhD man. Yeah, they are also called the non-taxable supply guys. <clears throat> okay, then section 8. Taxability of composite and mixed supply. Guys, when two or more goods or two or more services or goods along with services have been supplied for a single price have been supplied for a single price. We have to decide whether it is a composite supply or mixed supply. Accordingly, we have to decide the tax rates. Clear? Sir, what if each of the goods is supplied for a separate price? If each of the services is supplied for a separate price, then there is no question of deciding whether it is a composite or mixed supply, guys. It is a separate supply. Clear? For example, assume laptop is supplied along with charger and bag, guys. Yeah, for a separate price, they are charging for laptop 50,000, for a charger assume 2,000 and for a bag 1,000 rupees. Separate price is charged for each of this. In that case, totally you are paying 53,000 but there is a breakup given for each of the item. Sir, should we decide here whether it is a composite supply or mixed supply? No guys. So in that case, on 50,000, whatever is the rate applicable for laptop would be charged. On charger, whatever is 2,000. 
on that whatever is the rate applicable for charger would be levied and same way for bag whatever is the rate of gst on that on thousand rupees it will be levied clear if separate price is charged there is no question of deciding whether it is a composite supply or mixed supply the question of deciding whether it is a composite supply or mixed supply will arise only when all these three have been supplied for a single price assume guys all these three have been supplied for 50000 normally this is what happens for laptop along with charger and bag they are giving at 50000 in that case we have to decide whether it is a composite supply or mixed supply is that clear so when two or more goods or two or more services or goods along with the combination of services if they are supplied for a single price together then it is our duty to distinguish whether it is a composite supply or mixed supply guys you can see goods or services are both are supplied together in a combination for a single price and each of them may attract a different rate of tax but it is sold as one package for a single price only then we have to decide whether it is a composite or mixed supply guys come on composite supply section 2 clause 30 defines composite supply as a supply made by a taxable person that is the person who is registered under gst or who is liable to be registered under gst taxable person means the person who is registered under gst or who is liable to be registered under gst okay to a re uh, recipient consisting of two or more taxable supplies of the goods or services or both or any combination thereof which are naturally bundled and supplied in conjunction with each other in the ordinary course of business one of which is a principal supply guys two or more goods or services have been supplied for a single price together and which are naturally bundled sir what is naturally bundled they have not defined in the law naturally bundled means when majority of the customers are expecting them to buy together we call it as naturally bundled and it is subjective guys there is no fixed list where we can give oh, all these are composite all these are mixed supply all these are naturally bundled all these are not naturally bundled no it is our judgment clear so wherever you expect the products to be bought together we will call it as naturally bundled majority because everyone may not expect the same thing different cranky people also will be there so if majority of the customer or recipients are willing to buy it together in that case we call it as naturally bundled if not not naturally bundled guys okay and in the ordinary course of business we are selling it together who supplier and one of which is a principal supply sir what is principal supply they have defined in the law principal supply is the supply which has a predominant position in the supply guys for example if i am purchasing all this sir is it a naturally bundled yes guys normally people will buy all this together agree now and sir which is the principal supply here laptop because of this only the other two things have been supplied now i didn't go to buy charger or bag i went to buy laptop along with charger and bag clear because obviously without charger how will i use the laptop for a long period of time clear so in that case laptop is a principal supply which has a predominant supply guys or predominant position you always remember like that. because of this item we are purchasing the other things also like mobile with charger which is the principal supply mobile clear uh, tv along with the remote or along with the stabilizer sir which is the principal supplier tv agree na yes so example charger supplied along with mobile phone which is a principal supplier guys the mobile phones and taxability sir section 8 which talks about taxability please remember the definition along with the taxability both important guys there are chances of asking question on this also okay shall be treated as supply of principal supply so composite supply will be treated as a supply of what principal supply the entire value of composite supply will be charged at the rate applicable to the principal supply so in my example guys assume let me just give the random rates i'm just giving the random rates rate applicable to laptop is 18 percent charger is assume 20 percent and bag is assume 12 percent i'm just taking random rates you need not worry from exam point of view what is the rate applicable for each goods if at all if there is any question like this they will mention the rates in the question okay so which is the principal supply laptop what is the rate 18 percent so on the entire 50 000 18 percent would be charged guys whatever is the rate applicable to the principal supply so in case of composite supply it will be treated as the supply of what principal supply what is the principal supply here laptop or in this example mobile phone so in that case whatever is the rate applicable to the principal supply will be charged on the entire value clear yes so now coming towards mixed supply and easy to remember 230 composite supply c c is the third alphabet guys 
clear so you can see here c is the third alphabet so 30 <coughs> co 30 okay mixed supply under section 274 mixed supply means two or more individual supplies of a goods or services or any combination thereof made in conjunction with each other conjunction is together guys uh, with each other by a taxable person for a single price where such supply does not constitute a composite supply means it is not naturally mandatory two or more items have been supplied together whether goods or services or combination of both have been supplied for a single price but it is not a composite supply means they are not naturally bundled they are not naturally bundled sir i went for a diwali wanted to purchase a diwali pack okay sweet box along with that they are giving chocolate and dry fruits also so in that case is it naturally bundled no guys it is not naturally bundled so you can see example gift pack comprising of chocolates and sweets or dry fruits in this case we treat it as not naturally bundled hence it is a mixed supply in case of mixed supply what is the rate applicable sir it is given in section 8 please remember the definition section along with section 8 guys rate of gst what supply it is is given in section 8 whereas the definition is given in section 230 composite supply and mixed supply 274 okay very important this four definitions what we have covered in this chapter are very important guys what are those goods services composite supply and mixed supply and along with this who is the related person who is distinct person even that is important okay and that is important even for the registration chapter also okay so in case of mixed supply it shall be treated as a supply of that particular supply that attract highest rate of tax the entire value of mixed supply will be charged at the rate applicable to the supply that attract the highest rate of tax guys assume i have purchased a pack gift pack along with chocolates sweets and dry fruits the rate applicable are assume sir 28 percent for sweets 18 percent for chocolate 12 percent and the cost of this pack is assume 5000 so what they are telling as they are not naturally mandated we will categorize them as mixed supply and in case of mixed supply on the entire 5000 the highest rate would be applicable what is it 28 percent on the entire value 28 percent would be lived so entire package i have purchased for 5000 on that what is the gst to be lived 28 percent guys is that clear yes so I have, you can see i have given some examples also here that is goods supplied along with transportation service so this is goods transportation service along with insurance so what it will be composite supply in that case which is the principal supplier goods guys principal supply same way sir chocolate or biscuit along with the beverages and food is supplied what is it mixed supply in that case whatever is the highest rate that would be applicable in case of mixed supply you need not worry about sir what is principal and all you need not worry guys clear then sir i have purchased ac along with that they are giving free installation for all this put together assume they are charged me thirty thousand okay i'm just taking a random figure in that case so what is it sir composite supply so which is the principal supply here the ac guys purchase of ac is that clear yes so we are done with chapter 2 guys what all we have covered come on section 7 section 8 along with schedules guys so if i have to come to the section numbers here we have covered all this section 7 and 8 we have covered along with 71a aa 71b 71c 71 capital a 71 72 73 73 is like guys government has the power to tell this is a supply of goods this is a supply of services and not the supply of the other assume means this is like giving clarity for the people if they tell assume normally this is a supply of pen so what is it guys supply of goods now government came and told no no because it is a supply of services and not a supply of goods we are supposed to follow it they are the big boss we have to follow it clear huh? means they have the power as per section 73 treatment of supply of goods or services based on the recommendation of the gst council if they tell this is a supply of goods and not a supply of services we have to follow it or if they tell if this it is a supply of services and not a supply of goods we have to follow it this is only when they have a when there is a confusion among the people or a, with the public that whether it is a supply of goods or supply of services that is where they will use this power and give the clarification is that clear yes then section 8 also we have covered so as and when we cover any sections guys you guys can just come here come back here and just tick the sections the respective section so in the next chapter we would be covering two more sections that is section 9 and 10 
levy and collection of CGST and this we will study along with section 5 of IGST. Section 5 of IGST. So even in IGST 1 and 2 is same guys that is short title extend and commencement in I section 1 it is applicable to entire India including Jammu Kashmir then short title is IGST Act commencement is from 1st July 2017 then then whatever terms they would have used in IGST Act they have defined it in section 2 clause something then 3 and 4 talks about administrative which is not a part of your inter syllabus then 5 guys whatever section 5 of IGST Act is there same to same is given in section 9 with few changes in the words in section 9 of CGST Act they would have used the word intrastate supply on which CGST is levied whereas in section 5 of IGST Act they would have used the word interstate supply on which IGST would be levied clear all other things will remain same each of the section has pi pi subsection which we will learn now i'm just giving you what we will be covering now i'm just giving some information is that clear yes guys so section 5 of igst act along with section 9 and 10 of cgst act we will be covering it in chapter 3 guys clear yes sir yes guys now we will revise chapter 3 which talks about charge of gst that is levy of gst India has adopted a dual GST model where the tax is imposed simultaneously that is by both central government as well as states guys that is central government will be living and collecting CGST whereas the states would be living SGST even if the supply is within the union territory instead of SGST UTGST would be levied but UTGST will be levied and collected by central government but that amount would be exclusively used only for the development of respective union territory guys yes so in case of intrastate supply that is the supply is within the state we charge cgst and sgst cgst is for central government sgst is for the respective state that is, then intra union territory supply whenever there is a supply within the respective union territory only that is ladakh or andaman and nicobar islands in that case cgst plus utgst would be levied guys both will be levied and collected by central government because the union territories union territories are administered by central government only so in that case but the amount whatever is collected as utgst as i told will be utilized only for the development of respective union territories then interstate supply that is when the supply is outside the state or outside the union territories in that case we call it as interstate supply igst would be levied and collected by central government so completely i interstate supply is administered by central government guys but half of the revenue will be central governments the remaining half will go to the destination state okay just a minute make <clears throat> yeah the cgst is levied under cgst act 117 and utgst is levied under utgst act 117 and this is applicable to the union territories of what and all only five union territories are there guys under gst andaman and nicobar islands lakshadweep Dadra and Nagaraveli and Daman and Dew, all this put together one and Chandigarh as well as Ladakh, totally five. SGST is levied under the respective state legislation. So there are totally 31 states for GST purpose as we already discussed. So each and every state will have their own SGST act and under that they will have the power to levy SGST as guys. That is SGST only it will be levied in case whether the, when the supply is within the state. That is intrastate supply. National capital territory of Delhi, Puducherry or Pondicherry and Jammu Kashmir is treated as state for GST purpose and SGST is levied under the respective state legislation. Guys, as of now, Jammu Kashmir doesn't have their own government, but still it is a union territory with, the, with their own state legislation. So for GST purpose, we will treat them as state only. So supply so already we have discussed i just i will go back and show you that <clears throat> for gst purpose totally how many states are there and how many union territories are there guys 28 plus 3 totally 31 states including jammu kashmir delhi and puducherry whereas five union territories guys for gst purpose only please be careful outside the gst for general knowledge purpose there are actually 28 states and eight union territories yeah so please don't get confused with respect to what you learn in gst to actual reality huh. let us continue so supply we have to identify whether it is an intrastate supply or interstate supply we call it as nature of supply sir when a supply will be 
intrastate supply when the location of supplier and place of supply of goods or services are within the same state or within the same union territory guys when it is within the same state or union territory we call them as what intrastate supply and in case of intrastate supply what do we leave cgst plus sgst or if it is within union territory we leave cgst plus utgst then if the location of supplier and place of supply of goods or services are in two different states or two different union territory or a state and union territory then we call it as interstate supply and igst would be leave always sir what is location of supplier is the place where local supplier is registered sir what about the place of supply we have a separate chapter for it we will cover it guys which is a part of igst act place of supply provisions are covered in igst act actually okay sir now we will actually get into the part which is covered in this chapter that is section 9 very important section which is we will, which we call it as charging section guys like in income tax and all we have one general charging section 4 and specific charging section that is the first section under each head of income is a specific charging section the same way under cgst act we have section 9 and under igst act we have section 5 which talks about levy and collection of gst guys as per section 15 gst would be levied on the transaction value transaction value is nothing but value of supply how do we determine this is given in section 15 of cgst act which we will learn it as a separate chapter later later guys and on this whatever is the rate of gst we will apply it then sir when the gst would be levied who is liable to pay gst is it forward charge or reverse charge what sir that is what we will discuss under section 9 guys let's first before going to section 9 who has the liability to pay GST? We will discuss. Then I will go back to section 9. There are two mechanisms under GST guys. That is forward charge mechanism and reverse charge mechanism. Under forward charge mechanism, whenever the supplier, whenever the supplier is supplying goods or services to the recipient, the liability to pay GST is on the supplier. So what will supplier do? He will charge from the recipient. So assume he is selling the goods, assume for 1 lakh guys on which GST is applicable 18,000. He will collect totally 1,18,000 from the recipient and deposit 18,000 with the government. 18,000 is not his amount. Clear? So, recipient will totally pay 1,18,000 and the supplier will keep 1 lakh in his pocket and 18,000 he will remit it to the government. Sir, recipient, can he claim the ITC of 18,000, sir? Yes, subject to conditions subject to condition if he satisfy all the conditions given in ITC chapter yes he can claim guys is that clear yes so <laughs> this we call it as what forward charge mechanism okay sir then there is something called as reverse charge mechanism that is whenever the supplier supply goods or services to the recipient under income tax law they are clearly told okay recipients which are those goods or services which are taxable under GST they have specified it okay now if they have clearly given in the law recipient if you take so and so goods or services from the respective supplier you have to pay tax under rcm in that case recipient will pay to the supplier only one lakh i am taking the same numerical he will pay to the supplier only one lakh and he will only deposit to the government eighteen thousand under reverse charge mechanism under reverse charge mechanism who will deposit recipient only we call it as what reverse charge mechanism guys is that clear so here who has the responsibility to pay taxes supplier but can he collect it from the recipient yes he can collect it but supplier is the one who has to charge issue tax invoice collect the amount and deposit it to the government clear and here sir recipient can he claim the input tax credit yes subject to the conditions whereas coming to reverse charge mechanism so, in the law, they have defined <clears throat> or they have notified on which goods and services reverse charge is applicable. Any other item which is not covered under RCM, it is always taxable under forward charge. Guys. Is that clear? Yes. So, we will see what are those services. Goods actually is not a part of your inter syllabus. That is the goods which are taxable under RCM is not a part of your syllabus. Whereas, services which are taxable under RCM is a part of your syllabus. Guys. Oh, now, in this scenario, recipient is the one who is liable to pay gst directly to the government and sir can he claim the itc of whatever he has paid yes even in this case the tax is paid on his inward supply but recipient paid it by himself still the 
ITC can be claimed subject to conditions, guys. Because under both, whether it is forward charge or reverse charge, for recipient, it is inward supply only. If he satisfy all the conditions given in ITC chapter, he can claim the credit of the same, guys. Is that clear? Yes. So, this is the two mechanism <coughs> which I told you. <coughs> so, now we will go back to section 9. Section 9 has 5 subsections, guys. All 5 are important. 9 subsection 1. CGST shall be levied on all intrastate supplies of goods or services or both, except on the supply of alcoholic liquor for human consumption, which is completely outside GST, on the value determined under Section 15 and at such rate not exceeding 20%. Maximum CGST rate is 20%. Guys, uh, the maximum rate of GST as of now is 18%. If we divide it between CGST and SGST, we will get it 14% both each. Agree now. So as of now, the maximum rate of CGST is 14%. But even in the future, if you want to increase the rate, you cannot increase beyond 20% because the law is restricting you. The maximum rate of CGST that can be levied even in the future is how much guys? 20%. But as of now, it is 14% because the highest GST rate is 28%. So, if I divide it between CGST and SGST, we get 14% each. So, as of now, 14%. But maximum limit is given in the law is 20%. Is that clear? Yes. So, and GST will always be levied on what value? That is why I just mentioned. Section 15, we will be covering later. GST rate will always be levied on the value of supply as determined in Section 15. Clear? Yes. So, next, <coughs> subsection 2. The CGST on supply of petroleum crude, high speed diesel, motor spirit, commonly known as petrol, aviation, turbine fuel, and natural gas, in short, I call them as PhD man, shall be levied with effect from later date and as may be notified by the government. So, as of now, they have not brought these items under GST. Temporarily, yes, they are outside the GST. But any day in the future, if GST council decides, yes, we will bring these products also under GST, GST can be levied on the same guys. But as on today also, it is outside the GST. So, subsection 1 and 2 talks about forward charge guys. Here, who is liable to pay tax? As per this two section, supplier. Supplier guys. 3 and 4 talks about RCM. Who is liable to pay tax under RCM? Recipient. What are those we will see? Subsection 3, the government may by notification specify categories of supply of goods or services or both. The tax on which shall be paid on reverse charge basis by the recipient. Means section 9, subsection 3 is giving power to the government to notify supply of few goods or services on which recipient will pay tax under reverse charge mechanism. Sir, did government use this power? Yes, they have released a notification telling on so and so goods and services RCM is applicable. So, if your supply is not covered in that list, it is understood that, okay, it is taxable under forward charge. And you are supposed to know, guys, which are those goods or services which are covered under RCM. But for inter, goods is not covered. You need not worry. Only services. Clear? Yes, for inter level. <coughs> then subsection 4. The government may by notification specify a class of registered person, a recipient who shall, in respect of supply of specified categories of goods or services or both, received from an unregistered supplier pay the tax on reverse charge basis means it is a supply supplier is unregistered whereas recipient is registered in that case they are telling recipient you have to pay tax is it always sir no guys it is only in with respect to few supplies with respect to real estate transaction and all but when exactly 94 is applicable is not again a part of your inter syllabus they are not covered in detail yeah they have notified few things like cement or real estate transactions and all but they are not covered it for you at inter level in detail so what you are supposed to worry about is 93 which is important yeah yes guys 93 has given power to the government to notify certain supply of goods or services on which recipient will pay tax on reverse charge basis 94 is also talking about rcm but supplier is unregistered recipient is registered in that case recipient is the one who is registered let him pay the tax under rcm is what 94 is telling is that clear yes and 95 <coughs> who is liable to pay tax as per 9.5 is economic, uh, electronic, not economic, electronic commerce operator. The government may by notification specify categories of services, only services, no goods are there. The tax on intrastate supplies of which shall be paid by electronic commerce operator, if such services are supplied through it, means 
if there is any supplier who is supplying services through electronic commerce operator to a recipient they are telling supplier will not pay tax recipient will not pay tax electronic commerce operator you pay the tax you pay the tax is that clear yes sir sir have they notified using this power yes guys they have notified four services which we will see later so 93 and 95 is important for you from exam point of view which we will cover in detail okay just a second now <coughs> so we learned section 9 of cgst act sir what about section 5 of igst act same to same copy paste mutatis mutandis for interstate supply for interstate supply the changes are like this guys okay same section 5 also has five subsections wherever it is intra it will be inter there and the maximum rate of igst is 40 percent and not 20 percent because it is always a combination of both clear right? so maximum igst rate is 40 percent guys so wherever it is intrastate supply it will be inter in section 5 <coughs> You can see, so yeah, here also it will be inter. Is that clear? Yeah. Yes, so that's all, guys. So the maximum rate of CGST or SGST or UTGST individually shall be maximum 20%, whereas IGST maximum 40% because it is a combination of two things. Fine, guys. So this is all about section 9, red, along with section 5 of IGST Act. Section 9 of CGST, section 5 of IGST. Section 9 is applicable in case of intrastate supply, which talks about CGST. Section 5 is applicable in case of interstate supply, which talks about IGST. Is that clear, guys? Yes. Now we will see, sir, which are the cases where reverse charge mechanism is applicable? Important, guys. Important from exam point of view. So, section 9, subsection 3 gave the power to the government to notify certain goods or services which are taxable under reverse charge mechanism on which recipient is liable to pay tax. Government used this power government used this power and they notified certain goods and services which are taxable under rcm guys but what is a part of your syllabus is only services part goods is not a part of your inter syllabus clear guys it is like this because see rcm always should be read along with exemption because majority of the item here is also connected to exemption clear so wherever required i will be giving connection to exemption now but not in detail guys because when i go to exemption there i will give because by then you guys will be knowing rcm list clear as of now i will just give some touch here and there when i go to exemption yes wherever we see the connection point i will tell you this is what we saw in rcm and this is what is covered in exemption clear huh? guys when you study all this together your knowledge should be like this <clears throat> means after studying rcm after studying exemption everything so the final conclusion will be like this supply once we identify whether the activity or transaction is a supply we have to check whether it is a supply of goods or services then from supply if there is anything which is covered in negative list negative list or non-taxable supply let me call it as non-taxable supply we have to remove it that is whatever we learned in section 7 subsection 2 read with schedule 3 okay sir and if there is any exempt supply also, we have to remove it, guys. Exempt supply is given in section 11, read with notification, which we are ready to cover. We have to remove it. Remaining is what, sir? Taxable supply. <clears throat> so, taxable supply on which GST is levied. Okay. So, first we will identify whether the activity or our transaction is a supply as per section 7.1. Yes, sir. Then we will see whether it is covered in negative list. If yes, we will remove it. We will check whether it is covered in exemption list. If yes, remove it. Then, if not covered in both these places, then it is taxable. It is understood that it is taxable. Okay, sir. Now we need to identify whether it is taxable under RCM, FCM, that is forward charge mechanism or reverse charge mechanism. Guys, they are specifically given which are the goods or services on which recipient is liable to pay tax. So we should, we are supposed to know that list any other supply of goods or services which is taxable but not covered under rcm is always covered under what fcm that is forward charge mechanism is that clear because they are not given the list which are taxable under forward charge they are just given the list which is exempt they are given the list which is negative list or not taxable supply they have given given the list which is covered under rcm so remaining all are it's understood that it is taxable under 
power charge guys like even in income tax they are given only what is exempt so if you are earning any income which is not exempt it is understood that it is taxable clear same way here so you are supposed to know what is exempt you are supposed to know what is covered in negative list or non taxable supply that is section 72 read with uh, schedule 3 then you should know what are the goods or services covered under rcm remaining all are taxable under forward charge mechanism guys is that clear yes sir fine guys but this will start the rcm part <coughs> reverse charge mechanism please be attentive attentive na guys guys look here hey, look here first item i have given three columns important columns here category of supply what is supply that is the supply nature of service or category of service then who is the supplier who is the recipient so we know that under rcm recipient is the one who is liable to pay tax so last column is very important but who should be the supplier who should what is the category of service is also important because rcm is not applicable always they have given okay only if the supplier is so and so person and they have supplied so and so service and to so and so person only then rcm is applicable clear yes guys come on transportation of goods by road by a goods transportation agency so who is the supplier here goods transportation agency okay sir gta in short who is the recipient of service sir any factory registered under the factory act any society registered under the society act any cooperative society any person registered under gst that is the person who is registered under gst guys clear a registered taxable person we call him as then any body corporate a partnership firm whether registered or not doesn't matter and firm here include llp also no okay then any casual taxable person who is registered see registered word is not actually used in rcm list but exemption is given for unregistered person in exemption list so that is why i have added the word here registered actually in this notification they have not used the word registered but when you guys are studying together it will be easy na so that is why i have just mentioned the word registered because if casual taxable person is not registered actually for him registration is mandatory only if he is supplying some notified goods and all up to threshold certain threshold limit he need not get registered okay assuming he is not registered it is covered in exemption list guys if he is registered rc always clear huh? yes located in taxable territory means india but gta this is rcm but gta has an option to pay tax under forward charge if they have opted that is gta as a sub supplier if they have opted to pay tax under forward charge then rcm is not applicable if they have not opted to pay tax under forward charge only then rcm is applicable guys whenever gta is opting to pay tax under forward charge they have to issue invoice to the recipient and they have to disclose that that gta that is the supplier i am paying the tax under forward charge you need not pay under reverse charge clear if gta is not opting to pay tax under forward charge only then if the recipient is the following people not for everyone only if the recipient is the specified recipients who are covered here for them rcm is applicable guys is that yeah yes sir one exception guys assume a person registered under gst any person but if the person is registered under gst only for tds purpose if the per person is registered under gst only to deduct tds and they are not providing any taxable outward supply they are telling rcm is not applicable for them even though they are registered but they are registered only for tds purpose then no rcm guys no rcm for that recipient clear even though they are registered fine i have given a chart on this <coughs> let me see that and explain yeah person liable to pay gst for gta service when recipient is one of the specified recipients specified recipients means the following people guys clear huh? yes next gta opts to pay gst under forward charge means they have an option na? they can pay tax under a forward charge yes sir in that case if they are paying tax at 12 percent under forward charge then for them itc is available they can pay tax on their outward supply under forward charge at 12 percent and on their inward supply they can claim full itc subject to conditions sir if on their outward supply if they are paying gst at five percent under forward charge only they are only paying it but in that case as they are paying at five percent itc is not available guys even though they are eligible as per itc chapter as they are paying output tax only at five percent whatever tax they have paid on inward supply they are not eligible to claim credit even though they are satisfied conditions given in itc chapter still they will not be eligible okay gta doesn't opt to pay tax under forward charge in that case if the recipient is a specified recipient 
you will pay GST and reverse charge mechanism at 5%. Guys. In that case, can GTA claim the ITCs are? No, because they didn't pay anything. The recipient paid it directly under RCM. So in that case, GTA cannot claim input tax credit on whatever tax they have paid on their inward supply. They cannot claim it. Sir, what if the recipient is not a specified recipient? I have given the note here. Where the recipient is other than the specified recipient, then unregistered recipient or unregistered person recipient or unregistered casual taxable person GST is exempt. It is given in exemption list. Clear? Huh? So in simple, if the recipient is other than this people, then it is exempt. It is covered in exemption list. Clear? Huh? So only if the recipient is the following people, either FCM or RCM. If not, it is always exempt. Clear, huh? Sir, who is recipient now? Recipient of GTA service is the person who pay or is liable to pay freight for transportation of goods by road in goods carriage located in taxable territory. Only goods transportation are covered guys. GTA, goods transportation, please be careful. Next, <clears throat> legal services supplied directly or indirectly. Who is the supplier? An individual advocate including senior advocate or a firm of advocates. To whom? Who is the recipient sir? Business entity located in taxable territory territory only then the recipient has to pay tax even for this there is some connection with exemption i would be explaining it in exemption guys okay yes then services supplied by arbitral tribunal arbitral tribunal here is the private arbitral tribunal which is not registered under the law because if it is set up under the law or set up under the law or set up by a law it is covered in negative list whereas here whatever is there sir i have some private dispute with my brother or wife or with my partner we are getting settled by the arbitral tribunal which is like not set up under the law. In that case, yes, they are covered here. Who is the supplier? Arbitral tribunal. Who is the recipient? Business entity located in taxable territory. They are the one who is liable to pay tax under RCM. Guys, business entity means any person who is doing the business. It can be in any form. Okay, like sole proprietor, uh, partnership, uh, company, uh, private, uh, public, uh, doesn't matter. Next, sponsorship services. Any person who is providing it, and who is the recipient? Any body corporate or partnership firm located in the taxable territory. They are the one who is liable to pay tax. Then fifth one, services supplied by central government, state government, union territory or local authority. So they are the supplier guys. If they provide any services to whom? To any business entity located in taxable territory. Who is liable to pay tax? The business entity. That is the recipient. But the following services are not covered under RCM. Renting of immobile property, they are excluding it. Please be careful. The following items are not covered under RCM. See, renting of immobile property is covered and as a separate item under 5A. You can see here. Renting of immobile property by whom? Central government, state government, unit territory, local authority to whom? Any person registered under GST. So, the recipient is registered under GST. Who is liable to pay tax? Recipient. Okay. Guys, here the supplier includes everyone like the central government, state government, unit territory, local authority including the court and tribunal but it will not include Ministry of Railway or Indian Railways. It will not include, which is an addition. Please be careful. This is an amendment. Clear? Huh? Yes. Next. <clears throat> Guys, they are excluding first item which we saw, which they have given it as a separate item for year. What about B, sir? Services specified below. That is, services by a uh, department of post and ministry of railways. Again, please be careful. This is a new addition, which was not there before. Okay. Then services in relation to aircraft or a vessel or inside or outside the presence of the port or airport. Then transportation of goods or passenger. Sir, what about these three items, sir? Is it covered under RCM? No. Is there any separate item for this, sir? No. That means what? FCM is applicable. Guys. Forward charge mechanism is applicable. For these three items, even though the supplier is government, including Indian railways, RCM is not applicable. Irrespective of who is the recipient, we will not worry about it. RCM is not applicable. Clear? That means, where is it? Where do we check it, sir? Under forward charge. Clear, guys? So, please be careful. The B item is not covered under RCM. Whereas, A item, they have excluded from entry 5, but they have added in entry 5A. Separate item. Is that clear? Yes, sir. And please be careful. Here, the central government, state government, union territory, local authority, including court and tribunal as a supplier. Okay. Next, renting of residential dwelling to a registered person. That is the residential property has been let out for residential purpose to a registered person. Means the tenant is who? A person who is registered under GST. 
in that case rcm is applicable guys the tenant is the registered person under gst means even though the property is let out for residential purpose assume i am registered i have taken the property in that case so should i pay gst under rcm yes or else the company has taken for their employees to stay there or the directors to stay there should come but we pay tax under gst under reverse charge mechanism yes provided they are registered under gst next services supplied by a director of a company or a body corporate to a said company or a body corporate guys see if a director is an employee of a company if he is getting salary it is a part of negative list so salary is not at all covered under gst sir what is covered here then the director fee or sitting fee so even in income tax we have seen director fee or sitting fee which is earned by the director for attending the board meeting is taxable under other sources same way yo if company is paying the director fee or sitting fee to the director which is not taxable under salary head in the hands of director on this who is liable to pay gst who is the provider director who is the recipient the company or the body corporate they are the one who is liable to pay tax who the company or body corporate they are liable to pay tax under reverse charge mechanism guys in the statutory update they have also given <clears throat> hope you guys have already watched the video on statutory update which i have already discussed and updated guys in the statutory update they have given the clarity on this telling if director what if he is renting any mobile property or he is giving any other services to the company is rcm applicable no if director is giving services in the capacity of director only this rcm is applicable sir now assume director is renting the immobile property to a company or body corporate will rcm be applicable no but assume director is renting residential dwelling to a company and company is registered under gst in that case will rcm be applicable yes next assuming sir director is letting commercial building to a company or a body corporate will rcm be applicable no guys rcm will not be applicable fcm hope it is clear for you clear huh? so only director what services is giving in the capacity of director to a company or body corporate is covered here clear if is renting residential dwelling to a company which is registered under gst then that may come here if he is renting any other property or if he is giving any other services then rcm is not applicable guys fcm clear up yes so then insurance agent services an agent whatever services is giving to the insurance company is catching the customers or the people who will buy the policy and giving it to the insurance company so insurance company will pay commission to the insurance agent so who is the supplier here agent who is the recipient insurance company but who should pay gst a recipient that is insurance company under reverse charge mechanism guys same way services supplied by recovery agent recovery agent will help the banking company or financial institution to recover their loan or like they are like body builders they will go and make sure that they will scare the person telling hey repay the loan if not it is there for you anta clear nene gide magane anta so in that case whatever recovery agent they are giving the services to the bank or financial institution or nbfc with respect to recovering of their loan the bank or nbfc or financial institution will be paying some amount to them okay and recovery agent is not an employee if they are employee again employer employee relationship covered in negative list clear so this recovery agent is someone outsider assume they are appointed for on contract basis or for a temporary period <coughs> in that case who is the supplier here recovery agent who is the recipient banking company or the nbfc or financial institution but who is liable to pay tax recipient guys located in taxable territory located in taxable territory means india guys where gst is applicable next supply of services by and music composer photographer that is taman or ari krishna from kannada industry we have different people you guys would be knowing well <clears throat> so music composer or or anirudh anirudh from tamil industry famous person engu guy so music composer or photographer or artist or the like by way of transfer of permitting the use or enjoyment of a copyright so who is the supplier here guys music composer photographer or artist who is the recipient music company or the producer or production company or the artist in that case who is the person who is liable to pay tax the recipient guys is that clear yeah. yes 9a supply of services by an author by way of transfer or permitting the use or enjoyment of a copyright in this case guys the author has an option to pay tax under forward charge in that case he will issue invoice to the recipient and disclose that he is opted to pay tax under forward charge in that case rcm will not be applicable 
if author is not opting to pay tax under forward charge, then the publisher has to pay tax under reverse charge mechanism. Clear? Similar to GTA. Okay, 9A and GTA, they have the option to pay tax under forward charge. If they are not opting it, then recipient has to pay tax under reverse charge. Guys. It is like that. So you remember that also. In which cases, both the options are open. Forward charge as well as reverse charge. Whereas in other cases and all guys, straight away reverse charge. Straight away means if you are, if I am talking about other services and all, they are like straight away for a reverse charge. Clear? There, there is no option and all. <clears throat> okay. Supply of services by the members of overseeing committee to RBI. So this overseeing committee will help the RBI to take various decisions or management decision. In that case, RBI is the recipient. They are the one who is liable to pay GST. Then supply of services by an individual direct selling agent. To whom to bank or nbfc they will help the bank to sell their product to the people guys if that agent is an individual then who is the recipient bank or nbfc they are liable to pay tax under reverse charge mechanism sir what if the direct selling agent is like a company firm and all rcm is not applicable please be careful guys everywhere they have clearly given what is the service to be supplied who is the supplier who is the recipient even if one condition is not met then rcm is not applicable clear yes then <clears throat> services provided by business facilitator to a banking company business facilitator is the one who help the banks to take various decisions guys or uh, they will guide them okay business facilitator is the supplier banking company is the recipient so rcm is applicable banking company is the one who is liable to pay gst then services provided by an agent of business correspondent to a business correspondent again business correspondent will be hired by the bank to sell their products or services to the people, especially in rural area. If this business correspondent has appointed the agent, so it is like this. <clears throat> Banking company has hired business correspondent and business correspondent has hired an agent. So agent is giving services to business correspondent and business correspondent is giving to banking company. In that case, they are not talking about this side. They are talking about this. Who is the supplier agent? Who is the recipient or business correspondent? They are telling business correspondent, please pay tax under RC. Yeah, even this, there is a connection for exemptions, guys. I would be doing it. And when I go to exemption, I will try to give connection even for RCM. Okay. Yes, good. <coughs> Next, security services. Any person other than the body corporate. Means who is the supplier? Any person other than the body corporate. Sir, what if the supplier is a body corporate? RCM is not applicable. Okay. But recipient is whom? Any registered person located in taxable territory. So recipient is registered under GST. So in that case, if the supplier is any person other than body corporate, RCM is applicable. Then renting of motor vehicle. Who is the supplier, sir? Any person other than body corporate. Sir, what if it is a body corporate? Same story. RCM is not applicable. Okay. Who has not paid CGST at 6% or total GST at 12%, including both. On renting of motor vehicle. Means supplier has not paid tax at 12%. Who is the recipient? Any body corporate. Look at this. Supplier is any person other than body corporate. Whereas the recipient is a body corporate. Only then RCM is applicable. For this also, I have given a chart. I have mentioned refer chart. Okay. Person liable to pay GST for renting of motor vehicle services. If GST is payable at 12%, guys, then forward charge. Always forward charge. Sir, if GST is payable at 5%, then check who is the supplier. If supplier is other than body corporate, check who is the recipient. If recipient is other than body corporate, then again forward charge, guys. Ad again forward charge. Okay. Sir, what if recipient is body corporate, then reverse charge is applicable. Like our case, whatever we saw. Then, sir, what if the supplier is a body corporate, then always forward charge, guys. Always forward charge. Let me repeat. Let me repeat. Sir, bit confusing, sir. Okay. GST payable under at 12%, always forward charge. Who will pay tax? Supplier. Clear, huh? whoever it is, whether body corporate or uh, other than body corporate, it doesn't matter. If you are paying at 12%, good, pay it under forward charge. Okay. If GST is payable at 5%, then we have to check who is the supplier. Assume supplier is body corporate, straight up a forward charge, guys. Don't even check who is the recipient. Clear, huh? yes. Sir, what if supplier is other than body corporate? Check who is the recipient. If recipient is other than body corporate, then obviously RCM is not applicable. That means what? FCM. Sir, what if the recipient is a body corporate? Supplier is not a body corporate. Whereas the recipient is a body corporate. And GST is payable at 5%. Then RCM is applicable. Then RCM is applicable, guys. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I am only asking. I am only answering. <clears throat> because I cannot hear you guys. Yeah. 
16th one services lending of securities under securities lending scheme 1997 who is the supplier here lender person who deposits the certificate who is the recipient borrower that is the person who borrows the security they are asking recipient you please pay the tax under reverse charge mechanism and whatever services we have seen here guys that is as per section 94 ready with notification same services have been notified even under IGST Act. If it is an interstate supply, assume the following services have been supplied outside the state, still RCM is applicable. As per section 5, subsection 3 of IGST Act, read with notification. But in addition to this, even import of services have been included in IGST Act. That is one addition. But that is not a part of your inter syllabus. Okay. See, wherever it is not a part of your inter syllabus, I am just mentioning it. Good to know that you guys would be learning it at final. Clear, huh? So, all the 16 means 16 in the sense in between A, B and all is there. All the services, whatever we covered here, if they are supplied outside the state, even in that case, RCM is applicable as per section 53, read with notification of IGST Act. In addition to that, they have also added import of services, guys. Clear huh? on which again RCM is applicable, where importer is liable to pay GST. That too, only if it is covered as per section 71B or para 4 of schedule 1 read with section 71c only if it is covered there then we will come here and check who is taxable na? i explained it already here okay always guys think like this <clears throat> first we will check whether the activity or transaction is a supply then we will see whether it is covered in negative list or not taxable supply or exempt supply then we will remove it so for this who is liable to pay tax and all we will never check why because it is not at all liable for gst then from supply, if I remove negative list and exempt supply, we will get taxable supply. Then we will see who is liable to pay tax. RCMR, FCMR. RCM means recipient, FCM means supplier. Ultimately, whether it is RCM or FCM, tax will go from whose pocket? Recipient's pocket only. Only the mechanism is different. That's all. Okay, guys. Then coming to 9.4, as I already told you, it is not a part of your inter syllabus, guys. 9.4. Now going to 9.5. 9.5 give the power to the government to notify certain supply of services through electronic commerce operator on which electronic commerce operator is liable to pay GST. Did government use this power? Yes, they used it and they have notified four services. Which are those? We will see one by one. The government may notify specific categories of services, the tax on intrastate supplies of which shall be paid by whom? Electronic commerce operator. If such services are supplied through it, guys. So, it is not the supplier who is paying it. It is not this recipient who is paying it. Who is paying it? The middleman. That is the electronic commerce operator. Clear? Yeah, important, guys. Again. So, the following categories of services supplied through it, electronic commerce operator are notified for this purpose. I call them in short, RAT. Okay. <coughs> Services notified guys. So totally four are there. Please be careful, especially in the first one. There is some amendment which has happened. Services by way of transportation of passenger by a radio taxi, motor cab, maxi cab, motorcycle or any other motor vehicle except omnibus. This is a change. Pre previously even omnibus was there. Except omnibus if it is provided by company. Sir, if omnibus service is provided by the company, the supplier is a company, then they will pay tax under forward charge only. Sir, if what omnibus service is provided by, that is transportation of sir, passenger service provided by omnibus, who is not a company, then RCM would be applicable. Then RCM is applicable. Guys. So simple, if omnibus is providing transportation of passenger, check who is that omnibus service provider. Is it company? Yes, forward charge. If it is not a company, then RCM. Clear? Yes. The tax on omnibus service provided by a company, means supplier is a company. Through e-commerce operator is payable by the home company itself, who is a supplier. Clear? Yes, guys. So if the supplier is other than company, then it would be uh, electronic commerce operator who will pay tax, not RCM, electronic commerce operator. Please be careful. So guys, it is like this. If supplier is providing through electronic commerce operator to the recipient, what service? Transportation of passenger. Transportation of passenger. They are telling electronic commerce operator, you have to pay tax. But if transportation of passengers, not transportation of passenger service is provided by the omnibus, who is a company, then they will pay tax under forward charge mechanism. Sir, what if the supplier is not a company? They are any other category of person like sole proprietor, partnership firm, LLP, OAOP, BOI, anyone like that. In that case, 
electronic commerce operator will pay tax guys electronic commerce operator will pay tax okay so the example is ola uber that is the electronic commerce operator through whom you will book cab service and all so whatever images i have given here is the example of the category of service guys next transfer services by way of providing accommodation in hotel in guest house clubs campsites or other commercial places meant for residential or lodging purposes except where the person supplying such service is liable for registration under section 22 subsection 1 of the cgst act guys <clears throat> assume supplier is providing accommodation services and recipient is booking it through electronic commerce operator not directly through hotel through electronic commerce operator in that case assume oyo or make my travel <clears throat> so any platform okay so through any of this platform you are booking the hotels what they are telling is check whether supplier is covered in section 22 subsection 1 where the registration is based on turnover so if the supplier for supplier of service what is the turnover applicable guys 10 or 20 lakh yes sir if he has if his aggregate turnover has already crossed that limit then he has to get registered yes sir so if a person is registered under gst because his turnover is more than the threshold limit then supplier will pay tax under forward charge mechanism supplier will pay tax under forward charge mechanism no sir supplier is a small person he is not registered under gst in that case who will pay tax electronic commerce operator here conditional guys please be careful oh okay. next services by way of housekeeping such as plumbing carpentering etc only housekeeping except where the person supplying such service is liable for registration under section 22 subsection 1 so whoever is providing housekeeping services guys through the e-commerce operator like urban company and all hope you guys are aware of see through urban company you can book many services including beauty painting and all clear but those things are not covered here only the housekeeping services clear domestic help in that case if the supplier is actually registered under gst because his aggregate turnover is more than 10 lakh or 20 lakh then they will pay tax under forward charge if they are not registered, they are small suppliers, sir. Their turnover is less than 10 or 20 lakhs, sir. In that case, they are catching hold of whom? Electronic commerce operator. Okay. Next, supply of restaurant service other than the services supplied by restaurant, entering, sorry, eating joints, etc. located at specified premises. So, other than means in that case, e-commerce operator will not pay tax. Okay. Sir, if specified premises, if the restaurant services is provided in specified services, e-commerce operator will not pay tax. Who will pay tax? The restaurant or the person who is running the specified premises. Sir, what is specified premises? Specified premises would mean premises providing hotel accommodation service having declared a tariff of any unit of accommodation above 7500 per unit per day or equivalent. Guys, this doesn't have any connection with accommodation, but what they are telling is, See, in some hotels, normally they will have the accommodation <clears throat> in the different floors, whereas in the basement or in the ground floor, they will have the restaurant. For any of the room, any of the room, if they are charging more than 7,500 per day per room, in that case, they are telling this is treated as specified premises. In that case, even if you are booking any food from this restaurant, which is there in the ground floor or in the basement, or assume rooftop also, because sometimes it will be in rooftop also. In that case, they are telling, no, electronic commerce operator will not pay tax. The actual supplier will pay. The actual supplier will pay, guys. Is that clear? Yes. So, these are the services which are notified under reverse charge mechanism. On which, sorry, not reverse charge, sorry. These are the services which are notified on which the tax has to be paid by electronic commerce operator guys clear huh? so in short i call them as a rat guys see that there is something called as rat atra which will happen in odisha that is with respect to puri jagannath so let him bless you guys with respect to your preparations and exam now so when i assume you guys are going there it happens around nine days you guys are planning to go there for the first time odisha so in that case you have to book the transportation of passenger service you have to travel from your place to there yes sir so for that you are using electronic commerce operator also there you have to stay for around 9 days or 10 days if you are extending and also in that case more than 10 days assuming 9 days 
okay so you have to book an accommodation yes sir then there you have to have kind of <clears throat> food for around nine to ten days so you are booking through uh, swiggy or zomato okay sir and also assume guys when you go to an accommodation normally they will take care of all the housekeeping but in the room they are telling or in the accommodation or hotel they are telling sir you have to take care of everything okay you have to clean the room because you are staying for nine ten days and we have a your shortage of your labor source here labor force please do it yourself in that case you are a lazy person so what you did you booked a housekeeping services through urban company to clean your room clear so this is just an example where you guys can connect to this services which are notified on which the tax has to be paid by electronic commerce operator guys. this is just a story built by me so that you guys can connect clear yes so rat rat stands for what r for restaurant service a for accommodation service t for transportation of passenger whereas transportation of goods is not covered please be careful then housekeeping housekeeping guys okay then all the provisions of cgst actually apply to such e-commerce operator as it is the supplier actually supplier is the one who is liable to pay tax in maximum cases but here they have told in this four cases electronic commerce operator has to pay so it is as if electronic commerce operator is liable to pay tax he has to follow all the provisions then sir who is electronic commerce operator <clears throat> i have already given the example here and most of you would be using all this you will already be connected to but still just a simple line electronic commerce operator is any person who owns or operates manages an electronic platform for supply of goods or services or both through him guys but if they sir i am purchasing goods or clothes through Amazon, Flipkart and all and on that also electronic commerce operator has to pay tax. No, no, only services are notified. Please be careful. And it would be good if you guys remember the examples what I have given here so that it will be easy for you to connect and remember guys. And sir, when an electronic commerce operator is liable to pay tax, how will he pay it? If he is having any physical presence in the taxable territory, that means he has any office or branches in India, then obviously such e-commerce e -commerce operator is liable to pay tax sir what if he doesn't have any physical presence in india he doesn't have any office or branch in india is run uh, is running the platform in india but by sitting in somewhere in usa or uk in that case you have to appoint a person who is representing you here okay means e-commerce operator has to appoint a representative in india who will represent him in india okay so in that case that representative will be liable to pay gst as per the above in case of the following four services sir what if representative is also not appointed in the india or in taxable territory then you have to appoint the representative and he is the one who will be taking care of the gst provisions or compliance in india guys is that clear this is not so important for you from exam point of view but this four is important guys especially with respect to this omnibus there is a change please be careful i will repeat that if the transportation of passenger service is provided by a supplier who is a company forward charge is applicable whereas if it is provided by any other person means supplier is any person other than company yes e-commerce operator is liable to pay tax guys only for omnibus whereas for others irrespective of who is the supplier if transportation of passenger service is booked through e-commerce operator e-commerce operator will pay tax and please be careful guys with respect to this too okay they have told if supplier is resisted under gst because his turnover is more than the threshold limit then he will pay tax if not only e-commerce operator has to pay tax so here it is conditional please be careful yeah yes sir so we are done with section 9 guys we are done with section in detail section 9 so please be careful under section 9 1 and 2 is liable to pay tax the supplier under forward charge 3 and 4 recipient under reverse charge whereas section subsection 5 e-commerce operator that is with respect to four services that is wrath okay now let us move towards section 10 guys <clears throat> one more important section guys in income tax we have something called as presumptive schemes now that is under section 44 ad ada or ae why is it brought into act that is sir to reduce the compliance burden for the small business persons or small professionals okay, it is difficult for them to maintain books of accounts get them audited worry about what is allowed what is disallowed 
they cannot take care of all that sir they are just doing some small business or professions so in order to reduce their compliance burden and tax liability they introduce something called as presumptive schemes or presumptive taxation under income tax law which we would have learned in pgbp chapter same way under gst guys so the rate of gst might be applicable 12 percent 18 percent 28 percent sir i am a small business budding now it is difficult for me to acquire the customers because my competitor is able to sell at a lower price now i want to acquire some market share so obviously i have to keep some competitive price so assume the gst applicable is 18 percent or 28 percent and all so obviously supplier what he will do he will collect it from the recipient and obviously the recipient will see it as a cost only whenever assume recipient is paying 118 rupees including 18 rupees gst for a recipient 18 rupees he will see it as a cost only you guys also would have paid 18 percent gst on the coaching services what you have taken Agarina, so you will see it as a cost only so actually for the academy that 18 percent is not their revenue they have to deposit with the government but still for the recipient they will see it as a cost oh i have to buy the product at 118 so now assume <clears throat> if this amount is lower then obviously i can compete with the my competitors and i can try to acquire some market share agree means the rates under composition schemes are kept lower guys irrespective of what goods or service you are supplying they are telling this is what the rate is but one thing is you have to pay the tax out of your pocket clear huh? yes and here <clears throat> irrespective of the category of goods or services you are supplying they have given the rate you have to pay tax at, as per the respective rate clear but there are some conditions restrictions and all clear guys yes and also in this scenario see normally under gst a tax has to be paid every month and return has to be filed every month that is gstr1 along with gstr 3b and plus annual return so there are gstr1 12 returns monthly returns gstr 3B monthly returns, 12 returns plus annual return. Clear? And if you are opting for QRMP, then quarterly. But GST payment will always be monthly. Whereas under composition scheme, it is not like that. They are telling pay GST quarterly, file return annually. That means they are trying to reduce your compliance burden. They are trying to reduce your compliance burden. But the restriction here is you have to pay the tax out of your own pocket and you cannot supply the goods or services outside the state. If you are doing so, then you are not eligible for composition scheme. Yes. Is that clear? Yes. So, we will get into section and learn what exactly is given in section. Section 10 of CGST Act 2017 contains the provisions regarding composition levy. Who are the eligible person? There are two categories of composition scheme, guys. One is covered in 10.1 and 10.2. The other one is 10.2a. Okay. 10.1 and 10.2 is available for manufacturer of goods or trader of goods or restaurant services. I call them in reverse, RTM. Not RCM, RTM. R for restaurant, T for trader, M for manufacturer. Clear? Huh? Yes, sir. Now, when they are eligible, is it always? No. If I want to opt for composition scheme in this year, I have to check what was my aggregate turnover in the last year. Clear? Eligibility is always based on the turnover of last year, guys. If my aggregate turnover in the preceding financial year is up to 1.5 crore or 75 lakh in case of 8 special category states, which are those 8 special, special category states? Guys, as per Article 279A, there are 11 special category states. That is 3 topmost states plus 8 northeastern states. But for composition scheme, that is for Section 10, one purpose, only 8. Only 8 special category states are taken. What are those, sir? Arunachal Pradesh, Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, Sikkim, Tripura, Uttarakhand. For this states, if you are operating in any of this state, then the threshold limit applicable for you is 75 lakh to check eligibility. If you are operating in any other states or union territory, then the threshold limit applicable is 1.5 crore. Sir, what if I am operating, means assume I have my business in Manipur and Karnataka. What is the threshold limit applicable for me? 75 lakh. Seven. You can operate in more than one state, but you cannot sell outside the state. Clear? So, if you are having operation in any of this special state also, then in that case, guys, <coughs> the threshold limit applicable is 75 lakh. And when we are checking eligibility turnover, we have to check it pan India based, not for the respective branches. Clear? Yes. So, in the past year, that is the previous financial year, if the turnover is up to 1.5 crore, or 75 lakh for 8 special category states. In the current year, the supplier will be eligible for 
composition scheme. <clears throat> Sir, what are the rates under composition scheme? Guys, this rates you have to remember, which is important. For a manufacturer, 1% of the turnover, that is total turnover, which includes exempt supply also. Okay. Whereas for a trader, only 1% of taxable turnover. Whereas for restaurant services, 5% of the turnover, that is total turnover. Please be careful, for manufacturer and restaurant, it is 1% or 5% of total turnover. Whereas for trader, 1% of taxable turnover. And this is a total rate. If they ask only CGST, then 0.5 is for manufacturer. For trader, 0.5. Whereas for restaurant, 2.5. Whatever rates I have given here is the aggregate rate. That is total GST rate. If they ask only CGST, then it is 0.5 and for trader also 0.5 of taxable turnover and for restaurants 2.5 of total turnover. Fine, sir. Sir, what if I am a survey? Oh, the, the, I will just cover it. So, <clears throat> first let me finish this. 10.1 and 10.2. Now, sir, I am either of this three. That is RTM. Along with this, I want to provide on small service, sir professional service or legal service which is not covered here because only one service is covered here which is the restaurant service so they are telling along with rtm along with rtm means either of these three restaurant trading or manufacturing along with this three any of these three if you want to provide any other service yes you can provide but that should be a marginal service they are talking about that in this <clears throat> in order to enable the small service provider avail the benefit of composition scheme under section 1001 the following proviso has been inserted that is only for these three people guys okay what is it the proviso permits a registered person opting for composition scheme under section 1001 to supply services of a specified value not exceeding 10 percent of the turnover in the state or union territory in the preceding financial year okay last year whatever was the turnover 10 percent of that or 5 lakh whichever is I year guys. So simple guys. Assume last year. So assume I am in currently in 23-24. So last year 22-23 Pan India based aggregate turnover was assume 50. Oh, 50 dollars exactly. Let me make it as 70 lakh. Okay na. So this year along with our team either of these three not if not, need not be all three either of these three along with RTM, can I provide any other service? Yes. But that service turnover should be within 5 lakh or 10% of last year turnover. What is the turnover of last year? 70 lakh. So 70 lakh into 10%, which comes to 7 lakh. Whichever is higher, 7 lakh. So whatever turnover I am getting from that marginal service should be within 7 lakh. That is 7 lakh or less than that. If it is more than 7 lakh, assume from this professional service or legal service, the turnover is 8 lakh or 9 lakh or 10 lakh. Even though my aggregate turnover all put together might be within the limit, still I will become ineligible for 10-1. I will become ineligible for 10-1 because that is not called marginal. The service is big enough. Clear? So I will become ineligible for section 10-1 composition scheme. Hope you guys understood. Then aggregate turnover. Sir, what is aggregate turnover? See, there are two turnover which we have to calculate. One is, assume this year 23-24, to check whether I am eligible for composition scheme, I have to go and check last year turnover. Agree na? Yes, sir. Then in the current year also, I have to give calculate turnover. This is to calculate what? Tax liability. This is to check eligibility. This is to calculate tax liability. Agree na? Yes, sir. What is aggregate turnover? It is given in section 2.6. Aggregate turnover is equal to taxable outward supply, exempt supply. Even exempt supply is covered under aggregate turnover. Please be careful. Plus exports plus interstate supply of a person having same PAN to be computed on all India basis. That is on PAN based. Excluding GST and CIS. Means aggregate turnover will not include anything charged under GST. Whether it is CGST, SGST, IGST or CIS, whatever. UDGST, anything. It will not be included. Guys. And this is the definition given under section 26, which is important for the entire act. But for composition person, the export and interstate supply will not make sense. Why, sir? Because they are barred from carrying out the supply outside the state. So obviously, they cannot engage in export or interstate supplies, guys. If at all, if they do, they become ineligible for the composition scheme. Immediately, they have to go to normal scheme. Clear up? Yes, sir. Now, connecting to this aggregate turnover, guys, <coughs> Okay, before I go through it, let me discuss 10 to A also. 10 to A. 
सर टेन टू ए इज अवेलेबल फॉर होम टेन टू ए इज अवेलेबल अगेन इन डिफरेंट कॉम्पोजिशन स्कीम इट इज अवेलेबल फॉर दो आर नॉट एलिजिबल फॉर टेन वन सो टेन वन इज अवेलेबल ओनली फॉर होम आर टी एम रेस्टोरेंट ट्रेडर मैन्युफैक्चर अग्री ना एनी पर्सन अदर देन दिस आई एम प्रोवाइडिंग ओनली सर्विस प्रोफेशन सर्विस और लीगल सर्विस और अलॉन्ग अलॉन्ग विथ आर टी एम आई एम प्रोवाइडिंग वन सर्विस विच इज नॉट मार्जिन इन दट केस टेक एंटायर बिजनेस अंडर टेन टू ए क्लियर सो टेन टू ए इज अवेलेबल ओनली फॉर दो आर नॉट एलिजिबल अंडर टेन वन गैस क्लियर दट इज प्योर सर्विस सप्लायर और you are supplying rtm along with service and that service is not marginal service clear yes so for eligibility what we have to check preceding financial year turnover which should be up to 50 lakh all states put together and what is the rate of gst guys 6% that is 3% cgst 3% sgst is that clear yes this is the second category of composition scheme available for service suppliers or for the suppliers for whom 101 is not available Okay, so now we saw how to calculate aggregate turnover, guys, under section two six. So we have learned aggregate turnover. We have to calculate for both the years. For last year, to check the eligibility, to check the eligibility that whether I am eligible for section ten in current year. Plus for the current year, I have to calculate the turnover to see what is my tax liability. Clear? And please be careful only for trader. It is one percent of taxable turnover for him. We have to exclude exempt supply only while calculating tax, sir. What what about while calculating the eligibility? Should we consider exempt supply also? Yes, for the trader. So to check eligibility, we have to include exempt supply. Whereas to calculate tax for a trader, we should take only one percent of taxable turnover, where we have to exclude exempt supply only for a trader. Please be careful, guys. With respect to this eligibility and tax payable, they have given explanation. We'll just go through it, which is important. Again, <clears throat> you can expect a question on this. Listen, listen. As per explanation one, what we are talking now is first twenty three twenty four is the current financial year, guys. Current financial year. Then twenty two twenty three is the preceding financial year. So we are not now checking the aggregate turnover of twenty two twenty three. Why, sir? To check whether I am eligible for composition scheme or not. So this is eligibility turnover. Eligibility turnover, guys. Okay, sir. As per section one to section ten, while computing aggregate turnover in order to determine eligibility of a registered person to pay tax under any of the composition scheme, any of the composition scheme, the value of supply of exempt services by way of extending deposit loans or advances in so far as the consideration is represented by way of interest or discount. Shall not be taken into account, guys. Means simple. Whatever definition they have given in section two six remains same, except one change. In two six, they have told include all the exempt supply, na? Yes. But in the explanation one to section ten, they are telling when you are calculating the eligibility turnover for the last year, eligibility turnover for preceding financial year, they are they are telling okay, keep as it is two six whatever is there. What all you have to include? Value of all outward supply. Taxable supply, exempt supply, exports, interstate supplies of a person having the same pan. Okay, computed on all India basis for all the branches put together. Then you have to exclude CGST, SGST, UDGST, IGST says value of inward supplies on which tax is payable under reverse charge. Obviously, it is a aggregate turnover means only your outward supply. Sir, on my inward supply, I am paying tax under reverse charge. Will it be considered as my aggregate turnover? No, guys. All these are as per section two six guys. Whatever is there here. This is as per what section two six. Okay, now they are telling exempt supplies. They asked you to include it, na? But as per explanation one, they are telling only for explanation sake. Value of exempt supplies of services provided by way of extending deposit loans or advances in so far as the consideration is represented by way of interest or discount, you have to exclude it. Very simple. Assume last year turnover assume is eighty lakh. In that taxable turnover. Exempt turnover, taxable turnover is sixty lakh. Exempt turnover is twenty lakh. In that financial service, that is the extending loans advances in which for which return in return interest or discount is charged. Discount when it will be charged, guys? You know this discounting of bills and all. You went to a bank with the bill face value of ten thousand. The maturity period is three months away. So you discounted the bill with the bank. Assume they are paying you nine thousand. What is the amount they got? Thousand rupees. Which is nothing like discount. 
clear huh? yes assume financial services 5 lakh and other services is 15 lakh <coughs> so for eligibility purpose guys for eligibility purpose what is the turnover is it 80 lakh no sir 80 minus 5 lakh how much 75 lakh. 75 lakh for checking eligibility what is the turnover 75 lakh means all exempt supplies will be included except financial service except financial service guys assume in 23 24 i am providing rtm along with that one marginal service so marginal service can be like up to 5 lakh or 10 percent nah? so 10 percent should be applied on what sir is it on 80 lakh or 75 lakh 75 lakh. please be careful there also we have to exclude the financial service that means sir marginal service up to what i can provide 5 lakh or 10 percent of 75 lakh which comes to 7.5 lakh whichever is higher how much 7.5 lakh so even for checking this marginal service we will take the 10 percent of last year turnover now there also we have to exclude financial service guys is that clear yes please be careful and this is common even for the 10 to a 10 to a also that is while checking the eligibility turnover of last year whether it is within 50 lakh we have to apply the same provision clear huh? yes only then we will be eligible for composition scheme in the current year and as per explanation 2 this is applicable for calculating the <clears throat> 20 to 23 we are done with eligibility turnover sir we are eligible so in 23 24 we have to pay tax huh? for a trader it is taxable turnover whereas for others it is always total turnover so while calculating that what should be include or what should be exclude take as per section 26 whatever is the aggregate turnover but exclude two things exclude two things what is it whatever the financial service we discussed same thing plus one additional thing one additional things supply from the first day of april of a financial year up to the date when such person becomes liable for registration under the gst guys this is the threshold limit applicable for registration normally applicable in the first year of your operations guys assume sir i have started my business in 23 24 so in that case this is the first year i don't have any history in the current year can i straight away go to composition scheme yes obviously when you don't have any business in the past it is considered that your turnover was less than threshold limit because it is like nil agree na? so less than threshold limit yes sir so in the current year am i eligible yes as you i am a service provider for whom threshold limit applicable as per registration is 20 lakhs okay now so what they are telling is in 23 24 first calculate your total turnover okay total turnover okay okay assume i am a sir, restaurant service supplier threshold limit applicable for me is 20 lakhs okay <coughs> so up, assume my total turnover is 50 lakh okay sir 50 lakh in that taxable supply is 40 lakh exam supply is 10 lakh in that exam supply financial services 6 lakh and other services is okay means along with restaurant i am also providing financial that is what i am taking okay along with restaurant okay other services around 4 lakh i am just trying to explain numerically guys because restaurant how come they will go and provide financial services around all not possible but still we cannot rule it off what if they are doing it okay chalo in the worst case i am just explaining the turnover calculation okay sir. oh now what they are telling how much turnover should i take it is 50 minus financial service i have to exclude 6 lakh okay now 44 lakh so should i now pay tax on 44 lakh they are telling no as it is your first year of business whatever is the threshold limit applicable for you for registration purpose reduce that also how much is that 20 lakh i told you i am a restaurant supplier so res registration limit applicable for me is 20 lakh clear it might be 10 lakh also in case of special states but i am considering it as 20 lakh so reduce that also pay tax only on remaining 44 lakh oh, sorry 24 lakh at what rate sir whatever is the rate applicable for restaurant what is the rate five percent is that clear hope you guys understood guys so while calculating the taxable turnover or the turnover on which tax has to be paid in the current financial year you have to exclude two things as per explanation two explanation two is telling exclude two things what are those it's financial service and the threshold limit applicable for you for registration purpose up to that you reduce it 
See, threshold limit can be 10 lakh, 20 lakh, or if you are a supplier of goods, it can be 40 lakh also. Okay, as per the notification. So, whatever is the threshold limit applicable for you, after studying registration chapter, you will clearly understand when 10, when 20, when 40. So, whatever is the threshold limit applicable, we will reduce it. But normally only in the first year, because obviously we cannot give this benefit every year. Only in the first year, up to the threshold limit applicable for registration, we will reduce it. Over and above that, whatever is there, on that you have to pay tax at composition rates. Is that clear guys? Yes. So please be careful. This is only for the purpose of what? In the tax payable in the current financial year. And the person who is opting for composition scheme will pay tax quarterly. Clear? So for each quarter he has to do this calculation and pay the tax on the respective amount. Whereas this explanation once was with respect to threshold limit to check what? Eligibility guys. Please be careful. And that is what? In the last financial year. Clear? Huh? Yes. Next, there are few people for whom the composition schemes are not available. That is both the composition scheme, whether 10-1 or 10-2A. For whom 10-1 is not available, it's given in section 10-2. For whom 10-1 composition scheme is not available, that is RTM is not available for whom is given in 10-2. Same way, for whom this composition scheme is not available, is given in section 10-2A only. Clear? Huh? But the criteria is same. <clears throat> What are those? We will see. The following persons cannot opt for composition scheme. Section 10.2 and 10.2a. Okay. Means both the schemes are not available for the following people. Who are those? A person engaged in the supply of goods or services which are not liable to tax under GST. Means you are supplying only something which is not liable under GST. Clear? Means if you are doing taxable plus exempt, then obviously you might be covered. But they are telling you are supplying only exclusively something which is not covered under GST. You are not eligible. Okay. A person engaged in the making of interstate outward supply of goods or services. Guys, if you are supplying the goods outside the state or services outside the state, you are not eligible for composition. But can I purchase, sir? Yes. Inward supply, you can do it. But outward supply, you cannot do. See, you can have operation in more than one state. Assume I am having operations in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Kerala. Can I do it, sir? Yes. But everywhere, you should make sure that you are supplying within the state. And all the states put together, your aggregate turnover is within the threshold limit. Okay. Next, a person supply. Okay, one more thing, guys. Sir, assume I am a composition supplier. I have taken an inward supply. Inward supply on which RCM is applicable. So, should I pay tax at composition rate or normal rate? Normal rate, guys. You should always pay tax at normal rate. If on your inward supply, if RCM is applicable, always pay tax at normal rates. Yes, on your outward supply, you will pay tax on uh, composition rates. Clear? So, nor RCM is always taxable at normal rate, whereas outward supply at composition rate. Clear? Yes. Next, a person, that is the supplier who is engaged in the making, supply of goods or services was there, but now goods has been removed. So, please be careful, only services. So, a person who is supplying the services now, goods is not there. Please be careful with it. Through electronic commerce operator who is required to collect tax under section 52, that is TCS. Clear? So, if you are supplying the services through e-commerce operator on which e-commerce operator has to collect TCS, not the one which we discussed in 9.5 because on that e-commerce operator has to pay tax directly. Whereas, section 52 is talking about TCS. TCS is not applicable when section 95 is applicable. Please be careful, guys. So, you are the supplier of services through e commerce operator on which e commerce operator is supposed to collect TCS as per section 52. In that case, they are telling supplier of services, you are not eligible for composition scheme. Next, a person who is engaged in a manufacture, manufacture, manufacture of aerated water, fly ash bricks or fly ash aggregate or fly ash blocks or bricks of fossil mills or similar siliceous earths, building bricks and earthen or roofing tiles or tobacco products or ice cream pan masala. If you are a manufacturer of the following items, even though your threshold th uh, turnover is less than threshold limit, still for you composition schemes are not available. Clear? Sir, what if I am a trader of the following goods? You are eligible. Subject to other condition, you are eligible guys. Trader is allowed, manufacturer is not allowed. Please be careful. And I have kept a short form here as about tip, ABT tip. Clear? About short form of about like ABT tip. A for what? Aerated water. B for bricks. T 
T for tiles, then T for tobacco, then I for ice cream, P for pan masala. Short cut. Okay. If you are a manufacturer of all these items, then no composition scheme. If you are a trader, yes, you can do it. Then casual taxable person and non-resident taxable person, irrespective of what you are supplying, where you are supplying, for you, composition scheme is not available. Clear? Yes, guys. Hope you understood. And for these people, both the schemes are not available. Please be very careful. Clear? And 10-1 for whom it is not available also, we saw. It is available only for RTM. If you are providing any other service, obviously for you, 10-1 is not available. You have to go for 10-2. Sir, along with RTM, I am providing marginal service. If the marginal service turnover is within the threshold limit, like 10% of the last year turnover or 5 lakh, whichever is higher, you can get even that marginal service also year only. Clear? Huh? Means, assume. Okay, let me tell that also. <coughs> the important. Sir, I am a manufacturer. Plus, I am also providing marginal service. From manufacturing, I am getting 90 lakh. Whereas from marginal service, I am getting only 5 lakh, which is within the limit, sir. Which is within the limit. Now, what is the rate applicable, sir? So, 90 lakh watt rate, 5 lakh watt rate. They are telling, means they are not exclusively mentioned anywhere in the law, guys. But it is understood that, what is your total turnover? 90 pi lakh. On this 1%. On this 1%. So, whatever item you already covered under RTM, na, on that goods or service, whatever is the rate, either 1% or 5%. Same rate will be applicable even for marginal service. Clear? Huh? Yes. Then conditions and restrictions for composition supplier. Person opting for composition levy has to comply with the following conditions. What are those one by one? The option to pay tax under composition scheme lapses from the day on which is aggregate turnover during the current financial year exceeds the specified limit. That is either the 75 lakh or 1.5 crore or 50 lakh, whichever is applicable guys as per section 10 subsection 3. Means under both the composition scheme, this whatever conditions and restrictions we are telling, that is for both the schemes guys. Clear? Huh? Yes. Now, assume sir in the last year, my turnover was less than the limit sir, threshold limit. That is either 75 lakh or 1.5 crore or 50 lakh. So in the current year, I opted for composition scheme. I was eligible, so I opted. But sir, on 1st February 24, my turnover crossed the limit. My turnover crossed the limit. In that case, what they are telling? You cannot continue under composition scheme. Immediately move from section 10 to 9. 9 is normal limit. Clear? Huh? So, whatever turnover you have from 1st April to 1st February or till 31st January, you can pay tax at composition rates as per section 10. Whereas from 1st February, the day your threshold limit crossed, you have to move to section 9 and pay tax on at normal rate. At normal rate. Means the day you are moving out of section 10 to 9, from this day you can also claim ITC. You can also claim ITC. Guys, one more restriction when you are under a composition scheme is you cannot claim ITC. Means input tax credit or whatever tax you have paid on your inward supply, you cannot claim credit. The day you move from 10 to 9, can I claim the credit, sir? Yes. So for any inward supply which you take on or after 1st February, you can claim input tax credit subject to conditions in ITC chapter. Clear? Sir, what about the stock I have on this date? You have the you have to give the details of the stock what you are having on on 1st February. This stock obviously would have purchased it before 1st February. That is stock of inputs or capital goods. Stock of what? Input or capital goods. This obviously would have purchased it before 1st February. They are telling we will give credit for the both. We will give credit for this also, but you have to give the details of this in GST ITC 01. Yeah, yes. So in simple guys, once your threshold limit crosses in the current year on any day, of whatever threshold limit applicable for you, either 1.5 crore or 75 lakh or 50 lakh, whatever threshold limit if you cross, immediately you have to move to section 9 on the same day. From that day, you are liable to pay tax under section 9 as per normal rates on your outward supply. And you are eligible to claim input tax credit on your inward supply. And whatever stock you have on that day, which you would have purchased before that, that is the stock of input or capital goods, obviously you will be using it after 1st February. They are telling you can claim the credit. You can claim the credit and actually this is given in section 18 which I will explain when I go to input tax credit chapter guys with respect to this credit part and how to calculate that.
Next, the composition supplier shall not collect any tax from the recipient on the supplies made by him and he shall not be entitled to any credit of input tax paid on inward supply. So, section 10, subsection 4. So, composition supplier, whenever he is paying tax under section 10 at composition rates, he has to pay it out of his pocket. He cannot collect the tax from the recipients. So, he cannot issue tax invoice to the recipient. He can issue only bill of supply. I have given it to you. He cannot issue tax invoice. He can issue only bill of supply to the recipient. Who? Oh, composition supply. Now, composition supplier, when he is under section 10, can he claim credit of inward supply, sir? No. Now, assume you guys have, I am the composition supplier. You have purchased the goods from me. Who should pay tax? Me only, out of my own pocket. Assuming by mistake I have collected from you. I should not do, but I have collected. Now, can you claim the credit? No. If you have purchased the goods or services from a composition supplier, you cannot claim any input tax credit. And moreover, I have to disclose it in my business place that I am a composition taxable person. Guys. I should mention it in my business place or even in my name board. I have to disclose I am a composition taxable person. And when he, even in bill of supply, what I will issue to my customers, I have to mention I am a composition supplier. Clear? It is the duty of the person who is covered under section 10. Notes, the conditions and restrictions are applicable for both the schemes under section 10.1 as well as 10.2a. Whatever we saw is applicable for both. Then, the composition scheme is opted if applicable under one pan. Then, it is applicable for all the businesses under one pan. Now, sir, I am doing three businesses, sir. One of the business is not eligible for composition scheme, sir. For the remaining two business, can I follow composition scheme and for one business, normal scheme? No, no, no. For all the businesses registered under one pan, you can either follow composition scheme or normal scheme. Not like few business under composition, few business under normal. You cannot do it. Same way. Sir, assume I am engaged in, uh, I am doing supply in three states. Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. Sir, in Tamil Nadu, I have supplied outside the state. Sir. Only in Tamil Nadu branch, by mistake, I have sold the goods outside the state. In that case, what they are telling? Even if one branch is not eligible for composition scheme, all your branches should move to normal scheme under section 9, guys. Even if one branch is not eligible for composition scheme or even if one branch has violated the condition given to section 10, then all your branches or all your businesses has to move to section 9. So, simple. In simple, if I have to tell, all your businesses or branches should be either under section 10 or under section 9. It cannot be like few here, few there. Is that clear? And even guys, if you have violated any conditions like, sir, I have supplied outside the state or I started manufacturing this about tip, ABT tip, something in between the year, then obviously you are not eligible for composition scheme. Immediately you have to move to section 9 and start paying tax as per section 9 at normal rates. Sir, what are the advantages and disadvantages of composition scheme? It has both guys, pros and cons. First, we will see advantages. No classification of goods are required. Okay. Single GST rate is applicable on all the supplies made. Okay, sir. No requirement. Okay. So no single GST rate means whatever is the rate, 1%, 5% or 6%, single rate would be applicable on their entire turnover, whether it is taxable turnover or total turnover. And one more thing, guys. See, here for turnover purpose, they have given export, interstate supply and all. But for from composition point of view, that will not be so relevant for you. Because you know, composition supplier cannot supply the goods outside the state obviously you cannot supply outside the country also clear but this is as per the definition given in section 26 clear yes okay i'm just <clears throat> mentioned that point next no classification also is required because irrespective of what is the hsn code doesn't matter because only that is required for section 9 normal classification where you will pay tax at normal rates but under composition scheme no classification is required then no requirement to issue tax invoice, he will issue bill of supply. Then payment of tax is what? Quarterly, whereas for others and all monthly. And return filing is to be done annually. Hence reduced compliance burden. So compliance burden is reduced for the uh, composition supplier. These are the advantages. Sir, what about disadvantages? Composition dealer cannot avail the benefit of ITC paid on inward supply. So on his inward supply, you would have paid tax at normal rates. And he would have satisfied all the conditions given in ITC chapter. Still, he cannot claim any credit. Still, he cannot claim any credit on his inward supply. Next, 
he cannot charge tax on the supplies made by him means he has to pay tax out of his own pocket then even the recipient cannot claim itc if i have supplied goods or services to you i cannot collect tax from you but still if at all if i have collected can you claim credit no you cannot then a limited territory of business a composition dealer is barred from carrying out interstate outward supplies you cannot supply the goods or services outside the state if at all if you do immediately you have to switch from section 10 to 9 clear guys yes so this is all about this chapter guys so in this chapter we have covered two sections which i had already mentioned which are those section 9 along with section 9 of cgst act along with section 5 of igst act and section 10 of cgst act and sir what about composition levy in igst act guys you know already composition supplier cannot supply the goods outside the state or services outside the state so composition scheme is covered only in cgst act and not in igst act clear so as of now we have done till section 10 of cgst act and section 5 of section 5 of what igst act guys clear yes sir yes students now we will revise chapter 4 which talks about exemptions under gst section 11 of cgst act and section 6 of igst act talks about exemption it gives power to the government to notify certain goods or services which are exempt from gst guys using this power the government has notified few goods and services which are exempt from gst but what is covered for you in inter syllabus is only the service part that is the services which are notified by the government that are exempt under gst guys clear yes this is what we will be learning in this chapter guys bit lengthy chapter the list is little big so you guys have to be little patience enough till i complete this chapter guys fine we'll see power to grant exemption from gst has been granted wide section 11 of cgst act and wide section 6 of igst act state gst laws also contain identical provisions granting power to exempt yes gst it is important to note that exemption under gst may be provided in any of the following manner what are those exam means there are different types of exemptions guys which are those we will see first exemption to specified activities or transaction sometimes exemption is provided in respect of specified activities or transaction means anyone performing this activity or transaction will enjoy the exemption will enjoy the exemption normally agricultural activities so whoever is doing agricultural activities even in income tax also it is exempt even in gst they are telling it is exempt Consequently, the status of the supplier or the recipient will become immaterial. Exemption to specified suppliers. At times, exemption is given to specified suppliers only. Here, the status of recipient becomes immaterial. For example, sir, charitable activities performed by charitable institution is exempt. Or educational institution, whatever services they are giving to students, faculty and staff is exempt. So, here, the exemption is what? Based on the supplier. If this supplier is providing so and so service, they are telling it is exempt. Okay. Then exemption to specified recipients. In some cases, exemption is given to specified recipient only. Here the status of supplier becomes immaterial. For example, any supply made to unregistered person, they are telling it is exempt. Or if the supply is made to government or government authority, they are telling it is exempt. In that case, this is a recipient based exemption. Last one exemption to specified suppliers and specified recipients means here they are telling exemption is provided only if supplier is supplying so to so and so person they are told okay only supplier should be so this person and recipient should be this person only then they enjoy the exemption not for all sometimes exemption is given only when activities or transaction are carried out by specified suppliers for specified recipients only Clear? Yes. These are the different types of exemptions, guys. Now, coming to Section 11 of CGST Act. Section 11 has three subsections. What are those? One by one, we will see. Where the government is satisfied that it is necessary in the public interest, it may, on the recommendation of the council, that is GST council, which has been set up as per Article 279A, guys, by notification, exempt generally, either absolutely, the absolutely means without any condition, or subject to such condition, means, if there is any exemption which is conditional, only if you satisfy that condition, you will enjoy exemption. If it is absolute, no condition, nothing. You enjoy the exemption straight away. 
goods or services or both from the whole or any part of the tax. Subsection 2, where the government is satisfied that it is necessary in the public interest, it may on the recommendation of the council by a special order. In each case, under circumstances of an exceptional nature, exempt from the payment of tax, any goods or services or both. Guys, whichever exemption has been given generally by way of notification, we call it as general exemption. As per subsection 1, whichever no exemption is been given by way of special order, by way of special order, we call it a special exemption or specific exemption. Okay, so last one. The government may, if it consider necessary or expedient to so to do for the purpose of clarifying the scope or applicability of any notification or order issued, insert an explanation in such notification or order as the case may be by notification at any time within one year of the issue of a notification or the order. Order here means special order. And every such explanation shall have effect as if it had always been the part of the first such notification or order as the case may be. Guys, what they are telling is, assume there is an exemption given by the government by way of either the notification or special order. From 1st July 23, they are notified certain activity as exempt. Now for this, they can give an explanation telling why we have given this exemption. What is the reason behind it or what is the logic behind it? They can explain it by way of notification. Sir, when they can give this notification is along with this notification or special order or they can give it within one year from year guys. Okay now, means exemption notification or special order is given on what day or notified on what day? 1st July. So for this explanation can be given through notification within one year from the date of original notification or special order. Clear? Huh? Means they will have time till 30th June 24 guys. They will have time till 30th June 24. Is that clear? Yes sir. So within this date, any day they can give the explanation for this notification or special order through what? Again a notification. Clear? But assume guys. So the explanation is given somewhere on 1st January 24. Explanation is given through a notification. So this will have effect from what day? Is it from 1st January or is it from 1st July? It is from 1st July. Because exemption notification or special order is already notified on 1st July. Only explanation is given from 1st January. That doesn't mean that exemption will be effective from 1st January. No, no. Exemption will be effective from 1st July only. Even though explanation is given later, that doesn't affect the effectiveness or applicability of exemption. So whenever the notification or special order for exemption is notified or released, on from that day it will be effective, guys. Okay. Then there is an explanation you are telling. Explanation for the purposes of this section, where an exemption from the whole or part of the tax leviable thereon has been granted absolutely, that is without any condition, the registered person supplying such goods or services or both shall not collect the tax in excess of the effective rate on such supply of goods or services or both. Now, if I am enjoying any exemption for my supply, now if I supply that goods or services to you, can I collect the tax from you? No. Only if I am liable to pay GST as a supplier, I will collect it from you. Assume guys, there is no exemption like this, but still I am just giving an example. Assume the rate applicable for my goods is 18%. But government has given an exemption telling because you pay only 10%. They have given exemption in the rate, not completely, partially. Clear, a part of the tax is exempt. Instead of 18%, they asked me to pay tax at 10%. Okay, so in that case, how much I can collect from my recipient maximum? 10%. I cannot tell. 18% is what applicable for me, but government gave me exemption, not for the recipient. So I will collect 18% from him and deposit to the government only 10%. No, 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 you cannot do it. So supplier, when he is liable to pay 10%, he can collect only 10% from the recipient tax. Clear? And in the uh, syllabus or in the GST law, they have not given any rate-based exemption, guys. They have not given any rate-based exemption. I have just given an ex uh, example here because they have told they cannot collect the tax in excess of effective rate. So, you have to understand what, how exactly is that. Clear? Same way. Sir, what if the government has given me complete exemption? Means I need not pay any tax for whatever I am supplying. In that case, I cannot collect any tax from the recipient. I cannot collect any tax on my from my recipients on my outward supply guys. Yes. 
So, this are the three subsections of section 11. So, section 11, they have not given any list of goods or services which are exempt. They have given the power to, to the government to notify it. Same way, section 6 of IGST Act also contains similar provisions and exemption of IGST, which is granted on interstate supply. Clear? So, section 11 of CGST Act talks about intrastate supply, whereas section 6 of IGST Act talks about interstate supply. But whatever list we will see, guys, the list of services which are exempt, it is same under both CGST Act as well as IGST Act. Whereas under IGST Act, few more additions are there with respect to interstate supply. They are added few more exemption, but that are not a part of your inter syllabus. You will be learning it at final level. So only the services which are exempt under CGST Act is a part of your syllabus. Same to same services are also exempt under IGST Act. Plus few more additions are there. Is that clear? Yes, so the absolute or unconditional exemption is mandatory in nature, means you have to claim it. You cannot tell no, sir. I don't want exemption, I will pay GST. No, if it is unconditional or absolute without any condition, that means you have to avail it. However, where the exemption is conditional, it is an option of the registered person whether to avail the same or not. If it is conditional, assume you don't want to take exemption. So, what will you do? Violate the condition. So, they would have told, you can enjoy the exemption only if you satisfy so and so conditions. If you want, obviously any person want to claim exemption. So, if you want to claim the exemption, satisfy all the condition and claim it. No, sir, I don't want to claim. In that case, don't satisfy the condition. Automatically, you become ineligible for the exemption. So, conditional exemption, whatever is are there, they are not mandatory, guys, for the person to claim it. Okay. Now, coming to exemptions under GST. It is important before seeing the list of the exemption, it is important to understand what is exempt supply and it is defined under the GST law. Exempt supply has been defined as supply of any goods or services or both which attracts nil rate of tax or which may be wholly exempt from tax and therefore includes non-taxable supply as per section 2 clause 47 guys. So you can see I have given you Chart, the exam supply includes what? Nil rated supply. Nil rated supply means under GST it is covered. But the rate applicable is zero. Zero rated supply is different guys. Okay, but what I am telling is nil rated supply means the rate applicable is nil or zero. Clear? What exactly is this and all we will discuss later. The difference between nil rated supply, exam supply and zero rated supply, non-taxable supply. All these differences we will understand in ITC chapter guys. As of now, you understand exempt supply includes what? Nil rated supply, wholly exempt supply plus non-taxable supply. Normally, what we understand is exempt supply is something which is exempt. But it also includes two more extra elements. What are those wings? Nil rated and non-taxable supply. Sir, what is non-taxable supply? It is also defined. Non-taxable supply means a supply of goods or services or both which is not liable to tax under CGST Act or under the IGST Act guys means which is outside the GST that is the alcohol, PhD man that is petroleum products all these are outside the GST now we call it as non-taxable supply. Thus under GST a supply not liable to tax is also included within the purview of exempt supply. Supplies not liable to tax are what are those alcoholic liquor for human consumption it is completely kept outside GST guys. Then as on today temporarily even petroleum products that is PhD man has been kept outside. So even those things as on today, is it called as non-taxable supply? Yes guys. And alcoholic liquor for human consumption, you know, <clears throat> the famous brand United Breweries, they are trying to, they are thinking to rename the brand Kingfisher as what sir? Queen Fisher. After the RCB woman, oh, <laughs> I know funny, but after the RCB women won the WPL, they are thinking to change the name. Instead of King Fisher, we will keep, keep it as Queen Fisher. Okay, chal. <clears throat> so, these products are called the non-taxable supply guys. That is all called PhD man. Clear? Yes, sir. Then, goods exempt from tax. Under GST, everyday items such as common man have such used by common man have, may have been included in the list of exempted items like what are those? Unbranded atta, maida, basin, unpacked food grains, milk, eggs, curd, lassi and fresh vegetable are among the items exempted from GST. But the list of goods which are exempt is not a part of your syllabus guys. So you need not worry. I have just given here for your information. 
now what is important is the services notification number 12 bar 2017 central tax rate dated 28th june 2017 year in after year in after referred to as notification unless otherwise specified as exempted the various services only from gst so wherever we see the exemption it is completely exempt guys it is not like partially and all okay sir then exemption from igst has been granted to various services wide notification number 9 bar 2017 integrated tax rate dated 28th june 2017 all the services exempted from cgst have also been exempted from igst what i already told you now sir are we supposed to remember this notification number and all if possible you remember if not also fine guys igst 9 whereas cgst 12 remaining all things remain same date and all not required guys whenever in descriptive type if you are answering any question with respect to exemption you have to start like this as per section 11 of cgst act read with notification and if you can remember the notification number you can quote it if not also it's fine at inter level notification numbers and all is not important notification number even entry numbers because exemptions and all is given by way of entry number please don't try to remember entry numbers guys that is not important is that clear so i repeat once again whenever you are starting explain explaining any answer with respect to exemption please start your answer explanation of provision applicable provision how do you start with as per section 11 of cgst act as per section 11 of cgst act read with notification and if you remember notification number you can just quote it clear yeah. and here you can remember is what i feel because entire list of exemption is given under the same notification guys clear but still even if you don't remember nothing wrong you can just tell read with notification that's all okay fine guys now let us see the list of services which are exempt under gst the list is little lengthy guys we'll go through it one by one quickly and here exemption should always be read with rcm guys okay few exemptions are connected to not all the exemptions few exemptions are connected to rcm wherever connection is there i will just connect it to rcm and i will tell you when is when is it exempt when is it actually taxable under rcm see if there is any supply which i already told i will just repeat it guys if there is any supply which is covered in negative list not taxable or which is covered in schedule 3 or section 72 okay let me mention 7 subsection 2 all the items okay sir or if there is any services which is sorry which is uh, if there is any supply which is exempt that is also not taxable so we will get what taxable supply so from supply if i reduce this two items that is the negative list along with section whatever 7 sub, sub section 2 talks about and schedule 3 then section 11 <coughs> exemption or section 6 of igst act we will get taxable supply then we have to see whether it is taxable under rcm or fcm so if there is any taxable supply which is covered under rcm recipient will pay tax if there is any taxable supply which is not covered in rcm it is understood that it is taxable under fcm guys where supplier is liable to pay tax is that clear yes sir and few cases that is in case of rath electronic commerce operator will be liable to pay not the supplier not the recipient who will pay tax the electronic commerce operator in case of rath clear in the upcoming chapters i will draw a chart on all this and explain it but as of now please do understand this much guys is that clear yes sir come on guys let us get into the list of exempted services each of the entries of the exemption notification has been discussed below so it is arranged in the category wise guys first one services related to charitable and religious activities entry number 1 sir are we supposed to remember entry numbers please don't okay just remember what are the items covered in exemption guys before i start also as a student i know this feels that sir too much exemptions are there how do we remember it guys please don't skip this chapter even though it is lengthy even though it might be a dry topic but still important guys because at least one question will come from this topic and sometimes they will ask the easiest question guys even if you have some idea about that exemption you can write the answer clear so please don't ignore it even if you are watching this revision classes also i feel somewhere more than enough so please make sure that you don't completely skip or ignore this chapter guys okay let us start with services by an entity registered under section 12a of income tax act 1961 by way of charitable activities guys 12a of income tax act 
talks about the procedure for registration for a charitable entity or charitable institution and it is not a part of your inter syllabus clear yes and wherever any section is not a part of your inter syllabus i would be mentioning it that at least you will have an idea that okay we will be learning this at final class clear yes so i have given some notes for this let us quickly go through services provided by an entity registered under section 12 of the income tax act 1961 by way of advancement of religion spirituality any religion guys spirituality or yoga are exempt as such activities are covered in definition of charitable activities so all this advancement of religion spiritual and yoga are also a part of charitable activities okay next activities of schools colleges or any other educational institution run by charitable trust by way of education or skill development of abundant orphans homeless children physically or mentally abused persons prisoners or persons over the age of 65 years that is more than 65 or above residing in rural area will be considered as charitable activities and income from such supplies will also be wholly exempt from gst guys next sir what about hostel accommodation education yes you are telling that if it is provided by a charitable entity which is registered under section 12a it is a part of charitable what about hostel sir for the children who are studying there they are also providing hostel hostel accommodation services provided by the trust to the students do not fall within the ambit of charitable activities they are not charitable hostel accommodation yes education is a charitable but not hostel however accommodation service in hostels including such services provided by a trust having a below 1000 rupees per day is exempt under entry 14 of the notification if the amount what, what they are charging per day is less than 1000 they are telling it is exempt sir what if it is more than 1000 entire amount would be taxable guys normally what they charge is per month guys assume they are charging 25000 per month obviously per day you calculate less than 1000 ah yes sir exempt assume they are charging 40000 more than 1000 rupees per day na yes sir is it taxable yes it is taxable clear because normally they don't charge per day and all but exemption here is given based on per day charge so less than 1000 rupees per day means exempt if it is more than that taxable entire amount would be taxable guys clear ah huh? yes sir hmm. next 13 entry number 13 services by a person not by a charitable entity person okay by way of what that person is doing conduct of any religious ceremony okay any religious ceremony from any religion guys okay renting of precincts oh, okay let me see the note with respect to this the fourth one it can be inferred that the amount charged by whatever name called for the conduct of any religious ceremony is exempt from gst religious ceremonies are like life cycle rituals including special religious pujas conducted in terms of religious text with respect to the race, whatever religion you are from by a person so authorized by such religious text like priest molvi or father whoever is conducting whoever is authorized to conduct that religious ceremony whatever they are giving their services to the, the people of their religion they might be charging an amount for that services but still it is completely exempt under gst guys fine next coming to b renting of precincts of a religious place meant for general public owned or managed by an entity registered as a charitable or a religious trust under section 12a or a trust or an educational institution registered under section 1023c or a body or an authority covered under section 1023 bba of the income tax act that is renting of premises guys what they are talking about renting of premises of what religious place not some other place religious place oh, okay sir however entry b shall not apply to the following cases what is it sir renting of rooms where charges are 1000 rupees or more per day guys whenever you visit any temple church and all they may have some room facilities there they will provide the room for you to rest or to get freshen up or to stay there also in that case whatever renting of rooms they are doing if the amount is 1000 rupees or more per day it is fully taxable if it is less than 1000 nothing is taxable completely exempt next renting of premises community hall kalyana mandapam or open area and the like where charges are 10000 or more per day like kalyana mandapam and all you can get married in the church mosque or in the temples so assume you are hiring a kalyana mandapam there or the convention hall for which if you are paying 10000 or more it is completely taxable if it is less than 10000 nothing is exempt for the supplier guys clear nothing see i repeat 
if the amount is 10,000 or more, completely taxable. If it is less than 10,000, it is completely exempt. Clear? Yes. Renting of shops or other spaces for business or commerce where charges are 10,000 or more per month. You guys would have seen whenever you visit any temples and all, you will, be, you will be seeing some shops there where they will be selling few items for children's or even the puja items and all. In that case, if that uh, shop belongs to the person <coughs> or the religious place belongs to the charitable institution or the their locality, in that case, if the amount what they are charging to the tenant, if it is less than 10,000 per month, if it is less than 10,000 per month, then it is completely exempt. Sir, what if it is 10,000 or more than that? It is fully taxable, guys. It is fully taxable. So please be careful. Please, different places has like different places has different money. Room, 1,000 rupees or more per day. Whereas Kalyana Mandapa Mandal, 10,000 or more per day. Whereas the shops, 10,000 or more per month. Clear? 1000 or 10,000 or more means taxable. Less than that means exempt. Okay. Next entry number 60. Services by a specified organization in respect of religious pilgrimage facilitated by the government of India under bilateral arrangement. Note 5. As per entry 6, not all the religious pilgrimage guys, the services provided by Ach Committee and KMVN in relation to pilgrimage to Mecca and Kailash, that is Manaso Sarovar, respectively are not liable to GST, means exempt, only provided by these two people, that is Ach Committee and KMVN, guys. Last one, yo. Services by way of training or coaching in recreational activities relating to arts or culture by an individual, that is the coach, or sports by a charitable entity is registered under section 12AA or 12AB of the Income Tax Act. So sports activity or coaching of sports will may not fall under charitable activities now. But for that separate entry is there. Entry number 8. Clear? Yes. So 6. Besides charitable activities, services provided by way of training or coaching in sports by a charitable entity registered under section 12AA of the Income Tax Act are, are also exempt. So coaching or training of sports may not fall under charitable activities but still for that there is a separate entry guys for that there is a separate entry that is entry 80 fine we are done with next agriculture related services important even in income tax we have learned agriculture income as per the definition of section 21a is exempt under section 101 agrina guys 21a defines agriculture income and 10.1 gives exemption for agriculture income. Agriculture income from a land situated in India used for agriculture purposes is exempt under section 10.1. Agree na? Yes, sir. Same way under GST also, they are giving exemption. So, what are those? Entry number 24. Services by way of loading, unloading, packing, storage or warehousing of rice. Rice actually is not an agriculture product or crop. But still means because it has been processed. But still here separate exemption is given for that with respect to loading unloading packing and storage or warehousing of rice cats okay then services by way of warehousing of minor forest produce minor forest produce means other than timber guys and exemption is not given for the timber whatever i would have highlighted in red color that means exemption is not available for it see guys where i would have because in many exemption lists they would have told other than except excluding so, wherever I would have highlighted anything in red color, that means those are not exempt. That respective thing is not exempt. Is that clear? Yes. Sir. That one thing you should have in this exemption chapter, wherever, wherever I would have highlighted something in red color, the content, that means they are not enjoying the exemption. That means they are taxable. Okay, sir. Okay, next. 24B, services by way of storage, warehousing of cereals, pulses, fruits and vegetables. Then 54, services relating to cultivation of plants and rearing of all life forms of animal except rearing of horses. For rearing of horses, exemption is not available. Okay. For food, fiber, fuel, raw material or other similar products or agricultural produce by way of what and all, the following all the activities performed by anyone are exempted. What are those? One by one. Agricultural operations directly related to the production of any agricultural produce including cultivation, harvesting, threshing, plant production or testing. 
supply of farm labor for the purpose of agricultural activities even that is exempt then processes carried out at an agriculture farm including tending pruning cutting harvesting drying drying cleaning trimming sun drying fumigating curing sorting grading cooling or bulk packaging and such like operations which do not alter the essential characteristics of the agricultural produce but make it only marketable for primary market even these things are there even in section 21 a agricultural definition guys if you are doing any primary activities at the land <clears throat> to make the product ready for the primary market even that is considered as agricultural activities whatever you earn from that is an agriculture income same way here clear huh? yes sir what if i am doing any processing and all that will fall under manufacturing guys that will fall under manufacturing you will not enjoy the exemption here next renting or leasing of agro machinery which is used for agricultural purposes or vacant land with or without a structure incidental to its use loading or unloading packing storage or warehousing of agricultural produce then agriculture extension services services by any agricultural produce marketing committee which we call it as apmc in short or a board or services provided by a commission agent for sale or purchase of agricultural produce they act as a middleman between the farmer and the market guys 55 carrying out an intermediate production process as a job work in relation to means you are a job worker providing some intermediary services in relation to what cultivation of plant and rearing of all life form of farm, all life form of animals except horses because for horses exemption is not available okay for food fiber fuel raw material or other similar products or an agricultural produce then 55a services by way of artificial insemination of livestock artificial insemin insemination means making the animals or birds give birth by way of artificial okay now artificially other than horses here also the exemption is not available for horses guys next educational services one of the important services guys the exemption available in respect of input and output services see for educational they are talking about both input as well as output services input as well as output both are covered here so you have to be very attentive have been tabulated as follows guys before we go forward to understand the exemption first we have to understand sir what are the educational institution there are three categories of educational institution guys one two three you guys can just connect to your schools and colleges educational institution providing preschool education and education up to higher secondary school or equivalent that is till 12th or plus 2 clear so you guys can just connect to your schools or college next educational institution providing education as a part of curriculum for obtaining a recognized qualification that is ug or pg undergraduate or post graduation so if you are, if at all if you are done your undergraduation you can just connect to your college or university the last one educational institution providing education as a part of approved vocational education course vocational is nothing but professional so professional courses are covered here guys including our icei that will also fall here clear sir is it an educational institution yes sir hope it is clear for you one two three so you can remember something like this guys school college or like university the last one is our big boss our boss icei okay sir so first let us see output service guys then i will come back to input service sir if educational institution is providing any of this service output service they are exempt they are exempt what are those only two are there very easy services provided by an educational institution to its students faculty and staff any services guys they are not mentioned here if educational institution is providing any services to students faculty and staff it is always exempt any services okay na sft if they are providing any services to sft students faculty and <coughs> the uh, staff clear yes sir just a second yes sir yes yes sir yes guys students faculty and staff yes sir then clause aa by way of conduct of entrance examination against consideration in the form of entrance fee guys many of the institution has this system of conducting entrance examination they are conducting it for whom prospective students that is to be students in the future as on today they are not the students of the institute 
So for them, whatever entrance examination they are conducting, obviously they may charge some amount for it, 100 rupees, 500 rupees, 1000 rupees. Sir, even that services are exempt? Yes, guys. Because these guys will not fall under the category of students because they are yet to be students. After the entrance examination is conducted, if they are done well, only then the institute will select them as their students. Till then, they are not their students. Agree, na? So that is why separate exemption is given for them, guys. Next, coming back to your <clears throat> exempt input services means if educational institu institution is taking any input services in the following category, they are exempt for them. Guys. Who? The actual supplier. Whoever is supplying it, for them it is exempt. Clear means for educational institution, if supplier is giving the following input services, they are telling for the supplier it is exempt. For the supplier, it is exempt. Obviously, in that case, will he collect the tax from the recipient? No, he need not. So, which are those guys? One by one, we will see. Category wise, we will go. That is for first school up to 12th. Okay. What are those? Transportation of students, faculty, and staff. Guys, if college itself or school itself have bought the vehicle and if they are giving the service, that is covered here directly. If they are outsourced it to the outsider, means they don't own the vehicle, they have outsourced it to some travels to provide transportation services to their students, faculty and staff, then that will come here. So here, the educational institution is not directly providing the service to the students. They have outsourced it to the, some supplier, outside supplier, he will be providing it to the students. Clear? Yes. So in that case, it is like this supplier is giving services to educational institution. Yes, na. So it is an input service for educational institution. Is it taxable? No. If it is up to 12th, if it is for the school which is providing the education up to 12th, they're telling it is exempt. Okay, sir. Next, catering including any midday meals scheme sponsored by the central government, state government, or union territory. Then security or cleaning or housekeeping services performed in such educational institution is exempt. Clear, huh? means all these are outsourced work, guys. Clear, huh? now this security or cleaning or housekeeping services provided in educational institution is exempt, sir. What if security or cleaning or housekeeping services are provided at the prime at the residential premises of principal or a teacher or a faculty? Is that exempt? No, no, that is not exempt. Only in the school it should be provided. Then services relating to admission or to conduct of examination by such institution. Normally schools only will conduct it. By chance, if they have outsourced it to the outsider, then whatever services this outsider is giving to the uh, school is exempt. Guys. Is exempt. So, the following four services are exempt in the nature of input service to the educational institution, which is nothing but school here. Then coming to, okay, so you can remember like this TCS guys, especially TCS. TCS is the special thing here. T means what? Transportation. C means catering. S means security, including cleaning and housekeeping. The last one is actually exempt for all the category. The last one, whatever is there, that is there for remaining two also. So what is special for the school is TCS. Transportation, then the catering, the last one is security along with cleaning and housekeeping guys. Okay. Sir, what about degrees college? or educational institution providing education as a part of curriculum for obtaining a recognized qualification for them only two input services is exempt what are those sir? services relating to admission to or conduct of examination by such institution okay then one extra thing is there for them what is it supply of online educational journals or periodical clear this two are exempt guys sir what about this tcs sir what you gave here in the first category that is exempt only in the first category of educational institution guys Please be careful. Then the last one, educational institution providing education as a part of approved vocational education course that is professional. For them only one input service is exempt guys. That is services relating to admission to or conduct of examination by such institution. Easy to remember guys because this is actually covered in all the three categories. Okay now, irrespective of what type of educational institution, if the input service is by way of services relating to admission to or conduct of examination, it is always exempt. Okay. Then for second category, one extra thing is supply of online journals and all. Yes, sir. Whereas the first category, TCS, extra. TCS is the extra. Easy, na? Yes, sir. Chal. Next, healthcare services. Even this is important. Entry 46, services by a 
veterinary clinic in relation to health care of animals or birds is completely exempt but that is for veterinary clinic what about sir human beings sir 74 services by way of guys please be attentive this is important health care services by a clinical establishment or an authorized medical practitioner or a paramedics okay is exempt however nothing in this entry shall apply to the service provided by a clinical establishment by way of providing room providing room for the patients who are admitted is also a part of healthcare services guys but they are telling exemption is not available if the room charges is exceeding 5000 per day to a person if it is less than 5000 or equal to 5000 nothing is taxable but if it is more than 5000 they are telling exemption is not available only for renting of room is not available exemption is not available whereas for treatment and all yes they enjoy the exemption hope you guys are getting i repeat once again Nothing in this entry shall apply to the services provided by a clinical establishment only for providing room or renting of room where the room charges exceeding 5000 per day to a person receiving such health care services. So other services and all might be exempt for him. Only renting of room will be taxable. So when it will be exempt is only when it is less than or equal to 5000 per day guys per room. Is that clear? Yes. But this limit is not applicable for whatever I have given in bracket other than ICU or critical care unit or intensive cardiac care unit or neonatal intensive care unit for this there is no monetary limit if the person is admitted in icu or ccu or iccu or nicu then there is no monetary limit guys irrespective of the amount charged it will fall under the health care services which is wholly ex clear yes sir. now what is health care services what is covered in that what is not covered in that we have to understand Healthcare services means any services by way of diagnosis or treatment or care for illness, injury or deformity, abnormality or pregnancy in any recognized system of medicines in India and includes services by way of transportation of patient to and from any clinical establishment. Guys, this is for the patients who are normally admitted. Whereas for others, separate exemption is given. You can see clause B. Services provided by way of transportation of a patient in an ambulance other than those specified above. Sir, sometimes outsiders also will be providing ambulance service, not the hospitals. In that case, whatever services you are taking them from them with respect to ambulance, that is the transportation of patient from home to hospital or from one hospital to another hospital. If it is provided by the hospital itself, it is exempt. It is covered in clause A only. If it is provided by others, what sir, then it is here. Clear. So, even transportation of patient in an ambulance is always exempt, whether provided by the hospital or whether provided by others. It is always exempt. Yes. Clear. Yes. Even if it is provided for the patient who are not admitted also, it is exempt. Clear. <coughs> okay. Does not include. Okay. Means the healthcare services will not include a transplant or cosmetic or plastic surgery. Okay, so some many people will get, okay, now sir, boys especially, okay, our ears are falling, so we will not get girls to get married. So in that case, we want to get the ear transplant or anything, it happens like that. So in that case, if you are getting that, will it fall under the exemption category? No. Or cosmetic or plastic surgery, many of these stars, <clears throat> Bollywood stars or Sandalwood stars or Tollywood, Mollywood, whichever stars, if they are getting any cosmetic or plastic surgery, in that case, will that service fall under the healthcare services? No, guys. So that means they don't enjoy the exemption. Except when undertaken to restore or to reconstruct anatomy or functions or a of a body affected due to congenital defects, development, abnormalities, injury or trauma. Only in that case, yes, exemption is available. As it is apparent from the definition of healthcare services, only services in a recognized system of medicines in India are exempt under this entry. Following systems of medicines are recognized in the system of medicines in India, guys. Okay. What are those? Allopathy, Yoga, Naturopathy, Ayurveda, Homeopathy, Siddha, Unani, any other system of medicine that may be recognized by central government. All this enjoy the exemption. Next, renting of room provided to inpatient in an hospital is exempt subject to the limit and purpose specified, which we already saw. Clear? If it is given for the things what I have highlighted in purple color, no th threshold limit, no monetary limit. It is always exempt, guys. Whereas for any other purpose means, if the room rental per day per room is less than or equal to 5,000, exempt. More than 5,000, fully taxable. Next. Healthcare services provided by a clinical establishment will include food supply to the patient. 
but such food may be prepared by the canteens run by the hospital or it may be outsourced by the hospital from out outdoor caterers now food whatever is supplied to the patients who are admitted in the hospital whether hospital itself is providing it or whether they are outsourced it to others so in that case they are taking input service and they are giving it in either of this case it is exempt guys provided it is provided to which patient inpatient that is the patients who are admitted in the hospital okay food supplied to the inpatients are ad advised by the doctor or nutritionist is a part of composite supply of health care and not a separate taxable supply means normally they charge a single price for all these services in that case yes we can call it as composite supply and which will be the principal supply here health care services that is the treatment guys clear yes sir what if they are charging different price for each food separate piece treatment separate piece in that case obviously we will not consider it as a composite supplies individual supplies other supplies of food by an hospital to patients not admitted or their attendants or visitors are taxable guys now i went to visit a person who are admitted in a hospital there i felt hungry and i had something in uh, the hospital canteen in that case is it exempt for the supplier or the one who is giving the services to me no guys because i am not the patient who are admitted here. or else i just went for some checkup and i got it and i had some food and i came in that case is it exempt no and it is the responsibility of the hospital to maintain that data of food supplied for the patient who is admitted and for others because if the food is supplied, uh, supplied to the patients who are admitted is exempt whereas for others it is always taxable so it is the responsibility of the hospital to maintain a separate data for both yeah supply of services other than healthcare services such as renting of shops auditoriums in the premises of clinical establishment display of advertisement etc will be subject to gst all these are taxable guys whatever i have already told you whatever i would have given in red color that means it is taxable they don't enjoy the exemption now renting of rooms shops so assume in an hospital there might be some um shop where they are selling the medicines that are let by the hospital for that person to, to sell that medicines or tablets there in that case is it taxable sir yes next auditoriums so in a place called nimans okay and there is a hospital or in a healthcare unit called nimans in bangalore they have an auditorium so if they are letting out that auditorium is it taxable for them yes guys then sir advertisement display of advertisement so whenever we go to a clinic or hospital they make us wait there for the doctor they have that demand so they are making us wait so during that waiting period they would have displayed some advertisement for us to see so obviously for whichever company they are advertising they would have charged the money for them in that case is that service is also exempt sir no no that is taxable okay next <coughs> category services provided by government by government means government is what guys supplier services provided by government means the government is a supplier here okay let us see one by one entry number four services by a, by a governmental authority by way of any activity in relation to any function interested to a municipality under article 243 w of the constitution are exempt entry number five services by by a governmental authority by way of any activity in relation to any function interested to a panchayat under article 243 g of the constitution see guys any services performed by municipality or panchayat is outside the gst as per section 72 which we already learned now sir if any services on behalf of municipality or panchayat if it is done by governmental authority even that is covered under gst or not sir they are exempt here guys clear if municipality or panchayat directly providing any services they are covered in section 7 to second item there 7 subsection 2 second item which is neither a supply of goods nor a supply of services clear now if governmental authority is doing any activity which is in relation to function interested to whom panchayat or municipality so for who is the service provider here governmental authority for them also it is x means on behalf of municipality or panchayat the governmental authority is providing services clear so governmental authority as a supplier enjoy the exemption next services by the central government state government union territory or a local authority excluding the following services means services provided by central government state government union territory or local authority is exempt but except the following means the following is not exempt what are those sir trap i have kept the short form as trap it is a trap for them 
Services by way of Department of Post and Ministry of Railways. Ministry of Railways is a new addition. Please be careful. That is Indian Railways. Then services in relation to an aircraft or a vessel inside or outside the presence of a port or an airport. Then transportation of goods or passengers. Guys, this three is always taxable under FCM. Forward charge mechanism. These items have also been excluded from RCM list, if you guys can remember. Okay, so I call them as trap guys. What is the full form, sir? T stands for what? <clears throat> transportation of goods and passengers. R stands for D, railways. R stands for railways. A stands for airport. P stands for port. And another P stands for post. Postal departmental services. Is that clear? I repeat. Easy to remember. T for transportation of goods or passengers. Then R for railways or Indian railways. A for airport services are provided in the locality of the airport. Or P stands for port, where the vessel is nothing but ship, guys. Then P stands for postal, guys. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Next, the last one. Any services other than the services covered under clause, in, sorry, under entries A to C above, provided to business entity. Provided to business entity, again, they are covered in entry 7. We will see. They are excluding it from entry 6, but they are including it in entry 7. But not all. Please be careful. Listen, listen. Services provided by central government, state government, union territory, or local authority to a business entity with an aggregate turnover of up to such an amount in the preceding financial year as it makes it eligible for exemption from the registration under CGST Act 2017. Simple guys. If the recipient is a business entity, we will check what is their aggregate turnover in the last year. If it has crossed the threshold limit applicable for registration, that is 10 lakh, 20 lakh or 40 lakh as the case may be, whatever is the threshold limit applicable for them for registration. If their aggregate turnover has crossed this limit last year, then in this case, if the recipient in the current year is a business entity, for them RCM is applicable. Sir, what if aggregate turnover was less than the threshold limit? Then in this case, it is exempt, guys, as per entry 7. Oh, you can see here. Explanation. For the purposes of this entry, it is hereby clarified that the provisions of this entry shall not be applicable to following services. That is, Item ABC. Guys, if this three services, even if it is provided to business entity, whether they are registered or unregistered, doesn't matter. Always FCM. Always. Yeah. C. Yeah. Good. Okay. Next, services by way of renting of immobile property. That is in short, I call them as RIP. Okay. In simple, I have given the explanation here, guys, by way of note. If the aggregate turnover of business entity in the preceding financial year is more than 20 lakh or 10 lakh or 40 lakh, that is the threshold limit applicable for registration. Guys. 10 and 20 lakh is given in section 22 subsection 1 and 40 lakh is by way of notification only for exclusive supplier of goods within the state. Then such business entity will pay tax under RCM which we have already learned in RCM. Guys. I will try to connect. Once I am done all, with all this list, I will try to connect with a chart. Hope you guys are understood. Clear. I'll just repeat once again. Guys, if these three services provided to anyone, even though the supplier is the government, they're telling it is taxable under forward charge mechanism. Whereas D, what they excluded here, they have included in 7 telling. If government services are provided to a business entity, we will see whether they are registered or not. If they are registered RCM, if they are unregistered, except as per entry 7. Clear? Yes. Then entry 7, they are telling it is not applicable for ABC. ABC is nothing but trap. Okay. It is nothing but trap. For that, it is not applicable. Plus, it is not also applicable for RIP. Okay. Because RIP, renting of immobile property, if renting is done for a person who is registered under GST, RCM is applicable, guys. RCM is applicable. Okay. Next. Services provided by a central government, state government, union territory or a local authority to another. Means who is the recipient here? Another is central government, state government, union territory or local authority. In that case, it is exempt. However, nothing contained in this entry shall apply to services referred to in ABC of the entry 6 above. So if ABC, that is trap, if it is provided even for another government authority or central government, state government, union territory or local authority, even in that case, FCM, sorry, uh, forward charge mechanism is applicable guys. No RCM, no exempt in that case. Clear? Yes. Then entry 9. 
Services provided by central government, state government, union territory or local authority, they are the supplier. Where the concentration for such services does not exceed 5000. Here they are not naming the services, they are telling any services provided by them. If the concentration wattage charge is less than or equal to 5000, they are telling it is not taxable, it is exempt. Clear? Huh? Yes. However, nothing contained in this entry shall apply to a services referred to in ABC of entry 6 above. Means, even if these three services are given where the consideration is charged less than or equal to 5000, still FCM would be applicable. Still FCM is applicable. So, that doesn't, guys, in case of ABC, who is the recipient? What is the consideration charged? Whether they are registered, not registered, doesn't matter. Supplier is the one who is liable to pay tax under power charge. Clear? Huh? Yes, sir. Next, <clears throat> further, in case where the continuous supply of service is provided by the central government, state government, union territory or local authority, the exemption shall apply only where the consideration charged for such service does not exceed 5000 in a financial year. Means 5000 limit is for a year. Clear? So, if you are providing continuous service every month, in that case, aggregate the amount. Is it more than 5000? If yes, entire amount is taxable. If it is less than 5000 or equal to 5000, nothing is taxable. Yes. Okay, then 9C, <clears throat> supply of service by a government entity to a central government, government entity to central government, state government, union territory or local authority or any person specified by central government, state government, union territory or local authority against consideration received from central government, state government, union territory or local authority in the form of grants means government entity is giving services to whom? Central government, state government, union territory or local authority or any other person for which consideration is given by the government to whom to the government authority as a grant in that case whatever services is provided by government entity is exempt irrespective of the consideration clear simple services are provided to whom government entity to government or government entity to some other person for which consideration is given by government as a grant in that case for a government entity as a supplier is exempt Oh, okay. So, for whatever we have seen, especially for this entry, guys, 6, 7, 8, 9, I have made a chart. Let us just see that, which becomes easy for you. <coughs> I have connected exemption along with the RCM also. Let us see, guys. Services provided by central government, state government, union territory or local authority. That is, what is, if that service is ABC? ABC is nothing but trap, transportation of goods or passenger, Indian railways, then airport or port and the last one is postal. In that case, always taxable under FCM. Even consideration will not matter. Guys. Even the amount of consideration who is the recipient doesn't matter at all. Yes, sir. See, one postal services exemption they have given. Let us just see that 24C. What is it? Services by the department of post by way of postcard, inland letter, book post and ordinary post. That is envelopes weighing less than 10 grams is only exempt. Whereas any other services provided by them is taxable, guys. So please be careful with this 24C also with respect to postal. Clear? Huh? So I have given always taxable under FCM. Obviously, that will not include 24C8 because 24C is exempt. Okay, sir. Then coming to RIP, that is renting of immobile property. Services to whom? Who is the recipient you see? Registered. If the person is re recipient is registered under GST, these people are recipient I am talking about taxable under RCM. Sir, what if they are unregistered? Then we will see. <clears throat> if they are taxable under FCM, then if the consideration is more than 5000 in a financial year only, it is taxable under FCM. Taxable under FCM. Then what if it is other services, sir? Other than this thing. That is trap other and RIP. Other than this. Any other services, if it is provided to business entity, check whether they are registered or unregistered. Registered in the sense, check their last year. Last year, uh, Aggregate turnover. Is it more than the threshold limit applicable for registration? If yes, we call them as registered because by now they would have already registered, guys. Clear? Because last year, if they have crossed the threshold limit, you know, once the person is liable for registration, he has to apply for registration within 30 days. Huh? Yes. <coughs> so, in that case, it is taxable under RCM. If the recipient is registered under GST, then it is taxable under RCM. Sir, what if the business entity is unregistered? The recipient is the business entity not registered under GST. In that case, it is exempt, guys. 
it is exempt sir what if the recipient is any other person other than business entity for business entity we will see whether they are registered or unregistered whereas for others we don't even see whether they are registered or unregistered it is always exempt yes. it is always exempt is that clear yes so i have told you means in this three cases it would be taxable only if the consideration is more than 5000 in a financial year guys clear yes so this is a chart combining both exemption as well as the rcm with respect to government services let us continue guys 90 services by an old age home run by central government state government or an entity registered under section 12 ea of income tax act 1961 to its residents is 60 or more if it is less than 60 not exempt please be careful against consideration of up to 25000 per month per member if it is more than that fully taxable if it is less than or equal to 25000 per month per member exempt guys provided that the consideration charge is inclusive of all the charges for boarding lodging and maintenance including food guys 24c we already seen then 34a services supplied by central government state government union territory to their undertaking or public sector undertakings by way of guaranteeing the loans taken by such undertaking rpsus from the banking companies and financial institution now government undertaking rpsu public sector undertaking is obtaining the loan from bank or financial institution yes. they are obtaining the loan for which the guarantee is given to the bank or financial institution by the government by the government for that, this governmental undertaking or PSU is paying some commission to the government. They are telling this services is exempt. Whatever services the government is giving by way of guaranteeing to the loan taken by whom the government undertaking or PSU is exempt. So, with respect to who is the supplier here? Government. Whatever guarantee they are giving, they are telling it is exempt. Okay, sir. Next, 47. Services provided by the central government, state government, union territory or a local authority by way of what and all? Registration required under any law for the time being in force that is under GST or under the Companies Act. We are registering under MC and all. All this are enjoying the exemption. Testing, calibration, safety check or certification relating to protection or safety of workers, consumers or public at large including fire license required under any law for the time being in force guys. All this license, whatever they are giving, testing certificates and all is exempt from GST. Services provided by central government, state government, union territory or local authority by way of issuance of passport, visa, driving license, birth certificate, death certificate. When we are born also, we have to obtain birth certificate from the government. When we die also, our family members have to obtain death certificate. And including this visa, driving license, passport and whatever they issue. For that, obviously, they would be charging some amount, which is exempt under GST guys. 61A. Services by way of granting national permit to a goods carriage to operate throughout India or contiguous states. Contiguous states means who share the common border, guys, like Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Kerala. We all share the border. Clear? We, call it, we are called as contiguous states. 62. Services provided by central government, state government, union territory, or a local authority by way of tolerating non performance of a contract for which consideration in the form of fines or liquidated damages is payable to the central government or say state government low union territory or local authority under such contract so for tolerating the non-performance or for violating anything if you are paying any fine or liquidated damages for the police department or for governmental authority they're telling it is exempt under gst okay they're tolerating you for which you are paying fine in that case it is completely exempt under gst 63 services provided by central government state government union territory or local authority by way of assignment of right to use natural resources to an individual farmer for cultivation of plant or rearing of all life forms of animals except horses for food fiber fuel raw material or other similar products is exempt guys then 65 services provided by central government state government union territory by way of deputing officers after office hours or on holidays for inspection or container stuffing or such other duties in relation to import export cargo on payment of merchant overtime charges okay all these are not so important 74a services provided by a rehabilitation professionals recognized under a rehabilitation council of indian act 1992 
by way of rehabilitation therapy or counseling and such other activity as covered by the said act at medical establishment educational institution rehabilitation centers established by central government state government union territory or any entity registered under section 12 aa or 12 ab of the income tax act 1961 this is all the services which are exempt provided by whom guys the government as a supplier clear government includes like central state local authority union territory everything fines <coughs> so whatever this part is important guys whatever i would have given by way of chart not this because as they are connected with rcm also the entry 6 7 8 and 9 is considerably important okay next construction services construction services sir services provided by way of pure labor contracts means only labor there is no goods involved guys okay goods in the sense sand bricks cement those things are not involved pure labor contracts of construction erection commissioning installation completion fitting out repair maintenance renovation alteration of civil structure or any other original works pertaining to the beneficiary led individual house construction or enhancement under the housing for all urban mission or pradhan mantri awas yojana these are the government project to provide houses to the under privileged people guys who doesn't have houses so they thought okay so this is the government project they are assuming they are outsourcing it to the constructor assume now uh, prestige developers they are they are um, outsourcing this construction work to prestige developer in that case if all the goods is bought by the government and they have given it to the prestige and prestige is just doing the construction work and giving it to the government in that case whatever services the prestige is providing is accept guys clear huh? yes Sir, what if prestige only buy all the goods, they provide the goods along with the construction services, that is not exempt here. Please be careful. 10A. Services supplied by electricity distribution utilities by way of construction, erection, commissioning or installation of infrastructure for extending electricity distribution network up to the tube well of the farmer or agriculturist for agriculture use is exempt, guys. Okay, next 11th one. Services by way of pure labor contracts for construction of erection, commissioning or installation of virginal works pertaining to single residential unit otherwise then as a part of residential complex. Now assume guys, I want to construct my house. So I have approached a constructor or contractor <coughs> and I told him, sir, I will get all the items. You just do the construction work and give it to me. In that case, what is it? Pure labor contract and he is building what for me? Single residential unit. In that case, whatever services the contractor is giving to me is completely exempt, guys. It is only for single residential unit. Sir, what if it is a complex? What if it is like commercial building? Sir, what if it is like apartment or any flats? In that case, is it an exempt? No, no. In that case, whatever services the con uh, contractor is providing is not exempt here, guys. Hope it is clear. Only for single residential unit. Okay, which should be used for residential purpose. Even if it is a commercial property or residential complex or apartment, flat and all, exemption is not available. Okay, next passenger transportation services. <clears throat> Entry number 15. Transportation of passenger with or without accompanied belongings by air. Air means flight. Okay. In economic class. So only economic class is exempt. Embarking from or terminating in an airport located in means either your starting point or destination point is in any of this uh, airport guys. That is state of Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, Sikkim or Tripura. Any of this airport in, the st in those states if you are starting or if you are ending there. You are landing there or you are taking off there. Or at Bagdogra located in West Bengal. See there are different airports in West Bengal but only if you are starting, if you are taking off or if you are landing in Bagdogra airport, you enjoy the exemption. That is only for the services provided in economic class or what if it is business and all, no exemption, sorry, thank you. Next, non-air conditioned contract carriage other than radio taxi for the transportation of passenger excluding tourism, conducted tour, charter or IR guys, contract carriages, I have hired a bus, I have hired a vehicle. And I will decide where this vehicle will go. Clear means I have taken the vehicle on a rent or bus on a rent. Clear that is called contract carriage. Assume I want to go for a trip with my friends or with my family. In that case, I would have hired a bus or vehicle. In that case, I will decide where it has to go. 
clear we call it as contract carriage if it is for tourism purpose and all they are telling it is not exempt clear yes then stage carries other than air condition stage carry if it is air condition and all guys the exemption is not available if it is ac okay so stage carries other than air condition stage carries means what sir guys public transport in simple if i have to tell public transport so they would already have decided what is their destination i can get into this vehicle or bus at any point clear they will drop me wherever i want means they will not go to my home and all assume the bus is traveling from karnataka to chennai now there will be many intermediate point where they will give stop i can get into this bus at any point and i can get out of the bus at any point in between bangalore to chennai clear now i cannot ask sir please go to hyderabad please drive it to tirupati no no you cannot do it clear yes. so in simple public transport guys however nothing contained in b and c above shall apply to the services supplied through electronic commerce operator that is your booking the bus seat or the vehicle or cab through electronic commerce operator and notified under section 95 of cgst act 2017 and tax on such services shall be paid by whom electronic commerce operator as per section 95 agree guys so transportation of passenger services booked through electronic commerce operator like ola uber red bus abibus anything if it is bus if the supplier is a company then they will pay tax under forward charge please be remember remember that clear if any other person yes electronic commerce operator will pay tax clear yes so so your if you are booking it through electronic commerce operator then you will pay tax as per section 95 if not yes you will enjoy the exemption here then 16 guys <clears throat> Services provided to the central government by way of transportation of passengers with or without accompanied belongings by air embarking from or at terminating at a RCS that is regional connectivity scheme airport against consideration in the form of viability gap funding in order to develop the infrastructure and air connectivity government will support the small states where there might be shortage of funds to develop their airport guys through what viability gap funding means they will provide the gap uh, they will provide that gap Whatever shortage is there, they are trying to fill it by providing the funds to the government, especially central government. In that case, assume if this service of transportation is given <coughs> by this respective airport or airlines to the central government or their employees. In that case, who is the recipient? Central government. They are telling they will enjoy the exemption. But this exemption is only for a period of three years. This exemption is only for a period of three years yes we have supported us by providing the funds that doesn't mean that we have to give the service freely for you throughout the life now they're telling okay exemption is available only for three years even after three years if these services are provided by so provided to government it is not exempt gst is applicable <coughs> okay <clears throat> entry number 17 service of transportation of passenger with or without accompanied belongings by railways in class other than other than means first class or non air conditioned coaches there are they are taxable whereas any other class yes exemption is there oh metro monorail or tramway inland waterways public transport other than predominantly for tourism purpose in a vessel between places located in india now this is taxable guys clear public transport normally exempt but if it is for a tourism purpose in a vessel between places located in india sir i am traveling from assume from mumbai or kerala to lakshadweep now one of the best place to visit in India <clears throat> after Modi visited there. So now assume I want to travel in a cruise or a ship or a vessel from Mumbai to Lakshadweep or from Kerala to Lakshadweep. In that case, they're telling it is taxable. In exemption is not available, guys. Oh. Metered cabs or auto rickshaws, including e-rickshaws. But in case where the service of transportation of passengers by metered cab or auto rickshaws that is the last one guys including e-rickshaws are supplied through e-commerce operator that is you are booking the e-rickshaws or cab through the electronic commerce operator that is ola or Uber. in that case such services are not exempt from gst on that who is liable to pay tax electronic commerce operator under section 9 subsection 5 or section 5 subsection 5 of igst act clear yes sir Next, goods transportation services. Passenger we saw, now it is goods. 18, entry number 18. Services by way of transportation of goods by road. 
is exempt except the services of goods transportation agency that we will see later separately gta is not covered here or a courier agency this two are not exempt here guys clear courier agency is anyway not exempt whereas gta we will see separately okay yes sir then by inland waterways is always exempt next services by way of transportation by rail or a vessel vessel means ship from one place in india to another of the following goods which are those means if you are supplying only the following goods they enjoy the exemption transportation of goods which are those relief materials meant for victims of natural or non man made disasters calamities accidents or mishap defense or military equipments newspaper or magazines registered with register of newspapers agricultural produce milk salt and food grain including flour pulses and rice and organic manure guys only if this items are supplied or transported through a rail or vessel for any place in india to any place in india please be careful is exempt okay next coming to gta gta was excluded here yes sir so now they are giving separate list for it what is it we will see services provided by goods transportation agency by way of transportation in in a goods carriage of what the same items whatever we saw here same to same items are there here guys what are those agricultural produce milk salt and food grain including food flour pulses and rice organic manure newspaper or magazines registered with register of newspaper relief materials meant for victims of natural or man made disaster calamities accidents or misha or defense of military equipments all this are exempt guys even if it is transported by a rail or vessel for any place in india it is exempt even if it is provided by gta it is exempt next 21a services provided by a gta to an unregistered person including an unregistered casual taxable person other than the recipients who are covered under rcm specified recipients then rcm is applicable if they are not specified recipients guys there only while explaining rcm itself i have explained this it is exempt then this two guys please study along with rcm <laughs> 21b services provided by gta by way of transportation of goods in a goods carriage to department or establishment of the central government or a state government or union territory or a local authority or a government agency which has taken registration the recipient registration see guys they are the recipients they are registered under gst but they are registered only for the purpose of deducting tds and they are not providing any taxable outward supply for them rcm is not applicable i already explained when i was covering rcm yes sir and for the supplier also it is exempt no rcm no fcm both it is exempt guys it is exempt let me quickly go back to rcm point this one i will just yeah you can see here. rcm first item clear up there <clears throat> any registered person is covered here yes sir any person registered under gst i told you if the following people that is governmental authority and all if they are registered under gst only for, for, the, for the purpose of deducting tds then even though they are registered they are not covered under specified recipients that means rcm is not applicable and now in the exemption list we are seeing it is exempt that means no rcm no fcm in that case guys is that clear yes even casual taxable person actually in rcm list they have not used the word registered but after studying exemption we will understand only registered casual taxable person is covered here sir what if casual registered a casual taxable person is not registered then he is not a specified recipient here guys he is not a specified recipient here no see actually casual taxable person it is mandatory for him to get registered except in the cases where he is supplying notified handicraft goods threshold limit is applicable only if he cross threshold limit he has to get registered if not registration is not required yeah only in that case he enjoy that exemption for registration so even in the chart i had given here <clears throat> only if it is a specified recipients we have to check whether rcm or fcm is applicable sir what if the recipients is not a specified recipients what if the recipient is not a specified recipients like unregistered recipient or unregistered casual taxable person then gst is exempt that is what we just now learned that is now that is what just now what we learned guys shall i get back still too much is there yeah <clears throat> entry 27 is very important guys 
it has impact on other chapters as well yeah next is banking and financial services entry 27 services by way of extending deposit loans or advances in so far as the consideration is represented by way of interest or discount other than the interest involved in credit card services is always exempt clear so whatever interest is related to credit card is always taxable i have given a note here you can see service charges fees document documentation fees broking charges or brokerage charges administrative charges entry charges or such like fees or charges collected are not exempt and thus taxable same way interest charged on outstanding credit card balances has been specifically excluded from entry 27 that means it is taxable that means it is taxable guys okay so please be careful guys this is especially very important because this is in short i call it as financial services extending loans and advances by the banks in return for which they are charging either the interest or discount this services is exempt but while calculating the turnover to check the eligibility or to pay the tax life to calculate the tax liability under composition scheme in both the scenarios we exclude this service even though it is exempt actually aggregate turnover as per section 2 clause 6 includes the exempt supply clear so in 2 6 they are not excluding this but as per explanation 1 and explanation 2 to section 10 while calculating the aggregate turnover to check the eligibility and to calculate the tax payable in the current financial year they are asking to exclude this financial service even though it is exempt all other exempt services we will include but only this we will exclude guys only this we will exclude clear yes next inter say sale or purchase of foreign currency amongst bank or authorized dealers or foreign exchange or amongst banks and such dealers means if there is any currency exchange between banks or between the authorized dealers or between the authorized dealer and bank in that case it is covered here means exempt now assume i went for a bank and i exchange indian rupees into foreign currency in that case whatever service they are providing is it exempt no no <coughs> only if it is exchange between the banks or authorized dealers it is exempt clear and this is important even with respect to the tcs in income tax because they have brought some change with respect to this in between the year so please be careful this part currency exchange and all is important in income tax clear in tcs part that is tax collected at source 27a services provided by a banking company to basic savings bank deposit account holders under pradhan mantri jandan yojana where they're uh, asking the people or encouraging the people to open the accounts not now long back it is completely exempt only with respect to this basic saving bank deposit guys then 34 services by an acquiring bank to any person in relation to a settlement of an amount up to 2000 in a single transaction transacted through credit card debit card charge card or other payment card service is exempt that is when canara bank got like syndicate bank got merged with canara bank as you Canara Bank is making some settlements to the account holders of Syndicate Bank. If it is up to 2000, they are telling it is exempt. If it is more than 2000, obviously it is not exempt. Then life insurance business services, entry 28. Services of life insurance business provided by way of annuity. Annuity means lump sum. Under the National Pension System regulated by Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority of India under the Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority Act 2013 is exempt. Next, 29. Services of life insurance business provided or agreed to be provided by an, the Army, Naval or Air Force Group Insurance Funds to the members of the Army, Navy or Air Force respectively under the Group Insurance Schemes of Central Government. It means here normally the Central Government will act as an employer if they have taken any group insurance or life insurance for their employees like who are working in army and all guys in that case whatever services is provided by the insurance company that is with respect to insurance coverage with respect to the life of these people who are working in the indian army they're telling it's completely exempt okay. 29a services of life insurance provided or agreed to be provided by the novel group insur insurance fund to the personnel of coast guard under the group insurance scheme of the central government is also exempt then services of life insurance provided or agreed to be provided by the central armed force uh, police forces under the ministry of home affairs means under the control of central group insurance fund to their members under the group insurance scheme of the concerned central armed force police force is also exempt all this will fall under actually insurance company is giving services to whom central government because central government will act as an employer here 
they are taking insurance to whom? To their employees. And the employees means not all the employees who are covered here only is exempt. Clear? Huh? So, sir, what about the employees who are working in the office and all government department and all that? They don't enjoy exemption. So, assume these people are from police <coughs> or the force or the army and all. In that case, whatever insurance the central government has taken, life insurance, in the name of this employees, whatever services the insurance company is providing to the central government is exempt. Guys. Then 36, services of life insurance business provided under the following scheme. See, the if following schemes are provided by insurance company to anyone, they are exempt. Guys. Only the following schemes, please be careful. Janastri Bhima Yojana, Aam Admi, Bhima Yojana, not Aam Admi Party, Aam Admi Bhima Yojana, Life Micro Insurance Product as approved by the Insurance Regulatory and Development <coughs> Authority having maximum amount of cover of 2 lakh. Then Varista Pension Bhima Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Jivan Jyoti Bhima Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Vaya Vandan Yojana. This schemes or yojanas provided by the insurance company to anyone is exempt, guys. Clear? Next, services provided by special or specified bodies. <clears throat> Entry 30. Services by the employees, state insurance corporations to the persons governed, governed under the Employee State Insurance Act 1948 is exempt. Services provided by employees provident fund organization to the persons governed under the Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1952 is exempt. Then services by Coal Mines Provident Fund organization to the persons governed by the Coal Mines Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1948 is exempt. Nothing much to explain all here guys. I am just going through the list. Then services by National Pension System Trust to its members against the consideration in the form of administration fee. All these are exempt guys. Somewhere connected to our salary chapter in income tax. Clear. So all this state insurance means obviously these are not straight away covered under direct tax but we have seen PF contribution. ESI, welfare, superannuation, all this we have learnt in direct tax na? under salary head. Clear. And from the employer point of view, under the head PGPP, similar to that, guys. Clear. Huh? Yes. Next, general insurance business services. Entry 35. Services of general insurance business provided under the scheme notified by the government is exempt. And whatever are the schemes notified by the government is big list. I have not covered it here. I have not given it here. You need not worry, guys. Okay. Services by way of reinsurance of the insurance scheme specified in serial number 35. That is sometimes insurance company, if they can't bear the risk alone, they will share it with other insurance company where they will reinsure it. Even that reinsurance is exempt with respect to whatever schemes are notified in entry number 35. Guys. Then pension schemes. <coughs> Services by way of collection of contribution and an adult pension yojana. Whoever is collecting it, normally the employer or any other person. Whoever is collecting the amount and depositing it to the fund or NPS fund is exempt, guys. Even if they are charging any amount, normally the employer and all, they don't charge any amount for collecting and depositing. By chance, if they charge or any other person, you have opened, assume NPS account outside, not with your employer, outside. Even in that case, whatever amount they are charging for collecting and depositing the amount is completely exempt. Services by way of collection on of contribution under the pension scheme of the state governments. Clear? And a petal pension yojana, hope you guys remember, we have covered under section ATCCD in income tax, where the deduction is available for both SSC contribution as well as employer contribution. Okay, guys. Before I proceed further, I will just have a sip of water. Sorry. <coughs> It's a bit challenging to talk continuously for hours together with the camera that too. Yeah, fine guys, we'll continue. Business facilitator or correspondent. Services by the following person in respect of, in respective capacities are exempt guys. Okay, I have, I have explained this after, later with the chart also, but let us first go through the entries. Business facilitator or business correspondent to a banking company with respect to the accounts in rural area branch. With respect to rural area, branch is only exempt. Sir, what if it is an urban area? Not exempt. Okay. Then, any person as an intermediary to a business facilitator. Means agent for a business facilitator. First of all, business facilitator or business correspondent is hired by whom? Banking company. Now, this business facilitator or business correspondent has hired a person. Okay. 
any person as an intermediary to a business facilitator or a business correspondent with respect to services mentioned in entry a that is in rural area even that is exempt okay see we will see later first guys whatever is covered in entry 30a 9a and b read with rcm because there is a connection for rcm also please be attentive look here look here guys come on come on be attentive yeah if agent or intermediary is providing services to a business correspondent sir what about that if it is with respect to rural area exempt guys if it is with respect to urban area then rcm is applicable who is supposed to pay tax in that case who is the supplier agent who is the recipient sir business correspondent who should pay tax sir business correspondent under the rcm this is with respect to services provided in urban areas is that clear yeah. yes now we will go to the next part business correspondent is providing services to the banking company he is taking the service from intermediary or agent and then giving it to the banking company actually banking company has appointed business correspondent and business correspondent has appointed the agent lazy fellow so in that case sir who is the supplier business correspondent who is the recipient banking company if the services is provided with respect to rural area branch it is exempt okay. sir what if it is with respect to urban area branch fcm is applicable FCM is applicable. Who has to pay tax? The supplier. Who is the supplier here? Business correspondent. Clear? Both the category I have covered here, guys. Please be careful. Services by agent to business correspondent. Agent is the supplier. Business correspondent is the recipient. Whereas services supplied by business correspondent to banking company. Who is the supplier? Business correspondent. Who is the recipient? Banking company. Okay, sir. Same way. Just a second. Let me clear all this so that. <clears throat> yeah. Next. Same way. Business facilitator we will take. Business facilitator is giving services to banking company, whereas agent is giving services to business facilitator. First, we will cover this. Who is the supplier here? Agent. Who is the recipient? Business facilitator. If services is given by the agent or intermediary to the business facilitator with respect to rural area branch, it is exempt. Okay, sir. Sir, what if it is with respect to urban area branch? Forward charge is applicable. That means agent is liable to pay tax under forward charge. Clear? Yes, sir. Then, with respect to this service, <coughs> just a second. With respect to the services provided by business facilitator to banking company, who is the supplier business facilitator? Who is the recipient banking company? Okay, sir. Now, let us see. Whatever services the business facilitator is providing, with if it is with respect to rural area branch, exempt, guys. Rural area branch anywhere is exempt. Always remember that. Oh. Sir, what if it is an urban area? RCM is applicable. Who is liable to pay tax? Banking company. Please be careful, guys. Exemption is easy to remember. Wherever it is rural area branch, exempt. But if it is urban area, RCMI, FCMI is important. Try to remember RCM case. If it is not RCM, if it is understood, it is FCM, guys. Clear? Yes. Last one. Business facilitator or a business correspondent to an insurance company in rural area. Oh, oh, oh. business facilitator or business correspondent to an insurance company in rural area. For that, again, I have a separate chart you can see here. So here, who is the supplier, business facilitator or correspondent? Who is the recipient, insurance company? If it is with respect to rural area branch, exempt guys. If it is with respect to urban area branch, forward charge is applicable. Who should pay tax? The business facilitator or correspondent because this item is not covered under RCM. That means obviously it is understood it is taxable under FCM. Clear? I already told you, if something is not covered under RCM and if it is not exempt, that means it is taxable under FCM guys. Clear? Yes. Done with this. Next, services provided to government. To government means who? Government is recipient. Government is recipient here, guys. Okay. Pure services provided to government. Pure means there is no element of goods, guys. Okay. Pure services excluding works contract service or other composite supply involving supply of goods. Means pure services, there is no element of goods here. Provided to whom? Central government, state government or union territory or local authority by way of any activity in relation to any function interested to panchayat or municipality under the constitution is exempt. So for the constructor or the contractor, whoever is providing the pure services, any services, okay, see not only contractor or constructor, anyone who is providing pure services to whom? To the government with respect to any function interested to whom panchayat or municipality under the constitution is exempt, guys. Then composite supply of goods and services to government means a mixture of both goods as well as services. Composite supply of goods and services to which the value of supply of goods constitutes not more than 25% means less than or equal to 25%.
of the value of the set composite supply provided to the central government, state government or union territory or a local authority by way of any activity in relation to function interested to panchayat or municipality under the constitution guys. So here they told to your services. Now they are telling, okay, goods also fine, but maximum 25%. Assume guys, the person who is providing this uh, supply is charging 10 lakh rupees. Maximum in this, how much should be for goods? 2.5 lakh. And for services, 7.5 lakh. Clear means for goods maximum it can be 25 percent or less than that, not more than that. Clear, sir. Uh, by chance, what for goods if it is for goods it is 3 lakh, sir, and for services 7 lakh. It is not covered here, means exemption is not available. <coughs> Clear, uh? yes. 3b services provided to the government authority by way of important guys, new entry, new entry, what is the new entry added? So, services provided to government authority by way of water supply, public health, sanitization, conservancy, solid waste management and slum improvement and upgradation. All these are the responsibility of the government. If at all, if they have outsourced it to anyone, so they are providing services to whom? Government. So whatever services the supplier is providing to the government is exempt. The following services. Lavinia. Services provided by fair, fair price shops to the central government, state government, union territory by way of sale of food grains, kerosene, sugar, edible oil, etc. under public distribution system that is PDS against a consideration in the form of commission or margin means what the shopkeeper will get is a commission or margin for them it is completely exempt guys. Services provided to the central government, state government, union territory under any insurance scheme for which total premium is paid by whom? Tot any insurance scheme, total premium is paid by whom? Central government, state government or union territory. In that case, any scheme is exempt guys, any insurance scheme. 72. Services provided to the state, central government, state government, union territory administration under any training program for which 75% or more of the total expenditure is borne by the central government, state government or union territory administration. Guys, simple. Assume Arivo Pro Academy is providing some training to government employees. Government employees. And for this, they are charging, assume 10 lakh. 10 lakhs or 10 lakh. Huh? Okay, let us take. 1 lakh, 10 lakh is too much, 1 lakh. In that case, they are telling, see, if at least 75% of this expenditure is borne by the government. Assume guys, out of this 1 lakh, whatever is there, government itself is paying 80,000. And remaining 20,000, they are collecting from their employees and giving it. In that case, it is exempt. Sir, what if government is paying only 70,000, remaining 30,000, they are charging to their employees. In that case, it is not exempt, guys. It is not exempt, so it will be taxable for whom? IU Pro Academy as a service provider or training provider. Hope you guys understood. If at least 75% of expenditure is borne by the government, that is either central government, state government or union territory, then they are telling it is exempt. If the amount borne by the government is less than 75% means entire amount would be taxable. Clear up for the service provider. It is clarified that free coaching services provided by the coaching institution and NGOs under the central scheme of scholarship for students with disabilities where 75% or more of the expenditure is borne by the government or to coaching institution by way of grant in aid is covered under this entry and hence it is exempt from GST guys. Clear? Yes sir. Shall legal services again connected to RCM. I have given a chart later. First we will see the entry. Entry number 45. Services provided by an arbitral tribunal means arbitral tribunal here what is covered here is not set up under the law guys because any services provided by an arbitral tribunal which is set up under a law or which is established under a law is covered in negative list which is neither a supply of goods or not nor a supply of services. These are the private okay. or a partnership firm of advocates or an individual as an advocate including senior advocate by way of legal services to whom so they are the providers who is the recipients now any person other than business entity or if it is a business entity with an aggregate turnover of up to such amount in the preceding financial year as it makes eligible for exemption from registration under section under section what 22 of cgst act clear huh? means if the recipient is a business entity we will see whether they are registered or unregistered registered or unregistered in the sense in the last financial year did their turnover cross threshold limit applicable for registration Clear? Yes. Third one, the central government, state government, union territory, local authority, government authority or government entity. Fine. So, what is that? Okay, last one also we will see. 
In addition to above, legal services provided by a partnership firm of advocates or an individual as an advocate other than senior advocate. If senior advocate is providing, it is taxable, guys. Okay. To an advocate or partnership firm of advocates providing legal services is also exempt. It means one advocate providing services to another advocate or advocate providing services to partnership firm or partnership firm providing services to the another partnership firm, legal services. It is exempt. But if senior advocate is providing any legal services to another advocate or partnership firm, it is taxable, guys. It is taxable. Please be careful. I have given a chart here. You can see connecting RCM also. Legal services provided by arbitral tribunal or an individual lawyer, including senior, law firm, etc. To whom, if it is business entity, check whether they are registered. Registered in the sense last year turnover, is it more than threshold limit applicable for registration? If yes, taxable under RCM, reverse charge. If not, exempt this is as per this one clear okay what about like others if the recipient is advocate or firm of advocates it is exempt provided the supplier is not a senior advocate if the supplier is a senior advocate it is taxable guys please be careful if a supplier is a senior advocate it is taxable okay then others including like central government state government unit authority, local authority government authority or government entity in that case, we don't even check whether they are registered or not. It is always exempt, guys. Clear? See, if in these two cases, that is, sorry, okay. In these two cases, I can tell. Even if the services is provided by senior advocate, it is exempt. Whereas in this case, if the services are provided by senior advocate, it is not exempt. Please be careful. Next, sponsorship. <clears throat> sponsorship of sports event. Services by way of sponsorship of sports event organized by a national sports federation or its affiliated federations where the participating teams or individuals represent any district, state, zone or country or by, associate, by an association of Indian University, Inter-University, Sports Body, Sports Board, School Games, Federation of India, All India Sports Council for the Deaf, Paralympic Committee of India or Special Olympics Bharat or by the Central Civil Services Cultural and Sports Board or as a part of national games by an Indian Olympic Association or under a Panchayat Yuva Krida or Kale Abhyan scheme. All these are exempt guys. But please be careful, sponsorship services are also covered under RCM. Sir, what is it? I will quickly go back and tell. Just a second, yeah. You can see here the fourth item. Sponsorship services provided to a body corporate or partnership firm is always taxable under RCM. Clear? Yes, sir. Now going back to our exemption list. Yeah. Now, the following sponsorship services provided of any sporting event is our exempt, guys. Even if the recipient here is a like corp uh, body corporate or partnership firm, still it is exempt. Whereas any other sponsorship services other than this, if it is provided to body corporate or partnership firm, they are liable to pay tax under RC. Clear? Here, obviously, if the following people are the recipient, it doesn't matter whether they are body corporate or partnership firm. It is exempt. In any other case, yes, if, it, if the recipient is a body corporate or partnership firm, it is taxable, guys, under RCM. Clear? Yes. Performance by an artist, entry 78. Services by an artist by way of performance in folk or classical art forms of music or dance or theater. If the consideration charged for such performance is not more than, that is less than or equal to 1,50,000 are exempt from GST. Sir, what if it is more than 1,50,000? Entire amount is taxable, guys. The activities by performing, performing artist in folk or classical art forms of music, dance or theater are exempt if the consideration does not exceed 1,50,000. That is per performance. Clear? Less than or equal to. However, if the consideration for such activities exceeds 1,50,000, entire consideration is subject to GST. However, the exemption shall not apply to the services provided by such artist as a brand ambassador for any brand or any product or service. If they are acting as brand ambassador for which they are getting paid, it is not exempt. Further, all other activities by an artist in other art forms or western music or dance, modern theatres, performance of an actors in films or television serials would be taxable. Similarly, activities of artists in still art forms, example, painting, sculpture making, etc. are also taxable, guys. Next one, skill development services. <coughs> 69, guys, come on. I know you guys are a bit tired, but still, long 
chapter so it will take time i know <coughs> but still just focus guys few more minutes enter 69 any services provided by the national skill development corporation set up by the government of india a sector skill council approved by the national skill development corporation and assessment agency approved by the sector skills council or the national skill development corporation or a training partner approved by the national skill development corporation or the sector skill council in relation to okay provided by means the following people are the supplier in relation to what what services they are providing the national skill development program implemented by the national skill development corporation or vocational that is professional okay vocational is nothing but professional guys skill development course under the national skill certification and monetary reward scheme or any other scheme implemented by the national skill development corporation okay if the following people are providing the following services it is exempt guys okay they are like supplier next 70 services of assessing bodies empaneled centrally by the directorate general of training ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship by way of assessment under the skill development initiative scheme 71 services provided by training providers project, project implementation agencies under deen dayal upadhyaya gramin kaushalya yojana implemented by ministry of rural development government of india by way of offering skill or vocational training courses certified by the national council for vocational training then right to admission to various events <coughs> section uh, entry number 79 services by way of admission to museum national park wildlife sanctuary tiger reserves or zoo it is exempt guys completely exempt irrespective of the amount charged okay then 79 a services by way of admission to a protected monument to so declared under the ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains act 1958 or any other state acts for the time being in force see in these two cases there is no limit with respect to consideration. It is always exempt. Whereas 81, there is some limit with respect to consideration. Services by way of right to admission to circus, dance or theoretical performance, including drama or ballet. Award function, concert, pageant, musical performance or any sporting event other than recognized sporting event. Okay. Whereas sporting event is covered here. Recognized sporting event. Okay. They excluded in B but added in C. Then planetarium. All these are exempt only where the consideration for right to admission to the events or places as referred to clauses A, B, C, D above is not more than 500 per person. That means less than or equal to 500. Sir, what if it is more than 500? Fully taxable. Fully taxable. Okay, sir. Next, services by an unincorporated body or a non-profit entity. Guys, in 7AA, 7-1AA. We have already learnt if any association, body or a club, if they are providing any services to their members, if they are providing any services to their members for which they are charging the consideration, is it a supply? Yes. As per 71AA, it is a supply. Sir. Whether the consideration is received immediately or in the future, it is a supply between the association, body or uh, the club and the members. Clear? Yes. They have given some exemption with respect to this connected to this. What is it? We will see. Entry 77. Services by an unincorporated body or non-profit entity registered under any law to its own members by way of reimbursement of charges or share of contribution as a trade union or for the provision of carrying out any activities which is exempt from levy of GST or up to the amount of 7,500 per month per member. Okay. That is like per house and all for sourcing of goods or services from a third person for the common use of its member in a housing society or a residential complex means in this apartment concept and all guys they charge something called as maintenance if the amount of maintenance is up to 7500 per month per member or per house it they are telling it is exempt okay services provided by an unincorporated body or a non-profit entity registered under any law for the time being in force engaged in the following activities Activities relating to welfare of industrial or agricultural labor or farmers or promotion of trade, commerce, industry, agriculture, art, science, literature, culture, sports, education, social welfare, charitable activities and protection of environment is exempt. Provided whatever they are providing it to their own members against the consideration in the form of membership fees up to 1000 rupees per member per year. If it is more than that, the entire amount would be taxable. Guys. 
clear so here especially here c and here <clears throat> this two the exemption is given based on the amount of consideration then the last category guys other exempt services entry number two services by way of transfer of going concern as a whole or an independent part thereof we have learned already i have mentioned this as a note previously also guys so if by chance sir, i have purchased business asset i have claimed itc i transferred my business as a going concern will it be covered under para one no guys we have given exclusion there only because it is exempt if a business is transferred as a going concern sir will gst be applicable on it because when business is transferred because all the assets and liabilities will be taken over by the successor in that case will it be a supply will gst be applicable on it no guys because show will continue if it is if the business is liquidated or closing down then whatever inventory or stock you have on the date of closing will be deemed to be supplied that is different clear but here you are not closing down your business you are transferring it to someone else as a going concern show will continue but not by me but by a successor okay next services by way of renting of residential dwelling for use as a resident except where the residential dwelling is rented to a registered person taxable under rcm correct we already learned renting of residential dwelling to a registered person if the tenant is registered person under gst rcm is applicable ah, ah. sir what if it is rented out to any other person assume that tenant is not registered under gst exempt it is exempt guys now guys renting of residential dwelling obviously for residential purpose if the recipient is registered recipient is registered rcm if recipient is unregistered then exempt correct ah? yes sir now assume recipient who is registered is a sole proprietor and he has taken the house for his own stay and not to do any business or profession there he is doing the business or profession in some other building office building whereas he has taken the residential building for his own stay along with his family where he is not carrying on any profession even in that case, RCM is applicable, sir. No, RCM is not applicable. So, if the person who is registered, the tenant is registered for his business or professional purpose and the house is taken by him for his own purpose, where he is not doing any business or profession, he is just staying there with his family. In that case, they are given a clarification telling or explanation telling, no, RCM is not applicable. You can see here. This entry shall cover services by way of renting of residential dwelling to a registered person who is a proprietor of a proprietorship concern and rents the residential dwelling in his personal capacity for use as his own residence and such renting in his own account, not for his business or profession, for his own stay and not that of proprietary concern. Guys, simple example I will give. Actually, I am registered under GST. Okay, So, I am registered under GST for my profession. Now, assume I have taken an apartment or a <coughs> house for a stay along with my family. Now, sir, as the registered recipient, should I pay tax under reverse charge mechanism? Guys, no, provided I am not using my house for profession or business. What if by chance if I am using my house as an office along with residential purpose, then RCM will be applicable. Clear? Huh? Yes, this is only in case of sole proprietorship. Sir, what if the recipient is like a company or partnership firm and all? They have taken the building on rent and they are providing it to the employees to stay there. In that case, RCM is applicable? Yes, always. Always. Because this exemption, what they have given in explanation is only for sole proprietors. Please be careful. Then 19C, there is a change in this, guys. Satellite launch services provided by anyone is exempt. Previously, they had provided with some specified suppliers, but now they are telling provided by anyone is exempt. Okay. Next 22, services by way of giving on IR, that is renting, to a state transport undertaking, a motor vehicle meant to carry more than 12 passengers, means more than 12 means normally bus guys, okay. That is if you are renting out, assume you are renting out any uh, bus to state transport undertaking like KSRTC, in that case, it is exempt for you, okay. To a local authority or an electro electrically operated vehicle meant to carry more than 12 passengers, that is electric bus. So, if it is let out to a local authority, it is exempt, guys. Then to a goods transport, agent, uh, goods transport agency, a means of transportation of goods. Now, if you are letting your vehicle to a goods transportation agency, for you it is exempt. Now, 
for goods transport agency is sorry gta that is goods transportation agency whatever transportation service they are providing whether it is exempt whether it is covered under rcm we already seen now here who is the supplier you who is the recipient gta for you they are telling it is exempt if you are giving the vehicle for him to rent and then he is providing the services in that case for you as a supplier they are telling exempt oh provided it is used for transportation of goods motor vehicles okay sir then what if gta only own the vehicle sir they are only owning the vehicle and they are providing the services then there is no question of this point okay, na? this point will arise only when they are taking the vehicle on rent and then providing the services okay guys next motor vehicle for transport of students faculty and staff to a person providing services of transportation of students faculty and staff to an educational institution providing services by way of preschool education and education up to higher secondary school are equivalent guys we already seen here just a second i will quickly go back to educational where are you boy Abba. Hmm. this one transportation of students faculty and staff if school has outsourced it to the others assume school has outsourced it to a transporter so whatever service transporter is giving to the school with respect to transportation of students faculty and staff is exempt now assume this transporter doesn't own the vehicle he is taking it from someone else and then providing the transportation service to school in that case whoever is the person who is providing the supplier is renting the vehicle or bus to the transporter to provide what transportation of students faculty and staff to the school in that case they are telling even for him it is exempt even for him it is exempt sir what if this transporter only own the vehicle and he is providing the transportation of students faculty and staff to the store uh, to the school in that case also it is exempt means that exemption is covered here only okay but please be careful it is only up to 12th yeah for degree college university and all it is not covered yes entry number 23 services by way of access to road or a bridge on payment of toll charges so whatever toll charges we pay on the highways and all is exempt from gst 25 transmission distribution of electricity by an electricity transmission or distribution utility is exempt guys however the following is not exempt what are those however in this regard cbic that is central board of indirect taxes and customs has clarified that the other services provided by discounts that is the distribution companies to consumer against the charges are liable to gst such as means the following services are taxable guys application fee for releasing connection of electricity that is the mm. initial part what you pay for the first time rental charges against metering equipment testing fee for meters transformers capacitors etc labor charges for customers for shifting of meters or shifting of service lines then charges of for duplicate bill all this are taxable guys okay services by way of collecting or providing news by independent journalist or press trust of india or united news of india is exempt then services by way of public libraries by way of lending of books publications or any other knowledge enhancing content or material public libraries are exempt guys or what we call it as free libraries are exempt guys one point connected to this see i along with my wife we have done some videos on the free or public libraries available in bangalore for students and readers so why we did this was to help the students to find out some places to study especially in a place like bangalore there might be some students would have come out from outstation and they might be finding it difficult to study in their pg or hostel or wherever they are staying so we thought okay so if we are doing it if we spend some time on this and if you are doing it it will definitely help some of the students so you can check it out in my youtube channel <coughs> ca vikas goda so there there is a playlist called free libraries in bangalore we have covered various libraries in different part of bangalore so try to make use of it and if possible try to share it to your friends or juniors for whom somewhere it might be helpful guys yeah yes because getting a right environment to study is very very important when i was also a student <clears throat> it was very important for me to find a right place to study so for my final preparation actually I, I used to go to the library from morning to evening or till night actually. I used to stay there. I used to carry my box, have a lunch there, 
so till evening or till like around seven eight o'clock in the night till they close i used to stay there and study which is like a good place because you have a good environment sir environment there or atmosphere there where everyone are busy studying so you will also be forced when you guys are studying at home and all might be like you might your bed might attract you or your tv might attract you or your phone might attract you even when you go to the library you can use in some libraries you can fo use phone but please avoid it guys avoid the phone because that is the major distractor for you guys if you can win your distractions then definitely you will be able to win in your life guys means you will definitely be able to clear this course fine chal services by an organizer to any person in respect of business exhibition held outside india so business exhibition held outside india so you have appointed some event organizing company or event management company or an organizer to organize that exhibition outside india in that case whatever services that organizer is giving is exempt class next services by way of pre conditioning pre cooling ripening waxing retail packing lively uh, labeling of fruits and vegetables which do not change or alter the essential characteristic of the said fruits or vegetables then services provided by national center for cold chain development under the ministry of agriculture Co cooperation and farmers welfare by way of cold chain knowledge dissemination is exempt actually these two are connected to agriculture activity you can study along with that agricultural services next services by a foreign diplomatic mission located in india that is foreign embassy is exempt under gst even in income tax also for them exemptions are given for allowances perquisites and all here also they are given the exemption enjoy next 65a services by way of providing information under rti act that is right to information is exempt last but one services provided to a recognized sports body by so recognized sports body is a recipient here okay by whom who is the supplier so the following people are the supplier okay i should always understand because guys sometimes you may get confused with the supplier and recipients please be careful with that also so who are the suppliers an individual as a player referee umpire coach or team manager for participation in any sporting event organized by recognized sports body or another recognized sports body means recognized sports body giving services to another recognized sports body clear yes sir yes note recognized sports body means an indian olympic association sports authority of india and national sports federation recognized by ministry of sports and youth affairs of central government and its affiliate federations national sports promotion organization recognized by the ministry of sports and youth affairs of the central government then the last one guys 76 services by way of public conveniences such as provision of facilities of bathroom washrooms lavatories urinal or toilets so whenever you guys go to use any public toilets so in front of that they might be sitting they will collect two rupees five rupees ten rupees whatever amount sir are they subject to gst no guys they are not subject to gst yes this is all about the revision of exemption chapter guys so i we have almost took two hours to revise this chapter because it is a very lengthy topic yes guys i would have not explained each and every entry in detail because it is not a regular class as you are aware of wherever explanation is required i have explained it so this much would be more than enough for it from your exam point of view guys because in our regular classes and all i would have covered it in detail so now yes to the extent possible i have covered the explanation wherever it is required wherever it is important hope it was helpful for you so please don't ignore this chapter as i already told you guys Yes, students now we will revise chapter 5 which talks about the place of supply before i revise this chapter we will just revisit the section numbers and see till where we have covered guys so in the first two pages of your study material or revision material if you come i have given the section number of both cgst act and igst act so with respect to igst we have covered it till section 11 guys which talks about exemption whereas coming to IGST we have covered it till section 6 we have covered till section 6 now in this chapter 5 we will be covering only IGST provisions guys only IGST provisions so that is with respect to nature of supply it is given in section 7 8 and 9 nature of supply nature of supply means whether the supply is intrastate supply or interstate supply okay next 
10, 11, 12, and 13 talks about the 10, 11, 12, 13, which talks about place of supply provision. But all four sections are not covered for you. Only two sections are a part of your inter syllabus. Remaining two sections, you guys would be learning it at final level. Is that clear? So in simple, whatever we would be covering it in chapter 5, that is place of supply, is only the provisions what is contained in IGST Act. Is that clear? Yes, sir. With this, we will get started with chapter 5. First concept of supply. We are, we also call it as nature of supply. Guys. Nature of supply, that is whether the supply is intra or inter. Why, sir? Guys, because for intrastate supply, CGST plus SGST or UDGST will be levied. Whereas for interstate supply, IGST would be levied by central government. So it is very important for us to understand whether the supply is interstate supply or intrastate supply. Section 7 of IGST Act will tell the following supplies shall be interstate supplies. What are those? When the location of supplier and place of supply are in the two different states or two different union territories or two different states or one state, one union territory. They are always interstate supply. Guys, assume I am supplying it from Karnataka to Tamil Nadu or I am supplying from Karnataka to Andhra Pradesh or I am supplying from Karnataka to Pondicherry or you are supplying from Pondicherry to Tamil Nadu. All these are interstate supply. Clear? Sir, assume there is a supply from Ladakh to Jammu Kashmir or from Jammu Kashmir to Ladakh. What is it? Interstate supply. Is that clear? Yes. Then import and export will always be interstate supply, guys. Then any supply to or by SEZ developer or SEZ unit. Means if SEZ developer or unit is either the supplier or recipient, it is always interstate supply. Is always interstate supply. Okay. Then coming to intrastate supply. Whenever the location of supplier and place of supply is in the same state or in the same union territory, then we call it as intrastate supply. Guys. That is assume you are in Bangalore. I am supplying for you in Bangalore or in Karnataka, within Karnataka. Or assume I am in Chennai. I am supplying the goods for you or services to you in Chennai. What is it? Intrastate supply. Or both of us went to Pondicherry and we supplied the goods to each other. Sir, what is it? Intrastate supply. Clear? Yes. So, taxable supply, whenever we have to check whether it is intra or inter, when it is intrastate supply is when the location of supplier and place of supply is in the same state. We call it as intrastate supply. And in that case, CGST would be levied by central government, SGST would be levied by the respective state government. Or in case of intra union territory, UDGST would be levied. Then interstate supply, when the location of supplier and place of supply is in two different states, two different union territories, one state and one union territory, it is always interstate supply. And IGST would be levied by the central government and it will be collected by them. Half of it they will keep, the another half they will give it to the destination state or destination union territory. Is that clear guys? Yes. I am talking little loud. Why? Because there is some disturbance happening here guys. There is some work going on here. So don't mind me why I am talking loud so that you guys don't hear that sound. Clear? Huh? Yes. <clears throat> Next, supply in territorial waters. Sir, if the supplier is in territorial waters, the location of supplier or if the supply is in territorial waters, then the place of supply will be where in the coastal state or union territory closest to the baseline. Assume guys, I am supplying the goods to you on water, territorial waters assume in Chennai or in Tamil Nadu. In that case, where is the location of supplier or where is the place of supply? It will be in Tamil Nadu. Clear? Same way on territorial water, assume in Andaman and Nicobar, I supplied some goods to you on territorial waters. In that case, sir, what is the place of supply? What is the location of supplier? Nearest union territory there. That is Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Is that clear? Yes, guys. So here, to decide the nature of supply or concept of supply, Two things are important, location of supplier and place of supply. Location of supplier, they are not defined in the law. Location of supplier is always means where the supplier is registered. Where the supplier is registered. And place of supply, what is place of supply? They have covered it in IGST Act. Let us see. GST is a destination based tax. The tax is always levied at a place where the goods or services are consumed. Means ultimately tax is borne by whom guys? Consumers rather than place where they are produced. Place of supply is the place where the supply is consumed. Thus, place of supply determines the jurisdiction where the tax revenue should reach. So, destination-based consumption tax, I told you, even in case of interstate supply, 
half of the revenue out of the central government what they have collected as IGST, IGST, where the half will go to the destination state, not to the origination state. Please be careful with it. So now coming to the place of supply with respect to the goods, as per section 10, the provision determining the place of supply of goods in case of domestic transaction, it doesn't cover the import or export. Sir, what are those? We will see one by one. When supply involves movement of goods, means guys, whenever there is a movement of goods of between the supplier and recipient, we have to apply this. Sir, what is the place of supply? Location of the goods at the time at which movement of goods terminates, means where they are delivered for delivery to the recipient. Okay. Where the goods are delivered to the recipient or any other person on the direction of the third party. Guys, assume <coughs> Rocky Bai ordered the goods with Pushpa. Rocky Bai ordered the goods with Pushpa and asked him, ask Pushpa to deliver it to Bahubali. Deliver it to Bahubali. So, who ordered it? Rocky Bai. But Pushpa is delivering it to whom? Delivery is happening to Bahubali. So, your invoice will be issued to whom, guys? In the name of Rocky Bai. Agree, na? So, invoice always will be issued in the name of Rocky Bai. Clear? Even though the goods are delivered to Bahubali, in GST, we are assuming, we are deeming Rocky Bai as a deemed recipient. We are considering Rocky Bai as whom? Deemed recipient. Guys, this goods actually might be sold by Rocky Bai to Bahubali also. That is a different supply. We are not talking about that. But now, Rocky Bai ordered the goods to Pushpa to deliver it to Bahubali. In this case, even though the goods are physically delivered to Bahubali, Rocky Bai is considered as deemed recipient. Okay, now, nah? yes. So, place of supply of such goods shall be the principal place of supply of business that is of third party. So, who is the third party? In my example is Rocky Bai. So, whatever is the principal place of business of Rocky Bai? Principal place of business of Rocky Bai is there. That is the place of supply. Guys. Clear? Here, Rocky Bai is considered to be the third party. Because the goods are delivered by Pushpa to Bahubali. They are the two parties. But who ordered it? Rocky Bai. So, in that case, they are naming in the law that he is a third party, but he is deemed to be the recipient. It is as if he has received the goods. And what is the place of supply? Principal place of business of Rocky Bai. And not where the goods are delivered. Because goods are delivered to Bahubali. So, is that considered as place of supply? No, guys. Next, where there is no movement of goods in, in a supply. Sir, there is no movement at all. Means, recipient went to supplier's place like mall, shopper, shop or any places and he purchased the goods. In that case, or Tata Chromo, <clears throat> you went to the place or a mall or supplier's place and you buy bought the goods there only. In that case, location of such goods at the time of delivery to the recipient means the place where you have bought it. That's in simple because obviously they, it will be delivered there only. And one important thing, there is a new addition here. With respect to this, please be careful. New addition, new addition. <clears throat> Where an unregistered person, means the recipient is an unregistered person, purchases the goods over the counter, that is in any mall or Tata Chromo or Shopper Stop or any other apparel showrooms, guys. In one state, okay, over the counter is purchasing in one state and thereafter transport the goods to another state, that is his own state. Assume I, I am an unregistered, assuming I am an unregistered person under GST, I went to Tamil Nadu, purchased some goods over the counter and I bought it to Karnataka. And I bought those goods to Karnataka. In that case, address of the unregistered person recorded in the invoice is the place of supply. If it is recorded in the invoice. Even if the name of the state is mentioned is enough. Assume, for me, invoice is issued telling Vikas is from Karnataka. In that case, what is the place of supply? Karnataka. If the address of the recipient pers uh, unregistered person is not recorded in the invoice, that is my address or state is not recorded in the invoice. In that case, location of supply. That is Tamil Nadu in my example. Hope it is clear. Guys, please be careful. This is an addition. <clears throat> please take care of it. Next, where the goods are installed or assembled at site, like AC or any other like machinery and all. So sometimes when we have purchased, they will come and install it for free. In that case, even TV and all. Place of such assembly or installation will be the place of supply. Next, where the goods are supplied on a board or a conveyance, that is during the transportation, during the travel, they are purchased, they are supplying some goods to you including the food and all 
in that case location where such goods are taken on board not where it is supplied where it is taken on board before it is supplied to you that is the place of supply because when exactly it is supplied to you assume because when you are traveling you would have seen so many things like books especially in train they come and sell many items like books food and all now <coughs> for that should they check exactly where did they deliver at what station they delivered it to you no no at what point did they take those goods on board is the place of supply guys is that clear yes then place of supply in case of import and export of goods is contained in section 11 of igst act which is not a part of your inter syllabus guys good good news for you and actually place of supply is a new provision which is added for you at inter level previously it was completely covered in final but now out of the four section two sections they have brought at inter level guys so new topic somewhere it might be important guys so please take care of it <coughs> next and one more thing guys before i continue guys hope you guys are already aware of the institute has come out with a revised timetable nothing no major changes so for those whoever was waiting that exam will be postponed after june or in june so might be they would have felt bad guys i have kept on telling there are few things which are not in your control please stop worrying about it so the external factors which we cannot change even if i am thinking about it or if i am waiting for it can we change it no so always as a student one responsibility you have is your preparations whether the exams is conducted in may now whether it is in june or even some people might be worried sir what exams are in september or november so they have told that the exams will be conducted three times in a year now foundation and inter so for what exam should i prepare guys whatever your is your respective attempts prepare for it even if there is any shuffling reshuffling or anything guys ultimately you will write one or the other day you will write the exam clear plus minus of few days or few months can happen but can we change that no so please stop worrying about what will happen in the future what if there is any change so fine now my state they have kept the exam on the election date only or before the election date or after the election date how will i vote guys yes i can understand during the exam it is very difficult for you to go and vote but still if possible try to vote if not okay ultimately your exam is very very important but i strongly suggest you guys to vote okay and most of you will be voting for the first time don't miss it guys but if it is just on the exam day or before the exam day or after the exam day sir we are not at all able to go and vote there because i have to stand in the queue and waste the time so it will be very time taking for me if that is the case as a last resort okay guys don't think about it and waste much time and who will win the election who will win the ipl <coughs> don't worry all this will not add anything yes even i am a cricket fan our rcb women's have won the cup for us we celebrated okay done fine move ahead move ahead guys because we have to win in our life more than anything else we have to win in our life that is important clear so please focus on your studies now whoever is means writing especially in may guys just focus okay now the dates are announced you know you have a clarity when exam is exactly connect, uh, conducted please focus on your studies no nothing else don't worry about anything else guys if any announcement is done by ICI or anything related to my subject, I will definitely be updating in my telegram channel. So you will get to know there. Please don't give ears to any rumors guys. There will be saying telling sir for taxation now three days gap are there. So I feel the exam question paper would be tough. <coughs> so or else the evaluation would be tough. Sir, how will it be? Don't worry guys. If it is tough for you, it is tough for everyone. Don't worry about it. Why? But I, I am assured that once you guys watch all this statutory update, revision videos or marathon videos, everything, you guys will be master of taxation and you will definitely score above 60 guys. That is assurance which I can give provided you take care of preparation as well as the presentation in the exam. Yeah. So I have that belief in you guys. You should also self belief yourself. So have that positive mindset over all the papers or all the subjects and go for it guys clear and for taxation especially three days of gaps is there make maximum utilization of it 
make maximum utilization of it so even during the three days you can keep one on one day for direct tax video and two the second day for indirect tax video another one day you can study by your own clear huh? so both direct tax and indirect tax revision or marathon videos will be available for you yes sir watch both the videos one one day sing single day and the third day you study and uh, even on the exam day you will get that half day mere case of it guys make the maximum utilization of the opportunity you have got especially for taxation paper try to score maximum guys <clears throat> okay so we'll continue place of supply of services where location of supplier and recipient both are located in india that is both location of supplier as well as recipient both are in india okay na so section 12 what is it talking about <clears throat> general principle first guys general principle is when the special cases is not applicable okay if it is first check always special cases if s yes, apply the respective provision if not always general so first i have given general what is it we will see if the recipient is registered then location of recipient if recipient is unregistered still location of recipient if address exist if there is no address then location of supplier will be the place of supply okay this is the general principle next exception or special cases if there is any services related to immobile property lodging accommodation accommodation for functions that is like convention hall and all guys or party hall ancillary services to the above like decoration and all <coughs> then location where the immobile property is located if the location of immobile property or a boat or a vessel is located outside india then always location of recipient sir what if the immobile property location is more than one state then we have to take proportionately as per the contract between the supplier and recipient or as per the rules then beauty parlor fitness or restaurant and catering services plastic or cosmetic surgery etc location where such services is performed is a place of supply then training and performance appraisal check whether a recipient is registered if yes location of recipient if not location where the service is actually performed clear yeah? yes admission to cultural artistic sporting educational entertainment amusement event etc and ancillary services place where the event is held or where the park of such park or such place is located like wonderland or organization of above events including conferences fair exhibition etc ancillary services or assigning of sponsorship of such events if recipient is registered location of recipient if recipient is not registered place where the event is actually held sir what if the event is held outside india then location of recipient location of recipient sir what if the event is held for in more than one state then take proportionately transportation of goods or passenger if recipient is registered location of recipient if recipient is not registered then location where the transportation of goods or passengers starts okay that is starting point on board a conveyance while in transit that is during the transportation if any service is provided that what is the place of supply sir location of first scheduled point of departure of that conveyance for the journey even for goods where the goods are taken on board na whereas for services first scheduled point of departure guys next banking and financial services and stock broking services location of the recipient of services if address exist on the records if not location of supplier insurance services location of recipient of service clear guys see majority of the places they are like considering whether the recipient is registered or not if recipient is registered yes location of recipient if not some other alternative okay then with respect to telecommunication services including data transfer broadcasting cable tv services etc telecom license line uh, telecom line uh, <clears throat> that is fixed telecom line guys that is with respect to landline and all place of fixing or installation of that landline then postpaid mobile or internet services billing address of the recipient then prepaid mobile internet dth services if you are getting it through selling agent reseller distributor then address of that selling agent or reseller or distributor in the records of supplier then by any person to final subscriber location where the pre payment is received or a place of sale of voucher that voucher and all is coming means <coughs> it's not having so much relevance now or reality previous and all it is to be there you can buy the voucher of 10 rupees 20 rupees 100 rupees 1000 rupees like that and all when payment made through electronic mode that is sir i am getting recharge through my paytm or through <coughs> google pay phone pay then location of the recipient in the records of supplier in any other cases address of the recipient as per the records guys if address is not available then the place of supplier of services yeah yes sir. 
sir what if location of supplier or location of recipient is outside india then the place of supply has to be determined as per section 13 of igst act which is not a part of your inter syllabus guys which is not a part of your inter syllabus guys one shortcut which i can give here is check whether it is b2b supply b2b supply means both supplier and recipient is registered under gst in that case in majority of the cases what is the place of supply means it is location of recipient location of recipient if not maybe location of supplier or any other alternate they would have given clear this is just a shortcut may not be in every case but in majority of the case if it is a b2b supply means if recipient is also registered then what is the place of supply location of recipient guys is that clear yes small topic but a new topic at inter level please be careful with it so whatever provisions we have covered in this chapter guys entirely is from which act come on which act cgst or igst igst act both with respect to nature of supply or concept of supply whatever we have covered that is section 7 8 and 9 then <clears throat> with respect to place of supply we covered what 10 11 is not a part of your syllabus 12 and 13 13 is also not a part of your syllabus all this is a provisions contained in igst act guys we are done with this chapter <clears throat> fine guys now we will revise chapter 6 which talks about time of supply means when supply has taken place accordingly the liability to pay gst would be decided guys so time of supply provisions is covered in section 12 13 and 14 of cgst act but what is covered for your inter syllabus is only section 12 and 13 14 you will be learning it at final level fine we'll just see some introduction about this time of supply topic time is the essence of levy tax is imposed when the supply is made Hence, it is important to understand that what is the time of supply. Once the time of supply is decided, levy will be made. Means, person will get to know when he is liable to pay GST. Point of ta taxation means the point in time when goods have been deemed to be supplied or services have been deemed to be provided. The point of taxation enables us to determine the rate of tax, value and due dates for payment of taxes. Time of supply indicates the point in time when the liability to pay tax arises. Means they are not telling you how to pay tax at the time of supply. Time of supply will decide, okay, this is when you are uh, supplied. This is when you are supplied. Based on that, we have to decide what is the due date for payment. So, time of supply is not the due date of payment. guys. It is important to note here the, though, that though the liability to pay tax arises at the time of supply, the same can be paid to the government by the due date prescribed with reference to the said time of supply. So, for example, guys, assume time of supply is, is in on any date, on any date of March. In that case, so time of supply means uh, GST has to be paid on the same day. No. So, the liability that is the due date of payment, due date of payment normally will fall in next month, that is in April. That is in April. Hope you understood. Means time of supply will decide when supply has taken place, which creates the liability. When this liability has to be paid, what is the due date for payment is not the actual time of supply. Based on time of supply, we will decide, okay, what is the due date of payment? So for any supply for which time of supply is in March, the due date of payment normally will be in the next month. That is in April, guys. So I have given the example here. <coughs> you can see. If the time of supply of a given supply is 15th October, so as per uh, time of supply provision, we have decided the time of supply is 15th October. The tax liable thereon would be payable latest by when? 20th November. 20th November, which is the due date prescribed in the CGST Act for suppliers filing GST return on monthly basis. So for any supply, if the person is following the monthly returns, the due date of payment is 20th of next month. That is nothing but the due date to file GST at 3B. So, if the time of supply is on any date of a month, the due date of payment would be 20th of next month, guys. Is that clear? So, in simple, again, I am repeating because there is high chances that students will get confused. Time of supply will decide when supply has taken place. Based on that, we will decide the due date of payment, guys. Clear? So, before we start, so section 12 talks about time of supply for goods and section 13 talks about time of supply of services. And section 14 talks about change in the rate of tax, which is not a part of your inter syllabus, guys. So, before I start with time of supply, I have just given one chart here, guys. Let me explain it. Which what we have, which is what we have learned till now. 
first step is what we will identify whether the activity or a transaction is it a supply for which we will apply what section 7 that is 71a 71aa 71b 71c red which schedule 1 so based on this we will decide whether the activity or transaction is a supply so section 7 red which schedules 1 okay once an activity is a supply we need to identify whether it is a supply of goods or supply of services for which we have to uh, refer to section 71a red which schedule 2 section 71 capital a red which schedule 2 okay then check whether the supply is covered in negative list <coughs> then check the uh, supply is covered in negative list that is section 7 subsection 2 red with schedule 3 if yes that is neither a supply of goods nor a supply of services guys next check whether the any supply of goods or services is covered in exemption list for which we have to refer to section 11 of cgst act or section 6 of igst act red with notification clear yes sir if these two things are there on which gst is not applicable we have to remove it so these two are like a minus then we get what taxable supply then taxable supply check whether it is an intrastate supply or interstate supply for which we have to refer to what nature of supply which we already covered in the previous chapter intrastate supply means what when loss pass is in the same state or union territory we call it as intrastate supply that is cgst or sgst or utgst would believe it sorry cgst plus sgst or utgst would believe it when loss and pass is in two different state or union territory or one state and one union territory then what do we leave? Always IGST. Loss means location of supplier, pass means pass, uh, place of suppliers. Okay, sir. Then we also have to decide. We decided the nature of supply. Who is liable to pay GST? Supplier or recipient or electronic commerce operator. First, we should always see these two lines, guys. Okay. Electronic commerce operator, we have seen 9.5, read with section 5.5 of IGST Act, 9.5 of CGST Act, 5.5 of IGST Act, RAT. Rat services, Rat Tatra, I explained a story. Yes, sir. If not, check the RCM list. That is section 9.3 along with 9.4. 9.4 is not a part of your inter syllabus. So, 9.3 along with 5.3 of IGST Act. 9.3 of CGST Act, 5.3 of IGST Act. So, if any services are covered under RCM list because goods is not a part of your syllabus, in that case, recipient is the one who will pay tax under river charge mechanism, guys. Next, if it is not covered, if there is any taxable supply which is not covered in any of this scenario, then it is always taxable under forward charge mechanism, where the supplier is the one who is liable to pay tax, guys. So, forward charge mechanism is as per section 9.1 of CGST Act or 5.1 of IGST Act. 9.2 and 5.2 talks about 5 petroleum products which is temporarily kept outside GST. So, as of now, no one is liable to pay GST on it. But any day, those items might be included under GST. Yes. Clear? Yes. So, <clears throat> so, these are the three person. Any of this three person will be liable to pay GST, guys. Now, we are okay. Sir, we have understood who is liable to pay GST. So, we have got the answer for who. Now, we have to see when. When are they liable? When the supply is made? So, we have to understand that, yes. For which we have to refer to what time of supply so time of supply will answer to the question when when supply took place when supply took place clear guys yes <clears throat> so we'll get into section 12 where i have given a single chart for the time of supply of goods section 12 of cgst act the liability to pay tax on goods shall arise at time of supply as determined in terms of provisions of this section 12 subsection 1 that is like an ending so 12 subsection 2 talks about forward charge mechanism guys under forward charge mechanism who is the one who is liable to pay tax supplier so you should always think from supplier point of view earlier of the following two dates what are those sir? date of issue of invoice or due date of or issue of invoice whichever is earlier whichever is earlier is what time of supply sir what is the due date to issue invoice sir it is given here as per section 31, invoice must be issued within what time? Supply invoice, movement of goods on or before the time of removal of the goods. Guys, please be careful. Don't get confused with place of supply. That is different. What we are now discussing is time of supply. For time of supply, one of the criteria is due date to issue invoice for which we are referring to section 31. In section 31, due date to issue invoice is given. Okay. So when there is a movement of goods between supplier and recipient, what is the due date to issue invoice? on or before the time of removal of goods 
Sir, when there is no movement involved, then on or before the delivery of the goods to the recipient. Sir, what if it is continuous supply of goods? <coughs> means supplier is supplying the goods day in, day out to the recipients or every day, every week, every month like that. In that case, on or before the issuance of each statement of account or each payment is received. Means once in a while, like once in a month or once in a week, the supplier would be sending the statement of accounts to the recipient then or when he is receiving the payment. Okay. Goods are supplied on approval for sale or return basis, which you guys would have learned in accounts in foundation. On or before the time of supply or six months from the date of removal of the goods, whichever is earlier, means they are trying to tell indirectly maximum time which the supplier has to give to the recipient is six months to either accept the goods or to reject it. Within six months, if the goods are accepted by the recipient, obviously it is a supply. So on the date of acceptance or before that, you have to issue the invoice. Sir, supplier has sent the goods within six months till the recipient has not accepted the goods nor rejected the goods. Assume the supplier has given good amount of time, 10 months to the recipient. In that case, at the end of six months, it will be considered as deemed supply. Means deemed acceptance by the recipient and supplier will be liable to pay tax. So on what day is issued, is due to issue the invoice, on what day is supposed to issue invoice, at the end of six months from the date of sending the goods guys okay sir this is with respect to forward charge now coming to reverse charge mechanism so whenever we are applying the reverse charge mechanism we have to think it from recipient point of view because who is liable to pay tax here recipient so he should know when is he liable okay earlier of the following dates three dates are there date of receipt of goods that is when he is receiving it or 31st day from the date of issue of invoice it is like 30 days following the issue of invoice guys. So 31st day you have to take. 31st day from the date of issue of invoice. Then date of payment. Please be careful. No, not the due date because the person who is supposed to issue invoice is supplier. So they are not talking about that. So here for the recipient we are supposed to take what? Not the actual date of invoice. 31st day from the date of issue of invoice. Or date of payment. Sir, what is date of payment? Recipient is making the payment or receiving it? Is making it guys. To whom? Supplier. So date of payment is earlier of the date of debit in the bank account of the recipient because when recipient is making obviously his bank account would be debited yes and the date of recording the payment in the books of accounts by the recipient clear earlier of the two things date of debit in the bank account of the recipient or the date of recording the payment when am I recording the payment in my books of accounts whichever is earlier clear huh? yes next coming to vouchers. <coughs> Section 12, subsection 4. Supply is identifiable at the time of issue of voucher. Means, if at the time of issue of voucher, if it is known for what purpose the voucher can be used or can be redeemed, then the date of issue of voucher is the time of supply. No, sir. At the time of issue of voucher, we didn't know what for what purpose it can be used exactly. We are telling you can use it to buy anything in shopper stock. You can use it to buy anything in Tata brand or Tata Chromo. In that case, supply is not identifiable at the time of issue of voucher. So what will be the time of supply? Date of redemption. Date of redemption. At the time of issue of voucher, assume it is given only to buy pizza in Domino's Pizza. Clear? Or the burger in the McDonald's. In that case, it is identifiable. What is the time of supply? Date of issue of voucher. If it is not identifiable, like sir, voucher is given, voucher is given to buy anything in Tata Chromo or shopper stock or to buy anything there. In that case, it is not identifiable for what purpose it will be used. In that case, the date of redemption will be the time of supply, guys. Next, residuary cases. Residuary cases should be should apply only when subsection 2, 3, and 4 is not possible, guys. What is it, sir? When a periodical return is to be filed. So means the uh, person is filing the returns under the GST. Then the due date of filing such returns, whether he's filing monthly returns or quarterly returns, whichever returns, what is the due date of filing that return will be the time of supply. No, sir, he's not filing the returns also, but still is liable to pay GST. In that case, the date of payment or whatever date he paid the payment that is considered as time of supply. And this is like a worst scenario, guys. Clear, huh? Yes. Sir, what if there is any addition in the value of supply? by way of interest, late fee or penalty, means supplier is charging something addition. First, he sold the goods for 1 lakh. As the recipient has delayed the payment, 
is charging some interest late fee or penalty guys interest late fee penalty here is charged by whom supplier to whom recipient so recipient is paying what interest late fee or penalty to whom to the supplier why for the delay in payment in that case for this interest late fee or penalty the time of supply will be the date on which the supplier receives such amount clear guys assume supplier has supplied the goods to the recipient for 1 lakh and he has told if you don't supply the if you don't make the payment within one month you have to pay interest of 10,000 assume recipient is making the payment after one month in that case he ended up paying how much guys totally 1 lakh 10,000 so what is the time of supply means for 1 lakh we have to apply section 12 subsection 2 guys whereas for 10,000 we have to apply this last section that is 12 subsection 5 is that clear addition so it will be two different time of supply for 1 lakh different date and for 10,000 different date might be there is that clear because as we are applying two different sections this is all about the time of supply of goods guys and there is no separate time of supply for electronic commerce operator guys means there is no specific or special time of supply for electronic commerce operator clear up yes <clears throat> note in case of specified actionable claim this is a new thing added please be careful with this in case of specified actionable claims the supplier is liable to pay tax at the time of receipt of payment the other things will not matter here in case of specified actionable claim the supplier is liable to pay tax when the date of receipt of payment clear up please be careful this is a new addition even in negative list we have seen actionable claims other than specified actionable claims actually actionable claims is a part of schedule 3 means outside the gst but in schedule 3 they have excluded specified actionable claim means on specified actionable claim is gst applicable sir yes guys it is applicable so supplier when is he liable to pay tax at the time of receipt of payment clear huh? yes we need not check this pay date of issue of invoice due date of issue of invoice and all we need not check it okay then coming to section 13 that is applicable for services the liability to pay tax on services shall arise at the time of supply as determined in terms of provisions of this section section 13 1 so it is as per section 13 1 and guys actually what is covered in electronic commerce operator is services only not goods that is a is only services what is it restaurant accommodation transportation of passengers and housekeeping through electronic commerce operator agree na? all these are services sir for services supplied through electronic commerce operator on which electronic commerce operator is liable to pay tax is there any specific provision or special provision for that electronic commerce operator no there is no special provisions as such guys clear up because wrath is only covered under services please be careful with it okay <clears throat> first we will see forward charge whenever you are seeing the forward charge you should always think it from supplier's point of view forward charge mechanism section 13 subsection 2 when invoice has been issued on time under section 31 so on time means sir what is the time to issue invoice first we will see guys what is that time to issue the invoice or what is the due date to issue invoice is given in section 31 let us see it time limit for issue of invoice is as follows taxable supply of services invoice must be issued within 30 days from the date of supply of services means when the sub supply of service is completed within 30 days on or before that invoice has to be issued whereas in case if the supplier is banking company insurance company or financial institution or nbfc instead of 30 days they are giving 45 days time guys if the following people are the suppliers that is banking company insurance company financial institution and nbfc okay this is in general cases where the sir, if by chance if the question is silent about the supplier always take 30 days guys if they're specifically given that the supplier is a bank insurance company and all then apply 45 days clear huh? yes where the supply involves continuous supply of services invoice must be issued on or before what date due date of payment where the contract specifies the due date okay if there is a contract between the supplier and recipient if there is a due date of payment in the contract then on or before that due date invoice has to be issued next date of receipt of payment where due date is not there next date of completion of milestone event where the payment is linked to the completion of milestone event means now the recipient has told my uh, supplier only if you do so and so work assume you have construct completed the construction of first floor second floor only then i will give the payment if the payment is linked to the completion of a milestone event 
then the <coughs> then the due date to issue invoice is the date of completion of that milestone event guys is that clear again this is our complete continuous supply of services sometimes they may not tell the category of services and all guys in that scenario please always apply 30 days criteria clear yes next so what is the <coughs> time of supply sir under forward charge mechanism as per section 13 subsection 2 when invoice has been issued on time as per section 31 then earlier of the following dates what are those date of issue of invoice or date of receipt of payment sir what if the invoice is not issued within the time given under section 31 then we are not taking the date of issue of invoice in place of that what are we taking date of provision of service means on what day service was completed or was provided clear the date on which service is completed or the date on which the service is provided or date of pay receipt of payment whichever is earlier sir what is the date of receipt of payment i have given here at the bottom you can see the date of receipt of payment would be earlier of the date of credit in the supplier's bank account because here supplier is not making the payment he will be receiving it so it is credit not debit please be careful clear i don't get confused for this guys this was from recipient's point of view section 12 subsection 3 okay that is why we saw their debit and now we are thinking from whose point of view supplier's point of view that is why it is credit supplier will receive the payment okay date on which the payment is recorded in the books of accounts of the supplier whichever is earlier means on what day has recorded the entry bank to so and so party so on what day has recorded the payment entry in the books receipt of payment or the date on which is bank account is credited whichever is earlier guys next reverse charge mechanism as per section 13 subsection 3 <coughs> So, you guys, so guys, you know, see, easy to remember, subsection 3 is always about RCM. RCM, what we learned, is covered in which section, guys? 9, 3. 3 is not looking like a 3. Or 5, 3. Agree, na? So, here also subsection 3. 12 subsection 3 is for RCM of goods, whereas 13 subsection 3 is with respect to RCM of services, guys. Easy to remember. So, subsection 3, whether it is of section 9 of CGST Act or section 5 of IGST Act or whether section 12 or 13 with respect to time of supply. Subsection 3 is always RC. Yeah. Okay. Earlier of the following dates. We are here we have to think from whose point of view? Recipient point of view. 60 first day from the date of issue of invoice or date of payment, guys. Please be careful. For goods, it was 31st day. Please don't get confused. For goods, it is 31st day. Whereas for services, they are giving some long time, extended time, almost double, double only. Okay. 31 into 2 will be 30, 62, but here it is 61. Okay. Yes. Date of payment means who? Guys, here recipient is making the payment or receiving it? He is making it. So, date of debit or credit in bank account? Debit. Okay. Date of payment is earlier of date of debit in the bank account of the recipient and the date of recording the payment in the books of account by the recipient. Clear? On what day is recording the payment entry or the date on which his bank account is debited? Whichever is earlier, guys. So, please be careful. Don't get confused with the words debit and credit. When you are talking from supplier's point of view, it is credit because he will get the payment. So, in his bank account, the amount will be credited. Whereas, when we are talking from recipient point of view, it is debit because the amount would be debited from his account when he is making the payment. Okay. Then, with respect to voucher, residual cases and the addition in the value with respect to interest, late fee and penalty, this provision is same like goods. Guys. Same to same like goods. Yeah. So, this three, if you have studied, that is subsection 4, 5 and 6. If you have studied for goods, for services also copy paste. Clear? Huh? Yes. Whereas, obviously, subsection 2 and 3 is different. Clear? Always try to identify. Whenever something is like this, try to identify what is the difference. Clear? Huh? Yes. So, especially here, it is 31 days, whereas there it is 61 days. And here, date of receipt of goods is there, whereas for services, date of receipt of service is not there. Because as service is intangible and all, we cannot exactly tell when it is received and all. Yeah, so that is why date of receipt of service is not there. Clear guys? Yes, sir. So <clears throat> this is all about the time of supply provisions, guys. So coming to the sections, we have covered three sections of CGST Act here. Time of supply of goods, time of supply of services, change in the rate. We have not covered, but it is like implied. As it is not a part of your syllabus, it is as if we have covered it. Clear? So next chapter is all about value of supply. Only one section we will be covering value of supply guys.
Yes, my dear students. Now we will revise chapter 7 which talks about value of supply. Important topic guys because GST is more about theory. Whereas there are two topics where they can ask numerical question. One is value of supply. The other one is GST liability calculation. So GST liability calculation including the input tax credit part means they may ask a question with respect to like how much GST has to be paid through electronic cash ledger or what is the minimum amount of GST which the supplier has to pay. So there we have to take care of output tax along with the input tax credit adjustment and in what order it has to be adjusted everything we have to take care. Clear up that is one part of the question or is the other question on which numerical can be asked is value of supply topic guys. These are the two topics where they can ask numerical question like with respect to calculations. So please be careful I guess I feel that these two topics are very important because in GST they cannot ask all the theory questions only. They cannot ask all the theory questions guys and what I have seen in the past exam is either of these two either on the value of supply or on the GST liability calculation normally on this topic they are asking mandatory question in descriptive type. That, that is the first question in descriptive type normally will be either on value of supply calculation or GST liability guys. Fine. So accordingly, please give little extra importance for these topics. Yeah. So now we have understood till now already who is liable to pay tax, when they are liable to pay tax. So now on what value they are liable to pay tax? On what value are they liable to pay GST? Means obviously there should be a value on which GST should be levied. Na? Yes, sir. So what is that value? That is given in section 15 of CGST Act, guys. Section 15 of CGST Act states that the value of taxable supply is nothing but transaction value. Section 15 is applicable for both interstate supply as well as intrastate supply. There is no separate provisions for value of supply in IGST. Same to same provision whatever we learn in section 15 of CGST Act same to same is applicable for both intra as well as interstate supply. Okay. Now let us understand what is transaction value. Transaction value means price actually paid or payable for the supply of goods or services or both. Who will pay to whom? Recipient to supplier. Where the supplier and recipient are not related and the price is the sole consideration for the supply. There is nothing called in kind and all. All these three conditions has to be satisfied guys. Sir, what if one of the condition is not satisfied? For example, we have learned in section 71C read with schedule 1 that even without consideration there are four activities which is considered as supply. What about that sir? For that value of supply will not be determined as per section 15. We have to check valuation rules. We have to apply valuation rules which is again not a part of your inter syllabus. Yeah. Yes. Sir, what if supplier and recipient is related? Should we apply section 15? No guys. Again valuation rules. Again valuation rules. So whenever there is no consideration or there is a consideration but not in money or supplier and recipient is related. In that case, we cannot determine the value as per section 15. We have to apply the valuation rules, which you guys would be learning at final level. So now let us see section 15 part. Transaction value or value of supply is nothing but the price which the supplier is charging to the recipient plus certain inclusions are there under section 15 too. And discount has to be removed as per section 15. 3. Very important guys and very small topic, very easy for you to score. So the format I have given here, what all has to be added, what all has to be deducted. Guys, every item might not come in the exam. Might be they may ask like three, four items with respect to addition or discount deduction they may ask. So please be careful. Only when you know everything, okay, whatever they have asked, you guys can take it. So what we will start with, price actually paid or payable for the goods or services. Okay, we will take that. This is normally what the supplier is charging to the recipient. Inclusions. If at all, if any of these items are there, which is not included in the above price, what we have to do? Add it to the above price. Add it to the above price. What are those, sir? One by one. First item. Any taxes, duties, says fees and charges levied under any law other than GST because obviously now we are we calculating value to determine the GST liability. So before calculating GST liability, will you add GST? No. no. So any tax other than GST if charged separate, separately by the supplier. So if supplier is charging it separately, he was liable to pay it, but he is charging it to the recipient. But that amount is not included in the price. So in that case, what should we do? Add it guys. We have to add it. Then any amount that the supplier is liable to pay, but which has been incurred by the recipient of the supply. For example, supplier would have purchased raw material from someone for whom he has asked recipient, hey, you pay for it. 
in that case even the recipient has not directly paid it to the supplier he has paid to a person for whom supplier was liable to pay it is as if he has paid to the supplier as if the recipient has paid to the supplier guys should it should we include it in the value of supply yes then incidental expenses including commission and backing charged by the supplier to the recipient and any amount charged for anything done by the supplier at the time of or before delivery of goods or supply of services so any extra amount which the supplier has charged to the recipient as him recipient has asked supplier sir please pack the goods safely and send it to me for that supplier is charging extra 100 rupees in that case that also should be included in the value of supply see guys if it is already included in the price fine if he is charging it separately should we add it to the price yes we have to add it next interest or late fee or penalty for delayed payment of any consideration so if recipient is paying amount in delay so in that case if supplier is charging any interest late fee or penalty what we should do we should add it to the value of supply and please be careful for this the time of supply will be decided separately as per subsection 5 of section 12 or of section 13 for services 12 5 for goods 12 13 5 for services guys please be careful you can just write red with 12 5 and 13 5 13 5 that is with respect to time of supply here we have to add it to the value but what is the time of supply for this means it will be as per section 12 5 and 13 5 and guys many of the time what happened important when interest late fee and penalty is collected we will assume it to be inclusive of gst we will assume it to be inclusive of gst for example assume 10000 interest is received for delay in payment assume the interest uh, gst rate applicable is 18 percent guys so we will do a reverse calculation that is 10,000 is for 118. How much is towards value into 100? If I am calculating how much is towards GST, then I have to do into 18. That's all. Clear? Huh? So, whatever value we will get it. So, by doing this, guys, how much we will get? I will just check it. 10,000 divided by 118 into 100. So, how much is that? 8,474 we will get, but I am rounding it off to 75. We will add this to the value of supply. <coughs> We will add this to the value of supply. If the question is silent, if they have given supplier has received interest, late fee or penalty for delay in payment, then you can just give a note telling. It is assumed that it is inclusive of GST and do the reverse calculation like this and add only the amount which is towards the value. Clear? Huh? And please give a note for it. If they themselves has given that interest received is exclusive of GST, then in that case, whatever is the amount of interest, please add it straight away important guys important point next subsidies even this is important subsidies directly linked to the price directly linked to the price means guys already the price has come down because of this subsidy subsidy is given by someone to sell this pen at a lower price so obviously i have reduced the selling price of the pen why because someone else has given the subsidy so now what they are telling add it up add the subsidy amount okay Subsidy, subsidy is directly linked to the price, excluding the subsidies provided by the central government and state government. Guys, assume the normal selling pen of, uh, sorry, normal selling price of this pen, let us take it as 1000 rupees. 1000 rupees. So, if I am selling it to you and all, the value of supply would be 1000. Now, some charitable institution or NGO came and told, because we will give you 200 rupees as subsidy, please reduce the selling price to 800 and sell it to the students. So now I have reduced my selling price for 800. Why? Because I am getting 200 rupees subsidy from the NGO or charitable institution. So in that case, this is the price what I am charging. For that, whatever subsidy I am getting it from charitable institution or NGO, we have to add it guys. Because this subsidy is linked to the price. Linked to the price means price we have already reduced because of this subsidy. Now increase it for GST purpose. Selling price is actually 800 only. We are not collecting it from the recipient. But actually, what is the benefit as a supplier I got? Totally 1,800 from the customer or students, 200 from the NGO. Agree? So, they are asking me to pay GST on 1,000. They are asking me to pay GST on 1,000. Hope you guys understood. In the same scenario, assume I have reduced the selling price to 800 and the subsidy is given by central government or state government. 200 rupees subsidy for each pen I am selling it to the students. Assume government school students, they are giving me the subsidy of 200 rupees. So, I have reduced the price because of subsidy. But subsidy is given by central government or state government. Should I add it, guys? Should I add the subsidy? No, I need not add. In that case, what is the value of supply? 800. Hope you understood. First, always check. 
whether the subsidy is linked to the price. Linked to the price means price would have been reduced because of that subsidy. If that subsidy is given by central government or state government, no need to add. If it is given by others, add it. Sir, what if subsidy is not at all linked to the price? Don't do anything else. Don't do anything. I have given it here. You can see. Product or service based subsidy. If any subsidy is given based on the product or service, means they are asking you to <coughs> sell it at a lower price or something like that. If it is linked to the price, linked to the price means already selling price is reduced. I have given a symbol here. You can see reduced symbol. Okay. In that case, if it is received from central government or state government, no effect means we should not add. If it is received from others, then the person who is giving the subsidy is any person other than central government or state government. Add it to the value of supply. Add it to the value of supply. Okay. Sir, not linked to the price. If it is not linked to the price, what should we do? If it is received from central government, state government, please reduce it. Deduct it. Please be careful. Sir, subsidy is received for the product or service. But as of now, the price is not reduced because of subsidy. The price what is given in the question is not it linked to the subsidy. It is not linked to the subsidy. If it is given by central government or state government, guys, please deduct it from the value of supply because it is supposed to be deducted. You have not yet done it. Please deduct it now. Sir, what if it is received from others? Have you reduced the price because of the subsidy? No, sir, not it. So don't do anything. Don't do anything. Guys, here, sir, received by others, you are already linked to the subsidy to the price. That means price has already come down. Now we have to add it up and lift it up. Correct? Uh, yes. Whereas, if it is received from others, where subsidy is not linked to the price, means you are not yet reduced the price. You are not yet reduced the price. In that case, no need to add up. No need to add it up. Clear? Uh, yes. Now, with if you received the subsidy from government, if it is already linked to the price, that means already the price has come down. Should you do anything else? No, sir. Nothing else. Next, sir, if it is not linked to the price, the price has not changed. Price is same. But it is received from whom? Government. So can I reduce it now? Yes, you can reduce it. You can reduce it, guys. But from exam point of view, this is important, guys. Link to the price. Even if by chance, if the question is signed, assume that subsidy is linked to the price and just give a note. So guys, if there is a clarity in the question, please follow the same. If question is silent, I am telling you, please assume that subsidy is linked to the price and accordingly give the effect. See who has given it and accordingly decide whether to add it or not to add it. Is that clear? Yes. <clears throat> Even this part I have just given for your better understanding. But from exam point of view, this is what is important. Yes. Okay, sir. So we are done with the additions part. So please be careful, especially with the D and E guys. A, B, C and L is easy. And please be careful. A also, any taxes other than GST. Other than GST like municipal tax and all. Okay. Next. Any discount which is given before or at the time of supply and has been duly okay. See, not only <clears throat> that, so any taxes, guys, other than GST, if supplier is charging it separately to the recipient, take it. Other than GST, please be careful. Okay. Exclusions means what we have to reduce. There are two types of discount, guys. One, the discount which is given at the time of supply or before the supply. First one, any discount which is given before or at the time of supply and has been duly recorded in the invoice. It is recorded in the invoice. So it is given here like this. The value of the goods is 1 lakh and we are giving discount. Value of goods is 1 lakh and we are giving a discount of assume 10%. They are recording it in the invoice only. So the remaining amount payable by the recipient is how much? 90,000. In that case, if the discount is given on or before the supply and if it is recorded in the invoice, we can always reduce it. We can always reduce it while calculating the value of supply. So value of supply in my example will be how much guys? 90,000. Next, second category of discount. Any discount given after the supply. Means it was agreed at the time of supply. But it will be given after the supply. Okay. Any discount given after the supply has been affected if such discount was known and agreed at the time of supply. It was agreed at the time of supply. Telling supplier has told, I will give it provided you satisfy certain condition like you purchase more than 10 lakh worth of goods in a year or if you purchase more than 10,000 kgs in a year, I will give you discount. Clear? Means discount was agreed at the time of supply, but it was not given. It will be given in the future. Okay. 
in that case input tax credit as is attributable to the discount has been reversed by the recipient means if recipient has already claimed credit for the full value in that case to the extent of discount he has to reverse it only then supplier can reduce it from the value of supplier because supplier would have already given the invoice okay let me give an example assume guys uh, value of goods is 10 lakh invoice is already issued for 10 lakh to the recipient on which gst was assume 118 percent so 1.8 lakh so recipient has already claimed credit of 1.8 lakh now later later the supplier is giving a discount of 1 lakh on 1 lakh what is the gst applicable guys on 1 lakh what is the gst applicable 18000 18000 so to the extent of 18000 if recipient has already claimed the credit he has to reverse it only then the supplier will be eligible to reduce 1 lakh from the value of supply from the value of supply guys is that clear sir what if recipient has already claimed the credit of full 1.8 lakh and is not reversing it in that case 1 lakh cannot be reduced while calculating the value of supply by the supplier clear yes so only on 1 lakh whatever is the amount of discount this is the amount of discount on discount what is the gst applicable 18000 so we are not asking recipient to reverse entire 1 lakh 80000 we are asking him only to reverse 18000 itc 18000 itc which is the gst component on discount amount please reverse only that much yeah yes hmm where the value of supply of goods or services are both cannot be determined under section 15.1. The same shall be determined in such manner as may be prescribed. That is as per the rules. It is given in section 15.4. Means section 15 subsection 4 is telling. If you cannot determine the value of supply. Because one, any of this condition is violated. Assume supplier and recipient is related. Or the consideration is not solely in money. In that case. They are telling. Determine the value as per the rules guys yes and rules is not a part of your service then value of supply inclusive of gst if by chance if the value includes already gst then how do we calculate the value of supply or tax amount tax amount is like value inclusive of taxes divided by tax rate into 100 plus tax rate guys assume i have collected 1 lakh inclusive of gst in that case how do i calculate the tax amount sir 1 lakh Assume the rate of GST is 12%. So divided by 112% into what is the rate of GST? 12%. Denominator is like 100 plus GST rate. Clear? Yes. This is like tax amount or GST amount. Sir, what if I want to calculate value of supply? Then do total value you take, divide it by 112%, that is 100 plus GST rate into 100. Into 100. Yeah, percentage you can ignore also because both denominator and numerator has the percentage you can ignore it or if you take also you will get the same amount Clear. Yeah, this is only when the value is inclusive of gst i told you for interest we will normally apply this just a second for interest normally we will apply this kind of this and please be careful when there is a question on value of supply don't simply add and less you also give a note explanation telling why you have added something or why you have deducted something even if you are not adding something, please give the reason by way of note telling. This is why we are not adding. Yeah, and try to remember the sections, guys. 15.1, 15.2, 15.3. Very easy. Including clauses. A, B, C, D. And for exclusion, that is discount. There are two. That's all. Fine. Yes, guys. So, you can see here. I have just given it by way of diagram also. Discounts given at the time of supply. Yes. Shown in the invoice. Yes. So, in that case, discounts can be deducted from the value of supply always. Discounts can be deducted from the value of supply sir what if it is not shown in the invoice then discounts not to be deducted from the value of supply if it is not shown in the invoice next so at the time of supply or before the supply means this is the story sir what if the discount is given after the supply check it in terms of an agreement that existed at or before the time of supply means was it agreed at the time of supply if yes then can it be linked to the relevant invoices it has to be linked to the relevant invoices and credit note has to be issued with respect to that guys that is also important credit note has to be issued with respect to the discount given after the supply is made then proportionate itc has to be reversed by the recipient in my example i told you only 18000 he has to reverse not entire 180000 only on the discount component whatever itc if he has already claimed sir what if recipient has not yet claimed the credit then 
guys if he has not yet claimed the credit then he can claim only how much now 1,80,000 minus 18,000 he can claim only the balance he can claim only the balance if he has not yet claimed the credit if he has already claimed the entire 1,80,000 then he has to reverse only 18,000 clear and with respect to this a credit note has to be issued <coughs> clear guys if all these conditions are satisfied all these are satisfied then it can be reduced from the value of supply if not even if one condition is violated it cannot be reduced while calculating the value of supply guys that is this is with respect to discount that is 15 subsection 3 clear yes so next supplies where value cannot be determined under section 15 1 which we already discussed section 15 4 and notified supplies in section 15 5 both of this 15 4 and 15 5 along with rules you guys would be learning it at final level guys at final level this is all about value of supply guys yes students now we will revise chapter 8 which talks about input tax credit <coughs> Input tax credit. First of all, what is input tax? Tax paid on inward supply of input capital goods or services means whatever I have obtained are called input taxes. So what on my purchases, in simple, on my purchases, if I have paid any taxes, that is called input tax, guys. So in GST, we will call it as inward supply on inward supply of input in uh, input services or even the capital goods. Capital goods is nothing but fixed assets. If I have paid any taxes that is collected by my supplier, that is called input tax for me. Just a second. Yeah. Then this may be IGST, CGST, SGST or even UTGST. Taxes paid under reverse charge mechanism are also input tax. Now I am the recipient or for and for me the tax is payable under reverse charge mechanism guys. That is I am paying it as a recipient. Sir, what is it? Input tax only. Can I claim the credit of it? Yes, I can claim the credit of it. Clear? Ra? Yes, so the credit of the above taxes is called input tax credit. That is, the taxes paid on inward supply are available as a set off against the tax payable on outward taxable supplies. Means, guys, assume on my inward supply, inward supply, I have paid a tax of 1 lakh rupees. We call it as what? Input tax. Input tax okay sir next on my outward supply i am liable to pay assume one lakh fifty thousand gst what do we call it as output tax output tax now should i pay one lakh fifty thousand no why so because guys at the time of purchase i have already paid one lakh rupees so what my supplier did was he collected from me and deposited to the government okay same goods i am doing some activities and i am further supplying it for how much? Some big, uh, higher value. On that, what is the GST payable by me? 1,50,000. Now, from my recipient, I will collect 1,50,000. But will I remit entire amount to the government? No, no, no. So, what will I do? Whatever input tax I have paid, I can claim it as input tax credit of how much? 1 lakh. So, I will claim that and deposit only 50,000 to the government. Government totally got 1,50,000 on this. 1 lakh already at the time of purchase. My supplier had collected and remitted to the government. Yes, sir. Now, I collected 1,50,000 my, from my customer and I am remitting 50,000 to the government. So, totally government got how much? 1,50,000. What they are supposed to get? Yes, sir. So, this GST we also call it as value added tax. Means at each stage, whatever is the value addition, only tax has to be paid on that. Because the tax paid on inward supply is available as credit. But this credit is not free. It's subject to condition. Star mark will be there. <clears throat> you guys would have seen whenever they are giving any offer. Star mark would be there. Terms and conditions apply. Same way. To claim input tax credit, there are certain conditions and restrictions guys. If I can satisfy all that, only then I can claim this credit. What are those conditions sir? What are those restrictions sir? Everything we will be learning in this chapter guys. Is that clear? Yes, so next section 155 of CGST Act 2017 state that where any person claims that he is eligible for input tax credit under this act, the burden of proving such claim shall lie on such person. Now, I assume, guys, I am telling that I am eligible to claim 1 lakh credit. So, it is my responsibility to prove that I am eligible for claiming credit. Clear? So, the onus is on me that I have to prove. 
that I see whatever conditions they have given. I have to prove that yes, I have satisfied all these conditions. So I am eligible to claim input tax credit. Department will not come and prove telling because you are eligible to claim a credit of 1 lakh. Please claim it. Clear? Yes, sir. Provisions of input tax credit under CGST Act have also been made applicable to IGST Act. Why? It's section 20 of IGST Act. Guys, the input tax credit provisions are actually contained in CGST Act. CGST Act. You can see we have already covered till section 15 of value of supply. We already done with. Now, from section 16 to 21. Section 16 to 21 talks about what? Input tax credit, guys. Input tax credit. All sections are not covered in your syllabus. That is, these three sections, they are not a part of your inter syllabus. Remaining sections, yes, they are covered as an inter part. Guys. Now, sir, what about the input tax credit provisions in IGST Act? Is there any separate provisions there? No. Section 20 of, guys, section 20 of IGST Act will tell wherever separate provisions is not covered in IGST Act. Whatever provisions is already covered in CGST Act, what is mutandis will be applicable even in case of IGST or interstate supply. Clear? So, in simple, if I have to tell, whatever input tax credit provisions we will learn under CGST Act, it is applicable for both, whether it is intra or inter. Okay, there is no separate provisions under IGST Act with respect to input tax credit, guys. Everything we will be learning here from section 16 to 21 under CGST Act. Okay, now coming back, guys, this diagram alone will give you almost clear picture about when recipient can claim the credit. Okay, there are certain conditions to be satisfied. Only if all this condition, not any one or two, if all these conditions are satisfied, recipient can claim credit, guys. Sir, what are those? This diagram will give you a clear picture. Guys, listen here. First, we will talk from supplier's point of view. Supplier, whenever he is supplying goods or services to the recipient, he has to supply the goods or services along with the invoice, guys, along with tax invoice and collect GST on the supply. For example, assume he is supplying the goods worth 10 lakh. On that GST applicable is assume 18 percent. So, 1 lakh 80 thousand. So, totally he has to collect how much? 11 lakh 80 thousand from the recipient. Yes, sir. Now, he should in issue invoice to the recipient. Okay, sir. Then 1 lakh 80 thousand he has to de deposit it to the government within the due date. If not, he will be liable to pay interest. Okay, sir. And with respect to this, for supplier, what is it, guys? Outward supply. For supplier, it is outward supply. Yeah. Yes, sir. He has to give the details of this outward supply in GSTR 1 or using invoice for reaching facility. That is only when they are following QRMP. This is for someone who is following QRMP. That is quarterly return monthly payment. Clear. So, I repeat once again, please pay attention. Whenever supplier is supplying any goods or services, he has to supply along with invoice and he has to collect the tax from the supplier. Okay, sir. And supplier will pay totally, in my example, 11,80,000. So, sorry, recipient will pay totally 11,80,000. So, supplier will collect it. 1,80,000, he will deposit it to the government. Remaining 10 lakh, he will keep it in his pocket because it is his revenue. Okay, sir. And it has to be deposited within the due date of payment given under GST. We will see in the payment chapter what is the due date and all. We will understand because the due date of payment is linked with the due date of return, guys, under GST. Okay. And you should also file who the supplier, GSTR1, where he will give the details of outward supply. If he is following QRMP, then he can give the details using invoice furnishing facility for the first two months of the quarter. So, in this either GSTR1 or uh, invoice furnishing facility, he has to give the details of whatever supplies he has made to the recipient to the government. Only based on that, the recipient will be able to claim credit. And these are the things un to be undertaken by supplier. Okay. There are many other conditions to be satisfied by recipient if you want to claim credit. Even recipient should make sure that even these conditions are satisfied. Okay. Plus the following conditions. What are those? recipient should be registered under gst guys now assume you guys are not registered under gst you are purchasing any goods or services can you claim the credit no sir you are considered as a consumer as you are not registered under the gst only for b2b transaction guys we call it as b2b b2b that is business to business supplier is also registered recipient is also registered under gst only then they can claim the credit okay sir next itc is reflected in the form gstr 2b means Whatever details the supplier has given in GSTR 1 or invoice furnishing facility, it will auto-populate to the recipient in his GSTR 2B. 
it will auto populate to the recipient in his gstr to be then he can claim the credit then received the goods or services so literally the recipient should have received the goods or services in case of bill to ship to transaction guys even though the goods are delivered to third party or some other person in that case still it is deemed to be received by recipient okay next <coughs> ITC should not be restricted or blocked. So later scenarios we will see under section 17 and all when the uh, ITC is blocked or restricted. If there is any scenario where the ITC is not available, the recipient cannot claim it. Which are those scenarios in which the ITC is not available, we will learn later. Then the recipient should be in the possession of the tax invoice. Supplier has to issue tax invoice. Na? So the recipient should have a copy of it, either e-copy or physical copy, whichever is fine. Next. Furnished GSTR 3B means recipient can claim credit only by filing GSTR 3B. Clear means supplier would have given the details of his outward supply in GSTR 1 or using invoice furnishing facility. Yeah? Yes, sir. This will auto populate to the recipient in GSTR 2B. Yeah? Yes, sir. Now recipient should file GSTR 3B and in that GSTR 3B he can claim that credit. In GSTR 3B, recipient has to give the details of his outward supply, his inward supply. What is the ITC available for him? And after adjusting the ITC, what is the net GST to be paid in cash or using electronic cash ledger? All these details has to be disclosed by him. Next, input or input service or capital goods used for business purpose to provide taxable output supply. It has to be used for in a business purpose, guys. Sir, what if I am registered under GST, but I have purchased some personal goods. I have used it for my, for my personal purpose. Can I claim the credit of it? No. Next, sir, I am registered under GST. I have purchased some goods to produce the product which is exempt from GST. Means my output is exempt from GST. So whatever GST I have paid on the purchase of raw material or service, can I claim the credit? No. If your outward supply is exempt, then you cannot claim input tax credit on your inward supply, guys. Clear? So these are the conditions which has to be satisfied. All conditions, guys. Please be careful. And there is one more condition telling the recipient has to pay the consideration to the supplier within 180 days from the date of what issue of invoice so because this is mainly targeted on credit transaction assume recipient he has not paid amount 11 lakh 80 thousand to the supplier but supplier as he was liable to pay tax based on the time of supply he deposited 1 lakh 80 thousand out, out of his own pocket to the government in that case if recipient has satisfied all these conditions he may claim the credit but if he has not paid the amount or consideration including GST to the supplier within 180 days from the date of issue of invoice, then on 181st day, whatever credit already recipient has claimed, if at all if he has claimed, he has to reverse it. He has to reverse it along with interest, along with interest at 18% per annum. From the day he has claimed the credit till the day he is reversing, he has to add interest also. Clear? This is only in case of credit transaction, guys where supplier would have already deposited the tax out of his own pocket assume still he has not received any amount from the recipient and recipient has already claimed the credit after satisfying all these conditions in that scenario if recipient has failed to pay the amount to the supplier within 180 days from the date of issue of invoice they are telling on 181st day please reverse the credit whatever you have claimed along with interest along with interest guys clear so all this are the conditions to be satisfied in order to claim input tax credit credit is not free guys it comes with the conditions next coming to zero rated supply zero rated supply has been defined in section 16 of igst act guys what is it important actually <clears throat> zero rated supply means any of the following supplies of goods or services or both namely export of goods or services or both whenever it is an export either of goods or services it is always zero rated next supply of goods or services to to special economic zone developer or a special economic zone unit that means they are the recipient any supply made to a special economic zone unit or developer is a zero rated supply sir what about the supply made by them assume they are the suppliers in that case it is an interstate supply but not zero rated supply but not zero rated supply. Please be careful with it. Clear? So any supply made to SEZ unit or developer is a zero rated supply. Clear? Even both of this is actually interstate supply only because zero rated will always be interstate supply. But one important thing is if there is any supply made by SEZ unit or SEZ developer, it is an interstate supply, but not zero rated. But not zero rated, guys. Please be careful with it. 
is that clear yes sir now let us move to the actual provisions guys this diagram i has just explained the scenarios conditions everything to be satisfied now so where is it given in which subsections everything we will see one by one quickly eligibility and conditions for taking input tax credit section 16 subsection 1 recipient should be registered under gst okay and goods or services should be used or intended to be used in the business of the recipient they are telling whatever goods is purchased that is input service or capital goods it has to be used for business purpose sir only after using you can claim credit no no no. even assume today i have purchased it capital goods i will be using for next five years so when will i claim credit sir after five years huh? no no you can claim it now only but the purpose of purchase should be to use it in the business either now or in the future clear so some students may get confused sir only after i use can i claim the credit no at the time of purchase if your intention is to use it for business you can claim it you can claim the credit okay sir next guys one more thing important sir recipient assume is paying tax under reverse charge mechanism under reverse charge mechanism so should he get registered guys whenever the recipient is liable to pay tax under reverse charge mechanism it is mandatory for him to get registered it is mandatory for him to get registered so in that case he is paying tax on his inward supply but he himself is paying it supplier is not collecting it in that case can i claim, can he claim the credit sir yes he can claim credit he can claim the credit guys clear huh? so even if the recipient has paid tax on inward supply under rcm still he can claim the credit of it it is called input tax only <coughs> Okay, because in the uh, registration chapter, we will be learning that whenever RCM is applicable, recipient has to get registered. It is a mandatory for him to get registered, irrespective of his turnover. Even turnover of the recipient, we will not check when RCM is applicable, guys. Okay, let us move towards the subsection 2. Following conditions should be fulfilled by a registered taxable person. That is the recipient, guys. Okay, he is in the position. Okay, if you want, you can just mention there, recipient. Because he is the one who wants to claim credit. So he has to make sure he has satisfying all these conditions. He is in the position of tax invoice or debit note issued by the supplier. The details of invoice or debit note in respect of said supply has been furnished by the supplier in the statement of outward supply or invoice furnishing facility. Actually, this has to be satisfied by whom? Supplier. But recipient has to make sure that supplier is doing it. Or else recipient will cannot claim credit. Na? So sir, recipient has to tell, sir, supplier, please do it. I want to claim credit. Next, he has actually received the goods or services or both. I told you, even if it is a bill to ship to transaction, assume I, uh, I ordered the goods with you to deliver it to my brother. So even though the actual recipient is my brother, I am considered as deemed recipient. Clear as if it is received by me. Next, the input tax credit in respect of said supply communicated to such registered person under section 38 has not been restricted. Important because this is a new amendment which has been added. So now, I told you GSTR 2B, whatever details the supplier has given in his GSTR 1 or invoice furnishing facility, it has to auto populate to the recipient in his GSTR 2B. That is what this point is, guys. And that credit should not be restricted to the recipient or blocked. Tax charged has been actually paid to the government by the supplier. Even this condition actually has to be satisfied by whom? Supplier. So, recipient has to make sure that supplier has deposited the tax with the government. Only then the recipient can claim the credit. Next, E, that is the recipient has furnished the return under section 39, that is GSTR 3B, guys. So, whatever I am just circling, these are the conditions which are which has to be satisfied by supplier, but recipient has to make sure that supplier is doing it. Only then recipient will be able to claim credit, guys. Oh. Next, provisos. Provided where the goods are received in lots or installment, credit can be claimed upon receipt of the last lot or installment, guys. Assume I have purchased 50,000 kgs of goods from you. And you are delivering it to me in 5 installments, 10,000 kgs each. So, assume you have issued only one invoice for me. All 50,000 kgs put together, you have issued me one invoice. Can I claim the credit once I receive the first installment, second installment like that? No. What they are telling here is, if you have purchased anything in installment, even though single invoice is issued, please claim the entire credit only when you receive the last installment. That is in my example, only when I receive the fifth installment, for entire 50,000 kgs, I can claim the credit. Clear, huh? Yes. Where the recipient fails to pay to the supplier of goods or services or both within 180 days from the date of issue of invoice, the ITC availed by the recipient shall be added to his output tax liability along with what? Interest at the rate of 18.18% per annum. From what date to what date, sir? From the date he has claimed the credit 
till the day is reversing it. Reversing in the sense he has to add it to his output tax liability and pay to the government. Clear? Huh? Yes. Exceptions means this 180 days point is not applicable in the following cases. Reverse charge mechanism. Why? Because under reverse charge mechanism, only the recipient has to pay tax. Only then he can claim the credit. Agree? Huh? So credit will not be given until he pay the tax. So here that 180 days concept. So exception means in the following cases, 180 days concept is not at all there, guys. Next, schedule one cases, schedule one cases, four paras are there. Na? Those four activities, even without consideration, it is a supply. So obviously, recipient is not paying anything to the supplier, but still under GST, they are considering it as deemed supply. And what is the value of supply as per valuation rules? So in that case, recipient has to pay the tax and then claim the credit, guys. Clear? Na? So in this case, because Sir, within 180 days, sub recipient has to pay to the supplier. What will he pay? It is without consideration. The transaction is without consideration. So, obviously, that is why you are considering it as a supply as per schedule 1, para 1, 2, 3, 4. Agree, na? So, there is nothing to pay here from the recipient to supplier because it is without consideration. So, that is why this 180 days concept is not applicable there also. Then, additions made to the value of supply as per section 15 to B. That is, sir, supplier was liable to pay an amount to someone. And he has asked recipient, hey, you pay it. In that case, recipient has already paid it. Should it, should it be added to the value of supply? Yes, it has to be added to the value of supply. But was it paid directly to the supplier? No. So it need not be paid directly to the supplier. Now, supplier asked it to ask the recipient to pay to someone for whom supplier was liable to pay. For example, okay, let me give an example. Listen, listen. Assume I am the supplier. You are the recipient. I have supplied the goods for you for one lakh. 1 lakh guys. Okay. And I have told you, hey, I am supposed to pay 10,000 for my person. Okay. One of the person from whom I have purchased the goods, you pay that 10,000. You pay that 10,000. So you pay the 10,000 to the person for whom I told you. Clear. So totally how much you have paid? 1 lakh 10,000. But how much has come to my pocket? 1 lakh. So that 180 days concept is applicable only for 1 lakh. Whereas 10,000, you already paid it. That is why it is added to the value of supply. Now, if I ask you what is value of supply, it is 11 lakh as per section 15. Agree. So, for this, that 180 days is not applicable, guys. 180 days is not applicable because this amount is not paid by the recipient to the supplier. It is paid to some third person. But still, it will get added to the value of supply. So, for this alone, only uh, for 10,000 alone, 180 days won't be applicable. Whereas for 1 lakh, yes, 180 days would be applicable. Clear? Yes, sir. Subsection 3. Red with Income Tax Act, guys. If depreciation is claimed on tax component of cost of capital goods and plant and machinery under the income tax, the ITC on said component, tax component, shall not be allowed. Subsection 3, yeah. Yes, sir. So, you can write there, read with Section 41, sorry, not 41, 43 subsection 1, which talks about actual cost of the asset which is used for business to claim depreciation. So section 32 talks about depreciation. Obviously, we have to add whenever the asset is purchased, the actual cost of the asset has to be added to the block. How to calculate the actual cost is given in section 43 subsection 1 of Income Tax Act. Okay. Yes, sir. Now, guys, assume I have purchased an asset for 10 lakh and I have paid a GST of 1 lakh 80,000. Okay, sir. So totally, I have paid 11 lakh 80. So, in section 43 subsection 1, they are giving the choice to the person telling if you are eligible to claim ITC of this, if you are claiming ITC of it, please don't add it to the cost of the asset. Assume the SSE or the recipient is eligible to claim input tax credit, guys. So, in that case, for income tax purpose, he will capitalize how much? Only 10 lakh. And he will add 10 lakh to the block of the asset because 1 lakh 80,000 is claiming credit in, in GST. Clear. Sir, what if this ITC is not claiming it or it is blocked? Assume he has purchased motor vehicle for business. So, credit for motor vehicle is blocked. In that case, what will he do? He can capitalize entire 11 lakh 80,000, guys. He can capitalize entire 11 lakh 80,000 in income tax and the cost of the asset will be how much? 11 lakh 80,000. He can add 11 lakh 80,000 to the block of the asset. Is that clear? So, simple. First, we have to see for 1 lakh 80,000, that is the GST per component paid on the purchase of asset which will be used for business if itc is available then claim the itc in gst sir if itc is not available then add it to the cost of the asset capitalize even gst component and add the entire value to the block of the asset 
Is that clear? Yes. So please be careful. These two are connected. Even when I was doing income tax, I had told I will connect this when I go to GST. Then there is a time limit to claim credit. Sir, can, it, can the credit be claimed for lifetime? No, it has some expiry period. A registered person shall not be entitled to take input tax credit after 30th November of the following financial year or actual date of filing the irrelevant annual return, guys. That is GSTR 9, whichever is earlier, guys. The due date to file GSTR 9 is 31st December of next financial year. But here they are not talking about the due date. They are talking about actual date. Actual date means you can file return any date on or before 31st December. Due date is 31st December. That doesn't mean that you will go and file it on that only. Yeah, many people do it that only means they will go and file it on the last day. They want to test okay, whether the system is working properly, whether there is any crash on the site or not. So you can file, assume you are like, <clears throat> sir, obedient person, you are filing it in somewhere in November or uh, like October only. In that case, what is the actual date of furnishing the return? November or October, whenever you filed it. Guys, how is it? I will just explain. Assume, let me take one financial year. 23-24. So for whatever inward supply you have taken for all the months from April 23 to March 24, guys, what all purchases you have made? You can claim the input tax credit within certain time. Within certain time. They are not telling the end of March. They are giving some extended time. What is it, sir? Any credit related to financial year 23-24 can be claimed maximum within 30th November 24. That is 30th November of next year, not that year, next year. Okay, next financial year. Okay. 30th November of financial year. 30th, sorry, 30th November of next financial year. Okay. Next. For this period, that is the financial year, we have to file annual return now, giving the details of all the months. Yes, sir. When are you filing it? Assume, guys, I am filing it on 15th October. 15th October 24. Due date is 31st December, but assume I am filing it on 15th October. Whichever is earlier, 15th October. That means I can claim the credit within 15th October. Any credit from the for the month from April 23 to March 24, all 12 months, I can maximum claim by within what time? 15th October. 15th October. Let me change it, guys. Assume, sir, I am filing this on 15th December. I am filing the annual return on 15th December. In that case, whichever is earlier is what? 30th November. So, for any input tax credit which is available for financial year 23-24 can be claimed within 30th November 24, guys, max, whichever is earlier. 30th November or actual date of furnishing the annual return, whichever is earlier. Please be careful. Please don't get confused. The due date to file annual return is 31st December of next financial year. But it can be filed any day on or before that also. So, in the question, if at all, if there is any question on this, they should have given on what day the annual return is filed, guys. Clear? Yes, sir. We are done with. Next, Rule 37A, which is a new rule. Please be careful with this. Reversal of input tax credit in case of non-payment of tax by the supplier and reavailment thereof. Rule 37A. Rule 37A covers a situation where a registered person, that is the recipient, avails ITC in GSTR 3B for a tax period in respect of such invoice or debit note. The details of which have been furnished by the supplier in the statement of outward supplies in form GSTR 1 or using invoicing furnish, uh, invoice furnishing facility. That means supplier has given this detail, sir. Supplier has made the supply and he has given the details of his outward supply in GSTR 1 or using invoice furnishing facility. Okay, good, good supplier. Next, however, supplier does not furnish return in GSTR form 3B because every person is supposed to file two returns, guys. GSTR 1 giving the details of outward supply GSTR 3B giving the details of inward supply, outward supply, ITC available and what is the GST to be paid in cash that is using cash ledger. All these details has to be given in GSTR 3B. He filed his GSTR 1 but he forgot to file his GSTR 3B for the tax period corresponding to the said statement of outward supply till 30th September following the end of financial year in which ITC in respect of such invoice or debit note has been availed. Guys, what is this story? Some interesting story which very rare can happen but still they have included it. Assume guys, I have purchased the goods in August, August 23 and I have claimed ITC. I have claimed ITC because sir, supplier has given the details. Supplier has filed his GSTR 1 for August. He has filed it. 
<coughs> who the supplier and he has given the details of outward supply made by him so recipient claim can claim the credit now what happened supplier missed to file or he forgot to file gst at 3b for august he filed one whereas gst at 3b he missed it what is the due date to file gst at 3b it is following monthly scheme and all guys 20th of next month but he missed it he didn't file gst at 3b he filed gst at one but he didn't file gst at 3b but uh, Recipient has already claimed credit. Telling because he has given the details in GSTR 1 now. So it got auto populated in GSTR 2B to the recipient and recipient claimed the credit. In that case, they are telling, see, yes, okay. GSTR 3B is not filed. We are still giving you the extended time. August fall in which financial year? 23-24. He has to file the GSTR 3B at least within 30th of next financial year. 30th of next financial year means what? 30th September 24. Actually, for August, he is supposed to file GSTR 3B within what time? 20th September. 20th September of 23. This is the due date to file GSTR 3B. But now they are actually giving extended time. Obviously, for the delay in filing the returns on penalty, interest and all will be levied. But now they are telling, recipient, you already claimed the credit. Fine. We will wait till 30th September of next year. Even within this time, if recipient has not file this GS, sorry, not recipient. If supplier has not filed this GSTR 3B for which month? August month. Then please reverse the credit. Whatever credit you have claimed, now please reverse it. We waited till 30th September of next year. Within this time, if you file also, we are accepting it. We are not asking you to reverse it. By 30th September of next year also, we are giving huge amount of time. Even if within that time, if supplier has not filed this GSTR 3B, then recipient whatever credit you have claimed please reverse it okay in such case said amount of itc shall be reversed by the said recipient while furnishing a return in form gstr 3b on or before 30th november following the end of such financial year during which such itc has been availed means assume guys even with the, within this time gstr 3b is not filed by the supplier in that case they are telling within 30th november of that year please reverse your credit please reverse your credit in which form gstr 3b now recipient recipient guys please listen it's long story the recipient will file gstr 3b for which for september already period is over for october when will he file it for october october 24 please be careful when will he file it on or before 20th november they're telling please reverse it in this gstr 3b which you will file for october on or before 20th november please reverse the credit please reverse the credit clear yes sir however where the said amount of itc is not so reversed by the recipient such amount shall be payable by the said person along with the interest under section 50 that is 18 percent per annum if it doesn't reverse it before 30th november from 1st december interest will start further where the said supplier subsequently furnishes the return in form gstr 3b for the said tax period the said registered person may re-avail the amount of such credit in the return in form gstr 3b for the tax period thereafter now assume somewhere in the next year january february march the supplier filed gstr 3b for august in that case if recipient has already reversed the credit he can again re-avail it if he has already reversed it he can re-avail it guys clear i will just repeat the story guys please listen carefully because lot lot of stories are there connected now already they have told recipient can claim the credit only if supplier has given the details of his outward supply in gstr1 or using invoice furnishing facility which will auto populate to the recipient in his gstr2b assume guys for the month of in my example supply happened in august 23 supplier supplied the goods to the recipient and he filed gstr1 and he gave the details in gstr1 about outward supply and it got opto populated to the recipient in gstr2b recipient satisfied all this condition and he claimed the credit he claimed the credit but the supplier failed to file gstr3b for the same month that is august which he was supposed to file on or before 20th september he didn't do it he forgot it or he neglected it, whatever it is, he didn't do it. What the rule 37A is there telling us, we will wait till 30th September of next year. At least within that time, 
file GSTR 3B for which month? August. If not after 30th September, but before 30th November. Before this date. After 30th September, but before 30th November. The recipient, whatever credit he has already claimed, he has to reverse it in his GSTR 3B, which he will file before 30th November. So logically thinking, in between this, he will file GSTR 3B for which month? For September also, he will file when? 20th October. Sir, can you correct in that also? Yes, for September 24 or October 24, whatever GSTR 3B he will file, <coughs> he can reverse the credit. Even for September, because the credit has to be reversed after 30th September, but before 30th November. So in between this, you check which is the GSTR 3B you will file. Either for September, which you will file on or before 20th October, or for October, on or before 20th November, whatever you will file, he has to reverse in that GSTR 3B. And he will not be charged any interest for it. If he doesn't do it within 30th November, then from 1st December, yes, interest will start at 18%. Clear, huh? Yes, sir. Assume guys, in between this date, uh, recipient has reversed the credit. But somewhere in January or February, again, supplier filed his GSTR 3B. Whatever was pending for August, na, he filed it. Sir. In that case, recipient can reavail the credit. Whatever he had reversed, na, he can now reavail that credit. Clear? Yes. Chain link. Fine guys, we are done with section 16, read with rule also. Now we will move towards 17. Apportionment of credit and blocked credit. Below is the list of situation where input tax credit will not be available. Will not be available guys. Which are those sir? Where the goods or services are both used partly for business and partly for other purpose. Other purpose means personal. The amount of credit shall be restricted to input tax as is attributable to the purposes of business. Guys, assume on my inverse of Invite supply, I have totally paid 10,000 GST input tax. Okay, sir. And this input is used 60% for personal purpose and 40% for business purpose. In that case, how much credit I can claim? Only 4,000. Whatever is attributable towards business purpose. Only 4,000 ITC can be claimed. This is only when the same input is used for both business as well as personal purpose. Guys, see. Sir, if there is any input which I have purchased only for business purpose, claim full credit provided you have satisfied other condition. Sir, I have purchased one input used to use it only for personal purpose. No credit. Thank you. What they are talking about here is one input is purchased. It is partly used for business, partly for personal. Like in uh, income tax, we have learned now motor car. Motor car owned by employer, employee, expenses met by employer, employee. Car is used partly for personal, partly for official. We have seen a similar to that. Okay. Yes. So when the same input or input service or capital goods is used partly for business and partly for personal purpose, then whatever is attributable towards business can only be claimed as credit guys. Same way, where the goods or services are both used, means same goods, are used partly for affecting taxable supply, including zero rated supply, even zero rated will be covered under taxable only, and partly for affecting exempt supplies. The amount of credit shall be restricted to input tax as is attributable to the taxable supplies, including zero rated supplies. Similar, similar thing guys. Now I assume I have purchased input, input service or the capital goods on which I have paid 2 lakh input tax. This is partly used to provide my taxable outward supply and partly exempt supply. So in that case, check the turnover. <coughs> taxable supply, exempt supply. What is my turnover? Assume it is 10 lakh taxable supply and a 5 lakh exempt supply. They are telling divide it. So 2 lakh is the total input tax you have paid divided by total turnover 15 lakh into what is your taxable turnover 10 lakh. You can claim only this much credit. You can claim only this much credit. Remaining credit you cannot claim. Clear? Huh? Yes. So what did I do here? Total input tax paid divided by total turnover into taxable turnover into taxable turnover. And guys for this calculation there is actually a separate rule but that rule is not a part of your inter syllabus. So on this, only theory questions can be asked. You don't worry anything with respect to numerical question on this subsection 1, 2 and 3. There won't be any question asked for you numerically. Maximum they can ask theory question. That's all. Next, the value of exam supply. So that is whenever we are calculating exam supply only for the purpose of subsection 2, they are telling exam supply will include what and all supplies on which the recipient is liable to pay tax on reverse charge basis that is i am supplier my supply is taxable under rcm recipient is liable to pay tax they are telling 
pass the supplier consider it as an exempt supplier actually it is not exempt supply but still only for subsection 2 purpose they are telling include it as exempt supply for whom supplier because the recipient is the one who is liable to pay tax then transactions in securities actually securities is not a goods also it is not a services also but here they are asking you to include it and sale of land and sale of constructed building guys this is only for subsection 2 purpose please don't get confused for any other provisions clear and i suggest you don't worry too much on this what is what is covered in exempt and all because as i already told you the numerical part is not a part of your syllabus because how exactly to calculate this is covered actually in the rules and that rules is not a part of your syllabus yeah just remember theoretically what is covered that's enough then subsection 4 is there with respect to banking and all which is not a part of your inter syllabus guys okay good good sir all these are a good news for us input tax credit is available only on those goods and services used for business exports and supplies to scz fall under the category of what zero rated supplies sir if my outward supply is zero rated can i claim credit on my inward supply yes you can claim it itc is available on zero rated supplies and taxable supply but not on exempt supply. it is not available on exempt supplies guys so i will i have just given one table for it <clears throat> i will just cover that first at the end of this chapter you can see at the end of this chapter, let me cover that guys. Different types of supplies under GST. Zero rated means what? This is actually covered in section 16 of IGST Act. Exports. Okay, if you want, you can mention the section also. Section 16 of IGST Act. Please be careful. Okay. Exports and supplies to SEZ and SEZ developer. Sir, is credit available? Yes. If your outward supply is zero rated, on your inward supply, you can claim credit. Provided you have satisfied all the conditions. Okay. Then nil rated exempt and non GST guys. All these are actually an exempt supply as per section 2 clause 47. We have already seen exempt supply definition when we were covering exemption. It covers three categories of supply. What are those we are seeing now? Nil rated. Nil rated supply means what? Supplies that have declared rate of 0% GST. Zero rated supply is different. Nil rate. Sir, what is the difference between nil rate and zero rate? Actually, nil and zero is one and the same. But for GST, they are two different things guys clear so nil rate means applied within the country but the rate for those products are zero percent as on today but any day they may increase these rates okay sir some of the products on which uh, nil rate is applicable salt grains jaggery sir is credit available if my inward supply on my inward supply if i have paid gst if my outward supply is nil rated can i claim credit no exempt supply supplies but it is supply but do not attract gst example guys goods actually is not a part of your syllabus but services we have covered what all services are exempt big long story fresh milk fresh fruits curd bread etc what i have given here is only goods but there are a lot of services also then non gst that is the products or services for which gst is not at all applicable what are those alcohol phd man yes this supplies do not come under the purview of GST law. That is alcohol for human consumption. Only for human consumption. Sir, what if alcohol is used for any other purpose and all? Those products are not out there, the GST. Please be careful. Even in the definition, they have told alcohol for human consumption is kept outside the GST. If by chance, if alcohol is used for any medical purposes or to make any medicines and all, is it covered under GST? Yes, it will be covered. Clear? Yes. Alcohol for human consumption or petroleum products, guys. That is PhD man. Now, if all this is your outward supply, you cannot claim input tax credit. Input tax credit is not available, guys. Is that clear? Yes, I have also added an image here. So, I have tried to make my revision material as interesting as possible, guys, so that <clears throat> it will be easy for you guys to study. Okay, so a lot of efforts has been made behind this. Because, guys, yes, I may take class for a few hours or for regular class, you know, the taxation alone will take around 200 hours. Yes, revision may be around 13, 14 hours or 15 hours maximum. But still, the efforts what we put behind the scenes to make the notes, to prepare is much more than that, guys. Yeah, I'm not trying to boost by, by myself, but I'm trying to tell you, please make use of it because a lot of efforts has been made to make these notes. And that color also has an impact. You can see in the subsection 5, Wherever I have given something in green color means credit is available for it. Wherever I would have highlighted something in red color means the credit is not available. Credit is not available guys. Because here there is high chances that students may get confused. When credit is available, when not credit, credit is not available. Because they are telling other than except 
excluding so sir when credit is available when credit is not available there are chances of getting confused so here the color will depict guys wherever it is green credit is available wherever it is red danger credit not available okay subsection 5 input tax credit shall not be available in respect of the following namely motor vehicle for transportation of persons what if it is for transportation of goods it is not covered here means credit is available huh? yes and please be careful guys here when i am telling credit is available obviously section 16 conditions and all should be satisfied clear all the, whenever i tell itc is available that means all the conditions are taken care of them. clear yes sir so motor vehicle for transportation of persons having approved seating capacity of not more than 13 guys including driver less than or equal to 13 sir what if it is more than 13 credit is available so assume we have purchased bus for the transportation of persons in that case credit is available huh? yes credit is available yes sir next <clears throat> except when they are used for making the following taxable supplies that is in the following cases credit is available what are those further supply of such motor vehicle that is assume guys i have purchased car to further supply it i am a car dealer can i claim the credit on my purchase of motor car yes you can claim it then transportation of passenger sir i have purchased car for using it for the purpose of transportation of my passengers i am engaged in the business of transportation of passenger can i claim the credit yes you can claim it then imparting training on driving such motor vehicles that is driving school credit is available guys so in the following cases even if motor vehicle is purchased for the transportation of persons but for the following uh, following purposes credit is available clear sir please be careful passenger is covered now a company has purchased the car for the transportation of their employees employees are not passengers in that case can company claim the credit no they cannot claim sir company has purchased the bus for the transportation of their employees can they claim the credit yes because the seating capacity is more than 13 seating capacity is more than 13 now assume the sir the particular company has purchased a truck for the transportation of goods can they claim the credit yes because here what they have covered in the block list is motor vehicle for transportation of person so if it is for transportation of goods credit is available next clause a a listen here vessels and aircraft except when they are used for means if you have purchased vessel or that is nothing but ship or aircraft credit is blocked but if the vessel or aircraft what you have purchased is for the following purposes credit is available what are those sir? further supply of such vessel or aircraft that is you are selling you are purchased the ship and you are selling it next transportation of passengers imparting training on navigating such vessels or imparting training on flying such aircraft that is pilot training credit is available even if it is used for transportation of goods guys so if the aircraft or vessel is used for the following purpose credit is available for any other purpose sir mukesh ambani has purchased the aircraft for his business to transport his employees from one place to another place whenever there is any meeting or their family members are transporting but for business purpose can they claim credit no guys they cannot if it is for the transportation of passengers now air asia indigo they are purchasing the flight sir why to provide transportation of passenger services can they claim the credit yes they can claim the credit now assume adani purchased the ship to further sell it can he claim the credit yes he can claim the credit yeah yes next a b services of general insurance servicing repair and maintenance in so far as they relate to motor vehicle vessels or aircraft guys when you purchase the motor vehicle or vessels or aircraft on purchase whatever gst you have paid if it is blocked on purchase whatever gst if you have paid if it is blocked then once you purchase whatever general insurance servicing and repairs and maintenance services you take for that vehicle aircraft or ship na, even the gst paid on that is also blocked i repeat on the purchase of motor vehicle vessels or aircraft if credit is blocked even on the following services taken on motor vehicle aircraft and ship is blocked oh, okay next provided that the input tax credit in respect of such services shall be available if it is used for the following purposes means if it is see if on the purchase if credit is available means if it is used for the following purposes whatever i violated in green color here on purchase you can claim the credit yes sir so they are telling even on general insurance servicing and repairs and maintenance you can claim it so if on purchase you can claim the credit means even on the services you can claim it okay where services by a taxable person engaged in manufacture of such motor vehicle vessels or aircraft now assume tata motors they are engaged in the manufacture of uh, motor vehicles now they are taking any general insurance servicing or repairs and maintenance services can they claim the credit yes they can claim the credit same way if you are a person who is engaged in the manufacture of like vessels or aircraft and all in that case can you claim the credit with respect to whatever inward supply you will take in in the form of general insurance servicing or repairs and maintenance yes you can claim it 
Next, <coughs> in the supply of general insurance services in respect of such motor vehicles, vessels or aircraft insured by them. So even if you are taking any inward supply in the form of general insurance services, you are engaged, actually you are engaged in the business of general insurance services and you are taking any of this as inward supply. Can you claim the credit? Yes, you can claim the credit. These are additions guys, please be careful. These are the additions. Next, the following supply of goods or services are both. Food and beverage means following means guys the followings are inward supply for you. If you have taken any of this as an inward supply, if you have paid GST, you cannot claim credit. Okay, what are those? Food and beverages, outdoor catering, beauty treatment, painting, health services, cosmetic and plastic surgery, leasing, renting or hiring of motor vehicles, vessels or aircraft referred to in clause A or AA except when used for the purposes specified therein. So if you have taken leasing, renting or hiring motor vehicles or vessels or aircraft, if it is for the following purposes, credits are available. If it is for any other purpose, credit is not available. Okay, sir. Then life insurance, health insurance, credit is blocked. Guys. If you have taken any of this as an inward supply, credit is blocked. But provided that input tax credit shall be available where the inward supply of such goods or services or both is used for making outward supply of same category of the goods or services or both. That means I have purchased foods and beverages to further supply it in my shop or in my canteen in that or in my restaurant. In that case, can I claim the credit? Yes, on the purchase, you can claim the credit. Now assume, sir, Infosys company has purchased the food and beverages to give it to their employees. They are not selling it. They are giving it to their employees. In that case, can they claim the credit? No, because they are not further supplying in, in their own business. Clear? So, if the following inward supply is taken to provide same category of outward supply, means I am taking it and I am not consuming it. I am further supplying it. In that case, on the inward supply, I can claim the credit. Next, membership of club, health and fitness center, travel benefits extended to the employees on vacation such as leave or home travel concession. So, in income tax, we have seen for any places in India, if the employee is traveling for which sponsorship is given by the employer, so, employee can claim exemption for that. Yes, sir. Under section 10 5. Now, can employer claim credit of whatever GST you would have paid on the transportation cost or on the accommodation cost or whatever GST has paid? Can he claim the credit? No, he cannot. But again, one more thing is there. Input tax credit shall be available where it is obligatory for the employer to provide the same to its employees under any law for the time being enforced. And this is a same point for all the items whatever is covered under clause B guys. Clear? Means if any of this is provided by employer to employee and it was mandatory for the employer to provide it. Assume as per labor law guys, it is mandatory to provide lunch to the employee. In that case, he has purchased the food and he has given to the employees. So on purchase of food, whatever IT uh, input tax he has paid, he can claim the credit. So that means I repeat once again, if the following inward supply was taken by the employer because it was mandatory for him to provide it to his employees under any law applicable. In that case, whatever tax the employer has paid on the purchase of the following items, he can claim the credit as it was mandatory for him to provide the following to their employees under any law. Yeah, yes, sir. Clause C, work contract services. C for contract. Okay. Capital expenditure. If it is revenue, credit is available, guys. Revenue means they may not straight away mention it as revenue. They may tell debited to PNL account. Debited to PNL account means it is understood. It is like revenue expenditure and it is allowed, guys. Only capital expenditure is blocked. Okay. Works contract services, capital expenditure when supplied for construction of an immobile property other than plant and machinery, except when it is input service for further supply of works contract service. Guys, listen here. If I have provided works contract services to you, which is capital expenditure for you. Whatever GST you have paid for me, okay, I am the supplier. Na? Assume I am charging you 1 crore. And on that 1 crore, I was liable to pay GST, so I have charged you the amount. Now, as a recipient, can you claim the credit of GST paid? No. Because for you, the inward supply is what? Works contract service. And if it is capital expenditure for you, then you cannot claim it. For you, if it is a revenue expenditure, can you claim the credit? Yes. Now, if the works contract service is given with respect to plant and machinery, can the recipient can claim the credit? Yes, he can claim it. Even though it is a capital expenditure, still he can claim the credit. Okay, sir. Next, where it is input service for further supply of works contract service. Now, I provided works contract services for you and you are not using it for yourself. You are a subcontractor. You are giving it to your clients. 
I gave it to you, you are giving it to your clients. In that case, for you, it is for further supply. So whatever GST you have paid for me, can you claim the credit as a recipient? Yes, you can claim it. Because works contract service is not taken for yourself. It is for further supply. In that case, you can claim the credit. Next, D. Goods or services or both capital expenditure received by a taxable person for construction of immobile property. Okay. Other than plant and missionary on his own account, including when such goods or services are both used in the course of furtherance of business. Guys, listen here. I have purchased goods or services for the construction of immobile property for myself. Clear? That is, I have purchased like sand, bricks, cement, everything. To the, I have purchased, including some service like architect services and all, for construction of immobile property for myself. Now, whatever GST I have paid on my inward supply, can I claim the credit? No, I can't. Sir, what if it is for plant and missionary? I can claim it. I can claim it. Sir, what if it is a revenue expenditure? Normally, whenever I am purchasing the goods and services for the construction of immovable property, we will capitalize it, guys. Sir, by chance, assume you have treated it as revenue expenditure. Can I claim the credit? Yes, I can claim it. If it is a revenue expenditure for me, I can claim the credit. But, guys, maximum time it will be capital expenditure. Clear up, credit is blocked. Then, assume next scenario. I have purchased goods and services for the construction of immobile property, not for me, for my client. So it is not for my own account. I have purchased goods, as you I am engaged in construction company, I a construction business. I purchased the goods and services to use it in, for the construction of immobile property to my client. In that case, can I claim the credit? Yes, I can claim the credit. Yes, I can claim the credit because what is blocked is only on his own account. If I am purchasing for myself, even though it is for the construction of my office building, even though it is for the construction of the place where I do my business, still credit is blocked. If it is for further supply, I have purchased goods or services for further supply means, yes, I can claim the credit. Or assume I am the dealer. I am the dealer, I have purchased the goods and services which will be used for construction of immobile property. So now I am further supplying it. Can I claim the credit? Yes, I can claim it. Next. Goods or services are both on which tax has been paid under section 10, composition scheme. Guys, whenever the supplier is registered under composition scheme, he cannot collect the tax from the recipient. If by chance if he has collected, can recipient claim the credit? No. Even the person who is under composition scheme, on his inward supply, whatever tax he would have paid, he would have paid it at normal rates only. Still, he cannot claim the credit. Next. Goods or services are both received by a non-resident taxable person, one of the special person. Who is he? We will see it in registered, the registration chapter. Goods or services are both received by a non-resident taxable person except goods imported by him. So this NRTP is coming out from outside India and doing some business in India for a temporary period. In that case, for whatever goods he has imported, he would have paid IGST on it. Can he claim the credit of it? Yes. Sir, what if he has purchased any goods or services in India? Can he claim credit? No, he cannot. Next, goods or services are both used for personal consumption. So, we have already seen only it should be used for business, only then credit is available. So, obviously, this is like vice versa what they are given. Next, goods lost, stolen, destroyed, written off or disposed of by way of gift or free samples. Guys, if outward supply is free of cost. So, on inward supply, whatever I have purchased, I cannot claim credit. But, the con uh, like one, one point here is, one catch here is, sir, Okay, let me first mention. <coughs> Assume I had purchased 10 goods which I am uh, on which I have paid input tax of 10,000. Now I am giving this 10 goods free of cost as free samples. So if this is not taxable because as there is no consideration, then you cannot claim ITC. You cannot claim ITC of 10,000. But as per para 1, as per para 1, we have seen. If there is any business assets which is purchased and on which already ITC has been claimed, now if it is given free of cost or disposed of free of cost, then it is a supply even without consideration in that scenario guys. If outward supply, if outward supply without consideration, if it is covered in para 1 of schedule 1, then it is a supply taxable. So the value of supply will be considered or calculated as per valuation rules. Yes. In that case, can I claim ITC? Yes, I can claim ITC. Clear? Yes, sir. So only if outward supply is covered in para 1 of schedule 1, only then on inward supply we can claim ITC. If not, we cannot claim ITC. Oh, next, any tax paid in accordance with the provisions of section 74, 129 and 130, that is recovery sections. The person was supposed to pay tax, he has not paid it. 
Now the proper officer has pitch in and he has collected the tax. In that case, whatever tax you have paid, you cannot claim it as credit. Yes. You cannot claim it as credit. And proper officer under GST means GST officer. Yes. Fine. So block credit. You cannot, you cannot claim the credit and the, yes, sir. next section 18, availability of input tax credit in special cases, section 18 guys, important again, different scenarios are covered and interesting also, important and interesting, both, okay, 18 subsection 1 has 4 cases guys, one by one we will see, first, person who has applied for registration within 30 days from the date on which he becomes liable, that is as per section 25, Whenever you are liable for registration, you have to apply for registration within 30 days, guys, which we will learn in registration chapter. Okay, sir. Now, assuming he has applied for it, he can claim the ITC, that is input tax credit on the inputs held in the form of raw material, work in progress and finished goods. No capital goods. Please be careful. Only inputs. As on the day immediately preceding the date from which he becomes liable to pay tax. Then, next also we will just see. Okay, first, let me explain this, guys. Listen here. Yeah? I have taken an example here. <clears throat> Assume a person became liable for registration on 1st January for whatever reason. Maybe his threshold limit has crossed the limit or for whatever reason he became liable for registration on 1st January. Okay, sir. So now, as per section 25, he has to apply for registration within 30 days. Assuming he has applied on 15th January, so he has applied within 30 days. Huh? Yes, sir. So registration is granted. I am just taking a random date, 20th January. So, you will get his GST IN. You will get his GST IN, that is identification number, GST identification number from 20th January. Yes, sir. Now, what they are telling is, guys, any is inward supply after his effective date of registration for him is 1st January. That is the date on which he was liable, as per Rule 10. As per Rule 10. See, Section 25, Rule 10, everything we will learn in registration chapter. But as it is connected, I am mentioning. Hope you guys would have already studied all this. You will have a knowledge. You will be able to connect it. Okay, guys. So, as he has applied for registration within 30 days, even though the registration is granted on 20th January, he will be considered as registered person from when, what date? 1st January. So, anything he purchased after 1st January, he can claim the credit. He can claim the credit. Now, what they are telling is, Whatever stock of input is having on the preceding day, which is the preceding day, 31st December 22. Whatever stock of input is having, stock of what? Input. This obviously would have purchased before 1st January, but as he is having it as a stock, when will he use it? Obviously, on or after 1st January, they are telling we will allow credit. We will allow credit. Clear. So, we will allow the credit of whatever stock of input you are having, whether it is a raw material, WAP or finished goods, you can claim the credit. You can claim the credit because logic is simple. You would have purchased it before 1st January, but you are having it as an inventory on 31st December. Obviously, when you will be using it, guys, or when you will be selling it, on or after 1st January. So, they are telling, okay, we will allow you the credit. Clear? Yes. Next, you can see, reverse scenario I have covered here. It is actually not covered in section 18, but just for your better understanding, I am just explaining, guys. Assume person was liable for 1st January, but he didn't apply for registration within 30 days. He applied on 14th February. He wanted to literally apply on 14th February, special day for it. He applied it. Did he apply for within 30 days? No, sir. Assume registration is granted on 20th uh, February, guys. So, what is the effective date of registration for him as per rule 10 is the date on which registration is granted. So, he can claim credit only for the purchases he is making after this. Sir, can he claim any credit of the stock on this day or on the stock on this day? No, he cannot. So, for him, that benefit is not given. So, he is a registered person only from 20th February. So, any purchases he make on or after 20th February only, he can claim credit. If he is having any stock or inventory before this for which he has paid tax, still he cannot claim credit because you didn't follow what I told. So, we are not giving the credit. So, that means what is covered in section 18, subsection 1 is only this part, guys and not this part and why did i explain here is only for your understanding because you may have a doubt sir what if it, if it is not applied within 30 days can he claim the credit yes he can claim the credit but only for whatever purchases he has made on or after the date of grant of registration clear yes sir <laughs> next person voluntarily applying for registration he was not liable for registration he is applying it voluntarily 
next what is the uh, credit he can claim sir whatever inputs he is having on the date of grant of immediately preceding the date of grant of registration he can claim the credit of it now in both this scenario credit can be claimed when sir whenever we want no within one year within one year from what date of issue of invoice means the stock what you are having should not be more than one year old if it is more than one year old they are telling thank you you cannot claim the credit clear and please be careful within one year from the date of issue of invoice it is you should have purchased you would have purchased it two months back three months back six months back you can claim the credit now sir what if i had purchased two years back still i am having it as a stock inventory they are telling no you cannot claim the credit clear up so for this i will just give the explanation now now assume guys the person was not liable for registration but still voluntarily applied it sir can we do it yes you can do it so on 15th june the person applied voluntarily for registration they assume the registration was granted on 18th june he is called registered person from what date 18th june that is the date of grant of registration now after this anything he purchase he can claim itc guys subject to other conditions subject to other conditions he can claim it now they are also telling whatever stock he has stock of input that is whether raw material wip or finished goods whatever he is having he can claim it whatever stock is having on 17th june he can claim it but it should be purchased within one year clear means he can claim the credit within one year from the date of issue of invoice as per section 18 subsection 2 guys clear and the time limit is same for all the cases actually done with this three these two scenarios next please be careful in both these cases capital goods is not covered credit on capital goods is not allowed please be careful with it next three registered person who switches from composition scheme to regular scheme means he was under 10 now he is going for 9 okay he can claim the itc on inputs held in the form of raw material work in progress finished goods and capital goods as on the day immediately preceding the date from which he becomes liable to pay tax under the regular scheme that is section 9 regular scheme or normal scheme okay now how to claim it guys itc on capital goods please listen here capital goods is allowed yes how is it sir full credit is available no itc on capital goods will be reduced five percent per quarter of the year or part of the quarter from the date of issue of invoice whereas the credit for any item whether input or capital goods can be claimed within one year from the date of issue of invoice this is common for all the four cases guys this is common for all four cases and this is there only for third and fourth because only in third and fourth case they are giving credit to capital goods here and guys whatever i would have given till here is common for both the points clear huh? yes sir now <clears throat> let me explain with an example mm. so now assume guys person was paying tax under composition scheme either of the composition scheme either that is 10 1 or 10 2 a now when he is under composition scheme can he claim itc no he cannot claim and on his outward supply he has to pay tax at composition rates which he has to pay out of his pocket he cannot collect it from the customers now assume on 15th september due to any reason he became ineligible for composition scheme assume his turnover crossed the threshold limit immediately has to move to section 9 ah, yes or else he started supplying the goods outside the state for any reason guys he became ineligible for section 10 so he has to immediately move to section 9 he cannot wait he cannot even wait till the beginning of next year he immediately has to go okay sir so 15 september is switching to section 10 so, sorry section 9 so when he goes to section 9 can he claim the credit yes so whatever credit he will he is eligible for for any purchases made on or after 15 september he can claim the credit now what they are telling in 18 subsection 1 is on the preceding day that is on 14th september 23 whatever stock of input plus capital goods he is having he can claim the credit of that also he can claim the credit of that also whatever purchases he is making on or after 15 september he can claim subject to other conditions plus whatever inputs and capital goods he is having as on 14 september he can claim the credit of it provided he is eligible for it if it is blocked and all obviously he cannot claim clear see wherever we are talking about credit can be claimed credit can be claimed guys for that obviously section 16 and 17 conditions has to be satisfied only then you can claim it okay now yes and for capital goods guys assume capital goods was purchased somewhere here and gst paid on that 
GST paid on that was around 1 lakh. Okay, sir. And it is already used for two quarters. It was used for two quarters under section 10. After that, we are moving towards section 9. So it will be continued to use under section 9. What they are telling is 1 lakh straight away don't claim the credit. When your purchase credit was blocked, obviously you would have not claimed. Now, for how many quarters you have used under section 10 that as capital goods for two quarters. So for each quarter reduce 5-5%. So 5% into two quarters, which comes to 10%. Are, so 10,000 you reduce. Remaining 90,000 you can claim now. You can claim it. Clear. Huh? So if capital goods was purchased when you were under section 10, you were not eligible to claim credit. Check how long did you use it under section 10 before moving to section 9. How long did you use it? For each quarter reduce 5-5%. Five, five and quarter year is standard quarter guys. Standard quarters. Clear. So for example, please listen because in many places this thing is covered. So if I explain it in one place, it is understood. All other places also same guys. Please listen. Quarter is, year is always standard quarter. Assume 15 September he moved. Na? So this asset was purchased in June. June 15th June it was purchased. 15th June it was purchased guys. 15th June 23. So how many quarters we have to consider sir? Guys April, May, June we have to take it full. Even part of the quarter we have to take full. And standard quarters means you know April, May, June first quarter. July, August, September second quarter. October, November, December. January, February, March. Clear standard quarters. So now 15 June is the June is the last month of the quarter. Even if it is only 15 days in June, still you have to take full quarter. So April, May, June, should I count it? Yes, sir. Then July, August, September, should I count it? Yes, sir. Both the quarters you have to count. Even if it is a part of the quarter, full quarter you have to take. Please be careful. Okay. So hope you understood. So here we how many quarters we have to consider? Two quarters. Clear standard quarters. Standard quarters. Yes. Okay. Next, fourth point, guys. Registered person whose exempt supplies become taxable. Now, my outward supply previously was exempt. Now, government has withdrawn the exemption and they told because it is taxable from now. Can government do it, sir? Yes, they can do it. So, my outward supply was exempt from now. They are making it as taxable. In that case, he can claim that ITC on inputs held in the form of raw material, WAP, finished goods and capital goods as on the day immediately preceding what day? The date from which the exempt supply becomes taxable. So same story, conditions and all, same story guys. Is that clear? Yes. So let me give an example for this also. Assume my outward supply was exempt previously and whenever it is, my if my outward supply is exempt, I cannot claim ATC guys. I cannot claim ITC on my inward supply, which we already seen. Okay, sir. Now from 1st October, they withdrawn the exemption. That means it is taxable, sir. So on or after 1st October, any inward supply I take, if I am eligible to claim credit, I can claim it, guys. ITC is available. Because my outward supply is taxable, I can claim the credit. Yes. Now what they are telling is, whatever stock of input plus capital goods you are having on what day immediately preceding day that is 30th september 30th september 23 immediately preceding day whatever stock of input plus capital goods we are having we can claim the credit of it we can claim the credit of it guys hope it is clear yes all this you can study together because interconnected all the places they are telling okay preceding day whatever stock you have but difference is please be careful in these two cases, guys, capital goods is not there. Whereas third and fourth case, capital goods are there. Please be careful. Clear. Why? Because why they have not included capital goods here is now, see, and in first and second case, you are now first time getting registered under GST and you are coming under the uh, GST bracket. We are giving credit only on the inputs. Whereas here in three and four, you are already under GST, but you were under section 10 or your outward supply was exempt. Now, yes. You are coming to section 9 or your outward supply is becoming taxable. That is why they are telling, okay, in addition to inputs, we will also give capital goods. We will also give capital goods. Must, maja, madi. <coughs> Clear, huh? Yes. So even this one year thing, whatever is given in 18 subsection 2, it is common for all four cases. Whereas this capital goods thing is applicable only for third and fourth case, guys. Only for third and fourth case. Too much mess up, na? Let me clear.
Yes. So let me repeat once again quickly. Guys, 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 listen, 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 listen. Yeah. This whatever is there is common for all the four points. Whereas this capital goods five percent per quarter are part of the quarter. That is only for third and fourth case because credit is available only in third and fourth case for capital goods. Okay. Subsection four. Sorry. Subsection three. In case of transfer of business on account of sale, merger, demerger, amalgamation, lease, transferer shall be allowed to transfer the ITC which remains unutilized in is electronic credit ledger. Guys, if there is any succession of business, sale of business, amalgamation. Now, whatever unutilized input tax credit that transferer has in his electronic credit ledger, it can be transferred to the transferee and successor. Transferee or successor, he can claim it only if it was unutilized. If transfer has already utilized and enjoyed it, then can he transfer it to the recipient? No, he doesn't have it. Only the unutilized credit in the electronic credit ledger can be transferred. Oh, next fourth subsection four. This is the reverse scenario. Whatever we saw here, the reverse scenario is covered here. Where any registered person who has availed ITC opts to pay tax under section ten, that is, he was under nine, now he is moving to ten. Or where the goods or services are both supplied by him becomes exempt. Means it was taxable. Now it is becoming exempt. Reverse case, guys. Oh. He shall pay an amount by way of debit in electronic credit ledger or electronic cash ledger equivalent to the credit of input tax in respect of the inputs held in the stock and capital goods on the day immediately preceding the date of exercising of such option or the date of such exemption. Sir, what is it? Guys, listen, listen. This is also interesting, but reverse scenario. Okay. See, first I was under section 9. So ITC was available. Huh? Yes, sir. Now I felt no, sir. I I every rate. Okay. I rate of ITC uh, GST you're asking me to pay. So I want to go to section 10. So, sir, can we do it? Yes, obviously. If you are eligible for composition scheme, if your turnover is within the threshold limit, you are if you are eligible, yes, you can move it. So I am moving to section 10 from 1st April. Normally, if you want to move from section 9 to 10, you can move it only from the beginning of the financial year. Oh. So, I am moving from 1st April 23. So, once I go to composition scheme, whatever inward supply I get, I cannot claim ITC. I cannot claim ITC. Now, what they are talking about is preceding day, that is 31st March 23, whatever stock of input and capital goods plus capital goods you are having if you already claimed ITC whatever stock you are having on 31st March if you already claimed ITC please reverse it if you already claimed ITC please reverse it no sir I have not yet claimed I was thinking to claim credit by then I moved to section 10 in that case if the credit is not yet utilized you need not reverse it but if you already utilized it please reverse it please reverse it including the ITC claimed on capital goods. But that reduction and all is there, which we will see same way here, guys. Sir, my outward supply was first taxable. So I was eligible to claim ITC. But now from 1st June, the government released a notification telling because whatever you are supplying is exempt, enjoy. So in that case, on or after 1st June, any inward supply I take, I cannot claim ITC because my outward supply is exempt. What now they are talking about preceding day, that is 31st May na. 31st May 23, whatever stock of input plus capital goods I am having. Can I claim the credit of that? No. Okay. Now, if I already claimed, because this stock, when I will be using it, guys, on or after 1st June, what they are telling is, if you have not yet utilized the credit, you cannot claim it anymore. If you already utilized, please reverse it. Please reverse it. Same way here. Okay. Now, because this stocks, when I will be using it, on or after 1st April, here also this stock, when I will be using it on or after 1st June, they're telling you cannot claim credit. But if you already claimed it, if you already claimed it, reverse it. Sir, actually the credit is there in credit ledger, sir. I was just thinking by seeing every day morning, I was just thinking I, I should claim credit. I should claim credit. By the time I claim credit, exemption is given. In that case, should it be reversed? No. If you have not yet utilized it, no need to reverse it. If you have utilized it only, you have to reverse guys. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Next, you can see for capital goods, something special is there here. Guys, for capital goods here and all, we reduce 5% per quarter or part of the quarter, standard quarters, but here it is different. Please listen here. <clears throat> for capital goods held in stock, the input tax credit involved in the remaining useful life in the months shall be computed on pro rata basis, taking the useful life as 5 years, that is totally 60 months. 5 years is nothing but 60 months, guys. 
So you can see the formula I have given. ITC on capital goods to be reversed. Reversed in the sense you have to add it to your output tax liability and you have to pay it. ITC availed on such capital goods into remaining useful life divided by 60 months. Guys, listen here. I will explain this along with my example. Assume guys, any of this two scenario, the provision is same. I will just give an example in this scenario and I will explain. Assume I have purchased capital goods here and I have paid GST of 1 lakh. I have paid GST of 1 lakh on that. And before 1st June, guys, I have used it for 4 months. I have used it for 4 months. In that case, what they are telling is, if you already claimed full 1 lakh ITC, if you already claimed 1 lakh ITC, divide it. 1 lakh into total months is how much? 60 months. How much has to be reversed is, for more 4 months you can claim credit. What is the remaining life? 56 months. Reverse this much. Reverse this much. For example, 1 lakh, I will just give you the number, into 56. It comes to 93,333. This has to be reversed, guys. ITC to be reversed. You already claimed 1 lakh. But you can claim only for 4 months, which you have used during your outward supply taxable. Now, 56 months you will be using when? Year. So, they are telling reverse it. So, 4 months year. Sorry, not 4, 6. It is 4 months. You can claim the credit. Remaining 56, you reverse it. Clear? Similar example, I will give it here, guys. Assume, sir, I had purchased in goods, uh, sorry, capital goods and I have claimed an ITC of 20,000. I already claimed full. And before 1st April, I have used it for 20 months. I have used it for 20 months. So, it is understood that, see, the use, actual useful life of the asset might be more than 5 years, less than 5 years, but for GST purpose, we are considering it as standard 5 years, guys. So, it is understood that remaining 40 months you will be using here. So, 40 months credit, we have to reverse it. So, 20,000 is for 60 months. How much for 40 months? We have to reverse this much. We have to reverse this much, guys. So, 20,000 divided by 60 into 40. Again, 13,333 we have to reverse. We have to reverse. Hope you guys understood. See, please be careful. Actually, the useful life of the asset might be more than 5 months, sorry, 5 years, less than 5 years. But for all the capital goods here, they are asking you to consider it as 5 years, means 60 months. Clear? So, whatever period you have used before this, yes, credit is available. After that, whatever period is there, for that, we have to reverse it. Same way here. Clear? Please be careful. This is only in case of subsection 4, guys. That 60 months thing will come. Whereas, in other cases and all, it's like 5%, which we have to reduce. Okay. Then provided that after the payment of such amount, the balance in the input tax credit, if any, lying in its electronic credit ledger shall lapse. Means if you have any unutilized credit, you cannot claim it anymore. You cannot claim it anymore. Okay. Next, subsection 6. <coughs> subsection 6. In case of supply of capital goods or plant and machinery on which input tax credit has been taken, the registered person shall pay an amount. Guys, if you are supplying any capital goods or plant and machine, means you are selling it on which you have claimed the credit. They are telling you how to pay GST on it. How much, sir? An amount equal to ITC taken reduced at 5% for every quarter or part thereof or the tax on the transaction value determined under section 15, whichever is higher. Provided that, okay, that we will see later. Guys, listen, listen this story again. Assume I had purchased capital goods or plant and machinery. Plant and machinery on which I had paid a GST of 1 lakh. I am just taking easy numbers so that it becomes easy for me to explain. GST 1 lakh is paid. ITC is claimed, sir. ITC is claimed. And I have used it in my business for 2 quarters. Uh, let me take 4 quarters. 4 quarters. I have used it for in my business for 4 quarters. Okay, sir. And after that, I am selling it, guys. I am selling it sale value or we call it as transaction value. Transaction value is assumed 5 lakh, on which GST applicable is 18%. GST applicable is 18%. So, as per subsection 6 of section 18, they are telling, calculate. What is the ITC you already claimed? First point. ITC, what is it? You have already claimed 1 lakh. From that, you reduce 5% for each quarter or part of the quarter for which you have used the asset for business purpose. So, how, how many quarters I use the asset for business purpose? Four quarters. So, four quarters into 5% means 20%. So, the amount comes to minus 20,000 means 180,000. 
Okay, that is ITC claimed minus 5% for each quarter or part of the quarter which was used for business purpose. Standard quarters here also. Next, B. Uh, tax on transaction value. What is the actual sale value? 5 lakh. On that, what is the GST applicable? 18%. 18%. So, 90,000. Yes, so they are telling whichever is higher you have to pay. Whichever is higher. How much is that? 90,000. Whichever is higher. Whichever is higher. Means. Hope it is clear for you. Clear? Huh? Yes. So, please be careful. Sir, what? I had purchased capital goods of plant and machinery. But when I purchased, it was blocked. Sir. For what? For, for any reason, it was blocked. In that case, straight away, you will pay tax only on the transaction value. Clear? That ITC reducing and all, nothing will be there. This subsection 6 is applicable only when you have purchased capital goods, plant and machinery on which you have claimed the credit and later, after using it for few months or few quarters, you are selling it. Only then, this is applicable. Yes. Clear? Yes. Provided that where refractory bricks, molds and dies and jigs and fixtures are supplied as a scrap, the taxable person may pay tax on the transaction value of such goods determined under section 15 means as if he has supplied this. In case of whatever I have given in this paragraph, na, like bricks, molds, dies, jigs, fixtures and all, straight away, only the second point would be applicable. No, whichever is higher and now. Whatever is the transaction value on that, what is the GST? Just pay that much. Clear guys? Yes. And here also guys, please be careful with the quarters. Assume I had purchased the asset in June. On 20th June, I purchased it. And I sold it on 20th July. I sold it on 20th July. How many quarters I have used it, guys? How many quarters I have used? Sir, only one month, sir. No, two quarters. Standard quarters you have to take. April, May, June, July, August, September. Even part of the quarter you have to consider as full quarters. So, two quarters. Clear up. Please be careful. Sometimes they may test you this. If they have only given directly quarters, fine. If not, if they have given the dates, months and all, please be careful. Please uh, properly give your attention and then decide how many quarters it is. Fine, guys. Finally, you are coming to utilization of credit, which is very important for you. Input tax credit, numerical questions would be asked on this. Input tax credit is credited to a person's electronic credit ledger. The person may use this to pay his output tax liability. Guys, whatever credit we have, after all the conditions are satisfied, if it is not restricted, I can claim credit. Means credit you can utilize only if you have satisfied all the above conditions, whatever we already discussed. Clear. And actually how to utilize the credit is given in section 49 ready with few rules. Everything I have formed it in one table, which becomes very easy for you. Listen here. Please follow the order what I have given here. You have to follow the same order guys. Okay. You can see output tax I have given you and input tax credit I have given you. First, you should always utilize IGST credit guys. IGST credit first has to be utilized against IGST liability. If still you have any IGST credit, you utilize it against CGST liability or SGST liability in any order, in any ratio. Okay. So only once you utilize the IGST credit fully, you can go and touch CGST and SGST credit. Next is CGST credit. CGST credit should be first utilized against CGST liability. And then against, if still something is there, IGST liability. CGST credit cannot be utilized against SGST guys. Next, SGST credit or UDGST credit. Okay, both cannot have because under GST, registration is state-wise. For each and every state, you have to calculate your tax liability separately and pay it. Okay, for a respective state, you will either have SGST or if it is a union territory, you will have UDGST. But the treatment is same. Whether it is SGST or UDGST, the treatment is same guys. But for a single state or union territory, you will not have it both. You will have any one. And guys, Registration is always state-wise, so the payment of tax also state-wise. The credit utilization also will be state-wise. Okay. So, SGST credit will be first utilized against SGST liability. If still something is pending, we will utilize it against IGST liability. And we cannot utilize it against SGST, guys. So, SGST cannot be utilized against CGST. CGST cannot be utilized against SGST. Okay. Cross utilization between CGST and SGST is not available. Center and state. Clear and please be careful with the order, guys. Whatever order I have given you, understand, mug up, whatever you do, please remember it. Clear, yes, sir. <coughs> and please be careful. This utilization will come only if you have satisfied the conditions given in section 16. If you are not, if your credit is not blocked in section 17, only then you can claim the credit. Once you crossed all the hurdles, only then you can come and claim the credit here. Okay, sir. Then rule 86B, one twist. 
what rule 86b is telling is rule 86b of cgst rules not applicable for everyone guys only the big businesses restrict the amount of available in electronic credit ledger which is registered person can use to discharge his output tax liability only to the extent of 99 percent of such tax liability in case where the value of taxable supply value of taxable supply other than exempt and zero rated actually zero rated is a taxable supply but they are asking you to exclude here so taxable supply other than exempt and zero rated zero rated is not exempt it is taxable supply but they are asking you to exclude here okay in a month exceeds 50 lakh this rule overrides all other rules means in a, any month guys in a particular month if your taxable supply taxable supply means what your total supply minus exempt supply minus zero rated supply okay that is your taxable supply okay total supply means what is your total turnover minus exempt turnover minus zero rated supply okay you will get it if this is more than 50 lakh in a month not in a year in a month big supplier only in that case rule 86b is applicable what is rule 86b is telling is guys assume for a particular month assume february my taxable turnover is more than 50 lakh is this rule applicable yes so assume guys my output tax output tax is coming to around 20 lakhs what they are telling minimum 99 percent paid in uh, minimum 99 percent yes 99 percent you can utilize credit but minimum one percent you have to pay it in cash okay that means 99 percent you can credit you can utilize itc and one percent you have to pay it through electronic cash ledger how much the amount comes to 20 lakh into one percent which comes to twenty thousand so at least twenty thousand you have to pay it sir i have enough credit sir i have 25 lakh credits in my credit ledger sir doesn't matter how much credit you can utilize is only 99 percent maximum 99 percent even though if you have more than that you can utilize only 99 percent remain at least one percent you have to pay it in cash guys clear yes even though you have credit more than 20 lakh still only 99% you can utilize as credit remaining 1% you have to pay it through electronic cash ledger. That is what they are telling you. Clear? Ra? Yes. Sir, what if I have credit only 15 lakh? What if I have credit only 10 lakh? Obviously, you can utilize only that much remaining you have to pay it in cash ledger. This is only when you have ITC more than 20 lakh. This is when they are telling, no, no. Even if you have more than credit, more credit than 20 lakh, please you don't utilize full. Utilize only 99%, remaining 1% you pay it in cash. And sir, what about the unutilized credit? You can carry forward it to next month. You can carry forward it to next month. Okay. But this restriction is not applicable in the following cases. Means even if your turnover is more than 50 lakh in a month, if you are covered in any of these four cases, for you, rule 86B is not applicable, guys. Means you can utilize your full credit, if at all, if you have. Okay. Where the said person or proprietor, karta or managing director or any of its two partner, any of its two partner, minimum two, full time director or members of managing committee of association of board of trustee, as the case may be, clear. So if associate or the sorry not associate supplier is any person like company partnership form under they are telling whoever is the face of it, if they have paid more than one lakh as income tax in last two years in both the years more than one one lakh they would have paid. In that case, they are telling, okay, supplier, for your rule 86B is not applicable. In last two years, assume in the current year we are checking, 23-24, is rule 86B is applicable on that. Go back and check last two years, 22-23, 21-22. In both the years, if income tax paid is more than 1 lakh, more than 1 lakh, then they are telling in the current year, for the supplier, rule 86B is not applicable. If supplier is like company partnership firm under, whoever is the face of it. Or even if HGF, who is the face of it? Karta. Clear? So in case of company, who is the face of it? Managing director. In case of partnership firm, who is the face of it? Partners. Minimum two partners. If they have paid income tax more than 1 lakh, income tax, not GSTA, income tax more than 1 lakh in both the years, they are telling in the current year, rule 86B is not applicable. Okay, sir. Next. Where the registered person has received a refund of more than 1 lakh, more than 1 lakh in the preceding financial year, that is only in one year. An account of unutilized ITC in case of zero rated supply made without payment of tax or inverted duty structure. Now, in the last year, if you have got GST refund of more than 1 lakh, then in the current year, rule 86B is not applicable. In the last year, if you have claimed a GST refund of more than 1 lakh, that to what? Unutilized credit refund. 
unutilized credit means sir i had a tax which i have paid on my inward supply i was eligible to claim the credit of it but i have not claimed it so in that case can i claim the refund of unutilized credit yes only in two cases you can claim the credit of unutilized input tax credit guys that is when your outward supply is zero rated you will not pay any tax on it but on inward supply can i claim credit yes so in that case on inward supply whatever tax we have paid i can claim the credit but to claim the credit my output tax is zero so can i claim the refund of unutilized itc yes you can claim same way inverted duty structure inverted duty structure means on your inward supply gst is 28 percent whereas on on my outward supply gst is 12 percent so what tax i am paying on inward plus inward supply is more than what tax i will pay on my outward supply even in that case even though i am utilizing itc still i am not able to utilize fully in that case can i claim the Create a refund of unutilized input tax credit. Yes, you can claim. Inverted duty structure means the tax on your inward supply is more than the tax on your outward supply. The rates. In that case, even though you are eligible to claim ITC, if you are not eligible to claim full ITC, you can claim the refund of unutilized input tax credit. In that case, if you have in the last year, if you have claimed the refund of unutilized input tax credit of more than 1 lakh, in the current year, Rule 86B is not applicable. So it will not make sense also to apply rule 86b again we have to give credit refund of unutilized itc and all they're telling no no rule 86b is not applicable for you next c where a registered person has discharged his liability towards output tax though the electronic cash ledger for an amount which is in excess of one percent of output tax liability applied cumulatively up to the said month in the current financial year Sir, what is it? Guys, simple. Assume I am in January now. In January, my taxable supply is more than 50 lakhs. What they are telling is leave January. Take the preceding all the months from April to December. That is from the beginning of the financial year till the last month, which is the last month for January, December. So all this month put together, check what is your output tax. Assume it is 10 lakh guys. Check how much GST you have paid it in cash. How much GST you have paid in cash? Assume it is 1 lakh. Totally, I have paid GST. Output tax was a, a 10 lakh. Assume I have utilized the ITC of 9 lakh. Remaining 1 lakh, I have paid it in cash. Cash means using electronic cash ledger. Okay, sir. So now, what I have paid in cash, is it more than 1% of my actual output tax? We have to see, guys. So, you can see it is actually 10%. So, more than 1%? Yes, cumulatively. From the beginning of the year till the last month. Have I paid more than 1%? Is it more than 1%? Obviously. So if I have paid more than 1% of my output tax through electronic cash ledger, then in the current month, that is in January, they are telling no. Rule 86B is not applicable. Rule 86B is not applicable. Already till the last month, cumulatively, you have paid more than 1% of your output tax in cash. Now for January, we are not considering it. Same way we can do it even for February, March. So when I am doing for February, we have to count from April to Jan. Cumulatively, what was the output tax? In that, how much I have paid in cash? Is it more than 1%? If yes, even for February, it will not be applicable. Yeah, like that. Okay. Next, the last one. Where the registered person is, government department, public sector undertaking, local authority, statutory body. So if the following people are the supplier, even though their turnover is more than 50 lakh, our taxable turnover is more than 50 lakh, still rule 86B will not be applicable. Rule 86B will not be applicable, guys. Clear? Yes. So this is all about the input tax credit chapter, guys. This I already covered it. So input tax credit chapter. So coming to the sections, so you can see only section 16, 17, 18 was a part of your inter syllabus. Remaining three sections, you guys would be learning it at final level, guys. So this is all about input tax credit fine students now we will continue with chapter 9 that is registration under gst again bit lengthy chapter section 22 to section 30 of cgst act talks about registration like guys section 22 to 30 of cgst act talks about what registration and all the sections are a part of your inter syllabus. All the sections, each and every section here is a part of your inter syllabus. So we'll learn one by one. 
Registration of any business entity under the GST law implies obtaining a unique number from the concerned tax authorities for the purpose of collecting tax on behalf of the government and to avail input tax credit for the taxes on his inward supply. Now, if I am a recipient, if I want to claim input tax credit, then I have to be registered, guys. We have learned it in input tax credit chapter. Registration is mandatory for the recipient to claim input tax credit. As per section 2107, taxable person means who is registered under GST or the person who is liable but not yet registered. Even the person who is liable but not yet registered is considered as taxable person. Okay. Next, the registration under GST is PAN based whereas state specific. Now, if I am having operation in more than, uh, more than one state, then I have to take registration for each and every state mandatorily but everything under one PAN under one pen means for each state one registration at least is mandatory guys clear so registration is state specific but under my pan pan based gst identification number is a 15 digit number and a certificate of registration incorporating the gst in that is gst identification number is made available to the applicant upon registration every registered person shall display his gst in on the name board exhibited at every entry of his principal place of business as well as at every additional places of business that is branches registration under gst is not tax specific which means that there is single registration for all the taxes that is cgst sgst utgst igst as well as cis now if i am taking registration in karnataka sir should i obtain registration under each tax separately no guys if i obtain single registration that means yes i am it is understood that i am registered under karnataka state next Guys, I am. I would be talking little loudly because there is some work going on here. So there might be some disturbance in the audio. That is why I am bit little odd. Means I am trying to talk little loud. So hope there is no disturbance for you guys. Okay. <clears throat> so my voice should override that noise. That is what I am trying to do. It fine. Chal. So which are those sections which we will be covering in this chapter is section 22 to 30 guys. We will be covering all the sections in detail one by one. 22 very important. 22, 23, 24 is important. Who will, which will answer who is supposed to get registered under GST. These sections will answer what? Who is supposed to get registered under GST guys. That is section 22 plus 24 will tell who should get registered. And 23 is telling who should not get registered. 23 is telling who should not get registered. So, 22-24 is telling who should get registered. 23 is telling who should not get. So, it is like a minus. Okay, sir. Let us start with. <coughs> section 22, subsection 1. Very important. Subsection 1 especially is very important. Every supplier shall be liable to be registered in the state or union territory. If his aggregate turnover in the financial year is more than 10 lakh. That is in case of MMNT. Manipur, Mizoram, Nagaland and Tripura guys. Whereas more than 20 lakh in any other states or union territory. Guys, section 22, subsection 1 gave the power to the government to extend the limit of 20 lakh to 40 lakh for the exclusive supplier of goods within the state. Exclusive supplier of goods within the state. Using this power, government has notified it as per the notification. More than 40 lakh is the limit in case of exclusive only goods of goods within the state. Clear. And for this purpose, guys, if a person is supplying goods along with financial service, even though financial service is falling under service, we will ignore it and we will consider it as he is exclusively supplying only goods. He is supplying only goods. Okay. Subsection 2. Every person and this 40 lakh, we will see it later exactly for whom it is applicable, for whom it is not applicable and all. We will learn it later also. But this is as per notification. Section 22, subsection 1 gave a power to the government to notify when 40 lakh is applicable, government has used this power and they have notified it. Subsection 2. Every person who on the day immediately preceding the appointed day. Appointed day here is the day on which GST was implemented, 1st July 2017. Is registered or holds a license under an existing law. That is previous to, previous to GST, that is before 1st July 2017. If you were registered under any indirect tax like service tax, VAT, CST, excise, then it is mandatory for you to get registered under GST. Now, obviously, this point is not so relevant as on today, but still it is a part of the law. Guys. Next, where a business carried on by a taxable person registered under GST, that is that is transferred to another person as a going concern, 
the transferee or the successor shall be liable to be registered with effect from the date of such a transfer or succession. Now, my business was registered under GST. I am transferring my business to you. Now, for you also registration is mandatory, guys. Now, sir, can I give my registration certificate also to you? No, 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 no. Because my registration would have been taken under my PAN. Now, can I transfer the registration certificate also? That is not possible. So, in that case, if I am transferring my business to you, I have to cancel my registration and you have to obtain a separate registration, which is mandatory for you under your PAN. Next, subsection 4. In case of transfer pursuant to amalgamation or demerger of two or more companies pursuant to an order of I court, tribunal or otherwise, the transferee shall be liable to be registered with effect from the date on which registrar of companies issues the certificate of incorporation. So if there is any amalgamation or demerger due to the order of I court or tribunal guys, then the transferee, it is mandatory for him to get registered under GST. This is section 22 guys. Subsection 1 is very important here. Okay, and I will also talk about this in detail later along with the tables, chart and all. Now let us move to section 24. For whom the registration is mandatory. Guys, whoever is covered here, irrespective of their turnover, they have to get registration mandatory. Registration is mandatory for them, compulsory means. Notwithstanding anything contained in section 22 subsection 1, the following categories of person shall be required to be registered under this act. Person making interstate taxable supply, that is outside the state. Cash or taxable person making taxable supply, whether within the state or outside the state. Or persons who are required to pay tax under reverse charge mechanism, that is the recipient. This three sections has to be read with section 23, guys. Clear? Because there are some if and but story which is given in section 23, we will see it. Okay, I will go, I will explain when I go to section 23 along with this. Fine. Next, non resident taxable person, always. Then, a person who are required to pay tax under section 95, that is electronic commerce operator on RAT services. So he should always get registered who? Electronic commerce operator. Next, electronic commerce operator who is required to collect tax at source under section 52, not 95. Whenever electronic commerce operator is supposed to collect TCS under section 52, for him registration is mandatory. <coughs> okay. Next, seventh one. Person who is supplying goods or services, please be careful, this is a change. Person who is supplying goods as well as services. Only services was there before, but now goods or services subject to threshold limit and condition. That is only if their turnover is more than threshold limit, they have to get registered. Through electronic commerce operator who is required to collect tax at source under section 52. That is important. Let me explain. Assume electronic commerce operator. You are the supplier who is supplying the goods or services through ele electronic commerce operator. Now, if electronic commerce operator, guys, there are three, two scenarios. First, let us cover from electronic commerce operator point of view. If electronic commerce operator is paying tax under section 95, that is for RAT services. RAT services only. RAT. Clear? RAT Yatra. Okay. In that case, the electronic commerce operator has to get registered. <clears throat> okay. Sir, should supplier get registered? No. Supplier is not registered. That is why we are asking electronic commerce operator to pay tax okay sir next second scenario is if electronic commerce operator is supposed to collect tcs is supposed to collect tcs whatever supply has been made by supplier through electronic commerce operator to the recipient now so for the payment what electronic commerce operator will collect it from the recipient before he give it to the supplier he has to collect tcs tcs provisions are a part of your syllabus we will cover it at the end okay so, if electronic commerce operator is supposed to collect TCS for whatever supply of goods or services is happening through him, then electronic commerce operator has to get registered. Who should get registered? Electronic commerce operator. Now, something connected to this case. Whenever supplier is supplying goods or services through electronic commerce operator and if electronic commerce operator is supposed to collect TCS under section 52, they are telling supplier, you get registered only if your aggregate turnover is more than threshold limit. That is 10 lakh, 20 lakh, whatever threshold limit is applicable for you. Supplier should get registered only if his aggregate turnover crosses threshold limit. Clear? If not, he need not get registered. And here, goods is a new addition, guys. Before, for goods supplier, it was mandatory to get registered. But now, through statutory update, if you guys have already watched my statutory update video, there, there is a change. Even for good supplier, they have given threshold limit. 
clear and there are some conditions that he has to supply within the state that is under so hope you guys have watched all those conditions are important please have a look into it guys in the statutory update video <coughs> clear yes sir next we'll move forward person who are required to deduct tax under section 51 whoever is supposed to deduct tds now for them registration is mandatory and please be careful guys if the following people the person who is required to deduct tds now they are registered under gst but in two places in rcm they have been excluded that is gta service and security services recipient is registered but only for deducting tds sir. they are not making any taxable outward supply in that case if the recipient is registered only for tds rcm is not applicable which are those two services gta and security services you can just go back and look into it clear so whenever you want to refer to anything please pause the video go back watch it okay person who make taxable supply of goods or services or both on behalf of other taxable person whether as an agent or otherwise if agent is supplying the goods or purchasing the goods on behalf of the principal he should get registered mandatory <coughs> then input service distributor input service distributors provisions are not covered for you in your inter syllabus but still if you are a inter input service distributor for your registration is mandatory then every person supplying the online information and database access or retrieval services from a place outside india to an unregistered person in india means recipient is unregistered where is the supplier outside india he is supplying what online information and database access or retrieval services from a place outside india to a person in india but that recipient is unregistered supplier come to india and get registered come to india in the sense literally need not physically come because the registration you can apply online also but you have to get registered in india even the provisions with respect to this uh, supplier who is supplying online information and database access or retrieval services it is a part of igst act which you guys would be learning at final level clear in gst most of the provisions like uh, wherever i am telling covered in final level final level i know students somewhere feeling how oh, fine so these are the cases where it is mandatory for the person to get registered next we will see 23 first i covered 24 because there is a purpose i told you 22 24 will tell who should get registered 23 is telling who should not get registered okay the following persons shall not be liable to registration namely who are those any person engaged exclusively means only in supplying goods or services or both that are not liable to gst or wholly exempt from gst guys i am supplying only alcoholic liquor for human consumption which is completely outside GST exemption, no registration. Sir, I am supplying only a service which is exempt under GST. Should I get registered? No. Sir, I am supplying two things, one taxable, one exempt. Should I get registered? Yes, I should get registered. Provided I cross threshold limit and all. Because guys, while checking the aggregate turnover, aggregate turnover is as per section 26. And aggregate turnover includes both taxable outward supply as well as exempt outward supply. It includes both. So while calculating the aggregate turnover, you have to include both to see whether I am liable for registration or not. So if a person is supplying both taxable as well as outward uh, taxable as well as exempt outward supply, then for him threshold limit will be applicable. Assume I am supplying only exempt outward supply. My turnover is 80 lakh. Should I get registered? No. If you are exclusive supplier of exempt outward supply, no registration is required. Sir, I am supplying exempt goods for 80 lakh and taxable goods for only 10 lakh what is my aggregate turnover 90 lakh is it more than threshold limit yes sir should i get registered yes you have to get registered yes you have to get registered because while counting aggregate turnover we have to consider both exempt as well as taxable clear guys come on as per 2 subsection 6 what is the aggregate turnover taxable outward supply it will not include inward supply only outward supply even on my inward supply if i am paying tax under rcm it is not considered as my aggregate turnover only my outward supply that is my sales okay plus exempt supply export interstate supply under all under one pan all india based whenever we are calculating aggregate turnover it should always be pan based guys pan based clear registration is state wise but aggregate turnover is pan based even if i have operations in four states all four states put together i have to calculate sir assume <coughs> I have operations in Manipur and Karnataka. What is the threshold limit applicable for me? 10 lakh. Even if you are operating in one special category states, the threshold limit applicable for you is 10 lakh. 
both the branches put together if aggregate turnover is more than 10 lakh in both the states i have to get registered in both the states i have to get registered guys hope you are able to get it i repeat it assume the turnover in manipur is 5 lakh in karnataka it is 15 lakh both put, to, put together how much 20 lakh is it more than 10 lakh yes i have to get registered even sir both manipur and karnataka so even if i am operating in one special category states my threshold limit applicable would be 10 lakh special states means only mmnt here for registration only four states clear guys yes so while calculating aggregate turnover it should be pan based and as per section 26 which defines aggregate turnover gst anything charged under gst will not be included please be careful whether it is cgst sgst igst udgst says will not be included clear na? yes i don't know what work they are doing they are like drilling my head only here <coughs> we will see b an agriculturist to the extent supply of produce out of cultivation of land means if i am a farmer who is selling only my cultivation or my crops then i need not get registered under gst sir i am doing farming also plus manufacturing also in that case i have exempt plus taxable supply sir check both put together aggregate turnover is it more than threshold limit if yes you have to get registered see registration you have to get registered but we are not asking you to pay tax on exempt supply. Whatever taxable supply is there, you have to pay tax only on that. Clear? So if a farmer is having some business also, he is making some taxable supp outward supply. In that case, for him, threshold limit would be applicable. If he is supplying or selling only crops what is growing, irrespective of his turnover, he need not get registered. guys. Irrespective of his turnover, he need not get registered. Next. Subsection, uh, okay. I hope you guys understood both the clauses. So simple guys, if my outward supply, <clears throat> if my outward supply is out of the following three, only, only exam supply, no registration. Sir, only non-taxable supply, non-taxable supply means which is outside the GST on which GST is not at all applicable like alcohol, petroleum products like that. Then the third one, only agriculture products. In this three cases, irrespective of my actual turnover, I need not get registered. Whether it is more than 20 lakh, more than 1 crore, 10 crore, 20 crore, whatever it is, you need not get registered. Along with this, if you are doing something taxable supply, then we have to check whether my aggregate turnover, which includes both exempt as well as taxable supply. And even non-taxable supply is a part of exempt supply. Please be careful. So I am supplying alcohol along with that, some goods. In that case, even though alcohol is not covered under GST, is it a part of exempt supply? Yes. To check the aggregate turnover, should I include the turnover of alcohol business also? Yes, you have to include it because it is a part of exempt supply as per section 247. Agree, that is exempt supply definition. <coughs> Hope you guys are able to do it. One, if you are doing only either of this, no registration guys, irrespective of your turnover. If you are doing any of this along with the taxable supply, then we have to see what is our turnover and aggregate turnover will include both will include both and whenever we are calculating aggregate turnover it should always be all india basis guys pan based to check whether we are eligible or not if my all india basis turnover is more than the threshold limit in whichever states i am operating everywhere i have to get separate registration okay in my regular classes, I have given number of illustrations on this and I have given, <coughs> explain, I have explained this, but still to the extent possible, I am doing it here also. Fine. Subsection 2 guys, following category of person have been notified by the government as being exempted from obtaining the registration under GST law, read with section 24. I told you here, this three points we have to study along with section 23. So that is what we are doing now. What are those guys? Person that is the suppliers engaged only in making taxable outward supply, the total tax on which is liable to be paid on reverse charge basis by the recipient. Nice. I am supplying the goods or services on which always the recipient is liable to pay tax. RCM is applicable. For recipient, registration is mandatory as per section 23. Whereas for supplier, registration is not required. Sir, I am supplying, I am supplying two S1, S2. For S1, RCM is applicable. For S2, FCM is applicable. Should I get registered? Yes, maybe. If my turnover is more than threshold limit, I have to get registered. 
clear so what they are talking about here is i am supplying only an item which is taxable under rcm where the recipient is liable to pay tax so for recipient registration is mandatory because he is covered under rcm irrespective of his turnover he has to get registered whereas for the supplier if he is supplying only the goods or services on which rcm is applicable for him registration is not required okay sir <coughs> next the persons making interstate supply of taxable services and having an aggregate turnover of less than or equal to 20 lakh or 10 lakh in a financial year guys in 22 they told if it is interstate taxable supply you have to get registered but in section 23 they are giving exemption for interstate taxable supply of services that means this is applicable for whom only goods so if you are supplying services outside the state still for you turnover is applicable if you are supplying the services outside the state and if your turnover is less than 20 lakh or 10 lakh you need not get registered if your turnover is more than 20 lakh or 10 lakh yes you have to get registered clear so for goods if you are supplying outside the state registration is mandatory irrespective of the turnover if you are supplying the services outside the state then turnover is applicable it is turnover based registration is clear yes so here what is covered is only goods okay yes. see actually they have given like this only in section 24 but they have given some exemption in 23 so after studying both we will be able to tell clearly okay when exactly registration is applicable when it is not applicable so actually all these three sections you have to study together only after studying all these sections 22 23 24 you will be able to tell when a person is supposed to get registered or when he is not supposed to get registered guys only if you have a knowledge of one section or two sections that is not enough all three you should know please be very careful even when you are answering especially descriptive if there is any connection to be given please give it remember the section numbers last one a person including casual taxable person making interstate supply of goods have been exempted from obtaining registration that is outside the state which are those person making interstate taxable supply of notified handicraft goods or person making interstate taxable supplies of products made by a craftsman predominantly by hand even though some machinery may be used in the process conditions to be fulfilled the aggregate value of such supplies less than or equal to 20 lakh or 10 lakh whatever the threshold limit applicable for you 10 lakh in case of mmnd 20 lakh in case of any other state or union territory plus such persons have obtained a pan and have generated an e-way bill sir too much of confusion they have created guys let us see here now if you are a supplier supplying goods outside the state and if it is handicraft goods guys or goods which are made predominantly by hand even if you are supplying the goods outside the state whether you are a normal supplier or ctp that is casual taxable person for you threshold is applicable that is aggregate turnover is applicable for you only if your turnover is more than 20 lakh or 10 lakh you will get registered Whereas, if you are supplying any other goods outside the state, for you, turnover is not applicable, for you, registration is always mandatory. Cut off, cut it off, listen here again. Uh, no, no, listen here. If supplier is supplying handicraft goods or goods which are notified handicraft goods, okay? You can see here, notified. Sir, what are those handi notified handicraft goods and all? Are you, should you be bothered about it? No are the goods which are predominantly made by hand guys like baskets candle toys like that in that case turnover is applicable even if you are supplying outside the state still turnover is applicable you have to get registered only if your turnover is more than 20 lakh or 10 lakh sir what if my turnover is less than or 20 uh, less than 20 lakh or 10 lakh and if you have obtained a pan and if you are generating eBay bill for the transportation of goods outside the state for your registration is not mandatory even for CTP, they are giving that exemption. So, here in section 24, they told CTP you have to get registered. But if CTP is transferring, uh, supplying the handicraft goods or the goods which are predominantly made by and outside the state, for them, threshold limit is applicable. For them, threshold limit is applicable. One point connected to RCM also, guys. GTS service. There at the end, they have told recipient includes CTP, that is, casual taxable person majority of the case ctp will be registered but if ctp is supplying handicraft goods or goods uh, goods made predominantly by and outside the state if their turnover is less, less than the limit they would have not registered yes sir 
in that case is rcm applicable no if ctp is not registered rcm is not applicable rcm is not applicable in that case ctp will not be covered under specified recipients under rcm clear in any other case for ctp registration is mandatory whether they are supplying the goods within the state or outside the state registration is mandatory for them in that case they would have been covered under specified recipients case clear please be careful if ctp is supplying any other goods other than notified anti-craft goods or the goods made predominantly by and for them registration is mandatory guys whether they are supplying within the state or outside the state doesn't matter for them registration is mandatory clear who is casual taxable person who is not resident taxable person we will understand it is part of your registration chapter we will understand it later guys okay Hope you guys are clear now sir what about if i am supplying services outside the state threshold limit is applicable if your turnover is within the threshold limit no registration if it is more than threshold limit please get registered clear so please be careful these three points especially you have to study along with section 23 guys 23 the second subsection second subsection clear yes sir now again <clears throat> we are not yet done with this who should get registered we are still continuing the story I told you threshold limit has been increased to 40 lakh by way of notification. Sir, for whom exactly it is applicable? Guys, guys, please listen. Threshold limit for registration for those engaged in exclusive supply of goods. Exclusive means only goods. I told you for this purpose, if you are supplying financial service that is extending loan or advance for which in return interest or discount is charged. If you are supplying goods along with that financial service, we will ignore financial service. We will consider that you are exclusively supplying only goods. Clear? Yes. Enhance to 40 lakh wide notification except means in the following case, 20, 40 lakh is not applicable. It is either 10 lakh or 20 lakh or no limit. So 40 lakh is not applicable in the following cases. Which are those cases? Person engaged in making intrastate supplies in the states of Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Sikkim, Uttarakhand, Mizoram, Manipur, Nagaland, Tripura, Puducherry or Pondicherry and Telangana. In simple, as per section 10, there are 8 special category states. Ah, you have to take that plus PT here. PT means Puducherry, Telangana. Guys, listen here. Let me explain by way of story here. Guys, as per article 279A, there are 11 special category states, guys. You are supposed to remember it. Sometimes they may ask questions based on states. 279A, Article 279A, there are 11 states, special category states. Which are those, sir? Three topmost states, topmost states plus eight northeastern states, guys. Eight small, small northeastern states. The three topmost states is Jammu Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand. Jammu and Kashmir, Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh clear and eight northeastern states small small states this is as per article 279 in composition scheme as per section 10 1 guys composition scheme as per section 10 1 they have told the limit is 1.5 crore whereas for few eight states eight states not all 11 for eight states it is 75 lakh this is only for composition scheme under 10 1 whereas 10 to a everyone 50 lakh for everyone it is 50 lakh okay sir sir which are those eight states sir simple guys we will take same 11 states here 11 states and we will minus three states three states which are those three states sir arch 11 states same as as per article 279 you have to take but three we have to explore which are those arch clear what are those sir himachal pradesh arunachal pradesh uh, <clears throat> Yeah, Himachal Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh and Jammu Kashmir. And Jammu Kashmir, we have to exclude it. Remaining 8 states, yes, we have to consider 75 lakh. Only there are 8 special states for the purpose of composition scheme under section 10 one guys. As per article 279, no, 11. But for composition scheme under section 10 one only 8. That means they are excluding 3. Arj, they are removing it. Okay. Now coming to composition scheme composition so composition done registration 10 lakh limit is applicable when only mmnt only mmnt only mmn mmnt and later as per notification 40 lakh limit is applicable na? 
that is not applicable for 10 states guys 40 lakh limit is not applicable for 10 states which are those sir same eight states whatever was there as per composition scheme plus pd puducherry and telangana same eight states you have to take plus pd guys totally 10 states totally 10 10 states for this 10 states 40 lakh limit is not applicable either 20 or 10 hope you understood this story clear i just repeat it guys as per article 279a totally 11 states special category states three topmost states plus eight northeastern states for section 10 one composition scheme for which 75 lakh limit is applicable only eight states that is out of 11 we have to remove arch okay then for 40 lakh limit as per registration chapter are read with notification 40 lakh limit is not applicable for 10 states which are those eight states as per composition scheme special states plus pt that is puducherry and telangana for this 10 states 40 lakh limit is not applicable hmm. hope you guys got so when you remember like this it becomes easy guys or else you will confuse what is included where and the so please try to remember like this and make a note of it okay where which state is covered as special clear and for 10 lakh limit only mmnt please be careful for 10 lakh limit only mmnt and here the 10 states includes mmnt also 10 states whatever is excluded here from 40 lakh limit na, includes mmnt also okay sir then persons required to take compulsory registration under section 24 whoever is covered under section 24 na, for them there is no threshold limit so 40 lakh limit is also not applicable for them okay next suppliers of the following guys whether you are a manufacturer or a trader if you are supplying means if you are outward supply if your outward supply is the following goods for you 40 lakh limit is not applicable whether you are supplying it within the state or outside the state doesn't matter which are those goods sir? ice cream and other edible ice whether or not containing cocoa Tobacco and manufactured tobacco substitutes, pan masala, fly ash bricks or fly ash aggregate, fly ash blocks, bricks of fossil mills or similar shalaceous earth, building bricks and earthen or roofing tiles. So here about tip, but A is not there. A is not there, guys. Please listen here. In composition scheme also, if you are a manufacturer of about tip, you are not eligible for composition scheme. Both 10-1 as well as 10-2A, you cannot opt in. Clear up. But here, A is not there. Aerated water is not there. Please be careful. If you are supplying anything other than aerated water, A, you can see here, I have written A and I have scratched it. That is, A is not there. Only B, T, T. B means what? So, bricks. P means bricks. T means tiles. Then, T, tip. Tip means what, guys? T, tobacco. I, ice cream. P, pan masala. If you are supplying any of this, if you are supplying aerated water, you are eligible for 40 lakh. Please be careful, guys. If you are sub, if you are a manufacturer of ABT tip, including A, you are not eligible for composition scheme under section 10.1.10.2A. But here, same to same items they have kept, but excluding A. Means aerated water, they have not covered it here. Please be careful with it because they will play around this, guys. Clear up? Yes. Then, person who is taking voluntary registration, you yourself want to come under GST, we will welcome you. Come on, welcome, Bagra, get in. <clears throat> so, for him, no limit is applicable. He is himself getting registered. Okay. Chalo, guys. So, as a summary, I have given some table here. Let us quickly understand. Threshold limit for registration for service provider would continue to because this 40 lakh is only for exclusive supplier of goods, goods, goods. Okay. Threshold limit for registration for service providers. Would continue to be what 20 lakh or in case of mmnt 10 lakh so simple guys summary summary the tables are giving you summary if you are the exclusive supplier of goods within the state that is intrastate then what is the threshold limit applicable for you if you are from mmnt 10 lakh if you are from other six states means whatever 10 states they have excluded here na, i have given that in the first two columns remaining six states guys remaining six states it is 20 lakh any other states are union territory 40 lakh clear so these are the 10 states which are excluded here clear that is composition scheme eight states plus pt pt means what puducherry telangana okay sir then threshold limit for registration for suppliers of either the services or bt tip not a a is not there guys just as a shortcut i have mentioned here but i have scratched it please be careful bt tip or both goods and services you are supplying goods along with services and that service is not financial service any other services in that case if you are from mmnt 
10 lakh. If you are from any other states or union territory, territory 20 lakh. Guys, if you are op having operation even in one special state, the threshold limit applicable for you will be 10 lakh. When you are calculating aggregate turnover from all the states, check whether it is more than 10 lakh. If yes, you have to get registered in each and every state. Clear, ra? Yes, sir. Chala. So, till now we have understood who should get registered. Who should get registered. Now, we will understand how they will get registered, sir. Once I get to know I am liable for registration, how will I get registration? Within, within what time should I apply for registration? Section 25. Procedure for registration. Every person who is liable to register under CGST Act must do, whether you are covered in section 22 or 24, must do within 30 days from the date when he becomes first liable. Means once you become liable, within 30 days, you have to apply for registration in GST REG 01. Or if you are a casual taxable person or non-resident taxable person, guys, you have to apply for registration five days before you commence your business. Five days before you commence your business, you have to apply for registration. Oh, about these two people, we will cover it later in detail. Then permanent account number is mandatory for getting registration. Exception is for NRTP because they may not have PAN. Then 25 6 6B, 6C talks about this other authentication. We will see every registered person shall undergo other authentication or furnish proof of possession of other number. That is who is already registered because this other authentication and all they brought it in the year 2021 or 2020. So in that case, if you are already registered before that under GST, for you, register, uh, other authentication is mandatory. Now, sir, once other authentication provision is brought, whoever is applying for registration, at the time of applying the registration itself, for them, other authentication is mandatory. For fresh registration, every individual shall have authenticate himself with other number. Sir, what if the person applying for registration is like HUF, company, partnership firm? Then whoever is the face of it, guys, like managing director, partner, or HF, their other has to be authenticated. In case of a person other than individuals, such as partnership firm, EOP, BOI, company, ex trust, etc. If supplier or the following people, for getting fresh registration, authentication shall be done by other number of whom, whoever is the face of it. Partner, authorized representative, or managing director, or a trustee, etc. Registration need to be taken state-wise. That is wherever you are operating, when you are liable for registration, for each and every state, separate registration is mandatory. Sir, should I take registration only in the state where I have crossed the threshold limit? No, because aggregate turnover should be calculated on all India basis. If your aggregate turnover on all India basis or PAN based is more than threshold limit, in every state, wherever you are operating, you have to get registered. And there is no centralized registration under GST. A business entity having its branches in multiple states will have to take separate state-wise registration for the branches in different states. A person having a unit in SEZ or being a SEZ developer shall have, a, shall have to apply for separate registration as a distinct from, each, from his place of business located outside SEZ in the same state or union territory. Guys, let me give an example. Now in Karnataka, I have three branches. One is in SEZ. Other two is in non-SCZ. How much registration I have to take? For each state, one registration is mandatory. Another two branches are in non-SCZ. Okay. What they are telling is, for SCZ, separate registration is mandatory. So, in my example, I have to take minimum two registration in Karnataka. One is for SCZ branch and another registration for all non-SCZ branch. So, in non-SCZ, I have two branches, sir. No problem. You can take only one for that. So, one plus one I have to take, guys. Clear? Sir, assume in Karnataka only, I have two different SEZ, two separate SEZ and plus one non-SEZ. How much registration I have to take? Three. For each SEZ, even though it is within the same state, you have to take separate registration. Clear? Yes. See, for one state, one registration is mandatory. But if you have in the same state, if you have business is in SEZ and outside the SEZ, then for SEZ separate registration, outside the SEZ separate registration, guys. Now, sir, we will forget about SEZ and all. Now, in Karnataka, I am doing five businesses. How much registration I have to take? Minimum one. Minimum one. For all five businesses put together, you can take one. But if you want, you can take five different registration. But in that case, each registration for which you have, means for each business for which separate registration you have taken will be treated as distinct person. And if there is any supply between distinct person, even without consideration, it will still be a supply. Be ready for it. If you are ready for it, take separate registration. 
clear now i repeat assume in karnataka i have five different businesses or five different branches not in acz any other area in that case how much registration i have to take sir minimum one sir i want to take for separate registration for each branch separate registration for each business sir can i do it you can take it it is optional but if you take it then each branch or each business will be treated as distinct person if you supply anything between the branch or between the businesses it will be treated as supply as per schedule one if you are ready for it go for it clear huh? yes okay a person who has obtained more than one registration whether in one state or union territory sir can we obtain yes i told you if you have different business vertical or if you have different branches optional it is you can take more than one registration but if you take it is treated as distinct or more than one state or union territory shall in respect of each such registration be treated as distinct person so if for whichever branch or for whichever business you have taken separate registration under one pan each of them will be treated as distinct person guys clear sir now i have operation in five states sir karnataka tamil nadu andhra pradesh telangana kerala i have operations in five states my aggregate turnover is more than threshold limit where and all should i get registered all five states minimum five registration within the state if you want to take more than one registration you are always welcome but minimum is five clear huh? next the effective date of registration as per rule 10 important if you applied for registration within 30 days from the date you become liable then the effective date of registration is the date on which you become liable sir what if i apply for registration after 30 days will still the registration be granted yes it will be granted but the effective date of registration will be the date of grant of registration this will affect your credit please be careful so we already discussed this now yeah you can see i will just here is while discussing section 18 i explained this let me just reiterate that guys now i became liable on 1st january i applied for on 15th january i applying within 30 days is important whether registration is granted within 30 days or it's not important i have to apply for registration in reg01 within 30 days okay so what is the effective date of registration 1st january so i can start claiming credit from when what date 1st january so even whatever stock i have on 31st december also i will be eligible as per section 31 sorry as per section 18 next sir i applied for registration after 30 days sir so in that case what is the effective date of registration it is the date of grant of registration in that case from when i will be eligible to claim input tax credit only on or after 20th february sir can i claim the credit of the stock which i have on 8, 19 february no sorry thank you section 18 doesn't allow this section 18 subsection 1 doesn't allow this guys okay <clears throat> so please be careful if at all if there is any descriptive question like this please explain connecting all the provisions guys yeah and you have to remember the section being my students you have to remember the sections guys because everything i am covering it in section order and i am mentioning the section even in my regular study material or revision material i have everywhere i have given sections because i want you guys to remember the provisions along with the sections okay bank account details may be furnished after obtaining registration certificate rule 10 a guys there, there is a change in this amendment in this so important as a part of statutory update they have changed this please be careful listen listen now while applying for registration if you are not given your bank account details once registration is granted still you can give your bank account details but within certain period what is that period sir the registered person has an option to give his bank account details after obtaining registration but within 30 days from the date of grant of registration or before furnishing the details of outward supply under section 37 in gstr1 or using invoice furnishing facility whichever is earlier guys so once you have obtained the registration within 30 days from the grant of registration or before you file your first gstr1 or if you are following qrmp before you give the first details using invoice furnishing facility whichever is earlier either 30 days or before filing the first gstr1 or invoice furnishing facility whichever is earlier before that you have to give your bank account details if not your registration might be cancelled exception no relaxation for tds deductor tcs collector or who has obtained voluntary registration for this people whenever they are applying for registration only they have to give bank bank account details guys okay then uin unique identity number section 25 9 under 10 read with rule 
any specialized agency of the United Nations organization or any multilateral financial institution and organization as notified under the United Nations Privileges and Immunities Act 1947, consulate or embassy of foreign countries is required to obtain UIN from GST portal and it is a centralized case. Sir, if a person that is foreign embassy and all, if they have obtained UIN, are they called taxable person? No, no, no. If a person is having unique identity number, they are not called as taxable person, guys. A person having UIN is not registered person and thus is not a taxable person. Clear? Then why should they obtain UIN and all? If they pay any tax on their inward supply in India, they are actually eligible to claim input tax credit. They can claim the refund of it actually. Clear? So for that, they should have some unique number which is UIN. UIN is centralized. Okay, they need not obtain it every in every state, guys. Then with 25, <clears throat> for 25, there are some charts and all. I will explain you. 26 telling, if you obtain the registration under a respective state in SGST Act, it is deemed registered under CGST Act. Now, assume, sir, I have applied for registration under SGST Act of Karnataka. It has been rejected, sir. It is deemed rejected even under CGST Act. You need not completely apply under CGST Act and check it. Clear? Huh? So, registration is state-wise. So, if you have applied for a registration in a particular state, if it is granted, it is understood that you are registered under CGST also. If it is rejected, it is understood that it is rejected under CGST also. Clear? Huh? Yes. Then, coming back to section 25, guys. Procedure, I have just given it you. Part 1 is not so important. Part 2 is important. But part 1, let us just quickly go through. Procedure for registration. <coughs> Every person who is liable to get registered and a person seeking voluntary registration shall before applying for registration declare his PAN and state or union territory in part A of G in form GST REG1. This is the form in which registration application will be made guys on GST common portal. PAN is validated online by a common portal from CBDD database and is also be very that is from direct tax okay because for direct tax purpose also what is the unique number PAN. And is also be verified through separate OTP sent to the PAN linked mobile number and email address. So you have to validate the OTP. Then TRN is generated and communicated to the applicant on the validated mobile number and email address. Fine, sir. Then using TRN, applicant shall electronically submit application in form, sorry, in part B of the application form along with specified documents at the common portal. He has to attach various documents like address and all. Part B of the application contains the details such as constitution of the business, jurisdiction that is area or address, option for composition scheme, date of commencement of business, reasons to obtain registration, address of principal place of business and the nature of activity carried out there that is the nature of business, details of additional place of business, details of bank accounts, details of authorized signatory, author authentication etc. Guys when you are obtaining the registration itself if you want to straight away go to composition scheme. In the part B only you can select, I want to opt for composition scheme. Yeah, yes. Next, on receipt of such application, an acknowledgement in the prescribed form shall be issued on the to the applicant electronically. A casual taxable person applying for registration gets a TRN for making an advanced deposit of tax in his electronic cash ledger and an acknowledgement is issued only after said deposit. CTP also will make application for registration in GST REG1 only. But he has to deposit the tax in advance, which we will discuss in section 27, guys. Okay. Then application shall be forwarded to the proper officer. Proper officer is nothing but like GST official. The procedure after receipt of application by the proper officer is depicted in part two. This is important, guys, from exam point of view. So, what is it, sir? We will see. Proper officer will examine the application and accompanying documents, guys. If everything is in order, he is happy with everything, he is satisfied. In that case, even if other authentication is done, then registration will be granted within seven working days from the date of submission of application without site verification. Means site verification is not required because other authentication is done online. No problem. Clear? Huh? Yes. Sir, application is in order, but in any of this scenario, A is when there is no physical verification required because other authentication is done, guys. Now you can see in B scenarios, when is it sir, where the applicant fails to undergo other authentication or does not opt for other authentication or where the proper officer deems fit to carry out site verification or 
where a person who has undergone author authentication is identified on common portal based on data analysis and risk parameters to carry out site verification. This is something new. Okay. In any of this case, guys, if obviously physical verification has to be done by the proper officer. So previously physical verification was supposed to be done with the physical presence of the applicant, but now it is not required. Physical presence of the applicant during physical verification is not required, guys. Clear? Huh? Yes. So when physical verification, verification has to be done, registration will be granted not within seven working days, within 30 days of application after verification of site and prescribed documents. Because he needs some time for doing physical verification. He will go there, collect the information, click the pictures, and he has to upload it on the GST portal. So for all this, they are giving you 30 days time. Okay, so within 30 days, conduct the physical verification. And if you are satisfied, grant the registration. Grant the registration. Please be careful before physical presence of the applicant was required during physical verification. But now they have removed it. Physical presence is not required. Even without the applicant, physical uh, the proper officer can go do the physical verification and upload all the documents. Okay, sir. next. This is when the application was fine. Okay, under that there are two scenarios. Physical other authentication done or not done. Or done but not satisfied. Like that guys. A done. So in that case, within seven working days. B is like other authentication, other authentication is not done or not opted or even if it is done, proper officer is feeling, no, no, I want to do physical verification or else as per this system, they are suggesting, the system is suggesting other authentication uh, is not possible, better go for physical verification. In that case, within 30 days, physical verification will be done and the registration will be granted, guys. Next, what if the same is not in order? That means the proper officer needs some clarity, more information, more documents he require. In that case, the proper officer will issue notice, thereby seeking clarification, information, documents from the applicant electronically. So, if the applicant, okay, what, within what time the notice has to be issued? Normally, in general cases, within seven working days. Once he receives the application for registration, within seven days, if he is not happy with the application, if he is happy with the application, he will grant the registration. If he is not happy with the application, within seven working days, he will issue the notice. Whereas, if it is this three special cases, guys, that is whatever we saw here, B. In this three cases, notice will be issued within 30 days. Within 30 days, not seven days. Within 30 days from the date of application submission. Clear? Huh? Yes, sir. Next. This is one. Please be careful. Either of this will come when application the proper officer is not satisfied with the application. Okay, next. If applicant has furnished the clarification, once the notice is issued, he has responded to it within seven working days. In that case, if the proper officer is satisfied with it, then within seven working days from the receipt of information, he will grant the registration. He will grant the registration, guys. Sir, no, sir. The applicant has not at all responded. He has not at all responded or else he has responded. But proper officer is not satisfied with his response. In that case, proper officer may reject the applications for the reasons to be recorded in writing. Clear in two scenario. That is notice is issued to the applicant, but he has not at all responded within seven working days. Or else he has responded, but proper officer is not satisfied with the response. In that case, he will reject the application. He will reject the application guys clear yes clarification includes modification correction of particular declaring the application for registration other than pan state mobile number or email address then if the proper officer guys whatever time is given to the proper officer whatever time that is year seven days year 30 days or even year seven days or even year 30 days whatever time is given for the proper officer he has to either accept or reject the application within that time. If he is accepting, he will grant the registration in REG 06, registration certificate. Or else he can reject it by giving the reasons in writing. Sir, even after 7 days or even after 30 days, if he is silent, it is deemed acceptance. It is deemed acceptance. Clear? Huh? So whatever time limit is given to the proper officer, if he has neither rejected or accepted till that time, it is assumed that it is accepted. It is deemed acceptance, guys. Clear? Huh? Yes. Sir. Next, coming to section 27. 
next coming to section 27 again important because this covers two special peoples this ctp and nrtp has effect in all other provisions also guys what is it we will see for ctp and nrtp we saw registration is mandatory yes. except ctp we supplying handicraft goods or the goods made by predominantly in hand in those two cases threshold limit is applicable okay sir First, we will see who is this CTP and NRTP. Then we will come back to section 27. Guys. Casual taxable person is defined in section 2, class 20. Who is he? Guys, let me explain in simple terms first. Assume I am registered in Karnataka. I am doing business regularly in Karnataka. Now, there is some exhibition happening in Maharashtra. I want to go and participate there and sell my goods there. And the exhibition will happen only for 30 days or 40 days in Maharashtra. In that case, I am not doing any regular business there. I am going there only for a temporary period. In that case, for Maharashtra state, I have to apply for registration as CTP and obtain the registration only for that 40 days. Clear? For CTP and NRTP, maximum registration will be granted for 90 days. Or if I am asking for less than 90 days, assume for 30 days, 40 days, 50 days, they will grant me only registration for that many days. Clear? So, CTP means I have a regular business in a state. There I am registered as a regular person. If I am temporarily going and doing business in some other state, for that state where I am going now, temporary period, I have to obtain the registration as CTP, guys. So, let us see the definition, what words they have used. These two definitions are also important. Few definitions under GST is very important, guys. Which are those means? Goods definition, 252. Services definition, 2102. Then, composite supply, mixed supply. Composite supply, 230. Mixed supply, 274. Then aggregate turnover 26. Then even this to CTP and NRTP definitions are very important. Even exam supply definition, all these are important, guys. Please remember the definition along with the sections. And if you get an opportunity, write the section, write the definition and explain it. You will definitely get, get good marks there. Clear? Yes. Chal. Casual taxable person as a person who occasionally undertakes transaction involving what? Supply of goods or services or both in the course or furtherance of business whether as a principal or agent or in any other capacity in a state or union territory where he doesn't have fixed place of business he, i went to maharashtra there i don't have any branch or office there i did just went and doing business in an exhibition for 30 days or 40 days clear so thus a casual taxable person is someone who has a business in a different state but comes to a different state for a business purpose temporarily Okay, I am a business, regular business in Karnataka. I am registered here. I am going to Maharashtra for a temporary period. So, whenever he is liable for registration, he has to apply for registration in GST REG 01, five days brief, uh, prior to commencement of business. And he has to file which return, guys? GSTR 1, which we will learn in returns chapter. Okay, now coming to NRTP. Sir, who is NRTP? NRTP, as name itself is telling, non-resident. He is from outside India. He has business outside India. But now he is coming to India for a temporary period. Assume there is some exhibition happening in Karnataka. Or some fair is happening in Karnataka. Or, from, or some sale is happening in Karnataka. For 30 days or 40 days. So this non-resident wants to come here and sell his goods in India. In that case, for whatever goods he is importing into India, if he has paid IGST, he can claim the credit of that. We have learnt already in ITC chapter. Clear? Huh? If he is purchasing any goods in India or services in India, on that if he has paid any tax, he cannot claim the credit of it. Only on the goods which is imported into India, if he has paid IGST on it, he can claim credit of it. Clear? Yes. So this person came coming outside in, from outside India to India for a temporary period. In that case, in whichever state he is operating, he has to obtain the registration as NRTP guys. Yeah. Section 277 defines non-resident taxable person as any person who occasionally undertakes transaction involving supply of goods or services or both, whether as a principal or an agent or in any other capacity, but who has no fixed place of business or residence in India, he doesn't have any business place in India. He just came here to do the business in a particular state for a temporary period. Sir, what if he is doing business in two, three states? Every, everywhere he will take registration as NRTP in whichever state he is operating. Okay. Hence, non-resident taxable person is someone who has a business outside India but comes to India for a business purpose temporarily. Application for registration is to be made by whom? 
that is nrtp in which form reg09 for him 01 is not applicable 09 because we will not ask his details and all he is as is from outside india very limited information we might be asking okay five days prior to commencement of business and return to be filed is gstr5 and not one whereas for ctp it is one whereas for nrtp it is gstr5 separate returns for him okay and while obtaining registration for him pan is not mandatory whereas for anyone else whoever is obtaining for registration under gst pan is mandatory whereas for nrtp he may not have pan so we are telling okay you are excluded and you can just add a word here guys for nrtp itc credit is available only for the goods imported by him if he is taking any inward supply in india he cannot claim any credit he cannot claim any credit okay as per section 17 5 you can just make a note of it. 17 subsection 5 okay now we will see section 27 Registration granted for CTP or NRTP is valid for a maximum period of 90 days, which can be further extended for another 90 days or for the period which is mentioned in the registration certificate, whichever is shorter. Means if I have asked for registration only for 40 days or 50 days, they would have given it, but maximum 90 days. And once I obtain the registration, assume the exhibition got extended. Can I ask for extension? Yes, but maximum extension is 90 days. Clear? Huh? So now first registration is the period what I have asked or 90 days, whichever is lower. If required, if there is any requirement, then extension can be sought for maximum 90 days. Clear maximum is 90. Extension can be asked for 10 days, 20 days, 30 days also, but maximum is 90 days. Then, sir, assume, <coughs> sir, registration first time, I have taken only for 50 days. So that remaining 40, can I carry forward? No, no. So, if I already obtained 50 days registration, I can maximum ask for how many days the extension? 90 days only. Sir, remaining 40, can I carry forward and ask for 130 days extension? No, 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 no. You cannot do it. Clear? Huh? Yes. Next, CTP and NRTP shall make an advanced deposit of tax for an amount equivalent to estimated tax liability at the time of submission of application for registration. Guys, whenever they are applying for registration at the time of application itself, they will know for how many days they will operate in a respective state. So they have to estimate their tax liability, estimate. It might be upward or downward, short, nothing, no problem. Underestimation, overestimation can happen, but estimate your tax liability and deposit it in advance. Because what? After your registration is over, if you run away. So, state will be like, la, 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 la. So, what they are telling is, please deposit the tax in advance, then we will grant you the registration. And obviously, at the end of the registration period, if there is any shortage or if there is any excess amount, it will be adjusted. Assume you have deposited 1 lakh, but your actual tax limit is 1 lakh 20,000. So, once you, your tax limit is crossing 1 lakh, the remaining you have to pay. It is not like, sir, 1 lakh is the final amount. No, it is just an estimation. Sir, what if I had paid 1 lakh but my tax liability came to only 90,000? They will refund you 10,000. They will refund you 10,000. Okay. Next, CTP and NRTP will make taxable supply only after the issuance of certificate of registration. So, they have to obtain for, apply for registration within 5 days prior to the commencement of business. Sir. So, they can start doing the business only once the registration certificate is granted for them. Sir, no sir, I am only like in very hurry, urgent. I want to start now only. No, you cannot. You cannot supply the goods or services as CTP or NRTP unless you obtain the registration under GST tax. Next. So, these are some important sections. Remaining 28, 29, 30 is also important with respect to amendment, cancellation and revocation, guys. Yes, we'll quickly go through this. 28. This is with respect to sir, registration. Everything is already obtained. Now, I want to change something. So, whatever details I had given at the time of making the application, now I want to change it, sir, due to any reason. So, in that case, you can apply for amendment, guys. Every amendment is not cancellation, means I am applying for changes, like how amendment happened in taxation. Nah? So, they are just making the changes here and there, plus, minus, so like that. Amendment of registration. Every registered person, yeah, every registered person and the person to whom a unique identity number has been assigned shall inform the proper officer of any changes, that is amendment, in the information furnished at the time of registration or the subsequent thereto, with relevant documents, that is proof, within the period of 15 days of such change. Sir, I have already obtained the registration by giving some details about my name, address, everything. Now, I am changing few data like my mobile number or email address and all. 
Should I update it? Yes, you have to update it within 15 days of change. The certificate of registration shall stand amended upon submission of such application on the common portal. Okay. The B point is important. Guys. See, whenever I apply for any changes or amendment, it is deemed approved. Immediately it will be approved, except NAP. In the following three cases, means if there is any change in the legal name of the business or address of the business or addition or deletion of retirement or retirement of any persons, that is the partners or the persons who are engaged in the business. NAP, change in the name, address or persons, guys. In these three cases, approval is required. Means the proper officer has to approve it. Only then amendment will stand, uh, st will be effective. Clear? Huh? So in the following three cases, which are those? NAP. Which does not warrant cancellation of registration. The proper officer shall, after the due verification, approve the amendment within a period of 15 working days and issue an order. Means approval is required. In any other case, approval is not required. If there is any other change, like my mobile number I am changing, email address I am changing, you can just update that and it is deemed approved. The proper officer will not come and check and approve it. Clear? Only in case of NAP, you will cross check and then approve it. Only then the amendment will be effective. Clear? Now, sir, change of address. Can I apply for amendment? Yes. Now, I am changing my address from Karnataka to Tamil Nadu, sir. Can I apply for amendment? No, no, no. Because registration is state-wise. In that case, you have to cancel your registration in Karnataka and apply for a fresh registration in Tamil Nadu. Clear? Ra? Yes. So, if there is any change of address outside the state and all, which will lead to a separate registration, you cannot apply for amendment. Cancel your registration in Karnataka and obtain a fresh registration in Tamil Nadu. Okay. The proper officer shall not reject the application for amendment without giving the person an opportunity of being heard. That is in case of NAP guys. Okay, because he has to approve it. Na? If at all, if he is not happy, he is not satisfied, he can reject it. But obviously, he has to give a reason for you. First, he will send you a notice. Only then after receiving your reply, he will decide whether to reject it or approve it. If he is satisfied, straight away you will approve it. If he is not satisfied, straight away you cannot reject. First, give the notice, wait for your response. After receiving your response, you can either accept or reject it. Or, in case where the proper officer is of the opinion that amendment sought is either not warranted or the documents furnished therewith are incomplete or incorrect, he may within a period of 15 working days from the receipt of application serve a notice. Within 15 days, he will serve a notice to you. Requiring the registered person to show cause, that is to reply. You have to reply for it. Within a period of 7 working days, means you have to reply within 7 working days. He can issue the notice within 15 days. Okay. Whereas you have to reply it within 7 working days after receiving the notice. As to why the application for amendment shall not be rejected. The proper officer, if satisfied, shall approve the grant of amendment to a registration to the applicant within a period of 7 working days from the date of receipt of such supply. Sorry, reply. Once the reply you are given, within 7 working days, they will either approve it or reject it. In case where the applicant has not responded, he has not at all responded within 7 days, within the time limit, or the proper officer is not satisfied with the reply. Two scenarios, you have not at all replied, or you have replied, but he is not satisfied with your reply. Then, he may, for the reasons to be recorded in writing, shall reject the application for amendment. Not reject the registration only. Only amendment they are rejecting. Fine, sir. Next, E point. In case where the proper officer has not taken any action within a period of 15 days or 7 working days, as the case may be, the application for amendment shall stand amended, deemed approval, to the extent applicable. Sir, once I make an application for Amendment that is assumed for NAP. NAP, clear? I applied for it. NAP or PAN, either way you can remember, guys. Clear? I, NAP or PAN, vice versa. Oh. So I have applied for an amendment of NAP. And within 15 working days, he has to either approve it or give a notice. He is silent. On 16th day, it is deemed approved. Or else, he has given a notice. He has given a notice to you to explain few extra things. And you are replied for it. Within 7 working days, he has to either approve or reject. Na? Yes, but he is silent. On the 8th day, it is deemed approved, guys. Clear? If he is silent. Next. Any rejection or approval for amendment under the SGST Act or UTGST Act shall be deemed to be the rejection under this Act. This Act means CGST Act. 
If the change in constitution results in change in time, then fresh application has to be filed for the registration and not the amendment for registration. Guys, assume I have sold my business to you. Can I apply for amendment? No. Sir, telling, sir, just change the name and PAN. No, no, because I would have obtained the registration under my PAN. When I'm selling my business to you, I have to cancel my registration and you have to obtain a fresh registration. Clear? Huh? In that case, we cannot apply for amendment. Telling, just change the name of the owner, just change the PAN. No, 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 we cannot do it. Application for amendment of registration cannot be filed for a change in PAN because GST registration is PAN based. So I would have obtained registration under my PAN. When business is sold to you, you have to obtain the registration under your PAN. Yeah. Similarly, application for amendment of registration form cannot be filed if there is a change in the place of business from one state to another state. GST registration are state specific, which I already gave an example, guys. From Karnataka to Tamil Nadu, if I am changing my address or if I am sh shifting my business, I cannot apply for amendment. I have to cancel my registration in Karnataka and obtain fresh registration in Tamil Nadu. Note, mobile number, email address of authorized signatory can be amended only after online verification through GST portal. Done with 28, 29, <coughs> 29 subsection 1, where the person who has registered is applying for cancellation or if he has gone, gone forever, his legal heirs are applying for cancellation of registration. Here, the registered person or his legal heirs is applying for cancellation, guys. Yeah, the proper officer may either on his own motion or on the application filed by the registered person or his legal heirs in case of death of such person cancel the registration having regard to the circumstances where the business has been discontinued or transferred fully for any other person including the death of the proprietor amalgamated with the other legal entity demerged or otherwise disposed of. There is any change in the constitution of the business or the taxable person is no longer liable to be registered under section 22 or 24 or intends to opt out of registration voluntarily made under section 25 subsection 3 voluntarily he voluntarily came inside telling i want to get registered now voluntarily you want to go out the proper officer is like okay sir clear yes so in normally this case the person who has got the registration is only applying for cancellation or if he is gone the legal heirs will apply guys provided that during the pendency of proceedings means till the Cancellation proceedings is completed during that pendency because I have to apply for cancellation. The proper officer will cross check and only then they will decide whether to cancel it or not. Till then the business will be suspended guys. So business will be suspended means not cancelled. You cannot do any outward supply and all during the period of suspension. Clear? So once the cancellation proceedings has been started till it is completed during this period, the suspension will be charged means the business would be suspended. Okay. 29 subsection 2. The proper officer may cancel the registration of a person from such date. Here, proper officer he himself is doing it, including any retrospective date. He may start, he may tell from your today your registration is cancelled, or he may tell from 1st January your registration is cancelled. He has that power to decide. Oh, proper officer. As he may deem fit, where which all cases the proper officer can cancel the registration, sir. Important scenarios, guys, for descriptive type. A registered person has contravened such provisions of the act or the rules made there under, as may be prescribed. So, as per Rule 21, these are the cases which are covered. The registered person does not contact any business from the declared place of business. He has obtained the registration, telling, Sir, this is my branch, this is my office, but he is not doing any business there. Or issues, invoice, or bill without the supply of goods or services in violation of the provisions of the act or the rules made there under that is he is giving fake bills bogus bills or violates the provisions of section 171 of cgst act section 171 of cgst act talks about what anti profiteering measure that is you are making profit in the name of gst for example gst applicable for you is 18 percent but you are collecting 22 percent from your customer or 28 percent from your customer something like that Okay, violates the provisions of rule 10A that is bank details guys. Next, avails ITC in violations of the provisions of section 16 of CGST Act or the rules made there under. So in section 16 we learned what all conditions has to be satisfied. You have violated that condition and you have claimed credit. Or violates the provisions of rule 86B when it is applicable for you but still you have not followed it. That is minimum 1% you have to pay it through electronic cash ledger but you have not paid it even though your monthly taxable turnover was more than 50 lakh. Means 86B was applicable, but still you have not followed it. 
Okay, then the furnish the details of outward supplies in form GSTR 1 for one or more tax period which is in excess of the outward supplies declared by him in his valid return under section 39 that is GSTR 3B. Guys, if for a particular month I have filed my GSTR 1 where I have disclosed my output tax as 5 lakh. Whereas for the same month when I filed my GSTR 3B, I am disclosing my output tax as 4 lakh. So there is a mismatch. Huh? Yes, sir. There is a mismatch. Normally it has to match for the same month. Assume it is for April. In that case, if the output tax as per GSTR 1 is more than the output tax as disclosed in GSTR 3B for the same month, then also your registration can be cancelled. Next, a person paying tax under section 10 that is composition scheme has not furnished the return for the financial year beyond three months from the due date of furnishing the said return. The composition supplier is supposed to file annual return guys. So whatever is the due date for him to file annual return, we will learn it in return chapter. Even after three months, plus three months they are telling due date plus three months. Even within that time if he has not filed, his registration can be cancelled. Next. Any registered person other than the person specified in clause B has not furnished a return for a continuous period of six months. That is normal taxable person, not composition, other person. Whoever is filing monthly return, if they are not filed the returns for six continuous months, continuous months. Okay. Or if the quarterly return filer does not, that is QRMP, not filed return for a continuous period of two quarters. Clear up. So this person is like who is covered in section nine. This person is like who is covered in section 10, guys. Clear. So whoever is covered in section 9, they can file monthly return or quarterly return. Monthly returns means more than 6 months. Or continuous 6 months. Okay. Whereas QRMP means continuous 2 quarters. Next, any person who has taken voluntary registration has not commenced his business within 6 months from the date of registration. He has obtained the registration already 6 months is over. Still he has not started his business only. Only registration is granted. What are you doing sir? Registration has been obtained by means of fraud, willful misstatement or separation of fact. Means at the time of applying for registration, you have given some wrong information. You have manipulated the department. You are telling, we will teach you a lesson. We will teach you a lesson. Provided that the proper officer shall not cancel the registration without giving the person an opportunity of being heard. Means obviously a notice will be given. They will wait for your response. Only once you give the response, they will take the final decision. Provided further that during the pendency of the proceedings relating to the cancellation of registration, the proper officer may suspend the registration. That is from the day the cancellation proceedings has been started till the day it is completed. Your business during this period, intervening period, registration can be suspended by the proper officer. Then 29 subsection 3. The cancellation of registration under this section shall not affect the liability of the person to pay tax and other dues under this act or to discharge any obligation for any period, period prior to the date of cancellation. Assume my registration is cancelled from 1st January 24. Before this, before my registration is cancelled, I was supposed to pay output tax of 10 lakh. Now, can I take a protection telling, anyway you are cancelled my registration, I will not pay tax? No, no. Till the registration is cancelled, whatever tax I am liable to pay, I have to pay it. I may be paying it after 1st January, but still I have to pay it. Clear? So for anything which I am liable before my registration is cancelled, my liability will continue. Liability will not get cancelled. Okay. Next, 29.4. For all this, they may build some story and put a question, guys. Please be aware of all this provision. Okay. 29.4. The cancellation of registration under SGST Act or UTGST Act, as the case may be, shall be deemed to be cancelled under CGST Act also, guys. Oh. Then the last one, 29 subsection 5. Every registered person whose registration is cancelled shall pay an amount equivalent to credit of input tax in respect of inputs held in the stock and inputs contained in semi-finished or finished goods held in stock on the day immediately preceding the date of such cancellation or the output tax payable on such goods, whichever is higher. Guys, simple. Assume my registration is cancelled. Effective date of cancellation of registration is 1st January. In that case, on 31st December 23, whatever stock I am having, Whatever stock I am having, check how much ITC I already claimed. If I already claimed it. Whatever ITC I already claimed on that stock or the GST on the sale value. Means I, all this stock I would be selling it. Uh, 
So what is the GST on that sale value? Whichever is higher, I have to pay. Whichever is higher. That is the ITC I have claimed or the GST on the actual sale value of the stock what I am having. Whichever is higher, I have to pay it. Then the same way for capital goods and plant and machinery. Provided that in case of capital goods or plant and machinery, the taxable person shall pay an amount equal to input tax credit taken that is availed already on the set capital goods or plant and machinery reduced by 5% per quarter or part of the quarter or the tax on transaction value that is nothing but sale value of such capital goods or plant and machinery under section 15 whichever is higher guys clear same as like 18.6 18 subsection 6 was not you are not selling because you are closing down your business there it was normal sale I purchased plant and machinery used it for few months and then I am selling it 18.6 is applicable here you have purchased capital goods or plant and machinery assume you have claimed a credit of 1 lakh you already claimed the ITC of 1 lakh. You had used it for 3 quarters. Now you are closing down your business. So cancelled. The registration is cancelled from 1st January. So before 1st January you have used it for how many quarters? 3 quarters. They are telling. So from 1 lakh you reduce 5% for each quarter. That means 15% 15,000 reduce 15,000. Remaining is how much? 85,000. Compare this with actual tax value on the sale value actual tax on sale value assume guys you have sold it for 8 lakh on 8 lakh gst assume is 10 percent i'm just taking random rate the amount come uh, amount of gst on sale value will come to uh, how much Eighty thousand. that is nothing 8 lakh is nothing but transaction value guys on transaction value what is the gst 10 percent comes to eighty thousand. so whichever is higher the person has to pay to the government eighty five thousand. Clear, huh? Yes. This is all about section 29, guys. With respect to suspension and all, the procedure and all is there, which I have covered in detail in my regular class. You can guys can just have a look into it, guys. I am not going in detail about the suspension and all in this revision session. Oh, let us move to the last section in this chapter: revocation of cancellation. Section 30, read with rule 23. Subsection one there is a change in this guys there is an amendment in this so please be careful <clears throat> subsection one any registered person whose registration has been cancelled by the proper officer on his own motion that is as per section 29 subsection 2 guys in any of this case he has cancelled your registration in any of this case he has cancelled his registration sorry he has cancelled your registration so assume Due to any of this case, the proper officer has cancelled your registration. So, can you apply for revocation of cancellation? Yes, asking sir, by mistake I did it sir, please give it back sir. May apply for revocation of cancellation of registration within 90 days amendment change from the date of service of cancellation order. So, once your registration is cancelled, they would have sent a cancellation order to you. Once you receive the cancellation order, you are shocked. Within 90 days, you can make an application for revocation. Clear? Sir, what if I myself has applied for cancellation? Can I apply for revocation? No, no. You can apply for a fresh registration. If you yourself has applied, for example, as per subsection 1, if you yourself has applied for a cancellation, in that case, can you again apply for revocation telling, sir, by mistake, I applied for cancellation. You have cancelled my order. I was just checking whether you are working properly or not. Actually, you have cancelled it, sir. Good, sir. Please give it back. Can I make an application for revocation? No, 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 you cannot. Only as per subsection 2, if the registration is cancelled by proper officer by giving notice to you, you responded to it. Only in that case, you can ask for revocation, guys. Okay. This time period to make application for revocation is 90 days. But extension is available. However, on sufficient costs can be extended by the commissioner or an officer authorized by him in this behalf, not below the rank of additional commissioner or joint commissioner for a further period not exceeding 180 days. So it is like 90 normal time plus 180 days. And extension is maximum 180, they are telling. Clear? Means it can be less than 180 also, but maximum is 180 days, which is again an amendment. Please be careful. Provided further that no application for revocation shall be filed if the registration has been cancelled for the failure of the registered person to furnish return unless such returns are furnished and any amount due as tax in terms of such returns has been paid along with any amount payable towards 
interest penalty and late fee in respect of said returns guys so simple assume your registration was cancelled because you didn't file your returns as per class b or class c clear so in that case if you are applying for revocation first clear all your pending returns file all your pending returns if there was any tax liability which was pending please pay that only then apply for revocation without filing the pending returns if you apply for revocation that revocation also will be cancelled or rejected it will be rejected because if your registration was cancelled due to non-filing of returns first file all the pending returns pay all the tax only then apply for revocation okay so subsection 2 if the proper officer is satisfied that there are sufficient grounds for revocation of cancellation he may revoke the cancellation means he will give back your registration by an order within 30 days of receipt of application and communicate the same to the applicant once you make an application within 30 days if he is satisfied he will revoke the cancellation guys means you will get back your registration otherwise he may reject the revocation application however before rejecting can he straight away on face reject it no first give the notice wait for the reply only then take the decision However, before rejecting the application, he has to first issue a show cause notice to the applicant who shall furnish the clarification within seven working days of service of show cause notice. The proper officer shall dispose the application or that is either accepted or rejected within 30 days of receipt of clarification. That is, if he is not satisfied with the application for revocation, he will issue the notice for it. And you have to reply for that notice within seven working days. And once you reply, Within 30 days, you will take the decision whether to accept the application for revocation or to reject it. Clear? Huh? Yes. Last subsection, 30 subsection 3. The revocation of cancellation of registration under CSGST Act or the UTGST Act as the case may be shall be deemed to be the revocation of cancellation of registration under this Act. So, if it is accepted or rejected under the SGST Act or, CG, uh, or UTGST Act, it is deemed accepted or rejected even under CGS. This dialogue is common everywhere, guys. Deemed acceptance or rejection. Because you need not apply separately under the CGST Act. Okay. All returns due for the period from the date of order of cancellation or the effective date of cancellation of registration till the date the order of revocation of cancellation of registration have, been, have to be furnished within a period of 30 days. Because you have got your registration back so in that case for whatever period your registration was cancelled na, you have to file the return from the day within 30 days from the date of order of revocation guys clear yes so so this is all about the registration chapter guys bit lengthy i know sir theory so much is there sir i am losing my interest guys i understand but only one thing should motivate you what is it the ca qualification Yes, the journey is very tough. I can understand. Especially the last one and a half month will be very tough for you guys. I understand that. Please push yourself. Please push yourself. You will be able to definitely get better results. Clear? So this one and a half months is very, very crucial for you. So please make sure that you guys don't get deviated. Don't lose focus. Don't get negative thoughts into your mind. Okay. Don't let negativity rule your mind guys. Clear? Be positive. Be always like, I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. Never let, can I do it? Or will I be able to do it? Can I remember everything? How will be the question paper? Will I be able to write everything in the exam? Guys, please don't those things. Don't let those things to come into your mind. Always be positive. Practice, practice writing. Just don't study or don't watch the videos. Guys, this and all will definitely save your energy. So once you guys watch, even after every chapter, practice some questions, practice writing. For descriptive writing is very, very important, guys. Presentation plays a very major role. Please take care of it. Clear? Yes, sir. So coming to registration, guys, we have covered. Every section is a part of your syllabus. We have covered. So we, till now, we are done till where? Section 30 of CGST Act. Fine? Yes, sir. Yes, guys, now we will revise chapter 10, which talks about tax invoice, credit note and debit note. Various documents to be issued under the GST law. What is what? Who should issue it? When they should issue it? To whom they should issue it? We will be learning in this chapter, guys. <coughs> An invoice is a commercial instrument issued by whom? Supplier of goods or services to the recipient, giving all the details of what goods he has supplied what quantity of goods he has supplied or what type of service he has uh, supplied 
then what is the quantity means with respect to goods quantity has to be mentioned then what is the gst rate what is the gst amount then the gst in of the supplier if the recipient is also registered then gst in of the recipient name address everything has to be mentioned in the document guys a registered person cannot avail the input tax credit unless he is in the possession of tax invoice or debit note we have learned in input tax credit chapter only that is the recipient on his inward supply he can claim the input tax credit only if in the, if he is in the possession of the invoice or debit note only then he can claim the credit whether physical invoice or e-copy anything is fine so which are those sections which we will be covering in this chapter is section 31 32 33 and 34 guys we have already learned till section 30 of cgst act agree na come on guys respond correct so we already covered in registration chapter till 30 now in invoice chapter we would be doing it from 31 to 34 all the sections all the sections we would be covering it guys 32 and 33 are small small section whereas 31 and 34 in detail we will learn clear up yes sir so let, let us get into section 31 now see guys 31 actually we already tested when we were discussing about the time of supply the time of supply sometimes depends on the due date of issue of invoice within what time the invoice has to be issued we already learned along with time of supply so now it is just like a repetition for you so section 31 is important why because we have this will decide when the invoice is supposed to be issued that is the due date to issue invoice and the time of supply will also depends especially under forward charge and all it depends on the due date to issue invoice whether the invoice is issued within the due date or not it is also important both for goods as well as services guys so now we will see section 31 subsection 1 talks about time limit for issuing the tax invoice in case of supply of goods regular supply guys okay normal supplies or regular supply we call it as first check whether supply involves movement of goods between the supplier and recipient if yes then invoice has to be issued before or at the time of removal of goods before it is removed from the supplier's place invoice has to be issued okay next sir no sir there is no movement of goods between the supplier and recipient the recipient is going to the supplier's place and buying it buying the goods maybe like that in that scenario there is no movement guys invoice issued before or at the time of delivery of the goods or making the goods available to the recipient so before delivery here whereas if there is a movement before removal from supplier's place clear removal or the supply to the recipient is there but where from where do you remove it from supplier's place or from supplier's go down or warehouse before it is removed from there invoice has to be issued on or before that date any date before that date also is fine next time limit for issuing the invoice in case of supply of service section 31 subsection 2 read with rule 47 yes sir supply of services check whether the supplier is the banking financial institution nbfc or insurance company if yes then invoice shall be issued before or within 45 days from the date of supply of service means once the service is completed or rendered within 45 days the invoice has to be issued guys see 45 is a deadline on or before that day any day you can issue the invoice sir what if it is any other supplier any other supplier means invoice shall be issued before or within 30 days from the date of supply of service guys if nothing is mentioned in the question about the supplier please always apply this guys assume the normal supplier not the these people you can consider as special suppliers if they are the one who is supplying it then 45 days in any other case 30 days then sub, uh, section 31 subsection 3 we will cover it later by way of table i have given it in the way of table we will cover it later guys ah, subsection 4 and 5 talks about continuous supply subsection 4 talks about continuous supply of goods continuous supply of goods means when supplier is supplying the goods to the recipient day in day out, day out or every day every week so it is not possible to issue invoice for each and every supply sir assume in a day itself five six times i am delivering it to the same recipient or every day we are delivering it so in that case it might be challenging to issue the invoice for each and every supply so that is why they are telling in case of continuous supply of goods invoice shall be issued before or at the time each statement of account is received or each payment is received guys assume i am supplying the goods to you every day and once in 15 days i will give you a statement what all goods i have supplied throughout the 15 days and you will make the payment based on that so they are telling what is the due date for me to issue invoice for whatever supply i have made for 15 days now what is the due date for me to issue invoice the time when i am issuing the statement to you or the date when i receive the payment whichever is earlier they have not mentioned the word whichever is earlier but it is understood whichever is earlier guys 
the day I issue the statement of account to you or the date I receive the payment, whichever is earlier. Clear? Yes, sir. Even in your examination, you may not use the word whichever is earlier, but see, normally they will give any one, guys. The date on which the statement is issued or the date on which payment is received. So straight away explain the provision like this as it is and give the answer. If by chance, if they give both the date of issue of statement as well as the date of payment, then you please consider whichever is earlier. Whichever is earlier. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Next, continuous supply of services, section 31, subsection 5. If, see guys, continuous supply of services means assume I am providing audit services, professional services for you throughout the year or concurrent audit, I am doing it throughout the year or account maintenance service because audit and all may not happen throughout the year, maybe for few months. Assume accounting services, I am providing it throughout the year, day in, day out, I am me or my office people or my employees, article trainees, they are coming to your place and they are performing the work. In that case, it is not possible for me to uh, raise the invoice every day. Ah, today, my workers have worked for three hours, issue the invoice, give the payment. No, that won't be possible. So that is why, first check, is there any agreement between both of us telling what is the due date for payment? If yes, then on or before the due date of that payment, invoice has to be issued. No, sir, there is no due date in our agreement. We both are very good friends. So we are not entered into any agreement or even if there is an agreement, there is no due date for payment and all. In that case, on or before the actual date of receipt of payment. Yes. Clear. Last case. Now, if the payment is linked to the completion of milestone event, now you are told, sir, only if you complete the accounts of six months or eight months or three months, I will give you the payment. So, you have linked the payment to the completion of a milestone event. So, on or before I complete that milestone event, I have to issue invoice for that portion. For that portion, assume you are told, sir, once you complete the accounts of three months, I will give the payment. So in that case, once I complete the work of three months, on or before the date I complete the work of three months accounts, na, I have to issue invoice for the work I have done for three months, not throughout the year. Clear? So for whatever work I have done till that day, I have to issue the invoice tax. Clear? With respect to when the payment is linked to the completion of milestone event. Next subsection six where the supply of services ceases before its completion. In case where the supply of services ceases under a contract before the completion of supply, the invoice shall be issued at the time when the supply ceases to extend of extent of supply made before such cessation. Now guys assume I was supposed to give through the year accounting services. Now after six months you are telling sir thank you I really like I didn't like your service so thank you so much sir I will look for a better person. So after rendering means actually the contract or agreement was to give accounting services for one year. But after I perform my work for six months, you were not happy, not satisfied. You told sir, thank you, please you can go. In that case, for whatever work I have completed for six months, I have to issue invoice. When? On what day this contract is ceasing? Assume you are cancelling my contract on 30th September. So whatever work I have done, assume from the beginning of the year, till 30th September, I have to issue invoice on or before 30th September, on or before 30th September. This is only if the contract is getting cancelled in between the performance of the work, in between the performance of the work. So in that case, supplier has to issue invoice for the work done till that day, till that day, on or before the date of the cancellation of the contract. Clear? Huh? Yes, sir. Next. Goods sent on sale or return basis, section 31, subsection 7. You guys would have learned this topic in your account in, at foundation level, if at all, if you are from foundation level. Or even if you are from direct entry, at least in your degree, I feel somewhere you would have uh, read it. Where the goods being sent or taken on approval for sale or return or removed before the supply takes place, the invoice shall be issued. That is before or at the time of supply or six months from the date of removal, whichever is earlier. Guys, how does this goods sent on sale or return basis uh, work is? Assume I have sent my goods to you and I have given an option. You can either accept it or send it back to me. So when I send it to you, it is not a sale for me. It is not a purchase for you. Only if you accept it, it is a purchase for you and sale for me. Now assume I have given three months time to you. Within three months, you have to either accept it or give it back. If you accept, sale. If you give it back, not a sale. Even after three months, you are silent. That means it is sale for me. Or else you have done something which denotes to me that 
you have accepted the goods for example whatever goods i have sent na you have sold it to your customer obviously it is understood for me that you have accepted so is it a sale for me yes sir now what they are telling you this is from accounting point of view guys now what they are telling here is once i send the goods to you don't give maximum more than 6 months time assume i have given 10 months time for you to accept the goods in that case within 6 months from the day i have sent the goods to you within 6 months if you have neither accepted nor rejected it is deemed supply under gst at the end of 6 months it is deemed supply for me clear now assume within 6 months only assume at the end of third month you accepted the goods so when should i issue invoice at the time of accepting the goods because at the time of supply means when is it for me 3 months when did, whenever you accepted it clear so simple maximum time is 6 months if you are accepting the goods within 6 months then that is the time of supply i have to issue invoice on or before that day i have to time of supply in the sense when did you accept it here not the time of supply as per gst that is different clear here before or at the time of supply means when did you accept the goods clear if you have accepted the goods before 6 months then on or before that day i have to issue invoice if you have neither accepted nor rejected the goods within 6 months also then at the end of 6 months i have to issue invoice for whatever goods i have sent to you clear so indirectly they are telling don't give time more than 6 months no fool should give it why because obviously 6 months is too much time for a recipient to either accept or reject the goods normally will give in weeks or maximum one or two months yeah fine guys <clears throat> next we will just come to this summary of various documents some of summary of various documents e invoicing and all we will see it yeah this document will give you a clear picture of various documents who should issue it to whom should they issue it when they should issue it and all guys so we'll go through it tax invoices issued by the supplier to the recipient for outward taxable supplies made guys please be careful the contents of tax invoice and all in detail we have covered and it is just a common sense guys what and all should be included the details of supplier details of recipient details of goods details of services details of gst that is rate amount everything all this should form part of contents of gst including hsn code and all depending upon the turnover of the supplier then consolidated tax invoice is covered in section 31 sub section 3 issued by a registered person it is issued when always ah huh? no only if the value of supply is less than 200 and recipient is unregistered and recipient does not require separate tax invoice in that case at the close of each day i can issue consolidated tax invoice for the single recipient assume in a day i have supplied number of times to you whose value of the supply is 100 rupees 50 rupees 20 rupees 30 rupees 40 rupees 100 clear huh? less than 200 and you are unregistered under gst and you are telling sir separate invoice and all is not required in that case at the end of each day i can issue consolidated tax invoice for whatever supply i have made for you throughout the day throughout the day single supplier single recipient it is not applicable for multiple recipients and all clear huh? yes sir next revised tax invoice section 31 sub section 3 issued by a registered person read with section 25 and rule 10 guys revised tax invoice is issued for the below period within one month from the date of grant of registration so that is whatever supply has taken place between the effective date of registration till the date of grant of registration for this the revised tax invoice has to be issued within one month from here within one month from the date of grant of registration guys it is important because when questions on are asked on this topics and all you have to connect to section 25 rule 10 and all i will just see uh, explain it here you see we saw this scenario even when we were discussing section 18 na similar scenario i have taken here assume i was liable for registration on 1st january then i have applied for registration within 15th uh, on 15th january so i have applied within 30 days uh, as per section 25 yes sir so when i have applied for registration within 30 days from the date i was liable what is the effective date of registration guys the date on which i was liable as per rule 10 correct so registration is granted on 20th january so i will get my gst in only on this day but they are telling my effective date of registration is year so in that case any supply i make after 20th january i have my gst in i will issue tax invoice but for whatever supply i would have made between this date i didn't have my gst in 
so i would have not issued tax invoice to my customers so in that case what they were I means i would have not mentioned the tax amount gst in and all so in that case what they are telling is once you your registration is granted go back for whatever supplies you have made from the date you are liable for registration till the date your registration is granted issue revised tax invoice rti revised tax invoice within what time within one month from here within one month from 20th january you have to issue revised tax invoice for all the supplies you have made from 1st january to 20th january guys or 19th january clear up yes so please be careful with all this because it is connected to section 31 subsection 3 talks about this but connected to section 25 and rule 10 also so whenever the questions are like this guys please connect to the sections rules and write it definitely the evaluator will get impressed by your answer by your answer not by you by your answer clear up so please make sure that whenever you get a chance okay and you should analyze like that even in my regular class and you now even in re revision classes i am trying to connect wherever possible so if at all if there is any questions like that in the descriptive part please try to connect it from section to section or from section to rule wherever it is required clear unnecessarily don't give connections and all only if, if it is relevant yeah yes guys sure next bill of supply issued by home registered person registered person making what exempt outward supply or paying tax under composition scheme so bill of supply will be issued by whom the person whose outward supply is bill of uh, outward supply is exempt for him gst is not applicable so he cannot issue tax invoice so what will he issue bill of supply then the person who is registered under composition scheme whether it's section 101 or 102a both he will issue to his recipients what bill of supply he cannot collect tax from the recipients so he cannot issue tax invoice so what will he issue bill of supply next payment voucher issued by recipient paying tax under rcm so whenever the recipient is paying tax under reverse charge mechanism as per section 93 or 94 of cgst act or as per section 53 or 54 of igst act subsection 4 is not covered in detail for you so only subsection 3 is guys oh. Recipient shall issue invoice in respect of goods or services so received by him from unregistered supplier. So, this is especially in case of subsection 4. Clear now, assume sir, supplier recipient recipient is registered whenever RCM is applicable, recipient has to get registered. Assume supplier is unregistered in that case, supplier will not be issuing any tax invoice. So, what they are telling is recipient, you go and do self invoice, you issue, you issue invoice for yourself. This is only when supplier is unregistered. Recipient has to do self invoicing. Okay, sir. Then, and he shall issue payment voucher at the time of making payment. To whom? Payment voucher will be issued to the supplier. That telling, I have made a payment of so much. So, recipient, whenever RCM is applicable, whether it is 93 or 94, or even 53 or 54 of IGST Act, payment voucher should always be issued. Whether the supplier is registered or not, you have to issue payment voucher whenever RCM is applicable. Whereas, if supplier is unregistered and recipient is paying tax under RCM, in that case, he has to also do self-invoicing. Along with payment voucher, he has to issue payment voucher to the supplier and he has to do self-invoicing for himself. Clear? That is only when supplier is unregistered. Then receipt voucher issued by a registered person to the person who had made the payment. When an advance payment is received with respect to any supply of goods or services or both guys assume. I am supposed to supply goods to you in the future. I told you, if you give advance only, I will supply it to you. So, you are giving me the advance. So, in that case, I have to give a copy to you, telling I have received an advance of so much. I am issuing receipt voucher to you. Did I supply anything as on today to you? No. I am supposed to supply in the future. So, for that, I am getting an advance. So, for that advance, as a receipt, I have to give it, give to you what receipt voucher. And in the future, when I actually supply the goods to you, I have to issue tax invoice. And I have to collect tax from you. Clear up. Now assume you have given me the advance of 1 lakh and I told I will supply it in next month. But next month for some reason I couldn't deliver it. You are asking for a refund. Sir, please give me a refund. Why did you take the advance and you are not giving supply for me? So you are asking for a refund. Assume I gave the money back to you. In that, day, in that case, what document I have to issue? Refund voucher. When advance what I have received, what the time of receipt, receipt voucher will be given. And if the money is given back without any supply, without any supply, I didn't supply anything to you. I didn't issue any invoice to you. In that case, when I am giving back the advance to you, I am returning back, refunding back the advance to you. What should I issue? Refund voucher. 
issued by a registered person to the person who had made the payment. If no supply is made and no tax invoice is issued after the issue of receipt voucher for advance payment, means I had received the advance, but I didn't do any supply, I didn't issue any invoice. So in that case, I am giving back the money to you. For that also, I have to issue a document. Next, delivery chalan <coughs> issued by a supplier of goods. Supply of what? Always a huh? no. If there is any supply of liquid gas, where the quantity at the time of removal from the place of business of the supplier is not known or transportation of goods for the job work or transportation of goods for reasons other than by way of supply. Guys, see normally whenever goods are going to the other place, tax invoice has to be issued along with that but there is something called as e-way bill. Now assume I am delivering some liquid gas to you. So at the time of removal of liquid gas from my place, we don't know the quantity. We will know only when it is delivered to you. So in that case, the liquid gas will move from my place to your place with a copy of delivery chalan. Clear? And at the same time, now whenever I am sending the goods for a job workers. So for example, assume I am sending my goods for packing or designing, painting. I am not selling it. I have just sent it for a job work. Okay. So you will job worker will do the job and give it back to me. In that case, so while sending the goods, I have to send it along with what delivery channel. Clear? And for any other pay supply means for any other movement of goods where there is no supply where there is no for goods so you can see for transportation of goods for reasons other than by way of supply for example assume in Karnataka I have three branches but I have taken single registration I am moving the goods from one branch to another branch is it a distinct person is it a supply no because I have taken only one registration so I am moving the goods from my assume my manufacturing plant to showroom which is not distinct person is it a supply no so in that case the goods has to move along with what delivery channel Hope you guys got it. Yes. Note, the supplier is required to issue tax invoice after delivery of goods where tax invoice could not be issued at the time of removal of goods. That is in case of liquid gas and all. At the time of removal, if invoice was not supposed to be issued because I didn't know the quantity and all. Once it is delivered to the customer, at least issue the tax invoice. Then eBay bill, important. They have added as a separate chapter now, but still at least just an highlight I have given here. Issued by every registered person who causes the movement of goods through the transport. When for the movement of goods, if consignment value including GST, including GST is a key point here. More than 50,000, whether for supply or otherwise, whether it is for supply or just movement, or doesn't matter. If the value of the consignment including GST is more than 50,000, generate e bill. Who will generate, sir? Either supplier, recipient or transporter. Either of these three parties have to do it. And about this, we will learn in detail in the coming chapter, guys. We have a separate chapter for it. Then credit note and debit note, which is given in section 34, guys. 34. Important credit note, guys. Let me first give a simple example because this document is somewhere related to your accounts also. In your accounts also, you would have learned credit note, debit note, and all. But you have to understand literally when is it issued. Guys, assume I have made a sales to you. I have made a sales to you for 10 lakh. What is the entry I would have passed? Assume your name is Suchai. Okay. Your name is Sujay. What is the entry I would have made? Well, not Sujay because yes, yes will match. So <clears throat> let me take it as Virat Kohli. Virat Kohli. To what sales? Okay. Account debit. 10 lakh. 10 lakh. So till you pay me the amount, your account will have debit balance in my books. You are more or less like a debtor for me. After it. Till you pay. Once you pay, you will go out and bank or cash balance will increase. Clear? Awesome. In the future, the, you have returned some goods to me, sales returns. Or else, uh, you have asked for some discount for me, post supply. Or assume, <coughs> uh, see, when I have given the discount in the future, whether as per section 15, subsection 3, should we reduce it or not, that is secondary. But I have to always issue credit note to you. Whether from while calculating value of supply, will we reduce it or not depends on the condition where few conditions are there. That is, was it agreed at the time of supply? Did recipient reverse the credit? All this as we have to check it. But in case of any discount which is given after supply, credit note should always be issued. Clear? Was it agreed at the time of supply? Is the credit reversed by the recipient and all will not matter. Credit note should always be issued whenever there is a discount given after the supply is made. Clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Next, or else by mistake, I had charged more amount. Instead of charging 1 lakh, I have made entry as 10 lakh. 
in that case what do we do we will give the credit to Vika, uh, virat kohli agree na so what is the entry we will pass assume sales account debit to virat kohli or or if it is a sales returns then we will pass the entry sales returns to virat kohli clear so what are we doing we are giving credit to virat kohli that is our customer yes sir so in that case when we are giving credit to him in our book what note should be issue credit what note should be issue credit note guys means we have already charged more we have given excess debit so now to remove that can i go and scratch that entry and again, again rewrite no you cannot do it so how will you give it you give the effect you will give the credit to him okay with respect to sales returns or discount given or even if by chance if you have given excess debit now you will adjust it by giving the credit so as you are giving the credit to the account of the customer what note should you issue credit note let us see issued by a registered person to the recipient when you understand when credit note will be issued it becomes easy for you to retain guys or remember in your mind where the taxable supply in the invoice is more than taxable value of supply assume you already charged 10 lakh but actually it was supposed to be 8 lakh something like that or the tax charged in the invoice is more than the tax payable in respect of such supply it might be like that also by mistake i have charged 18 percent gst but actually i was supposed to charge 12 percent so for that difference six percent i have to issue credit note where the goods or supplies have been returned by the recipient that is sales returns where the goods received by have been found to be deficient means is not happy customer is not happy with the goods it's already broken by the time he receives it so he's giving it back nothing but sales returns then discount under section 15 3b see it need not be always that conditions are satisfied irrespective of condition is satisfied or not because 15 3b you can reduce the discount only if the conditions are satisfied so if any discount is given after the supply whether the condition is satisfied or not credit note has to be issued clear yes sir next debit note first let us understand when debit note will be given guys now purchase assume i have purchased the goods i have purchased the good from ms dhoni msd so what is the entry i will pass purchases to msd purchases account debit to msd now sir i am not happy with few goods i am returning it back or else by mistake i had recorded more amount in that case i have given excess credit to dhoni na? so what will i do i will give him debit i will give him debit in my books agree na? means whenever there is any purchase returns or if i already charged more amount now i have to reverse to that extent to that excess amount i have to reverse it so what will i do i will give debit in my books clear as a purchaser so who is msd for me creditor so till i pay him he will be having credit balance in my books once i pay he will go out and my back cash or bank balance will go down now assume to some extent it was recorded excess so now i am reversing it by giving debit so in that scenario what document should i issue to him guys I have to issue debit note to MS Dhoni. Yeah, the coolest captain who has made India win many trophies. Yeah, chill. Issued by registered person to the recipient, where the taxable value in the invoice is less than the taxable value of the supply. Okay. Then the tax charged in the invoice is the tax payable in respect of such supply. That is vice versa scenario, guys. Vice versa scenario. okay see issued by this registered person this is from purchaser point of view okay whatever i explained now assume let us think from seller point of view that is ms dhoni okay that is from ms dhoni's point of view now he would have recorded as what vikas to sales vikas to sales that is from seller point of view who is seller in my example msd okay vikas to sales he would have recorded vikas account debit to sales now he has recorded lower amount he has recorded lower amount guys not higher amount lower amount so in that case he has to give addition for that what will he what he has to do it again debit vikas ago assume he has debited 5 lakh but now actually he was supposed to debit 7 lakh so two more lakh he will debit again yes two more lakh he will debit again guys this is from sales point of view i am explaining please be careful sales point of view okay yeah so again he is debiting two more lakh vikas account debit yes so for that ms dhoni has to issue what to me debit note he has to issue debit note to me guys hope it is clear for you
clear and here whatever they have covered in the law is from both sales point of view they have not touched it from purchase point of view but you need not worry clear so what i have explained here it was from purchase point of view but what they have given in the law is only from selling point of view clear yes sir so where the taxable value in the invoice was less i had charged only 5 lakh but now we, i am to charge more two more lakh extra so in that case issue debit note then the tax charge in the invoice is less than the tax payable in the respect of such supply vice versa case assume I had charged 12% in the invoice, but actually the rate applicable is 18%. For the remaining 6%, what should I do? Issue debit note. Issue debit note. Oh. And whenever credit and debit note is issued, a declaration has to be made in the returns. When so, any registered person who has issued a credit note must declare the details of such credit note in the return for the month during which such credit note was issued but not later than guys credit note means the government's revenue is going down because already the invoice was issued for higher value now you are reducing that value by issuing a credit note so they are telling whenever you issue credit note you can disclose it in the month in which you issue the credit note not in the month which sale when sale happened sale had happened sometime back now you are issuing assume credit note for the supply which happened three months back so in the current month, assume in the March month, I am issuing credit note for the sales happened in December. So for March, whatever return I will file, I have to disclose the details of this credit note in March. Okay. But not later than 30th November of the following financial year or date of furnishing the relevant annual return. Means they are giving extended time. They are first telling, disclose it in the month in which you have issued the credit note. But not later than what? You can still issue it in next month. I'm sorry. You can also disclose it in the return which you will file in the upcoming months. But not later than 30th November of next financial year or actual date of filing the annual return for the current year. Whichever is earlier guys. Simple. Listen here. Sir, I had made a supply. Uh, financial year 23-24. Let me take. I had made a supply in December 23 and I had already issued invoice. Okay. With respect to this, in March 24, I am issuing credit note. Because I had issued invoice for a year value or I had charged a year tax. Now I am issuing credit note. With respect to supply made in December. What they are telling in the first line is, guys, issue the whatever issue you have made of credit note, now disclose it in the month of March. Means for March, whatever returns you will file it. Now in that, please give the details of this credit note also linking the invoice which was issued in december you have to link it this credit note should always be linked to the invoice clear so in march whatever return you will file means for march when will you file in the april clear so for march whichever return you will file please disclose the details of credit note in that return but still they are giving some extended time what is it that is 23 24 is the year in which credit note is issued now take 30th november of next year 30th November of next year, that is 24, next financial year. Okay. Our actual date of filing annual return. So for 23-24, when will you file annual return on or before 31st December of next year? Assume you are filing it on 15th November. So whichever is earlier is what? 15th November. So before 15th November, at any cost, you have to give the details of this credit note. That is the deadline for you. So before 15th, November for whichever month you will file the returns na? in that month returns you can give the details of this credit note but the maximum deadline is 15 November. First they are suggesting you to give it in the same month return. If not please give it latest by 15 November that is 30th November or actual date of filing annual return whichever is earlier guys. Annual return for which year? Annual return for the year in which credit note is issued. So which is the financial year 23-24 clear huh? Any tax liability shall be adjusted, reduced accordingly. Because of credit note, the tax liability will come down accordingly adjusted. See how smart the government is. When the tax liability is coming down, in the assume in the tax invoice, the tax liability was 5 lakh. Now, in the credit note, it is getting reduced to only 4 lakh 50,000. So, in that case, they are giving you the ex uh, extended time. You can do, give the information latest by 30th November or the actual date of filing annual return, whichever is earlier because your tax liability is getting reduced see the debit note now any registered person who has issued a debit note in relation to the supply of goods or services or both must declare the details of such debit note in return for the month during which such debit note was issued 
the tax liability can be adjusted upwards accordingly guys because of debit note the tax liability will go up because invoice was issued in the past but for a lower value or for a lower tax amount now due to increase in the tax liability we are issuing debit note agree na so government has to is supposed to get extra money so what they are telling whenever you issue debit note please give the detail in the same month no extended time nothing assume i am issuing debit note assume i am issuing debit note in august for the supply happened in june so when did i issue debit note august they are telling give the details of debit note for the return which you file for august for august you will file it in september na please give the details of debit note in that month only we cannot wait for tax collection we are getting more money we are happy please give the details in the same month no extended time nothing guys clear so this is all about the documents we have some more things to cover which is important <coughs> okay invoicing sir when should we issue the invoice electronically that is in online form all registered person with an aggregate turnover based on pan that is all india based see you may have operation in 10 states 15 states all the states put together what is your aggregate turnover all india basis in any preceding financial year from 17 18 onwards is more than 5 crore change they have reduced it now previously it was 10 crore now it has been reduced to 5 crore please be careful notified persons will be required to issue invoice guys now we are in which year we are in <clears throat> uh 23 24 still financial year 23 24 by the time you guys write the exams you will be in 24 25 okay so as of now let us take 23 24 what they're telling is gst was first time implemented in 17 18 that is in between first july 2017 from 17 18 to 23 24 in any year if your aggregate turnover was more than 5 crore then you for you invoicing is applicable e-invoicing is applicable sir is it for every supply no it is not for all the supply whenever e-invoicing is applicable it is only for p2b supply presently invoices and credit notes and debit notes when issued by the notified person to a registered person that is b2b supply guys b2b means supplier is registered recipient is also registered and for the purpose of exports are covered under e-invoice means if my outward supply is for a recipient who is registered under gst or if my outward supply is zero rated supply means i am exporting outside india clear in that case the person who is outside india may not be registered but still they are telling e invoicing is applicable e invoicing is applicable including for debit note and credit note thus presently such notified persons are not required to report b to c invoices c invoice means when recipient is not registered further e invoicing is also not applicable to invoices issued by input service distributor and for import of goods so invoice issued by input service distributor or for import of goods e invoicing is not applicable even if the recipient is unregistered e invoicing is not applicable guys only in case of b2b and export and export please be careful the recipient will be outside india you would have not registered under gst but still e invoicing is applicable clear yes next facility of digital payment to the recipient section 31a the government has notified that invoice issued by a registered person except specified class of person discussed below whose aggregate turnover in any financial year exceeds 500 crore okay in respect of b2c supplies here it is b2c supply that is the recipient is unregistered supply of goods or services are both to an unregistered person including the person having uin if the recipient is having uin for gst purpose is considered as unregistered person only the UIN, who can obtain UIN, the person, uh, like foreign embassy and all, they will obtain UIN, centralized base, only for the purpose of obtaining the refund of whatever tax they would have paid on their inward supply. If the recipient is the person who is having UIN, will it be considered as registered person or unregistered person? Unregistered person. Okay. Shall have what? Dynamic QR code. That is the scanner, which you guys would be well versed with. Okay. So, what they are telling? This... QR code is applicable for him uh, when guys in any year not in every year any year from 1718 including 1718 in any year if the aggregate turnover is more than 500 crore not 5 crore 500 crore two zeros extra clear is more than 500 crore only then for B2C supply QR code is applicable and this is for B2B supplies please be careful this is for B2B that is e-invoicing whereas 
the QR code is for only B2C supplies. We are opposite. Dynamic QR code is not applicable to an invoice issued to an unregistered person by the following suppliers. Means if the supplier is the following people, even though their turnover is more than 500 crore, still for them, the QR code is not mandatory, guys. QR code is not mandatory. Who are those, sir? Suppliers. Following people are suppliers, not recipient. Please be careful. So even though the recipient is unregistered, sir, it is B2C supply. Still, they are telling if the following people are the suppliers, that is the notified person, specified class of person, except they told me except specified class of person, that is what we are seeing. For them, QR code is not applicable. Insurer or banking company or financial institution, including NBFC, GTA supplying services in relation to transportation of goods by road in goods carriages. We saw in RCM, even in exemption list and all of those people. Supplier of passenger transportation service, person supplying services by way of admission to exhibition of cinematograph films in multiplex screens, that is PVR, INOX, those people. Supplier of online information and database access or retrieval services. So if the following people are the supplier, no QR code, even though if their turnover is more than 500 crore guys. Next, no dynamic QR code in case of exports, because exports actually will fall under B2C only, because the recipient is outside India, not registered. So it will fall under what categories are B2C, but they are telling in case of exports, dynamic QR code is not required. We cannot go and tell that person, sir, please scan this and make the payment. So it's not mandatory. <coughs> okay, chalo. In the invoice means whatever they are talking about is in the invoice, the dynamic QR code should be there. Okay, somewhere on the top or bottom, please include the dynamic QR code. By using this or by scanning this, the recipient should be able to make the payment. Clear. So whenever dynamic QR code is applicable, it should be a part of the invoice which is issued by the supplier to the recipient so that recipients can scan it and make the payment guys. Okay, section 32, small small sections. A person who is not registered person shall not collect any tax under this act. No, it means if you are not registered, you are not liable to pay tax. If you are not liable to pay tax, please don't collect it from the recipients. No registered person shall collect tax except in accordance with the provisions of this act or the rules made there under. Clear. So if you do that, that if by chance, even though you are not liable to pay tax, you collected the GST and you kept it in the pocket, then all the actions can be taken against you. You may also be put behind bars, free boarding and logic. Then amount of tax to be indicated in tax invoice and other documents, section 33. Guys, in the invoice, whichever the supplier is issuing to the recipient, whenever supplier is liable to pay GST, when he is collecting it from the recipient, it is his duty to disclose the amount and rate of GST in the invoice, the amount as well as the rate of GST and even whether it is CGST, SGST, IGST or CGST plus UTGST, please mention that in the invoice. That is what section 33 is done. Then coming to invoice come bill of supply rule 46A. So where a single registered person is supplying taxable as well as exempted goods or services or both to an unregistered person, a single invoice come bill of supply can be issued guys. Now assume if I am making exempt supplies to you. If I am registered under GST, what document will I issue? Bill of supply. Now, if I am making taxable outward supply to you, if I am registered under GST, what invoice, what document I will issue to you? Tax invoice. Now, assume same supply to the same recipient is supplying two goods. One is exempt, one is taxable. In that case, should I issue separately one tax invoice and one bill of supply, sir? No, you can issue one. That is one invoice come bill of supply where both will be included exempt goods as well as taxable goods. That is when both is supplied that is exempt supply as well as taxable supply is supplied by single supplier to the single recipient. I can issue one invoice come bill of supply. Guys. This is all about the invoice chapter along with credit note and debit note. So we have covered four sections of CGST Act guys. Yes, guys, now we will revise chapter 11, which talks about accounts and records. A new topic added at inter level and very small topic, guys. Very small topic, only two sections that is section 35 and 36 of CGST Act. Accounts and other records, section 35. It has various subsections. We will do it one by one. Subsection 1 Every registered person shall keep and maintain at his principal place of business as mentioned in the certificate of registration. That is, when you are applying for registration, you would have mentioned what is your principal place of business. Accordingly, registration certificate will include that branch as principal place of business. So, there you have to maintain your books of accounts, which gives a true and correct account of production or manufacture of goods inward and outward supply of goods as well as services, 
stock of goods, input tax credit availed, output tax payable and paid such other particulars as may be prescribed. Proviso is telling, provided that where more than one place of business is specified in the certificate of registration, means if you have additional places of business, then the accounts relating to each place of business shall be kept at such place of the business. Okay, means for each additional place of business, you will maintain the accounts there. Subsection 2, every owner or operator of warehouse or godown or any other place used for storage of the goods and every transporter irrespective of whether he is a registered person or not shall maintain the records of the consigner, consignee and other relevant details of the goods. Now if I am the owner or operator of any godown or warehouse where the goods are stored of someone else, obviously I have to maintain the data of how much quantity is stored and this goods belongs to whom. All the data has to be maintained by me. It is my responsibility. Whether I have registered under GST or not doesn't matter. Even if I am a person who is transporting the goods, assume you have asked me to transport your goods from Karnataka to Andhra Pradesh. In that case, as a transporter, I should maintain the data. Goods belongs to whom? What quantity is there? Obviously, see, as a supplier, you guys, you would have given me some data. And as a transporter, it is my responsibility also to make sure that I have the data of what is the goods supplied or I am trying to move from one place to another place. Who is the actual consigner? Who is the consignee? Clear consigner here is nothing but supplier. Consignee is nothing but the recipient for whom the goods would be delivered, guys. Next subsection 3. The commissioner may notify a class of taxable person to maintain additional accounts or documents. So this power was given to the commissioner to tell any person, hey, maintain additional accounts. And accordingly, these are the additional accounts to be maintained, guys. I have given it here by way of diagram or <coughs> the image. You can see additional GST accounts to be maintained. If you want, you can just give a reference also. That is your, okay, refer diagram. Okay. What and all, in case of import and export, the details has to be maintained. That is like invoice, bill of supply, delivery challenge, credit and debit note, in, uh, receipt voucher, payment voucher, refund voucher, e-way bills. Then in case of stock, that is inventory, opening balance, inward, outward supply, lost or destroyed goods, premises details, that is where you have stored the goods, business premises. Uh, goods supplied as a gift or free samples. Then balance of stock, raw material, finished goods or scrap. Then with respect to tax, what you have paid or to be paid, tax payable, tax collected and paid, that is TCS, input tax, ITC claimed. Even if you are a supplier, you are collecting the tax from the receipt and that data also you have to maintain. When did you collect, when did you remit it to the government like that. Then tax invoice, credit and debit notes, delivery chalan. Then with respect to the people, people means suppliers and recipient. Okay, now if I have made the outward supply, I have to maintain the data of my recipients. If I have taken the inward supply, I have to maintain the data of my supplier along with his name and address. Okay, that's all guys. Then coming to subsection 4, where the commission con commissioner considers that any class of taxable person is not in a position to keep and maintain accounts in accordance with the provisions of this section. He may for the reasons to be recorded in writing permit such class of taxable person to maintain the accounts in such manner as may be prescribed. Now assume I have started my business, I am a very small businessman. I went and requested commissioner, I cannot maintain so much data, it is very costly for me, I cannot keep chartered accountant for me, I cannot pay for him so much, so I will keep a normal BCom graduate and I will maintain whatever I can. If I can request, then they may tell, okay, maintain so and so accounts. They will tell, okay, in what manner, in, in what way I have to maintain the accounts and which are the important documents to be maintained, they will tell, at least that much I have to maintain. Clear? This is only if the commissioner is permitting it, it is not always. Oh. Subsection 5, subject to the provisions of section 17.5H. 17.5H talked about what guys? When you have supplied, that is blocked credit. Under blocked credit, if your goods are destroyed by fire or stolen or if it is given free of, some, free of cost or as a free samples, in that case, credit is blocked up. As per section 17, subsection 5H, credit is blocked because your outward supply, there is no GST. So on in inward supply, the goods what you have purchased, but you have given it free of cost or it is destroyed or it is stolen. Can you claim the credit? No, you cannot claim the credit. That is what subsection 5 of section 17 along with clause H will talk about. Where a registered person fails to account for the goods or services or both in accordance with the provisions of subsection 1, means if he has failed to maintain the data of these goods which are stolen or 
destroyed and all. The proper officer shall determine the amount of tax payable on the goods or services or both that are not accounted for as if such goods or services or both had been supplied by such person and the provisions of section 73-74 that is recovery shall apply for determination of such tax. Now, assume I had purchased 100 kgs guys. Inward supply. Okay. Inward supply is 100 kgs. Now, outward supply I have done only 60 kgs. Remaining 40 kgs, assume the department or commissioner is asking because where did the remaining 40 kgs go? I told sir, it is destroyed. Sir, it is stolen. And there is no proof for it. Clear? Maybe I would have sold it, but I am telling sir, no, it is destroyed. So that is why if I not maintain the data of it, or I told sir, I gave it free of cost. In that case, it is duty. Okay. See, if it is stolen and all, I can may not be able to prove it exactly but still at least some proof should be there for example like cc camera or something some data i should have to prove that sir it is stolen or it is destroyed clear if not then they may go ahead to collect taxes from me then sir how long should i maintain the books of accounts section 36 may be important for mcq this kind of, this kind of provisions and all is important for like mcq guys so in mcq they may ask any of this provisions Section 36, period of retention of accounts. Every registered person required to keep and maintain books of accounts or other records in accordance with the provisions of Section 35, Subsection 1 shall retain them until the expiry of 72 months from when? From the due date of furnishing the annual return for the year pertaining to such accounts and records. Guys, listen it. Now assume we are maintaining the books of accounts for financial year 23-24. For 23-24, Annual return that is GSTR 9 has to be filed on or before 31st December of next year. <coughs> next financial year. Yes, sir. What is that? 31st December 24. So the annual return for the financial return that for sorry. Annual return for the financial year 23-24 that is in GSTR 9 has to be filed on or before 31st December 24. Yes, sir. Due date to file. Annual return they are telling you how to maintain the books of accounts for 23-24 from the due date for another 72 months. Not from the end of the year. It is not from 31st March. Whatever is the due date for you to file annual return now from there 72 months. From there it is 72 months guys. Hope you got it. I have given one example here also. Books of accounts relates to financial year 22-23. Due date to file annual return is what? For financial year 22-23, 31st December of next financial year, which comes to 31st December 2023. Books of accounts of financial year 22-23 has to be maintained for 72 months from when? From 31st December 2023. That is, till 31st December 2029. Clear? Yes. Next. However, a registered person who is a party to any appeal or revision or any other proceedings undertaken by the proper officer or commissioner of GST shall retain the books of account and the other records pertaining to the matters of such appeal or revision for a minimum period of one year after the disposal of such appeal or revision as the case may be. Guys, some revision or appeal or some proceedings is going against me. So now that is with respect to assume the financial year 2010-11. So, should I keep the main uh, and retain the books of accounts for that 2010-11? Yes. Till when? Till the final judgment is given. And once the final judgment is given or final verdict is given, even after that for at least one year, I have to maintain. Even though the books of accounts is related to 2010-11, if any revision or if any appeal or if there is any proceedings going against me for the year 2010-11, once the final judgment is given, at least from that day, another one year I have to keep it irrespective of for which year it relates to. Clear? Yes, guys. So, this is all about the accounts and records. Very small topic, guys. So, till now, we have covered till where? Section 36 of CGST Act. Section 36 of CGST Act. Till there, we have covered. Yes, sir. Next, guys, with respect to returns, that is Section 37 to 48. We will learn it in returns chapter. Returns chapter, we will be doing it as a last chapter. That is chapter 15. Clear? Huh? So, this we will be doing it at the end. Section 37 to 48, including the goods and service tax practitioner. Clear? So, the next topic would be the payment. 
clear so payment eva bill tds tcs everything we will cover and at the end we will do the returns guys is that good yes sir yes guys now we will revise chapter 11 which talks about accounts and records a new topic added at inter level and very small topic guys very small topic only two sections that is section 35 and 36 of cgst act accounts and other records section 35 it has various subsections we will do it one by one subsection one every registered person shall keep and maintain at his principal place of business as mentioned in the certificate of registration that is when you are applying for registration you would have mentioned what is your principal place of business accordingly registration certificate will include that branch as principal place of business so there you have to maintain your books of accounts which gives a true and correct account of production or manufacture of goods inward and outward supply of goods as well as services stock of goods input tax credit availed output tax payable and paid such other particulars as may be prescribed proviso is telling provided that where more than one place of business is specified in the certificate of registration means if you have additional places of business then the accounts relating to each place of business shall be kept at such place of the business okay means for each additional place of business you will maintain the accounts there subsection 2 every owner or operator of warehouse or godown or any other place used for storage of the goods and every transporter irrespective of whether he is registered person or not shall maintain the records of the consigner consignee and other relevant details of the goods now if i am the owner or operator of any godown or warehouse where the goods are stored of someone else obviously i have to maintain the detail data of how much quantity is stored and this goods belongs to whom all the data has to be maintained by me. It is my responsibility. Whether I have registered under GST or not doesn't matter. Even if I am a person who is transporting the goods, assume you have asked me to transport your goods from Karnataka to Andhra Pradesh. In that case, as a transporter, I should maintain the data. Goods belongs to whom? What quantity is there? Obviously, see, as a supplier, you guys, you would have given me some data. And as a transporter, it is my responsibility also to make sure that I have the data of what is the goods supplied or I am trying to move from one place to another place, who is the actual consigner, who is the consignee. Clear consigner here is nothing but supplier, consignee is nothing but the recipient for whom the goods would be delivered, guys. Next subsection 3. The commissioner may notify a class of taxable person to maintain additional accounts or documents. So this power was given to the commissioner to tell any person hey, maintain additional accounts. And accordingly, these are the additional accounts to be maintained, guys. I have given it here by way of diagram or <coughs> the image. You can see additional GST accounts to be maintained. If you want, you can just give a reference also. That is your, okay. Refer diagram. Okay. What and all, in case of import and export, the details has to be maintained. That is like invoice, bill of supply, delivery challenge, credit and debit note, in, uh, receipt voucher, payment voucher, refund voucher, e way bills. Then in case of stock, that is inventory, opening balance, inward, outward supply, lost or destroyed goods, premises details, that is where you have stored the goods, business premises. Uh, goods supplied as a gift or free samples. Then balance of stock, raw material, finished goods or scrap. Then with respect to tax, what you have paid or to be paid, tax payable, tax collected and paid, that is TCS, input tax, ITC claimed. Even if you are a supplier, you are collecting the tax from the receipt and that data also you have to maintain. When did you collect, when did you remit it to the government like that. Then tax invoice, credit and debit notes, delivery chalan. Then with respect to the people, people means suppliers and recipient. Okay, now if I have made the outward supply, I have to maintain the data of my recipients. If I have taken the inward supply, I have to maintain the data of my supplier along with his name and address. Okay, that's all guys. Then coming to subsection 4, where the commission con commissioner considers that any class of taxable person is not in a position to keep and maintain accounts in accordance with the provisions of this section. He may for the reasons to be recorded in writing permit such class of taxable person to maintain the accounts in such manner as may be prescribed. Now assume I have started my business, I am a very small businessman. I went and requested commissioner, I cannot maintain so much data, it is very costly for me, I cannot keep chartered accountant for me, I cannot pay for him so much, so I will keep a normal BCom graduate and I will maintain whatever I can. If I can request, then they may tell, okay, maintain so and so accounts. They will tell, okay, in what manner, in, in what way I have to maintain the accounts and which are the important documents to be maintained, they will tell, at least that much I have to maintain. Clear? This is only 
if the commissioner is permitting it it is not always okay subsection 5 subject to the provisions of section 17.5 h 17.5 h talked about what guys when you have supplied that is block credit under block credit if your goods are destroyed by fire or stolen or if it is given free of some free of cost or as a free samples in that case credit is blocked up as per section 17 subsection 5 h credit is blocked because your outward supply there is no gst so on in inward supply the goods what you have purchased but you have given it free of cost or it is destroyed or it is stolen can you claim the credit no you cannot claim the credit that is what subsection 5 of section 17 along with clause h will talk about where a registered person fails to account for the goods or services are both in accordance with the provisions of subsection 1 means if he has failed to maintain the data of these goods which are stolen or <clears throat> destroyed and all the proper officer shall determine the amount of tax payable on the goods or services or both that are not accounted for as if such goods or services or both had been supplied by such person and the provisions of section 73 74 that is recovery shall apply for determination of such tax now assume i had purchased 100 kgs guys inward supply okay inward supply is 100 kgs now outward supply i have done only 60 kgs Remaining 40 kgs, assume the department or commissioner is asking because where did the remaining 40 kgs go? I told sir, it is destroyed. Sir, it is stolen. And there is no proof for it. Clear? Maybe I would have sold it, but I am telling sir, no, it is destroyed. So that is why if I will not maintain the data of it, or I told sir, I gave it free of cost. In that case, it is duty. Okay. See, if it is stolen and all, I can may not be able to prove it exactly but still at least some proof should be there for example like cc camera or something some data i should have to prove that sir it is stolen or it is destroyed clear if not then they may go ahead to collect taxes from me then sir how long should i maintain the books of accounts section 36 may be important for mcq this kind of, this kind of provisions and all is important for like mcq guys so in mcq they may ask any of this provisions Section 36, period of retention of accounts. Every registered person required to keep and maintain books of accounts or other records in accordance with the provisions of section 35 subsection 1 shall retain them until the expiry of 72 months from when? From the due date of furnishing the annual return for the year pertaining to such accounts and records. Guys, listen it. Now assume we are maintaining the books of accounts for financial year 23-24. For 23-24, annual return that is gstr 9 has to be filed on or before 31st december of next year <coughs> next financial year yes sir what is that 31st december 24 so the annual return for the financial return that for sorry annual return for the financial year 23 24 that is in gstr 9 has to be filed on or before 31st december 24 yes sir due date to file annual return they are telling you how to maintain the books of accounts for 23-24 from the due date for another 72 months. Not from the end of the year. It is not from 31st March. Whatever is the due date for you to file annual return now from there 72 months. From there it is 72 months guys. Hope you got it. I have given one example here also. Books of accounts relates to financial year 22-23. Due date to file annual return is what? For financial year 22-23, 31st December of next financial year, which comes to 31st December 2023. Books of accounts of financial year 22-23 has to be maintained for 72 months from when? From 31st December 2023. That is, till 31st December 2029. Yes. Clear up? Yes. Next. However, a registered person who is a party to any appeal or revision or any other proceedings undertaken by the proper officer or commissioner of GST shall retain the books of account and the other records pertaining to the matters of such appeal or revision for a minimum period of one year after the disposal of such appeal or revision as the case may be. Guys, nice. some revision or appeal or some proceedings is going against me. So now that is with respect to assume the financial year 2010-11. So, should I keep the main uh, and retain the books of accounts for that 2010-11? Yes. Till when? Till the final judgment is given. And once the final judgment is given or final verdict is given, even after that for at least one year, I have to maintain. 
even though the books of accounts is related to 2010-11, if any revision or if any appeal or if there is any proceedings going against me for the year 2010-11, once the final judgment is given, at least from that day, another one year have to keep it. Clear? Irrespective of for which year it relates to. Clear? Yes, guys. So, this is all about the accounts and records. Very small topic, guys. So, till now, we have covered till where? Section 36 of CGST Act. Section 36 of CGST Act. Till there, we have covered. Yes, sir. Next, guys, with respect to returns, that is section 37 to 48. We will learn it in returns chapter. Returns chapter, we will be doing it as a last chapter. That is chapter 15. Clear? So, this we will be doing it at the end. Section 37 to 48, including the goods and service tax practitioner. Clear? So, the next topic would be the payment. Clear? So, payment, EVA bill, TDS, TCS, everything we will cover. And at the end, we will do the returns. Guys. Is that good? Yes, sir. Yes, students. One more new topic that is EVA bill as a part of chapter 12. So, this topic actually was there under old syllabus also, but not so in detail. It was just a part of invoice chapter, but now they have made it as a separate chapter, guys, and they have covered it in detail. So, let us learn it. E-way bill provisions discussed in chapter are contained in section 68 read with various rules, guys. State GST laws also has the identical provisions with respect to E-way bill. Provisions relating to E-way bill under CGST Act have also been made applicable to IGST Act, section 20, guys. IGST Act doesn't have separate provision for everything. It has some separate provisions with respect to nature of supply or place of supply and all. Zero rated supply and all, they have defined it. If there is no separate provisions covered under IGST Act, in section 20 of IGST Act, they have told whatever provisions are already considered in CGST Act, motadis, motandis will be applicable even under IGST Act. That is what is given in section 20 of IGST Act. This is only for those provisions which are not separately covered under IGST. Guys. Okay, now we will start with EVA bill. Section 68 of CGST Act 2017 provides that government may require the person in charge of the conveyance, means whoever is in charge of the conveyance like driver, conductor like that, carrying any consignment of goods of value exceeding such amount as may be specified to carry with him such documents and such devices as may be prescribed. Means section 68 is just prescribing this. What they should carry, when they should carry and all is given in rules. Okay. Electronic way bill is a compliance mechanism wherein by way of digital interface, the person causing the movement of goods, causing means who is initiating it. Okay, movement of goods, normally the supplier or if not supplier, at least recipient. Uploads the relevant information prior to the commencement of movement of goods and generates eBay bill on the GST portal. Guys, actually eBay bill has to be generated by supplier. Now, majority of the cases, supplier will generate it. If by chance, if supplier has not generated it, then it can still be generated either by recipient or even transporter. Even transporter can generate it. Clear? But in majority of the cases, supplier would be generating it because he is the one who is causing the movement of goods. He is the one who is arranging for transportation and sending the goods to the recipient. Or sometimes if recipient only is arranging for transportation, then he will generate the eBay bill, guys. Clear? <coughs> yes, sorry. Following are the benefits of eBay bill mechanism. Physical interface to pay way for digital interface resulting in elimination of state boundary check post previously there used to be post check post and all where the lorry drivers or truck drivers they have to stop wait for the government officials they will give the approval only what they will check all the documents if not if required they will check the goods also only then they will allow you to continue your journey in this case the turnaround time and all used to be very high guys hours together the drivers used to spend in the check post only clear which is just a wastage of time so but under eBay bill they are trying to eliminate it it will facilitate the faster movement of goods it will improve the turnaround time turnaround time means what is the time taken by transporting the goods to go and come back clear previously it is to be used days together but now by after introduction of eBay bill to some extent it has been reduced guys because instead of delivering two times assume they are now able to deliver it five times Good only. No? So, that will save the time for the business officials. Plus, they, it will help them to make more businesses. With the same vehicle, they can make more and more businesses. Okay. 
it will improve the turnover and time of trucks and helps the logistics industry by increasing the average distances traveled reducing the travel time as well as the cost to see travel time in the sense they will reduce the waiting time okay the time what they used to waste by standing in the check post and all that time has been reduced so obviously that will have a positive impact on the business guys this is the advantages under e-waybill system means under gst they have in one of the key feature under gst is e-waybill guys so this is what the advantages of this e-waybill mechanism under gst okay now we'll discuss the procedure procedure for generation of e-waybill e-way bill is a document introduced under gst regime that needs to be generated before transporting or shipping the goods worth more than fifty thousand within the state or outside the state guys before gst and all if you have to move the good from one state to another state there used to be a separate tax called entry tax or authorized duty to be levied clear but now it is not there it has been subsumed under gst so whenever there is any movement of goods whose value is more than fifty thousand, whether within the state or outside the state doesn't matter from Kar within Karnataka only I am transporting from Bangalore to Mysore, Mysore to Ubli, Ubli to Darwadi, some anywhere. <coughs> in this, in that case, e-way bill has to be generated. Next, sir, I am transporting the goods from Karnataka to Kerala or Kerala to Goa or Goa to Andhra Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh to Telangana, Telangana to Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu to Maharashtra. So, if the value of the goods is more than 50,000, e-way bill has to be generated. Okay, guys. Chal. Every registered person who causes the movement of goods of consignment value exceeding 50,000. What is that consignment value also is given in the explanation. We will see it later. Okay. If it is more than 50,000 in relation to supply. Sir, why the goods is moving because of supply? Or for reasons other than supply. Sir, I am just sending it from my Karnataka branch to another branch. It is not a supply, sir. Doesn't matter. You would have taken a separate registration. Distinct person. Actually, it might be deemed supply as per schedule 1. Or else assume, sir, within Karnataka only, I have taken only one registration. I am transporting the goods from one branch to another branch. One branch to another branch. It is not a supply, sir, because they are not distinct person. Should I still generate e-way bill? Yes. Sir, I am sending the goods to my job worker's place. Should I generate the e-way bill? Yes. Because when you are sending the goods to the job worker place, it may not be supply, but still you have to generate e-way bill. Next, due to inward supply from an unregistered person. So if supplier is unregistered, recipient has to generate e-way bill. Okay. Shall before commencement of GST uh, such movement furnish information relating to said goods as specified in part A of GST e-way bill 01. EWB stands for e-way bill guys. So part A information has to be given by the person who is generating it. Okay. Sir, what details he has to give it in? That details of goods guys. The details of goods has to be updated in part A of GST e-way e bill 01. Electronically on the common portal that is GST portal and the unique number will be generated at the set portal. Once you give the details in part A, a unique number would be generated. Yeah. And using that unique number, you can update the details of part B. And part B contains the details of vehicle in which you are transporting. Who can update it? Either the supplier, recipient or the transporter. Once unique number is generated, using that unique number, anyone can update the details of vehicle, either the supplier, recipient or the transporter provided also that where handicraft goods are goods made by a craftsman or transported outside the state or union territory by a person who has been exempted from the requirement of obtaining registration under section 23 the e-way bill shall be generated by the said person irrespective of the value that means even if the value is less than 50,000 still they have to generate e-way bill because in section 23 when they have given exemption for registration telling your turnover is within 10 lakh or 10 lakh, oh sorry, 10 or 20 lakh. Yes. And you have to generate e bill. Conditions are both. So even though the value is less than 50,000, you are supplying the goods outside the state, notified handicraft goods. In that case, registration is not applicable for you. Provided two conditions are satisfied. What are those guys? Sir, your registration turnover is within 10 lakh or 20 lakh plus your generated e bill. Clear. So in that case, e-way bill has to be generated even though the value is less than 50,000. Next, so guys, we have learned that if the value of the goods is more than 50,000, we have to generate e-way bill. Sir, that, wa that value, how do we consider it? Consignment value of goods is the value of supply under section 15, what we have already learned. And also includes CGST, SGST, UDGST, IGST and says charged if any and shall exclude the value of exempt supply of goods wherein 
the invoice is issued in respect of both exempt and taxable supply of goods. Guys, listen here. Value of supply will not include any GST component. Value of supply will not include because value of supply we are calculating to charge GST. So it will not include anything charged under GST that is CGST, SGST, IGST, UDGST says it will not include. What they are telling now is consignment value means value of supply plus GST or says GST includes CGST, SGST, IGST, everything guys. Okay, na? So consignment value means this one. Assume the value of supply is 48,000. GST is 6,000. So what is the consignment value of 54,000? Should we generate EVA bill? Yes, as it is more than 50,000, we have to generate EVA bill. Who? Either the supplier or recipient or transporter. Whoever is causing the movement of goods, guys. Hope it is clear for you. Clear. So including GST, if it is more than 50, many a times they may try to confuse you like this. Value of supply, they will give less than 50,000. But including GST, more than 50,000. So you will get confused. Should I include GST or not? See, as per section 15, we will not include GST. But for consignment value, we should include GST. Clear? Or else, it might be like this. Please listen here. Assume. Okay, let me mention here. Only. Value of supply is 45,000. And GST is assume 4,000. And CES is 2,000. Should we generate EVB? Yes, sir. Because says if at all if it is applicable, it will be over and above GST, guys. So what is the total consignment value? 49, 50, 1000. Is it more than 50,000? Yes, sir. So, should we generate EVA bill? Yes, it is mandatory. It is mandatory. Sir, what the value of the goods is less than 50,000? Okay, now, assume all this put together. It is 30,000 value of supply. GST is assume 5,000. There is no cess. So, in that case, what is the value of the consignment? 35,000. It is not mandatory to generate EVA bill, but still voluntarily you can do it. Voluntarily you can do it, guys. Clear, Yes. <laughs> Sir, should we consider the value of exempt supply and all while checking these values? No. In the same consignment, if you are sending both taxable goods as well as exempt goods, consider only the value of taxable supply. Exempt supply, you ignore it. Okay. That is if you are sending it in the same consignment. Okay, guys. Next, coming to the second point. Where the consignor or consignee has not generated the EVA bill. That is consignor means supplier, where consignee means the recipient. Either of them will do it if they have not done it. The EVA bill in form GST, EWB01, then the aggregate of the consignment value of the goods carried in the conveyance is more than 50,000. Then the transporter will generate it. Except in case of transportation by way of railways, air and vessel. In this cases, transporter will not do it. If you are transporting it by way of road in trucks, lorries and all, in that case, transporter can do it. Okay. Shall generate, except these three cases, guys. Who will generate? Transporter shall generate the EVA bill in form GST EVW01 on the basis of invoice or bill of supply or delivery chalan. And may also means you would be given the data of either the bill invoice or bill of supply by the supplier or recipient. One, at least one of the copy will be given. Using that, you generate EVA bill. Who? Transporter. And may also generate a consolidated EVA bill in form GST EWP02 on the common portal prior to the movement of goods. Okay, you can also generate consolidated EVA bill. What is consolidated EVA bill? We will understand. Guys, clear. Huh? So, first priority is who is causing the movement of goods? Majority of the time, supplier. Is. Who should generate the EVA bill? The supplier. If by chance supplier is not registered or supplier is not able to generate EVA bill, in that case, who will do? Recipient. Sir knows our recipient is also a lazy fellow. He has also not done. Then third option is transporter. Transporter will generate it. But transporter cannot generate in three modes of transportation. What are those? Railways, air and vessel. If the mode of transport is railways, air or vessel, transporter cannot generate EVA bill. Okay. Where the goods are transported by railways or by air or by vessel, the EVA bill shall be generated by the registered person. That is either the supplier or recipient, not the transporter being the supplier or the recipient either before or after the commencement of movement before or even after the commencement you can generate okay then registered person or the transporter may at his option generate and carry the eva bill even if the value of the consignment is less than 50000 i told you if it is more than 50000 mandatory if it is less than 50000 here example i gave 35000 can i still voluntarily generate eva bill good you can do it next fifth one 
e-way bill is valid for a movement of goods by road only when the information in part b is furnished so part a once you give the information what information you will give the information about the goods you will give the information and you will generate a unique number Uni using that unique number you can update the details in part b in part b what details will you give vehicle details okay now so until you give the vehicle details e-way bill will not be valid clear na? yes vehicle details means like vehicle number who is the owner or transporter all the details you have to update exceptions however means in the following cases part b information may not be required however details of conveyance may not be furnished in part b of the e-way bill where the goods are transported for a distance up to 50 kilometers means less than or equal to 50 kilometers within the state or union territory means you are transporting the goods within the state up to 50 kilometers from one place to another place within the state please be careful sir what if it is outside the state from karnataka Vasur to tamil nadu within 50 kilometers sir we have transport okay means from karnataka border to Vasur we have transported sir. clear huh? in that case within 50 kilometers assuming 50 kilometers border district sir karnataka border district to uh, Vasur in that case should we generate EV bill? Yes. In that case, the kilometer doesn't matter. Only if it is within the state or union territory, if it is up to 50 kilometer. From where to where? From the place of business of the consigner, that is the supplier, <coughs> to the place of business of the transporter for the further transportation. That is from supplier's place to transporter's, transporter's place. Or from transporter's place to recipient place. So from one place to another place, if you are transporting within the state, and if the distance is up to 50 kilometers, they are telling, Part B information is not required. Part B information. That is vehicle. Okay. Upon generation of e-way bill on the common portal, a unique e-way bill number shall be made available to the supplier, recipient and transporter on the common portal. That, all, that is what we discussed. Once the part A information is given, unique number will be generated. And that unique number, anyone can use it. Either the supplier, recipient or transporter. To do what? To update the details of vehicle in part B. Where the goods are transferred from one conveyance to another, the consigner or the recipient or the transporter shall before such transfer and further movement of goods update the details of conveyance in the eBay bill on the common portal in part B of form GST EWB01. Guys, already one vehicle details is given in part B. Now, sir, in between, we are changing the vehicle. We are unloading the goods from vehicle 1 and loading it to vehicle 2 or truck 2. In that case, you have to update, update the vehicle uh, details of vehicle 2 in part B. It is your responsibility. Clear? Yes. Who will do it, sir? Either of the three party again. Supplier, recipient or consigner. The user can update part B vehicle details as many times as he wants for the movement of goods to the destination. However, the updating should be done within the validity period. Okay, sir. What if the vehicles is changed? 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4. Number of times we have changed. You can update it any number of times. But that updation in part B of vehicle details should be within the validity period. There can also be a case where one e-way bill can go through multiple modes of transportation before reaching destination. That is air, water, road, everything you are transporting through rail. As per the mode of transportation, the e-way bill can be updated with new mode of transportation by using the option update vehicle number. Okay, now means the same goods is moving first through road, through a truck then through a ship, then through a air. In that case, update the details, at least with the mode of transportation, first by road, what is the vehicle number, then ship, then air, flight, all these details, you have to update it in part B. Where the multiple consignment are intended to be transported in one convenience, that is one vehicle. In one vehicle only, you are transporting the goods of many people. The transporter may indicate the serial number of all the e-way bills generated in respect of each such consignment electronically on the common portal and consolidated e-way bill in form GST EWB02 may be generated, option may be generated by him on the said common portal prior to the movement of goods. The generation of GST EWB02 is optional and not mandatory. Now guys assume in a single vehicle, <coughs> in a single vehicle, hope it looks like a vehicle, so in a single vehicle the transporter is carrying the goods of five different suppliers. Five different suppliers, guys. One, two, three, four, five. So, in that case, the suppliers, assuming they have generated five different e-way bill. They already have generated 
five different e-way bill. Now, can he combine all this instead of carrying all the five bills? Can he combine all this and generate one consolidated e-way bill? Yes. Who has this option? Transporter. Giving the details of all these five e-way bills generated by the supplier or recipient, he can generate one consolidated e-way bill. Sir, generating consolidated e-way bill, is it mandatory? No. He has an option. He can either carry all the five invoices separately or instead of five, carrying five invoices, he can generate one consolidated invoice and carry one. Clear, huh? Yes. And to generate consolidated EV bill, the form is GST EVW, that is EWB, EWB02, guys. EV bill. Cancellation of EV bill. Sir, once it is generated, can we cancel it? Yes, provided there is no movement of goods. Where an EV bill has been generated under this rule, but goods are either not transported or are not transported as per the details. Assume we are uh, generated the UA bill for 1000 kgs, but we have generated, uh, sorry, we are transporting only 100 kgs. In that case, cancel the old bill and generate a new bill. Or else, sir, we generated the UA bill, but later I change the mind not to transport or not to send these goods. In that case, you can cancel it. Okay. The EVA bill may be cancelled electronically on the common portal within 24 hours of generation of the EVA bill. Once you have generated the EVA bill within 24 hours, you can cancel it provided you are not transporting that goods. Provided that an EVA bill cannot be cancelled if it has been verified in transit in accordance with the provisions of rule 138B. Sir, it is already verified by the proper officer right? telling we have the, this goods has moved from this place to this place. If it is already verified by the proper officer, now you cannot cancel the e-way bill. Further, unique e-way bill number generated is valid for a period of how many days? 15 days for updation of part B. That is, once you give the details in part A, unique number will be generated now. So, within how many days you can fill the details in part B? Within 15 days. Not more than that. Clear? Huh? Yes. Next, validity period important, guys. What is the validity period of e-way bill, sir? Is, does it have any expiry period? Yes. <clears throat> the validity of e-way bill depends on the distance to be traveled. In case of dimensional cargo, see whether dimensional or over-dimensional, it depends on the Motor Vehicles Act, guys. Actually, in my regular study material, I have mentioned it. That How do we decide whether the vehicle is dimensional or over-dimensional? Depends on the dimension of the vehicle as per the Motor, Ve make, uh, Motor Vehicle Act read with rules. So from exam point of view, is it important? No, they would have already given it in the question whether the vehicle is dimensional or over dimensional. Accordingly, you decide the validity period. Clear? Huh? Yes. Okay. The validity of eBay bill depends on the distance to be traveled. In case of dimensional cargo, up to 200 km one day. For every 200 km or part thereof, over and above 200 km, one additional day, guys. Assume in case of over, uh, sorry, in case of dimensional cargo, we are traveling for 950 kilometers 950 kilometers the distance of travel is 950 kilometers just divide it by whatever is the standard guys that is 200 kilometers clear huh? so how much you will get 950 divided by 200 you will get 4.75 but you should always round it up to next that is five days what is the validity period of the uh, eBay bill five days same way assume 350 kilometers 350 kilometer is the distance divided by 200 you will get one point something but you should always round it up to two days always next day if any decimal please always take the next day because the days you cannot count it in decimal and all clear even part of 200 you have to consider it as full 200 clear guys yes this is in case of dimensional cargo sir what if it is in case of over dimensional cargo or multi-modal shipment in which at least one leg involves transport by ship means you are using different modes of transportation like road, railways or flight. One of the mode at least is ship. At least one of the mode is ship. Okay. In that case, so over dimensional cargo and all means they cannot cross certain speed limit also guys. In the highways and all you, would, you guys would have observed some lorries or some vehicles carrying heavy load will be going full slow mode. You will be like zing yanta. But that vehicles will be going in a very slow mode because they will be carrying heavy load. So in that case, what is the validity period for them up to 20 km one day for every 20 km or part thereof over and about 20 km one additional day. So let me take in the same scenario guys. In case of over dimensional guys, assume sir, the distance is 950 km. 
So in that case, divided by 20. So 950 divided by 20, you will get how much? 47.5. Yeah. So you have to round it up to how many days? 48 days. Same way. Sir, what if it is 350 days? Over dimensional cargo or multimodal, at least one ship, uh, one moment is through ship. In that case, 20. So 350 by 20, 350 by 20, 17.5. So you have to round it up to 18 days. 18 days, guys. Is that clear? Yes, this is how we will count it. So remember, up to 200, one day for dimensional. For every over and above 200, for every 200 or part of 200, additional one day. Whereas over dimensional, remove one zero. Remove one zero. Over dimensional. So over now. So for that, O, remove one zero. So in that case, 20. Up to 20, one day. Over and above 20, for every 20 or part of 20, additional one day. Okay, sir. Provided further that, where the under circumstances of an exceptional nature, natural calamity, law or order dis uh, issues, accident of conveyance, etc., including transshipment, the goods can, transshipment means moving the goods from one ship to another ship, guys. Load, unloading it from one ship and loading it to another ship. The goods cannot be transported within the validity period of eBay bill. The transporter may extend the validity period after updating the details in part B of Form GST EWB01 if required. So if there is any breakdown of the vehicle or if there is any protest going on between two states or the border is blocked, assume in Delhi now, for a few days the border was blocked, clear a former protest was, go was going on. So due to that, sir, we couldn't reach the place within the validity period. In that case, you can ask for extension. You can extend the validity period by mentioning the specific reason. The validity of the eBay bill may be extended within 8 hours from the time of its expiry. Means once it is expired also you can extend it but within 8 hours. Either before the expiry or within 8 hours of expiry. Okay, explanation, relevant date. Sir, this dates and all will be counted from when sir? Is it from the day, time I generated the eBay bill? No guys. Relevant explanation. Relevant date means the date on which the EVA bill has been generated and the period of validity shall be counted from time at which the EVA bill has been generated and each day shall be counted as the period expiring at midnight of the day immediately following the date of generation of EVA bill. Simple guys. Assume I am generating on 22nd March 24th. I am generating the EVA bill. Assume at 2 p.m. 2 p.m. So the days will be counted from when, sir? We will ignore the time. The first day will count from the midnight, guys. Midnight. Clear up means 22nd will not be counted in simple. The first day will be counted from when? 12. That is midnight of uh, midnight between what? 22nd and 23rd. Okay, now so first day will be counted. Start. First day will start from midnight 12 o'clock. Clear. So when it will end, sir, first day, 12 of next day. That is between 23rd and 24th. Clear. So in simple, ignore the day on which you have uh, generated the EVA bill. In excluding means irrespective of the time, just ignore that date. The first day will start from the midnight. Will start from the midnight, guys. Okay. Next, the EVA bill generated under this rule shall be valid in every state and union territory, guys. Okay, we need not generate. Now assume we have generated the EVA bill in Karnataka to transport the goods through different states. So should we generate EVA bill in each and every state, sir? Not required. Next, documents and devices to be carried by a person in charge of conveyance. Means whoever is in charge of the mode of transportation. Na, normally in case of vehicle, that is the lorry or the truck and all the driver. Guys. The person in charge of convenience shall carry the invoice or bill of supply or delivery chalan. The copy of this will be given by supplier or recipient to the transporter guys. Clear? Huh? Yes. Normally supplier, if by chance if supplier has not given, at least recipient will give a copy of this to whom transporter. And along with that, either of these three, either invoice or bill of supply or delivery chalan. Along with this, a copy of eBay bill in physical form or eBay bill number in electronic form or a map to RFID that is radio frequency identification device embedded on the convenience that is a vehicle except in case of movement of goods by rail by air or vessel there it will not be embedded okay 
tax invoice or bill of supply to accompany the transport of goods. Person in charge of convenience shall carry a copy of tax invoice or a bill of supply issued in case where such good where such person is not required to carry an e-way bill under these rules. So if by chance if he is not generated e-way bill, if value of the goods is less than fifty thousand and all, at least you, you should have what a copy of tax invoice or bill of supply case. Or if not that, at least delivery chalan. Okay. Next verification of documents and conveyances. So whenever the transporter is transporting the goods from one place to another place which belongs to someone else, the proper officer have all the right to stop him and ask him to submit e-way bill or the tax invoice or bill of supply or delivery chalan. The commissioner or an officer empowered by him in this behalf may authorize the proper officer to intercept that is to stop any conveyance to verify the e-way bill in physical or electronic form for all interstate and intrastate movement of goods. They have the power to stop the vehicle and check the e-way bill guys. Then inspection and verification of goods rule 138C. A summary report of every inspection of goods in transit shall be recorded online by the proper officer in part A of the prescribed form within 24. This is with respect to the proper officer. He will record it. Okay. Part A of prescribed form within 24 hours of the inspection and final report he will prepare in part B of the said form shall be recorded within three days of such inspection. Okay. Part A has to be updated within 24 hours and part B has to be updated that is report within three days of inspection. However, where the circumstances so warrant, the commissioner or any other officer authorized by him may on sufficient cause being shown extended the time for a period of the final report in part B of said form for a further period not exceeding three days. He already has three days. If that is not sufficient, it can be extended for another three days. The period of 24 hours or as the case may be three days shall be counted from the midnight of the day when, on which the vehicle was intercepted. Now assume on 25th March, the vehicle was stopped at 6 o'clock in the evening and it was intercepted by the proper officer. So within 24 hours, the details has to be updated in party. Na? So 24 hours should be counted from when? It is midnight. Midnight of what day? 25th and 26th guys. So 24 hours will be counted from here. Clear? Even the three days will be counted from where? The midnight. Not the exact time at what, at what time it was intercepted. We will ignore the time at what time it was intercepted. We will take the midnight of that day or the beginning of next day. Okay. Next, facility for uploading information regarding detention of vehicle guys. Where a vehicle has been intercepted and detained for a period means stopped. He didn't allow the movement of goods for a period exceeding 30 minutes. The transporter may upload the said information in specified form on the common portal because this will also affect the validity period. So that is why if the proper officer is intercepting the vehicle and is stopping it for more than 30 minutes, he has to update the details guys on the common portal. Blocking of e-way bill generation facility. This also to some extent important guys. They may ask descriptive question or even MCQ also. Blocking of e-way bill generation facility means disabling the taxpayer from generating the e-way bill. Means using your GST IN, you cannot generate e-way bill if it is blocked for you. Blocking of GST IN for every e-way bill generation would apply only for a defaulting supplier GST IN and not for the defaulting recipient or the transporter GST IN. Suspended GST IN cannot generate e-way bill as a supplier. However, the suspended GST IN can get the e-way bill generated as the recipient or as a transporter. Guys, now if my GST IN has been suspended to generate e-way bill, as a supplier, I cannot generate the e-way bill. Now assume you are supplying goods to me. I am the recipient. My GST IN has been suspended to generate e-way bill. Now as a recipient, can I generate e-way bill? Yes. Only as a supplier, I cannot generate e-way bill. As a recipient or as a transporter, even though my GST IN is suspended, still I can generate e-way bill. That is what they are clearly stressing on. Only if the supplier's GST IN is blocked to generate e-way bill, he cannot generate e-way bill as a supplier. For his inward supply, as a recipient, can he generate e-way bill? Yes, he can do. Sir, when e-way bill, uh, well, GST IN will be blocked to generate e-way bill, sir, in the following cases. As per rule 138E, no person shall be allowed to furnish the information in part A of GST e-way bill 01 
in respect of any outward movement of goods of a registered person who being a person paying a tax under the composition scheme under section 10 has not furnished the payment statement in CMP 08 for two consecutive quarter. So for the person who is under the composition scheme, both 10-1 and 10-2A, they have to pay tax quarterly and file payment statement in CMP 08 quarterly. Na? Yes, sir. But that person has not done it for two consecutive quarters. Or the person who is paying tax under regular scheme, that is section 9, has not furnished GSTR 1 for any two months or two quarters. Two quarters is when they are following QRMP or if they are following regular scheme, two months for two continuous months. Okay. Then being a person whose registration has been suspended under the provisions of rule 21A, that is during the pendency of cancellation proceedings, till the cancellation proceedings is completed, your registration might be suspended. During that time, your GSTIN will be blocked to generate EVA bill as a supplier as a supplier so in the following three cases if you are a supplier you cannot use your gstin to generate the eway bill guys so this is all about the <clears throat> eway bill chapter guys guys hope you guys are preparing well so yes there are only few days left for your exams i hope somewhere that you guys are doing well you are taken your own responsibility so only few days are left guys so please take it seriously and push yourself during this time at least 15 to 16 hours a day you have to study guys you have to study it because this one month is very very crucial just think if result do, don't means if you don't get the results which you expect then you have to work hard again for another six months clear whether the exams is in september or november it doesn't worry now your attempt is in may please focus on that and make sure that you will clear it guys okay now so push yourself for this one month telling that i will do it i will do it clear don't let negativity rule your mind don't let uh, self doubt on you thinking will i be able to do will i pass one group will i pass two group or even if you guys have taken two models yes it is challenging but guys once you have taken the decision please stick to it please make sure that you are sticking to it and working towards it clear if you're just thinking do do something sir i want to be a ca I want to qualify, I want to pass inter this attempt, you will not be able to guys, you have to work for it, work hard, definitely you will get the fruitful results, fine, so please make sure that you guys are not giving your ears to the rumors, you will not worry about sir, will exams happen in that time, this time, what about voting and all, what about elections, guys those things are not in your control, only thing you guys have to focus as a student is your studies guys, please practice more and more. And this EVA bill and all after studying it, you guys, please make sure that once all ticket is released, as of now, it may not be released, but before the exams, it will be released. So take a copy of it, please cross check whether everything is proper, including the centers and all. Then all the pen, pencil, stationary items and all, please keep it ready well before going to the exams, guys. And when you are practicing only, try to practice in a pen which you are thinking to write in the exam, okay, or which you are planning to use it in the exam please start writing in that that is very important you have to get used to it guys even calculator everything please don't buy the new calculator just before the exam day if at all if you are planning to buy it please buy it now only get used to it work in it so that you will be like it is not completely new for you on the exam day each and every minute is very very important in the exam all guys that three hours plus 15 minutes reading time is very very crucial for you it is like you guys have prepared for a Olympics and you are going there. You know, athlete. So Olympics and all will come once in a four years. But it's not like they will wake up early morning on the particular day and they will go and participate in that. That athlete would have practiced day in day out every day during that four years, guys. And at the end, whatever might be the results, they would have put the efforts. That is very important for you guys. Clear. So that three hours is very, very crucial for you. You guys would have prepared for six months, nine months, one years what you do or how you use that three hours is very very crucial guys and also guys on the exam day how do you prepare how do you prepare how do you dedicate your time towards the subject maybe everything you will not be able to cover but plan it before plan it before that on the exam days because too much time will not be there on the exam days from which book do you study what do you study and if at all, if you are planning to watch any videos, how long will you watch it? When will you watch it? Please put a proper timetable sitting today only. Sitting on today itself, please plan for that day. Clear on the exam day, you cannot after the exam. 
after coming back from, from the first exam you cannot plan for the second paper guys please do it okay for accounts how for law how for tax how for costing how so if you're writing both the modules for each and every paper you plan it after coming back from the exam what do you do next day what do you do next to next day means <clears throat> exam day what do you do all this you guys please plan it now only guys or else unnecessarily you will get panicked on the exam days and that nervousness you will carry to the exam all and in that what happens now in that such a scenario whatever you know also you will not be able to present it in the exam please avoid all that clear have a positive mindset and never doubt yourself and during your studies guys i will tell you a few experience which happened to me sometimes you will feel i am forgetting everything it it will happen sometimes you will feel i am getting confused from one subject to another subject from one chapter to another chapter it will happen no problem for every ca student it should happen clear that is when we will we have to understand that yes we have taken ca seriously we are preparing if someone has not taken ca seriously nothing of this will happen to them clear yes so sometimes you will feel short of time so not sometimes every time sir i am not able to cover it i am writing one group no time i am writing two group no time sir i am not able to cover everything but please don't skip any topics at least have an idea about it at least watch the revision videos okay of all the subjects so even taxation all the topics i have tried to cover please make sure that every topic you have an idea because on some simple topics they will ask questions in the exam like for four five marks and all don't let it go never be under prepared guys never be under prepared and in descriptive type whatever choice will be there that choice you have to decide in the exam all not before going to the exam all if you have not prepared any chapter then you have already taken choice before going to the exam all please don't do that don't go to the exam all under prepared clear all this feeling whatever i told confusion panicness or under prepared means we will feel like sir time is shortage i don't have enough time all this will happen but whatever time you guys have now please avoid all other things distraction whatever you guys know what is your distraction please avoid all those things keep it aside and focus only on your studies guys this one month or one and a half month is very 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 crucial for you trust my words guys i will just give you the plan for my subject okay so once you come from the second paper that is after completion of second paper i guess it is on fifth fifth may next tax paper is on 9th may if i am not wrong correct ah, after revised scheduled so you have a gap on how many days 6th 7th 8th you have gap of three days plus fifth also few hours you will get ninth also few hours you will get so almost four days guys effectively four days guys you have to score above 60 70 in tax this is like a blessing for you bonus for you clear up please make use of it this will help you to get overall average of the group guys okay i'm not telling you should not score good marks in accounts and law definitely how to do it all papers are important but when you are getting three days off for a particular paper that to my paper i'm very happy as a teacher you should also be happy as a student clear yes you might not be happy because exams are not postponed i was expecting exams will be postponed in june but guys okay now we have to accept what has happened so please accept it and prepare for whatever dates they have announced so now let me just tell guys this is just my plan it is not mandatory that you have to implement the same you can make necessary changes however it is convenient for you so now 5th may guys 5th may you will come <clears throat> to the home after the exams so exams would be till 5 o'clock so let us assume you will start somewhere in at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock guys guys you will be little tired on that day okay you would have already written two papers so you would have already studied you would have your mind also light lightly drained out so what i suggest is watch the revision video see revision video you would have already watched once as there are three days of time i'm suggesting you to watch again i'm suggesting you to watch again guys three days time you have so the total duration of the revision video i am assuming it to be both direct tax as well as indirect tax put together direct tax is for 14 and a half hours assuming indirect tax will be for around 12 13 hours totally 25 to 26 hours guys okay let me take it as 26 hours total revision video is for how many hours 26 hours dt idt both put together okay now dt already it is published 14.5 hours idt remaining you consider okay sir now <coughs> On fifth, try to watch the video for at least four and a half hours. 
ಅಟ್ಲೀಸ್ಟ್ ಫೋರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಫ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಕಸ್ ಫೋರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಫ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಸರ್ ಡಿ ಟಿ ನ ಐ ಟಿ ಟಿ ನ ಮೈ ಪರ್ಸನಲ್ ಸಜೆಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಡಿ ಟಿ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಗೋ ಟು ಐ ಟಿ ಟಿ ಬಟ್ ಸಮ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಮೈ ಫೀಲ್ ನೋ ಸರ್ ಐ ಟಿ ಟಿ ಇಸ್ ಈಸಿ ಫಾರ್ ಮಿ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಐ ಟಿ ಟಿ ವಿಚ್ ಎವರ್ ಇಸ್ ಕನ್ವೀನಿಯಂಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಯು ಗೈಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಎವರ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಸಜೆಸ್ಟ್ ಯು ಗೋ ಫಾರ್ ಇಟ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಆ ಸೊ ಆನ್ ಫಿಫ್ತ್ ಮೇ ಯು ಮೈಟ್ ಬಿ ಟಯರ್ಡ್ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಟೂ ಮಚ್ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಸಿಟ್ ವಾಚ್ ದ ವೀಡಿಯೋ ಬೈ ಪ್ಲೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ಇನ್ ಯುವರ್ ಲ್ಯಾಪ್ ಟಾಪ್ ಅವರ್ ಟಿ ವಿ ಅವರ್ ಮೊಬೈಲ್ ವೇರ್ ಎವರ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ಟ್ರೈ ಟು ವಾಚ್ ಇಟ್ ಆನ್ ಅ ಬಿಗ್ಗರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಬೆಟರ್ ಅವಾಯ್ಡ್ ಮೊಬೈಲ್ ಸೊ ಬೆಟರ್ ಇಸ್ ಟು ವಾಚ್ ಇಟ್ ಆನ್ ಲ್ಯಾಪ್ ಟಾಪ್ ಅವರ್ ಆನ್ ಟಿ ವಿ ಇಫ್ ಪಾಸಿಬಲ್ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ಐದರ್ ಡಿ ಟಿ ಆರ್ ಐ ಟಿ ಟಿ ಗೈಸ್ ಸೊ ರಿಮೇನಿಂಗ್ ತ್ರೀ ಡೇಸ್ ಕೀಪ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ 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 ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಓಕೆನಾ ಸೊ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಇಟ್ ಮೈಟ್ ಬಿ ಲೈಕ್ ಪ್ಲಸ್ ಮೈನಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಅನ್ ಅವರ್ ಒನ್ ಅವರ್ ಗೈಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಡಿಪೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಅಪನ್ ದ ಡ್ಯೂರೇಷನ್ ಸೊ ಯು ಟ್ರೈ ಟು ಕವರ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಓಕೆ ಐ ಎಮ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ರ್ಯಾಂಡಮ್ ನಂಬರ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ 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 ಟೋಟಲಿ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಕಮ್ ಟು ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಒನ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಆ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಒನ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಕೀಪ್ ಇಟ್ ಆ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಫೈವ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಫೈವ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಫೈವ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಡಿಪೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಅಪನ್ ದ ಡ್ಯೂರೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವೀಡಿಯೋ ಸೊ ಯು ವಿಲ್ ವಾಚ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಡೇ ಯು ವಿಲ್ ನಾಟ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ವಾಚ್ ದ ವೀಡಿಯೋ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಫುಲ್ ಡೇ ಯು ವಿಲ್ ವಾಚ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಫಾರ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ನೋ ಪ್ಲಸ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಪ್ಲಸ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ plus your studies guys so from whichever material the either from my regular study material or from my revision material or if you want to practice the question especially total income questions please practice even under gst value of supply gst liability calculation practice question on it mandatory questions guys in G- income tax value uh, total income calculation and tax calculation and under gst value of supply gst liability including itc uh, itc adjustment mandatory questions clear ah so please practice them okay other questions also you practice but this three areas please practice more and more questions clear so this three days seven hours of watching plus few hours of studies plus few hours of studies even on the exam days guys push yourself minimum 15 to 16 hours of studies should happen and please make sure that you will sleep at least for 6 to 7 hours or i will sacrifice my sleep i will not sleep at all i will study please don't do that because for the exam all you have to go with a fresh mind fresh mind and even on 5th may have a good sleep guys because you would have sacrificed little bit of your sleep for accounts and law paper so you can have little good sleep on 5th clear that is why i just kept 4 and 1/2 hours remaining 6th 7th 8th around 7 hours of watching plus studies keep the target like this guys clear on what see on what day will you watch dt idt is your choice my suggestion is dt first idt next clear and even on the exam day 9th may coming to 9th may your priority priority of the topics some important topics or some in- topics which you would be feeling like i am not so convinced please go through them clear and i one more thing guys whatever this revision material is there both dt idt soft copy is already shared in my telegram channel so you will be having it but i suggest you to take print out of it before the exams only don't go on the exam day to take the print out please take it now today you are watching which day see it in your calendar please go and take it today only what whichever day you are watching this please go take the print out on that day only clear it's better to have printed copy guys clear because you can also make a note of something and you can underline all these things you can do <laughs> or if you want to make some additions anything you can also make it so on the exam day also morning 3 4 hours you can just uh, just audit your revision book okay audit because you would have already done everything so on 9th may you can just verify you can jo- just watch you can just audit the revision materials guys clear so please plan for the exam days now itself guys this is my humble request don't keep the planning itself on the exam day you will simply waste the time sitting on that day to start with dt na idt na in dt what heads up income i will cover later first let me cover some simple topics please don't do it to the extent possible always try to go in the order guys because there will be connections clear so make use of this even revision videos revision notes and all guys i have put lot of efforts to make it okay i'm not <clears throat> telling you that just because i have made the effort you have to do you have to watch it or you have to use it no because i am trying to make your work your preparation easy so you have to make use of it now clear and that too for taxation you have got 3 days off means that is like blessing for you a complete bonus yeah perks for you so please make use of all that guys clear so please prepare please prepare a proper timetable and strategy and accordingly stick to it
once a person is registered under GST on his GST profile that is on the GST portal two ledgers that is cash and credit ledger and an electronic liability register will be automatically opened and displayed on his dashboard guys. So with respect to e-ledger there are two types of e-ledger that is <coughs> one cash ledger and credit ledger which will be prepared and updated by whom taxpayer that is the registered supplier. Whereas the second set is prepared and updated on the basis of returns furnished by the supplier that is either GSTR1 or GSTR3B or whichever returns they are filing or tax authority which is electronic liability register. That section 49 read with rules has given the provisions with respect to this registers or ledger. What should be debited or what should be credited in this ledger or register. But I have made it in the form of ledger accounts for better understanding. Guys, this is only for your better understanding to easily digest, okay, how exactly these things will be debited or credited in the respective register or ledger. So, in the exam, if at all, if there is any question on electronic liability uh, register or credit ledger or uh, the cash ledger, guys, please explain it in the point wise. Please explain it. You guys don't draw the ledger and explain it because this I have done it only for your better understanding. Clear? Yes as you guys would be called chartered accountants. So for you in the form of accounts or ledger accounts, if I explain, I thought, okay, that would become easy for you to understand. Fine guys, we'll start with electronic liability register will be maintained in form GST PMT. PMT stands for payment 01 form number. So your any amount which a person is liable to pay under GST would be debited guys. Anything including GST, interest, late fee, penalty, anything which a person is liable to pay will be debited here. And how will he pay it? Either through using a credit ledger or through using the balance in cash ledger. So if he is eligible to claim input tax credit and if he is, able, if he is having credit in the credit ledger, he will use it. Or in excess of that, if he has to pay tax, he will pay it through cash ledger. Or if he doesn't have any credit straight away, he will pay entire amount through cash ledger. Guys, assume the person's tax liability is coming to 2 lakh. He has a credit of 1 lakh. He will use 1 lakh. Remaining 1 lakh, he will pay it through what? Cash ledger. Clear? So whenever there is any tax liability to be paid, first he will see whether he has any input tax credit balance in the credit ledger. If yes, if he is eligible to utilize it, he will utilize it. And we also learned the order of utilizing. We will again learn it here. So once he adjusts the credit, after that, if still any amount is pending, he will pay it through electronic cash ledger guys. But please be careful, electronic credit ledger balance can be used only to pay output tax. Any tax to be paid under reverse charge mechanism or any interest rate fee penalty and all can be paid only through electronic cash ledger balance guys. Clear? Yes, sir. Next coming to electronic credit ledger, which will be maintained in form GST PMT 02 whatever the amount of credit which the person is eligible to claim as credit under input uh, under GST law that is the tax what he has paid on his inward supply we already learned in section 16 17 18 and all when he is eligible to claim credit what is the condition what is the restriction what is the block credit if at all if he has crossed all that and if he is eligible to claim credit that amount is reflecting on the credit side of electronic credit ledger sir what do we do with it he will adjust it against output tax guys so whatever input tax credit is available in the credit ledger, you will adjust it against what? Output tax. Please be careful. While adjusting the output tax, this paragraph is very important. The amount available in electronic credit ledger may be used for making payment only towards output tax. That is the tax payable on outward supply. The input tax credit credited to electronic credit ledger cannot be used for making a payment of tax under reverse charge mechanism. Sir, I am a recipient. I am pay, supposed to pay tax under reverse charge mechanism. Can I use my credit balance to pay it? No, because it is input tax, not output tax. So input tax, when you are liable to pay tax under RCM, please pay it first. And that whatever you pay, you can claim it as a credit, but in the following period. In the following period or subsequent period, guys. Hope you understood. So whenever as a recipient, if you are liable to pay tax under RCM, you have to pay it through electronic cash ledger. And sir, can I claim the credit of it? Yes, but you pay first and then claim the credit. So if you are like paying tax now under RCM, you can claim it as a credit in the following period. Okay. Then even interest late fee penalty and all can be paid only by using electronic cash ledger balance guys. You cannot utilize ITC to pay interest late fee penalty under GST. Okay, sir. So now we saw, 
the input tax credit if at all if it is there we can utilize to pay the liability so this two are connected whatever is credited here na this is debited here agree guys yes sir so in what order we will utilize it we already learned it in itc chapter just we will see we will just again revisit it input tax credit of a person is credited to electronic credit ledger so first it will be credited here whatever credit is available for okay then the person may use this to pay what only output tax liability that is the tax payable on outward supply in what order it can be used first always igst credit first should be utilized igst credit will be first utilized against igst liability <coughs> then if still some balance is there against cgst or sgst in any order in any order in any ratio choice is the assesses or the suppliers okay yes so first igst credit should be fully utilized only then you can touch cgst and sgst credit guys that is important provision please keep it in mind then central tax cgst <coughs> cgst credit will be first utilized against cgst liability and if still something is pending you can adjust it against igst liability but you cannot adjust it against sgst liability same way coming to sgst or utgst first adjust it against the same nature that is either sgst or utgst then if still something is pending against igst but you cannot adjust it against cgst guys for a particular registration you will either have cgst credit sorry either you will have sgst credit or utgst credit not both because under gst payment of tax filing of returns is state wise or union territory wise clear for each and every separate registration you have to file separate returns and pay tax separately you will utilize the credit also for that respective state so <clears throat> we cannot adjust the inter adjust the credit between cgst and sgst guys yes <laughs> next sir assume i had a credit of 10 lakh but i have utilized only 6 lakh i have remaining 4 lakh what do i do with it normally you will carry forward it to the next tax period you will carry forward it to the next tax period but in two cases guys that is inverted duty structure that is the tax on inward supply is more than the tax on outward supply or if my outward supply is zero rated i would have paid tax on my inward supply can i claim the credit of it yes but on my outward supply it is zero rated in that case can i claim the refund of unutilized input tax credit yes in this two scenario that is inverted duty structure or if your outward supply is zero rated supply you can claim the refund of unutilized input tax credit so in that case you will apply for that refund when you apply for that refund you will believe that you will receive it and debit that amount assume you are applying for 4 lakh refund you will debit it you will debit it here if it is processed good thank you for the department if by chance if they reject telling vikas you cannot claim it please utilize it in the next month in that case if it is by chance rejected give back the credit give back the credit as soon as you apply debit it assuming you will receive it if you receive no more entry if it is rejected you have to credit it back you have to credit it back guys clear yes sir but i told you refund would be given of unutilized itc only in two scenarios if not you will normally carry forward and utilize it in the next period guys okay next <clears throat> electronic cash ledger electronic cash ledger will be maintained in gst pmt 05 okay sir first see whatever order of numbers i have given na in the same order it has to flow guys first whatever amount the person has deposited into this cash ledger will be credited it is same like bank account guys now if i have to make any payment through my bank account first there should be a balance in my bank account same way if i have to make any payment under the gst i have to make it through cash ledger so to make the payment through cash ledger first there should be a balance in the cash ledger so can i deposit it yes so whenever you are supposed to pay anything under gst first deposit the amount into the cash ledger and make the payment through cash ledger it is as if like your bank account <coughs> but for gst purpose no okay. so amount you first deposit and what if by chance on your amount if tds is deducted or if tcs is collected even that will come and reflect it your when is tds deducted or when tcs is collected we will be learning it in next chapter guys so if at all on my amount if tds is deducted or collected so the person whoever has deducted or collected he would have remitted it to the government that will auto populate for me here and it will sit on the credit side of cash ledger okay what do i do with this balance sir i will pay any amount under gst so here we saw na 
<clears throat> after adjusting the credit anything else i will pay it through electronic cash ledger same amount is debited here so you guys already know na debit in one account means the opposite account will be credited so in one account it is debited in another account it will be credited same way there it was <clears throat> credited a year cash ledger whenever you are paying the liability through cash ledger it is credited in the liability register whereas in cash ledger we will debit what liability register clear yes sir same way here we learnt if there is unutilized input tax credit you will apply for a refund na? so when you apply for a refund you will debit it to the credit ledger and immediately the amount will be credited here as if it is like deposited into your cash ledger clear now if by chance if it is processed no more entry but if it is rejected you have to give credit back here yes sir same way here you have to reverse it you have to give what debit when you applied you will assume you will receive and you gave a credit here if it is rejected please debit it back debit it back the effect would be nil clear or else assume you applied for a refund of 5 lakh but they have processed 3 lakh and 2 lakh they have rejected so in that case when you are crediting you will credit 5 lakh when rejected assume only rejected is 2 lakh in that case 2 lakh we will debit it back hope it is clear for you <coughs> i will just here is same way sir i have deposited excess amount into the cash ledger what you normally do you will utilize it in the next month or next period no sir i want to claim a refund of it can i claim it yes you can claim if you have any unutilized money in cash ledger you can uh, claim a refund of it when you claim a refund so whenever you apply for a refund immediately it will be debited here if it is processed refund is processed no more entry if it is rejected obviously credit has to be given back credit has to be given back guys clear sir i applied for a refund assume of 10 lakh they have processed only 8 lakh rejected 2 lakh in that case you have to give credit of only 2 lakh clear until and unless they have mentioned anything about rejection it is understood that it is approved guys clear yes this is about cash ledger okay next electronic cash ledger contains a summary of all what all deposit and payments made by a taxpayer similar to your like cash account bank account and all you guys would have seen we will record the receipts we will record the payments but here all the receipts or all the deposit what is made will be credited here and even if there is any refund of itc normally it will be credited to cash ledger from cash ledger can i withdraw the money and can i get it credited to my personal bank account yes you can do it clear that is what we discussed here clear yeah? yes this too wherever i have given the number also guys that is important normally the account will flow in that order or the entries will flow in that order so I, if i have to just repeat please listen i will just repeat it so liability ledger first whatever amount i am liable to pay under gst will be debited and any amount of credit which i am adjusting against only output tax will be cre credited here will be credited so any amount i am liable to pay gst including interest rate fee penalty everything would be debited here but the credit what i have in my credit ledger can be utilized only towards output tax so if at all if you have a credit balance and if you are utilizing it then credit it here then cash ledger if any other excess tax to be paid after adjusting the credit or if you have any payment of like interest rate fee penalty and all you have to make it through cash ledger make it clear yes always first is itc adjustment after adjusting itc if still something is pending paid through cash ledger same way credit ledger whenever i am i am eligible for claiming input tax credit the amount will be credited to credit ledger i will utilize it to pay output tax clear and in the order what order and all we have learnt it yes sir <clears throat> next if at all if i am claiming a refund when i apply for a refund it will be debited here if it is processed fine if it is rejected give give back the credit give back the credit then coming to electronic cash ledger so what you guys from exam point of view what you should know is in each ledger or register what will be credited what will be debited that if you know more than enough guys. clear huh? yes then in electronic cash ledger first we have to deposit the amount there should be a balance for me to make the payment then first we will deposit Sir, in what and all mode we can make the deposit? I have given it here. You can see. Money can be deposited into the cash ledger by different modes, namely internet banking, credit card, debit card through authorized banks, unified payment interface that is UPI, any UPI, and immediate payment services, IMPS from any bank, real time gross settlement, RTGS that is NEFT also, 
then over the counter payment in branches that is you can go to the bank branch and deposit there of the banks authorized for deposits up to 10,000 per thalon per tax bill. Clear? Huh? By cash, check or demand draft. So over the counter, you can deposit only up to 10,000 per thalon per tax bill. Okay, or it's any other period. Fine, sir. Next, once you have a balance, anything you are liable to pay under GST after adjusting the credit, you will pay it through cash ledger. Clear? Huh? Then the refund part and all, I have already taken care. <coughs> Chalo, guys. The amount payable on reverse charge basis or the amount payable under section 10 that is composition supplier at composition rate guys. Any amount payable towards interest penalty fee shall be always paid by what? By debiting electronic cash ledger. Because against this amounts we cannot utilize ITC. Even though I have ITC I cannot utilize to pay the following amounts. Even composition supplier whatever tax he has to pay on his outward supply at composition rates. Can he use the credit? No he is not at all eligible to claim credit. Yeah guys yes. Next, what is the chronological order to discharge the liabilities of a taxable person? First, self-assessed tax and other dues for the previous tax period should be paid. Yes, previous tax period means for the past period if anything is pending. Then you pay it for the current tax period. If you don't do both, then the proper officer will pitch in and he will make sure that he is recovering from you. Under section 73 or 74, that is like a worst scenario. If you do, don't do it by yourself, then they will pitch in and ask you to pay Obviously, in that case, they will be charging interest penalty and all for which you should be ready. In the cash ledger, information is kept minor head wise for each major head. Guys, whenever we are depositing the money into the cash ledger, there is four major head. I have to choose, okay, for which major head I am depositing. Once I choose the major head, I have to choose the minor head also. For example, assume I am depositing the money for IGST, 1 lakh. Okay. I have chosen major head as 1 lakh IGST and I am depositing. Under that, how much? Assume tax for tax 80,000, interest 5,000, penalty 10,000, fees 5,000, others 0. So, whatever amount I am depositing, I have to choose under which major head for which minor head I am depositing. And whatever IGST amount I have deposited, now this 80,000 can be utilized only to make IGST payment. Same way, this 5000 can be utilized only to pay interest under IGST. Same way, this penalty 10,000 can be utilized only to pay penalty under IGST. Now, sir, this 80,000 can I utilize to pay CGST or SGST? Not directly. You cannot directly use it. First, transfer it. You can transfer it. The amount under IGST major head, under tax minor head, you can transfer it, assume to CGST and then make the payment of CGST. So, in simple, it means, sir, can I transfer the amount from one major rate to another major rate? Yes, you can do it. Can I transfer the money from one minor rate to another minor rate? Yes, you can do it. Sir, is it within the state? Yes. Sir, assume I have a balance in Karnataka state for my registration. Can I transfer this balance for my registration in Tamil Nadu? That is the distinct person who is registered at the same bank. Can I transfer it? Yes, you can transfer it. Provided you have cleared all your liabilities in Karnataka, if there is any balance under any major rate or minor rate in Karnataka state's registration, can I transfer it to different state's registration? Yes, you can do it, which we call it as distinct person. Provided in the state in which you are transferring, na, the transferor state, you should have already cleared all the tax liability. Clear? This is a new provision. Please be careful with it. Clear? I repeat once again. Please. So, I told you registration and payment of tax and utilization of credit is always state wise registration wise under gst now within karnataka i have obtained one registration <coughs> can i transfer the money from one major rate to another major rate one minor rate to another minor rate sir yes you can do it first transfer and then make the payment straight away for whatever amount i have under the tax minor rate under igst can i straight away utilize it to pay cgst or sgst no 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 first to transfer and then make the payment Okay, now this provision was already there, but now what they have newly added is <coughs> now I have a IGST tax balance in Karnataka after paying all the tax liabilities. Can I transfer this for my registration in Tamil Nadu? It is a distinct person registered under the same bank. Can I transfer it from the major rate of IGST in Karnataka to a major rate of Tamil Nadu registration? Can I transfer it? Yes. As it is a distinct person registered under the same bank, you can do it. Provided you don't have any liability in Karnataka. 
that is after paying all your liabilities in Karnataka, if you have any unutilized balance in the electronic cash ledger under any major or minor rate, you can transfer that unutilized balance. <coughs> okay. That is what is given here. Section 49, subsection 10 and 11 provides a facility to a registered person to transfer an amount from one major or minor head to another major or minor head in electronic cash ledger and also between distinct person and also between distinct person that is separate registrations. Clear? Ra? Yes, sir. We have covered everything now. <coughs> ah. Guys, one important thing is, see, there will be a question on GST liability calculation, including utilization of credit. So you should know how exactly to present the answer. I have just given the format here. See, listen here. Please, please listen. This is for a numerical question. I am just explaining you the format, how you have to answer. Always presentation matter, guys. So they would have given the question with respect to your output tax, input tax, and how much GST to be paid in minimum, or how much GST to be paid through cash ledger. The question would be like that. In that case, please try to present like this. First, compute the ITC available. If at all, if they have given opening balance, please take the opening balance, guys. If at all, if it's given, means last period balance, which was not utilized, is opening balance for the current period. If at all, if it is given, please take it. If not, if it is not given, ignore it. That's all. Okay, sir. Then in the current year, on your purchases or inward supply, purchases is nothing but inward supply. Check intrastate supply. You would have paid what? CGST plus IGST. Take it. Then interstate supply, IGST would have paid take it okay and also please make sure that have they given any conditions in the questions if nothing no masala is given in the question it is assumed that all the conditions and restrictions are satisfied if they have themselves has given with respect to one inward supply condition is not satisfied or they have given some int for you telling to suggest they are just suggesting you that check whether credit is available or not assume they were mentioned for one of the inward supply invoice is not available or goods is not yet received in that case, credit is not available. Please be careful. Clear? And whenever credit is not available, please explain it by way of note, guys. Why it is not available. Clear? So, I am repeating once again, if no masala, if nothing special information is given, we will assume that whatever tax we have paid on inward supply, we are eligible to claim a credit for it. And just keep a note, telling all the conditions and restrictions are satisfied for the purpose of claiming input tax credit. Hence, Tax paid on inward supply is available as credit or input tax credit. Clear? Huh? Yes. If question is silent, if they are if they have given anything specifically, please consider the same. Okay. Next, computation of tax payable on outward supply. That is output tax. So if there is intrastate supply, what will be there? Only CGST, yes, GST. Take it. Then in case of interstate supply, IGST would be there, which is nothing but output tax. Okay, sir. Next, <clears throat> GST to be paid in cash, that is to be paid in cash or through electronic cash ledger, one and the same guys. To be paid in cash is nothing but the amount to be paid in cash ledger. Oh, this is the final calculation. Computation of GST to be paid in cash or to be paid through electronic cash ledger by who is that person? And if the period is given, mention the period also for the month of April, May, June, like that. Clear? So everywhere I have just given the dash, but you don't just write the dash, whatever the name of the person is given, you write it. Even if the name of the month is given, please write the same. Okay. First, we will take the output tax, guys. Whatever we have got here, we will just take it. This too, you can just work it as a working note also. Working note one, working note two. Okay. Or else you can just keep it as main answer also. Output tax, you will take it. Okay, sir. Then adjustment of input tax credit. Whatever we have got here, na? IGST credit, CGST credit, SGST credit, we have to adjust it. But for adjusting, you have to use what? This order. Please be careful with this. Chances of going wrong in this area is more, guys, by the students. Okay, first always adjust IGST credit. So IGST credit you will adjust against what? IGST liability. Okay, sir. If still you have IGST credit, even after adjusting IGST credit against IGST liability, still if you have credit, adjust it against CGST or SGST in any order, in any proportion. But when you are adjusting, just make sure that the final GST to be paid in cash should be minimum guys, as less as possible because this is tax planning. Clear? So especially the, for this, you have a choice. So when you are adjusting this, please cross check how much SGST, CGST credit you have. So after adjusting that, what will be your final tax liability? Always try to keep this as low as possible. Minimum, minimum. Okay, now. Yes, sir. 
then adjust CGST credit against CGST. If by chance, if you still have CGST credit and if IGST liability is still pending, if at all, normally for exam purpose, it will not be. But if by chance, if you have still CGST credit and IGST liability is still pending because you didn't have IGST credit only, you didn't have at all, assume, assuming you didn't have this credit at all. So in that case, after adjusting CGST credit against CGST liability, if still something is pending, you will adjust it against what guys? IGST liability. But for exam purpose, it is they are not giving like that. So you need not worry. But still, in the worst case, if they ask how to do it, I'm telling you. Same way here, how we discussed. CGST first, we will adjust it against what? CGST. If still something is pending against IGST. Clear, huh? Yes. Now, next, CSGST we will take. SGST we will adjust it first against SGST liability. If by chance, if still some SGST credit is there and IGST liability is still pending. If at all, if it is there, guys. If at all, normally it will not be there. If at all, if it is there, you can adjust it against IGST liability. If at all, if it is there. Clear? So finally, you will get minimum GST to be paid in cash. Clear? Yes. And if at all, if you had any credit which you couldn't adjust it, then you will carry forward it. For example, sir, assume, I will just tell you. IGST credit you have utilized fully already. So IGST liability is fully cleared, sir. Now CGST liability was 1 lakh. But I had a credit of 1 lakh 20,000. So how much maximum you can adjust? Only 1 lakh. Remaining 20,000, you can adjust it against IGST liability. But IGST liability is already adjusted from what? IGST credit. So remaining 20,000, what I can do? I can carry forward. I can carry forward, guys. Hope you guys got it. Okay, all different possibilities can be there, but you always stick to the procedure, guys. Whatever procedure we have discussed here, you should always go it in that order. If any order, sir, for example, sir, IGST credit is already over, IGST liability is also already over. In that scenario, this two will not play any role, guys, in the question. This two I am talking about. This two will not play any role. Clear because IGST liability is already zero after adjusting IGST credit. In that scenario, CGST or SGST credit, even though you can adjust it against IGST, you don't have any IGST liability still pending. Clear? Yes, sir. Next, we'll move towards section 50, which talks about interest. Interest on delayed payment of tax, section 50. Every person who is liable to pay tax, fails to pay tax or any part thereof to the government within the periods prescribed, shall pay interest at 18% per annum for the period for which the tax or any part thereof remains unpaid. If you are liable to pay GST but not paid, in that case, you will be liable to pay GST along with the interest at 18% per annum. Okay. Interest is from when to when. Normally, whatever is the due date, next day interest will start. Clear sir? What is the due date to pay GST, guys? We will be learning it. The due date to pay GST in returns chapter. Because in some places, due date to pay GST is linked to the due date of returns. So I would be explaining about the due date of paying GST in returns chapter, guys. Clear? Huh? Yes. <coughs> Sir, interest is on what amount? You can see, provided that interest in cases where the tax return under section 39 has been furnished after the due date, but furnished before the commencement of proceedings under section 73-74, shall be levied on net cash liability. That is that portion of output tax which is being paid through electronic cash ledger. Now simple guys. Now assume my output tax is 5 lakh. I have an input tax credit of 3 lakh. So how much I have to pay through cash ledger? 2 lakh. Now I have not paid it. I have not paid it. Find out the reason why you have not paid it. Assume sir I have filed the returns but still I have not filed paid that tax. I have filed the returns. But still, I have not paid the tax. In that case, I have filed the returns but not paid the tax. That is like a default. Okay, plunder. In that case, interest will be charged on 5 lakh guys. You have filed the return but not paid the tax. Interest is on gross tax. What do we call it as gross tax? Your output tax, actual output tax. Clear? Or else, sir, I have not paid GST because I couldn't file the returns on time. Assume I was supposed to file return GSTR 3B within 20th of next month, but I filed it on 25th of next month. 
So for that five days, interest would be charged, sir. Yes. On what amount? If the delay in payment of tax is due to delay in filing the returns, then they are telling interest would be charged on net tax, guys. Net tax means what you are paying through electronic cash venture. Hope you understood. So if the delay in payment of tax is due to delay in filing the returns, then for delay in filing the returns also you will end up paying interest. That is different. Now for the tax, whatever G interest you will pay is on net amount. That is the amount which you are supposed to pay through cash venture. Sir, assume I have full file lakh credit, sir. The GST to be paid in cash is zero, sir. In this, in that case, what will be the interest? Interest also will be zero. If you have enough credit, the interest also will be zero. But please be careful with rule 86 B and all, because when rule 86 B is applicable, at least 1% you have to pay it in cash, even though you have a credit. Okay, sir, what if it is for any other reason? I have filed my returns, but still not paid the tax. Or I have paid, but short paid. In that case, for the delay of payment of tax, interest would be charged on gross tax amount tax, which is nothing but output tax. Is that clear? Yes. And interest will always start on the next day of the due date. If due date is 20th of next month, interest will start from 21st. Guys. Clear? Huh? That is what subsection 2 is telling. Next, subsection 3. A taxable person who makes an undue or excess claim of input tax credit or undue or excess reduction in output tax levity shall pay interest at such rate not exceeding 24% per annum on such undue or excess claim or such undue or excess reduction as the case may be not exceeding 24 they are told but rate notified is 18% even in this case the rate notified is 18% the person who was not supposed to claim credit he has claimed it or he has he was eligible to claim only 2 lakh credit but he has claimed 3 lakh on that one, next 1 lakh excess credit what he has claimed he has to pay interest at the person at the rate of 80 in the section they are told not exceeding 24 means maximum is 24 but the rate notified for this purpose is 18 percent so subsection 1 as well as subsection 3 both rate is 18 percent subsection 1 is for non-payment of gst or delay in payment of gst whereas 3 is like excess claiming of credit or you are not eligible to claim credit but still you have claimed it in that case also on whatever credit you have claimed from the day you have claimed it till the day you reverse it reverse it in the sense you have to add it to your output tax and pay it till that day on whatever amount of credit you have claimed interest would be 18 percent per annum tax. per annum means obviously how much ever days we is there we have to calculate that days and divide it by 365 or 366 so summary of various forms which are covered in payment chapter are <coughs> if you are Studying it in order, it is easy for you to remember. Even if at all, if you are answering any questions on like any ledger payment and all, it is good if you guys mention the form number in your answer, guys. Okay, try to remember it. GST PMT 01, maintenance of electronic liability ledger, read with rule 85. Okay, next, maintenance of electronic credit ledger, read with rule 86, that is PMT 02. Then PMT 03 is rejection order by proper officer for refund of unutilized ITC. Now, if at all you have claimed for a refund of unutilized ITC and if it is rejected, you will pass that order in what? PMT 03. Papa. Don't feel bad. It's okay. Chalo. PMT 04, communication of any discrepancy in the ledger. If at all, if there is any discrepancy mismatch in the ledger, that communication will be given in PMT 04. Then PMT 5. Maintenance of electronic cash ledger, read with rule 87. Okay, all these are read with rules, guys. The ledger or register. Then PMT 06, generate the chalan on the common portal to enter the details of amount to be deposited. So, whenever you are depositing the amount in any of, any of this form, you have to generate a chalan in PMT 06, guys. Clear? Yes. So, this is all about <coughs> the payment chapter, guys. Payment chapter. So guys, with respect to numerical question, there will be a question on tax calculation. So please be careful. I have explained the format and all. So do practice some questions and do it. Okay. Make sure that, okay, whatever questions come, you will be able to handle it. In that numerical question, you should not even lose half marks or one marks. Guys. Fine. Yes, sir. So coming to the section numbers, guys. So section numbers, sir, what all sections we have covered till now? In this chapter, guys, we have covered 49 and 50. In the next chapter, we will be covering 51 and 52. That is a new topic again, TDS and TCS. Clear? Huh? Yes. E-way bill also we already learned. We have covered it. <coughs> Sir, only 68 sections are there in CGST Act. No, no. 
even after this there are sections but i have given only to the extent which is applicable for you or which is covered for you and in between this also there are many sections which are not applicable for you so you need not worry whereas in between guys so that is section 37 to 48 we would be covering it in a returns chapter okay else we have done all the other things 51 and 52 in next chapter we will be doing it clear ah yes sir just mark all the sections whatever we have covered come on do it fine guys we'll yes students now we will revise chapter 14 which talks about tax deducted at source and tax collected at source that is tds and tcs in short a new topic added at inter level so please be careful with this topic i feel somewhere they may ask the question either on tds or tcs in this attempt guys now sir what is this tds tcs is it connected to what we have learnt in income tax even in income tax you taught us tds and tcs is it connected no guys so tds tcs what you have learnt in income tax is different that is from income tax point of view what we are learning under gst is different clear there is no connection also in between and here the tds and tcs topic is very small whereas in income tax tds especially is a very lengthy topic agree that tcs comparatively okay sir but here how is it sir very easy guys i can actually just simply explain it in one diagram here both the concept of tds as well as tcs i can just explain it in one diagram let us see guys small small topic section 51 that is tax deducted at source first sir who should deduct it who should deduct the tds guys whenever the deductor or the recipient that is the uh, person who is making the payment who is the government department establishment or agencies or local authority or an authority or board which has been set up by the government or society or public sector undertaking if the recipient who is making the payment to whom supplier means supplier has supplied the goods or services to the recipient and if the recipient is the following people not every recipient if the following people are the recipient and if the value of supply is more than 250000 then they have to deduct tds at what rate 1 plus 1 percent that is cgst 1 percent yes gst 1 percent sir what if it is interstate supply then straight away 2 percent clear huh? and issue certificate in gst or 7a for whom recipient has to should issue to the supplier clear huh? yes as a proof even in income tax we learned uh, whenever tds is deducted the deductor or the payer has to give the proof to the payee in the form of 16 form 16 16 double a 16 b c d and uh, yes sir same way and once he deduct the amount he has to deposit whatever tds the recipient has deducted he has to deposit it to the government within 10th of next month and also he has to file one return called gstr 7 within 10th of next month so if the tds is deducted assume in april within 10th of may the, it has to be deposited and the deductor has to file gstr 7 guys with the government clear so please be careful the value of supply only if it is more than 250000 sir what if it is less than 250000 no tds guys sir what if the recipient for example you and me common man we are making the payments sir 3 lakh 5 lakh 10 lakh should we deduct tds sir no because the they have clearly given who should be the deductor the specified people whom which i have highlighted here in green color only if the recipient or the following people recipient of what goods or services only then they have to deduct tds clear ah? yes sir chalo guys what exactly is given in the law in section 51 we will see section 51 of the cgst act states that the following people are the recipients guys please be careful not the supplier supplier can be anyone recipient should be the following people okay who are those department or establishment of the central government or state government or local authority or governmental agency or an authority or a board or any other body which has been set up by the act of parliament or state legislature or established by an e-government with minimum 50 percent 51 percent means majority with 51 percent or more participation by way of equity or control to carry out any function means majority is held by government then society established by the central government or a state government or a local authority under the society's registration act 1860 not all the societies only which is the which is the society set up by the government guys okay then public sector undertaking we call all these people as whom deductor they are nothing but recipients guys yeah <clears throat> recipient is the one who is liable to pay amount na, that is for the supplier of goods or services if the recipient are the following people then they have to deduct tds sir is it always no only if the value of supply is more than 2 lakh 50 000 guys 
so we call them all these people as what deductors deductors of what tedious okay when should they deduct tedious to deduct the tax at the rate of one percent that is cgst obviously cgst one percent means yes gst also one percent should be there okay from the payment made or credited to the supplier that is the deductee so who is the deductee here the actual supplier okay sir yeah to the supplier the deductee of the taxable goods or services are both where the total value of such supply under a contract exceeds 250 and while calculating the value of supply it should be excluding gst and says means the value of supply as per section 15 less as per section 15 if it is more than 250 only then tds has to be deducted and while checking the amount whether it is more than 250 or less than 250 should we include gst says and all no we have to exclude it clear for example assume the value of supply guys is 240 plus gst <coughs> assume is 30000 so total payment made by the recipient is 270000 should he deduct tds here no he need not because the value of supply is not more than 250000 guys clear next sir assume the amount value of supply is 3 lakh plus GST, I am just taking random amounts, assume 50,000. So, the total value which recipient is paying, the recipient is totally paying how much? 3,50,000. In that case, TDS has to be deducted only on 3 lakh and not 3,50. TDS has to be deducted only on 3 lakh, that is excluding GST guys. Clear? That is CGST 1%, yes GST 1% or overall 2%. Overall 2% guys. Is that clear? Yes, so. Next, guys, once the deductor deduct the TDS and remit it to the government within 10th of next month, it will auto reflect in the electronic cash ledger of the deduct. It will auto reflect in what? The electronic credit ledger, sorry, electronic cash ledger of the deductee. You can see, we learned it. You can see, oh, yeah, the TDS amount, will it be credited to cash ledger? Yes, of whom? Deductee. Means he will get the credit of it he will get the credit of it. It means it is as if he has deposited the tax. And can he utilize this amount to pay the amount under GST? That is the liability under GST. Yes, you can use it. Oh, sure. We'll move it. Next, provided that no deduction shall be made if the location of supplier and the place of supply is in a state or union territory, which is different from the state or union territory of registration of recipient. Important, guys. Even in RTP, there is a question on this. Listen here. If location of supplier and place of supply, assume location of supplier and place of supply is in Karnataka. Both is in Karnataka. What supply it is? Intrastate supply. Whereas, sir, the location of recipient is in Tamil Nadu. Is in Tamil Nadu. Should we deduct TDS? No. They are telling don't deduct TDS. If location of supplier and place of supply is in a one state, whereas location of recipient is in some other state, don't deduct TDS. Don't deduct TDS, guys. Oh, <clears throat> next. The amount deducted as tax shall be paid to the government by the deductor within 10th of next month, which we already saw. A certificate of tax deduction at source shall be issued in form GSTR 7A by the deductor, that is the recipient, to the deductee as a proof. Because obviously the deductee, when you are deducting the amount paid to him, he will be worried about what did you do, why did you deduct? When did you remit it to the government? All this proof the deductor has to give to the deductee in form GSTR 7A, guys. Next, the deductee, that is the supplier, shall claim the credit in his electronic cash ledger of the tax deducted and reflected in the return of the deductor furnished in form GSTR 7 within 10th of next month. That is what, whenever the deductor has deducted the TDS, he has to remit it to the government within 10th of next month by filing a returns in GSTR 7. Once the deductor has given the details of this TDS in GSTR 7 to the government, it will auto reflect to the deductee in his electronic cash ledger, guys. Yes. If any deductor fails to pay to the government the amount deducted as tax, he shall pay an interest in accordance with the provisions of section 50 subsection 1, that is 18% per annum, in addition to the amount of tax deducted. So if the person has failed to deduct TDS or else he has deducted it, but he has kept it himself, he has not deposited within 10th of next month to the government. In that case, 
he will be charged along with interest means you have to pay tds amount but along with the interest guys this is all about tds chapter guys means tds topic very small topic next coming to tcs tax collected at source this is collection not deduction sir what is this topic <clears throat> whenever the operator that is electronic commerce operator whenever there is any supply of goods guys guys listen here supplier is supplying the goods or services through whom electronic commerce operator to whom to the recipient so recipient is nothing but the customers or buyers they are placing the order for the goods or services through electronic commerce operator through electronic commerce operator okay sir now if the supplier is registered under gst if this supplier is registered under gst they are telling electronic commerce operator whatever sale is happening through you please collect the tcs under section 52 under section 52 please collect tcs please collect tcs for whatever taxable supplies is happening through the electronic commerce operator the electronic commerce operator has to collect tcs for example assume guys you have bought you have bought you are the buyer you have bought the goods worth 1 lakh okay let me take the amount on the other side you have bought a goods worth 1 lakh from amazon or flipkart or any other electronic commerce operator now you have made the payment to whom amazon or flipkart that is the platform now they will collect the money from you and then they will give it to the supplier from that they may also charge some commission assume 20 percent commission they are charging okay 20,000. remaining 80,000, they will give it to whom supplier but they are telling please collect tcs on it and while collecting tcs tcs is on what amount it is not on 80,000. it is on gross sale value not after commission before commission clear means what is the actual sale value which has happened na? so on that tcs has to be collected who should collect it the e-commerce operator is that clear so please be careful with it any registered supplier who is making the taxable supplies of goods or services through e-commerce operator to the recipient normally e-commerce operator will collect the amount and give it to the supplier but after deducting the commission so on the actual value of supply or sale please collect tcs Please collect TCS who electronic commerce operator. Clear? Huh? Yes, guys. Chal. Now, collector that is the operator, e commerce operator, ECO, we call it as electronic commerce operator. So, before making payment for supply, for whom? Actual supplier of goods or services. Collect TCS at what rate? 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 or CGST 0 0.5. Guys, in the exam, if by chance if they ask any MCQ question, please be careful with the TDS and TCS rate. If they ask CGST TDS rate, answer it as 1%. If they just ask as TDS rate, then it should be 2%. Same way TCS, it is 0 0.5, 0 0.5. If they ask only CGST, 0 0.5. If they just ask TCS rate, then it is 1%. Clear? For supplies other than RATH, RATH are covered where? 9.5. So on that, who is liable to pay tax? Electronic commerce operator. So if RATH services is supplied by supplier through e-commerce operator, should e-commerce operator collect TCS? No, no, no. Why? Because who is liable to pay GST? E-commerce operator. So should he collect TCS in that case? No. Even though he is collecting the money from recipient and giving it to the supplier, he need not collect TCS in that case. The e-commerce operator will pay tax by himself. Okay. So RATH is not covered under TCS, guys. Okay. So once he collect the TCS, he has to remit it to the government within 10th of next month and file a statement in GSTR 8 within 10th of next month. So means within 10th of next month, he has to deposit it and file a statement in GSTR 8. Clear? So assume if TCS is collected in April or let me take different uh, month. So if TCS is collected in February, it has to be deposited within 10th of March and uh, file, state, file a statement in GSTR 8 guys. within 10th of what? March. And the collector should also file, in addition to this statement, he should also file one annual statement in GSTR 9B within 31st December of next financial year. Means for whatever supply it has made through e-commerce operator, he has to give all the details in this annual return for entire 12 months. From April to March, what all supplies has happened through him on which he has collected TCS and deposited to the government. He has to give the details in the annual statement, guys. That is GSTR 9B. 
and once this is done guys that is collector has collected the tcs and he has deposited to the government and he has filed gstr 8 in that case the tcs will auto credit to the credit electronic cash ledger of the supplier clear so <clears throat> you can see in the electronic cash ledger even the tcs amount and this is for whom suppliers electronic cash ledger because tcs is collected from whose money suppliers money clear yes so in that case for the supplier for from whose money the tcs is collected it will go and auto reflect in his electronic cash ledger on the credit side okay so huh, we will see the story this is <clears throat> through diagram let us see what exactly is given in the provision section 52 of cgst act provides that every electronic commerce operator not being an agent shall collect an amount calculated at 0.5 percent cgst okay plus 0.5 percent sgst guys oh of the net value of taxable supplies made through it by other suppliers means the supplier see if amazon is selling their own products if flipkart is selling their own products they need not uh, collect tcs because they will not be making the payment to further to anyone na? they will just collect the payment from the customers and they will keep it in their pocket so in that case should they collect tcs no by other suppliers where the consideration with respect to such supplies is to be collected by the operator clear yes sir now what is this net value of taxable supplies sir the expression net value of taxable supply shall mean aggregate value of taxable supplies of goods or services or both other than the services mentioned in 95 that is rat please be careful ratadra yes made during any month to buy all registered persons so suppliers should be registered they are clearly telling suppliers should be registered yes sir through the operator reduced by aggregate value of taxable supply returned to the suppliers during the set month guys value of supply by chance if there is any returns and all you know in on the online business or online platform and all there are chances of returning also so in that case during the month what is the total sales made minus returns on that value tcs has to be collected sir is there any monetary limit to collect tcs no guys for tds 2 lakh 50 is there na? nothing like that is there in tcs on any amount tcs has to be collected okay next the amount collected shall be paid to the government by the operator within 10th of next month okay sir the supplier shall claim credit in his electronic cash ledger of the tax collected and reflected in the statement of the operator furnished in form gstr 8 within 10th of next month so this is the duty of the collector agree na yes sir. next one more duty he has every operator who collects the amount shall furnish an annual statement in form gstr 9b electronically containing the details of outward supplies of goods or services or both affected through it during the financial year on or before the 31st day of december of next financial year okay this is also responsibility of the collector guys so please be careful the difference between tds and tcs the rate tds is one plus one tcs 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 clear up for tds value is there more than 2 lakh 50 whereas here no monetary value on the entire value of sales minus sub, uh, returns you have to collect tcs and please be careful tcs should always be like one percent on the sale value that is before commission because the e-commerce operator will be paying after deducting the commission so in that case tcs has to be applied on 80 000 or 1 lakh or 1 lakh clear hope it you guys understood it next guys one more thing very important connected to registration also please listen here here they are telling section 52 is applicable only if the supplier is registered only supplier is registered now in registration chapter we have understood if the supplier is supplying goods or services is registration mandatory for him no only if his aggregate turnover is more than threshold limit guys whether you are good supplier or service supplier, first only service was there. Now goods also they have added with some conditions. If you are supplying goods or services through e-commerce operator, then if your turnover is more than threshold limit, only then you get registered. Only then you get registered. Clear? Now assuming the supplier's turnover was more than threshold limit, he has registered. In that case, what 
whatever this supplier is supplying through e-commerce operator. The e-commerce operator is collecting the payment from the recipient and giving it to the supplier. It is the duty of the e-commerce operator to collect TCS at 1% under section 52. Clear? Yes. Now, different story. Sir, what if the supplier is unregistered? Assume his aggregate turnover is less than threshold limit, so he is not registered. Guys, please be careful. First, only this exemption was given for service provider. Now, it has been extended even for good supplier. Provided his turnover is within the limit, subject to certain condition, which I already covered in my statutory update video. Clear? Yes. Now, assuming supplier's turnover was less than threshold limit, so he is not registered. He is supplying the goods and services through e-commerce operator. So, e-commerce operator is collecting the payment and giving it to the supplier. In that case, should e-commerce operator collect the TCS? No, guys. He need not collect TCS. In that case, for e-commerce operator, should he get registered? No. If e-commerce operator is not supposed to collect TCS, for him, registration is not mandatory as per section 24. Clear? So, for e-commerce operator, guys, when section 24 is applicable is, please listen here. If e-commerce operator is paying tax under section 95 of CGST Act or 55 of IGST Act, that is on what services? Rath services. If the supplier is supplying restaurant, accommodation, transportation of passenger or housekeeping services through e-commerce operator. If e-commerce operator is liable to pay tax on that as per section 9 subsection 5 or 5 of subsection 5 of IGST Act. In that case, e-commerce operator registration is mandate. Clear? Yes. Sir. Next, if e-commerce operator is supposed to collect TCS under section 52, even in that case, for e-commerce operator, registration is mandatory. Registration is mandatory. Now, for us, it is important to understand when e-commerce operator is supposed to collect TCS. Only if supplier is registered under GST. If supplier, whoever is supplying the goods or services, if he is registered under GST, e-commerce operator has to collect TCS under section 52. In that case, even for e-commerce operator, it becomes mandatory to get registered. It becomes mandatory to get registered, guys. Is that clear? Now coming to, sir, what about supplier? Supplier, you see, what is their turnover? If the turnover is more than threshold limit, yes, they have to get registered. That is the supplier of goods or services. If the turnover is less than or equal to threshold limit, then they need not get registered. Guys. And if they are not registered, TCS is not applicable. Clear? Yes, sir. Important because it is connected to registration. I have connected. Please be careful with it. <coughs> Note. The person deducting the tax under section 51, mandatory registration, guys. And the person collecting the tax at source under section 52 should mandatorily get registered under GST as per section 54. And they should apply for registration in what form? They, for them, form number is different. For others, REG1. Whereas for TDS and TCS person, they have to apply for registration in GST REG07. 07. 07. Easy to remember, guys. 5 plus 1, 6. Okay. That is 5 plus 1, 6. Whereas TCS, 5 plus 2, 7. Clear? Huh? So, like this. 5 plus 1, 6. Huh? 2 plus 4, how much? 6. So, like that. So, 5 plus 2, how much? 7. So, REG, 7. Something shortcut like that you guys can remember. Clear, guys? And one more thing. If the person is registered under GST, only for the purpose of TDS, that is this people, government officials, you can see them, how they are standing by wearing green dress. If these people are registered under GST, and if they are the recipients, they are registered, sir. Yes. In case of RCM, in case of GTA and security services, guys. GTA and what? Security services. They are telling, even though the recipient is registered, but only for TDS purpose, RCM is not applicable. RCM is not applicable. And actually, in case of GTA, they are giving exemption also in exemption chapter. GTA services provided to a government authority who is registered only for the TDS purpose is exempt. Whereas security services, recipient, if he is registered only for TDS purpose, they are telling RCM is not applicable. Whereas exemption is not given. RCM is not applicable, that means it is taxable under forward charge. Is that clear guys? So this is all about TDS and TCS. Very small, small topic. 
even on the exam day if you guys just go through these diagrams i guess more than enough more than enough guys yes so this is all about tedious and tcs <clears throat> yes students we will revise one last chapter under gst that is chapter 15 which talks about the returns returns is the document which the registered person has to file with the tax administration or with the department guys giving the details of all his outward supply inward supply what is the tax payable on his outward supply that is output tax input tax how much itc he can claim and after adjusting itc what is the amount of gst to be paid through electronic cash ledger yes sir. so let us see what is there the term written ordinarily means statement of information facts furnished by the taxpayer to the tax administrator at regular intervals in any tax law Filing of returns constitutes the most important compliance procedure which enables the government tax administrator to estimate the tax collection or to calculate the tax collection for a particular period and determine the correctness and completeness of the tax compliance of the taxpayer. And here taxpayer is nothing but the registered person under GST guys. So with respect to what all I have done under GST, I have to give a proof of all that to the department in the form of returns. In GST, there are different forms of returns, guys. That is the first return, monthly return, return for composition supplier, that is section 10 composition supplier, then TDS return, return for input service distributor. And input service distributor is not a part of your inter syllabus, you need not worry. Annual return and final return. Under GST, everything is online and is updated and matched regularly. If a business is done from offices in multiple states, the number of returns will go up accordingly. Guys, I already told you under GST registration is state wise. So if you have taken registration for each and every state in which you operate separately, so the payment of tax and return filing is state wise, that is registration wise. For each and every separate registration, you have to pay the tax and file the returns respectively. Sir, can I combine everything, all the registration in India and file returns once? No, no, you cannot do. For each and every registration, you have to pay the tax separately, you have to file the returns separately. Yes, sir. Under the GST laws, the correct and timely filing of return is of utmost importance because of two reasons. Firstly, under GST laws, a taxpayer is required to estimate his own tax liability, that is both output tax and input tax actually will auto-populate based on the information given by my supplier. Estimate the tax liability on self-assessment basis and deposit the tax amount along with or before filing of such return. So most of the cases what happens, the due date to pay tax is linked to the due date of filing the returns. So only once you pay the tax, you will be allowed to file the returns, especially GSTR 3B. Clear? So assume I am filing monthly GSTR 3B. For me, what is the due date to file the return for the current month? Within 20th of next month, I have to file. Yes, sir. So within 20th of next month, I have to pay my tax liability and only then I will be able to file GSTR 3B guys. Secondly, under the GST regime, filing of returns also has a huge bearing on the determination of tax liability of the other person that is the recipient. Only when the supplier has given the details of outward supply in his GSTR 1, the recipient can claim the credit now. If not, even though recipient has paid the amount to the supplier, if supplier has not filed his return, or in his return, if he has not given the details of outward supply, then the recipient will not be able to claim the credit, guys. Yes, sir. Then list of sections covered in this chapter, some section 37 to 48 of CGST Act, guys. And whatever provisions we will learn under CGST Act, mutatis mutandis will be applicable even under IGST Act. As per section 20, there is no separate provisions under IGST Act with respect to returns, guys. Whatever we will learn in CGST Act, same to same is applicable. So even <clears throat> if you guys come to the first two pages where I have given the section number, na, so I had told section 37 to 48, we will cover it in the last chapter. So we are seeing it now, guys. We are seeing it now. Yes, sir. Sure. <clears throat> now we will actually get into the returns provision. I have given all the different types of returns here. Who should file it? with what time, what is the due date, should they file it monthly, annually or quarterly, everything I have mentioned here guys, please be careful with this, especially MCQ questions and all may come or even if it is a descriptive question, it would be good if you mention the return form number along with the due dates when you are explaining the answer with respect to returns. Fine guys, GSTR1, filed by whom every registered person providing the details of what, only outward supply, only outward supply, 
Okay, including CTP. So, who is covered here is section 9 person, guys. Regular scheme or normal scheme, whatever we call, those people will file GSTR 1. Sir, when, sir, monthly or quarterly? Na? Normally monthly, but there is an the option called QRMP which you can opt for. It is not mandatory. If you want, you can opt for in order to reduce your compliance burden. Okay. If you are filing it monthly, 11th of next month. If you are filing it quarterly, then 13th of the month succeeding each quarter. For example, if I take first quarter, April, May, June, you have to file for April, May, June quarter, you have to file within 30th, 13th July. 13th July. Same way, sir, what if I take January, February, March? So, April 13th. Within on or before April 13th, you have to file it, guys. Clear? Huh? Yes, sir. <clears throat> sir, if question is silent, what should we assume? Assume monthly, guys. If question is silent, please assume monthly. Guys, I will be little loud because there is some work going on here. <clears throat> okay. So, I will just be little loud so that their voice will not override my voice. So, please accordingly adjust your volumes. GSTR 3B, which is covered in section 39. GSTR 1 is covered in section 37. Okay, sir. 3B. Simple return in which summary of outward supply along with input tax credit is declared and payment of tax is affected by a registered person. Guys, including CTP. Even CTP is a special person, but for his registration period, he should file C uh, GSTR 1 and 3B only. Whereas NRTP separate return is there. For NRTP, separate return is there. Okay, sir. Now, guys, listen. Sir, GSTR 1 is only for outward supply. What about GSTR 3B? Whoever is filing 1 should also file 3B, guys. Whoever is filing 1 should also file 3B. Sir, in 3B, what special, sir? They will give the details again of outward supply. On that, what is the output tax? Then, inward supply. On that, what is the input tax? How much credit they can claim? So, for, and, and also, tax liability. Output tax minus input tax credit claimed. Remaining, how much they will pay it through? Electronic cash feature. And actually, the due date to pay tax is linked to the due date of filing the returns, especially for monthly year. Clear? Huh? Yes, sir. Next, if they are following monthly, what is the due date, sir? 20th of next month. Or if they are following quarterly, quarterly is missing here. If they are uh, filing quarterly, then what, sir? 22nd or 24th of the month succeeding each quarter. Guys. Clear? Huh? Means April, May, June. On or before 22nd July or 24th July. Sir, when 22nd, when 24th, depend on the states where you are registered. Okay, different states has different due dates. For few states, it is 22nd. For few states, it is 24th, guys. Okay, sir. Next, GSTR 4, composition supplier. Return for composition supplier under section 10.1 as well as 10.2a. When they should file it annually, 30th April of next financial year. Okay, they have two annual return, guys. GSTR 4 and you can see here 9a also. 9A also annually, but for this the due date is 31st December of next financial year. Whereas for this 30th April, whereas the GSTR 9A is 31st December, guys. Please be careful, both annual. And easy to remember the GSTR 4, why, sir? Because they have to pay tax quarterly and file payment statement in CMP 08 quarterly. So, how many quarters are there in a year? Four quarters. Clear? But they will file the return annually. So, as they will pay tax quarterly. There are four quarters. So, you can easily remember GSTR 4. Clear? Uh, yes. Then GSTR 9A, yeah, guys. Please remember along with it. Then GSTR 5 for NRTP. NRTP special, special return. Okay. For he will apply for registration in also in separate registration form. Whereas the return which he has to file is also separate return, guys. That is GSTR 5. Non-resident taxable person. Monthly he has to file it. Only for his registration period. Sir, should he file it throughout the year? No. Because for him, registration will be granted only for a temporary period. Maximum 90 days plus 90 days maximum extension. Correct? Na? So, in that case, whichever is the validity period of his registration, na, for that, he has to file GSTR 5. When, sir, 13th of next month or within 7 days after the last day of the validity period of the registration, whichever is earlier. Guys. So, normally, assume throughout April, he was there as a registered person. So, 13th of May. Sir, in May also throughout the month he was there. So, 13th of June. So, assume in June, his registration got over on 15th June. In June, his registration got over, expired on 15th June. In that case, the due date for June would be, the due date for June would be 13th July. Yes, sir. 13th July or 7 days from the last day of the validity period. That is 7 days from here. So, let us take it as 22nd. Sorry, 22nd July, not June. 
which ever is earlier guys which ever is earlier agree na so that means for june whatever he has done from 1st june to 15th june he has to file the last return for him okay last return because his registration is over on or before what date 22nd june this is only for the month in which his registration is over if he is operating for the entire month assume from 1st april to 30th april he was there in a particular state as an rtp in that case he has to file the april month return when guys on or before 13th may clear up yes next gstr 7 return for authorities deducting tax at source that is tds whoever is deducting the tds that government authority is on a, for that registration is also mandatory yes sir they have to file monthly return on or before 10th of next month we have already seen this in the previous chapter then even tcs details of supplies affected through e-commerce operator whenever they are collecting the tcs for the supplies which has made through them so before they make the payment to the supplier they will collect the tcs now in that case they have to give the details in gstr 8 when monthly within what time 10th of next month 10th of next month even for them there is one annual statement 9b you can see gstr 9b annual statement for electronic commerce operator annually 31st december of next financial year okay sir next gstr 8 is done 9 9 is guys please listen here whoever is filing 1 and 3b they should also file 9 1 and 3b is monthly or quarterly whereas 9 is annually annual is mandatory okay gstr 1 and 3b you can either do monthly or quarterly whereas gstr 9 is always annually sir is there any option for that no 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 annual return for a normal taxpayer section 9 filing gstr 1 and gstr 3b except ctp that is casual taxable person casual taxable person will file 1 and 3b but he will not file annual return because his registration is granted only for a temporary period so he will file only 1 and 3b for his validity period that's all so what is the due date to file annual return 31st december of next financial year for all these guys the due date is same whether it is gstr 9 9a or 9b it has to be filed by different persons but the due dates are same clear huh? yes then gstr 9 final return if your registration is cancelled then once in your lifetime once when your registration is cancelled or surrendered one file one final return and get lost get lost from gst so what is the time limit within three months of the date of cancellation or date of cancellation order whichever is later that is three months you have to count from date of cancellation or date of cancellation order clear so simple whatever is the date of cancellation now what i suggest is take whichever is earlier sorry whichever is later take whichever is later add three months for it within that time it has to be filed i repeat take date of cancellation date of can uh, cancellation order whichever is later add three months for it that is the due date to file one final return under gst clear uh, yes so uh. then gstr 11 details of inward supplies to be furnished by a person having uin that is unique identity number and claiming a refund when monthly what is the time sir 28th of the month following the month for which statement is filed for example if statement is filed for march you have to file it within 28th of april guys within 28th of april and this is only to claim the refund of whatever input tax they would have paid on their inward supply and please be careful unique identity number is centralized and this is obtained only by this foreign embassy center clear huh? yes sir. then some notes composition supplier paying tax under section 10 of cgst act shall follow the special procedure for furnishing of return and payment of tax as follows both section guys that is 10 1 that is for what whom restaurant manufacturer and trader yes sir whereas 10 2 a that is for service suppliers or for those for whom 10 1 is not available for both of this this is the provision they have to file quarterly statement in form CMP08. We call it as payment statement, guys. By 18th of the month, succeeding such quarter. So, for example, for April, May, June, you have to make the payment. Whatever outward supply you have made, you have made, you have to pay tax on composition rate and out of your own pocket within what time? 18th of July, you have to make the payment and you have to file the CMP08 payment statement okay it is not a written payment statement please be careful then they have to file two annual return guys annual return in gstr 4 by 30th april of next year 
then annual return in GST are 9 year by 31st December of next financial year. Okay, sir. Second point. Registered person filing GST are 1 and 3B are required to file annual return also. I told you, except CTP. Okay, whoever is filing GST are 1 and 3B. Guys, CTP, please be careful. They will file 1 and 3B, but not 9. Okay, sir. Except the following people. Means the following people will not file GST or 9. I told you CTP, he will not file because his registration is granted only for temporary period. Whereas the remaining people, guys, for them, separate return is applicable. For them, separate return is applicable. So, they will not file GST or 9. Even they will not even file actually 1 and 3B also. They will file different returns, whatever is applicable for them. Who are those, sir? Non-resident taxable person, that is GST or 5. Then input service distributor, for him, for them, there is actually a separate return called GST or 6. But that is not a part of your inter syllabus. Next, person authorized to deduct, collect tax at source under section 51 or 52. That is for them also, there is a separate return of 7 and 8. They will file that. And for them, there is no annual. And for TCS, actually, there is annual statement. Please be careful. That is in 9B. For TDS, there is no such annual return or annual statement. Then person supplying online information and database access or retrieval services from a place outside India to a person in India other than registered person. They will file GST or 5A. This, this person and this person, whatever returns they are supposed to file, actually is not a part of your inter guys. Clear? Uh, input service distributor will file GST or 6 and this person supplying online information and database access or retrieval services from outside India to India to any person in India, he will file GST or 5A. This too, you guys will learn at final level. Okay. The details of output supplies furnished in form GST or 1 shall include what and all invoice wise details of all the supply made to registered person that is with respect to B2B, whenever the recipient is registered, we have to give invoice wise details. Whether it is intrastate supply or interstate supply, it doesn't matter because the recipient is eligible to claim credit. So, supplier has to give the details invoice wise, each and every invoice separately. Then, with respect to interstate supplies with an invoice value more than 250 made to an unregistered person, means if the recipient is unregistered, and if the supply is outside the state or union territory, only if the value of the invoice, invoice value, not value of supply, because invoice value will include GST also. If the invoice value is more than 250,000, then you have to you should, you have to give invoice wise details. Okay, sir. Then consolidated details when guys remember when invoice wise details. Whenever invoice wise details is not required, you can give what consolidated details means you can merge all the invoice and give details together either of the one you remember better is invoice wise details whenever you are not supposed to give invoice wise details you can give consolidated details consolidated details of all the intrastate supplies made to a unregistered person for each rate of tax means you would have supplied different goods or services at applicable I means which is gst applicable is different rates like 12 percent 18 percent 28% and all. In that case, for each rate, issue separate consolidated invoice, guys. Or you give, cons not consolidated invoice, whatever invoices you have issued, give the consolidated details of that in your returns. Next, state-wise interstate supplies with invoice value up to 250000 made to an unregistered person for each rate of tax. That is, here it was more than 250. Sir, what if it is within 250? That is less than or equal to 250000 you can give consolidated details. Next, the details of outward supplies furnished by the supplier shall be made available to whom? Recipient in form GSTR 2A or 2B. We call it as auto populate. It will auto populate to the recipient. Under GST, to the extent possible, they have made it automated, guys. They have brought a robust change under GST when compared to previous indirect tax regime. And GSTR 4A in case of recipient opting for composition scheme. So, if the recipient has opted for composition scheme, for whatever tax he has paid on his inward supply, can he claim the credit? No. Now, supplier would have given the details in his GSTR 1? Yes, sir. So, recipient, can he claim the credit? No. But it will auto reflect to him in his GSTR 4A. He can just see that, feel happy and leave it there. He cannot claim the credit, guys. Then, sequencing of returns is mandatory under GST. <clears throat> Until I have filed the returns for the past, I cannot file the returns for the current month, guys. For example, now assume I am in the March. 
without filing the returns for Jan, Feb and all. I cannot file the returns for March. First, I have to file the returns for the past. Only then I will be allowed to file the returns for the current period. A taxpayer cannot file GST or 1 before the end of the current tax period. Means, sir, for March, before 31st March, can I file GST or 1? No, no, please. If you are a regular person, within the month end or before the month end, you cannot file the GST or 1 for that month. To file GST or 1, what is the due date? 11th of next month. So, you have the time between 1st to 11th of next month. You file in between those dates. But there are two exceptions for it. That is casual taxable person after the closure of their business. Now, assume I, I was a CTP. My registration is getting over on 20th March. So, can I file my return? That is GSTR 1 only. Because for CTP 1 and 3B only, guys. Can I file my return on 22nd or 25th March, sir? Yes, you can file. Sir, just now you told... Before 31st March, you cannot file for March. Yes, that is a normal rule. But there are two exceptions for it. Clear? So, CTP in the month in which the registration is closed. For that month, once the registration is closed, immediately after that, they can file the returns. Now, sir, for Jan and Feb, throughout the month, they had an operation. Can he file the return for assume Jan? From 1st Jan to 31st Jan, full month, he had an operation. In that case, can he file Jan month return before 31st Jan? No, no, no. He can file it only after 31st Jan. Clear? This is only for the month in which his business is closed down. That is, his registration is closed. Next, cancellation of GST IN of a normal tax payer, guys. That is, any person whose registration is cancelled means, assume my registration, by any case, assume my registration is closed on 25th February. In that case, for February, whatever I have done from 1st February to 25th February, can I file the return before 28th February, sir, or 29th February, yes, I can file it. Means, after 25th February, even on 26th, 27th, 28th, or 29th, I can file returns. Yes. Clear? That is only when your registration is closed or cancelled in between the month. And it is my duty to file it. Okay, sir, anyway, my registration is cancelled, so I will not file it for February. No, I cannot take a protection like that. And even whatever tax liability is there, I have to clear it till 25th February. Taxpayer can now file nil return under GS, uh, under section 39 in form GSTR 3B or nil details of outward supplies under section 37 in form GSTR 1 or a nil statement in form GST CMP 08 or a nil return in the form GSTR 4 for a tax credit through a short messaging service using a registered mobile number. Guys, sir, assume for a particular month, I was registered. Assume for uh, December, I went for a long trip. I didn't do any activity. There was no activity, zero activity. Should I still file the return? Yes, you have to file nil return. Nil return is when you have zero business in that month. Sir, I have done only one supply, sir. Or I have taken one inward supply, sir. In that case, can I file nil return? No, even if you have one activity, one business, one supply, you have to file regular return, not nil return. And now, nil return they have done through short message service. That is, SMS also you can do it. Okay, good. Next, sir, I have filed my return. Is it final, sir? What if I have committed any mistake or if there was any uh, omission? Can I correct it? Yes, guys. Rectification of errors or omission. Section 39, subsection 9. <clears throat> omission or incorrect particulars discovered in the returns. That is, GSTR 1 or 3B. I have already filed it. Assume for last year, November or December, I have already filed it. But now I identified, oh, yo, I have committed a mistake. And can be rectified in the return to be filed for the tax period during which such omission or incorrect particulars are noticed. So, assume in March, I identified a mistake which I had committed in November month return. Can I rectify it in March month return? Yes, I can file. Clear? Sir, can I file revised return? Under GST, there is no concept of revised return. In income tax, yes, we have revised return concept. Whereas in GST, there is nothing called revised return, guys. So in the March, I can correct the mistakes which I have committed in the return which I have filed for November, guys. I can correct it. I can rectify it. Sir, what is the maximum time limit to make correction? The maximum time limit within which the rectification of errors or omission is permissible is earlier of the following dates. What are those? 30th November of the following financial year, it is not the, it is 30th, that's all. 30th November of the following financial year or actual date of filing the relevant annual return, whichever is earlier, guys. 
and the above time limit is for both rectifying the errors in GSTR 1 as well as 3B, whether you have filed it monthly or quarterly. Guys, assume now for the year 23 24, for any month or for quarter, you have filed GSTR 1 and 3B. You have filed what? GSTR 1 and 3B. Yes, sir. Now, if you have committed any mistake or error or omission in any of these returns which you have filed for financial year 23 24, you can correct it maximum within what time? 30th November of next year. Or when do you file annual return for this? Due date to file annual return is 31st December. But any day before that also you can file a yes. Assume you are filing it on 15th December, guys. Whichever is earlier is 30th November, 30th November 24. So, any mistake or omission committed in any GSTR 1 or 3B, whether you have filed it monthly or quarterly for the financial year 23-24, maximum time for you to correct is, in my example, 30th November, guys. Clear, huh? Yes. Next, what is the due date for payment, sir? You told, you will tell me. So, in payment chapter also, I told due date to make payment is linked to the due date of returns and we will cover it later. So, now it's time. Due date for payment of tax in respect of the persons required to file GSTR 3B and GSTR 5 are linked. Means for 3B and 5, whoever is filing the, the returns, that is GSTR 3B normal person, GSTR 5 NRTP are linked with the due dates for filing such returns. Whatever is the due date to file GSTR 3B, that is the due date to make payment. Same way for NRTP, whatever is the due date to file GSTR 5, he has to make the payment on or before that. Guys, NRTP would have already made the advance payment of tax. And if by chance, if there is any shortage, okay, he has made assume ad advanced deposit of 5 lakh, but actually tax liability is 6 lakh. In that case, remaining 1 lakh, he has to pay before filing his return. That is GSTR 5. Okay. Whereas, however, the due dates for payment of tax in respect of persons required to file quarterly returns, that is GSTR 3B under QRMP. This is normal people, but opting for QRMP. And the person paying tax under composition scheme is delinked. Means the due date is different and the due date to file return is different. Due date to make payment is different, guys. Composition person, we already seen. What is the due date he has to make the payment? 18th of the month succeeding each quarter. But he has to file annual return. Correct? Huh? Yes, sir. Then coming to, sir, what if the normal person is opting for QRMP? That is the person who is paying tax under section 9 is opting for QRMP. First of all, what is QRMP? Who can opt for it? We will see. QRMP scheme is an optional return, guys. Optional return filing scheme introduced for small taxpayers having aggregate turnover plan based up to how much? 5 crore in the preceding financial year. So, assume we are in the current financial year, 23-24. So, can I follow QRMP? Yes, provided in the last year, my turnover, all India based. Okay, for all the branches put together, okay, less than or equal to 5 crore. Only then in the current year, I am eligible for QRMP. Okay, sir. Means I am a small supplier, guys, if my turnover is less than 5 crore or equal to 5 crore. Okay. Furnish their form GSTR 1 as well as 3B on quarterly basis while paying the tax monthly. They have to pay tax monthly, but they can file the returns quarterly through a simple chala. Opting of QRMP scheme is GST IN wise. Distinct person can avail QRMP scheme option for one or more GST INs. Guys, important. Listen here. Assume I have a registration in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh. And my turnover in the last year in each of the states is 1 crore, 2 crore, 1.5 crore. So, how much it comes to? 4.5 crore. So, in the last year, this is last year turnover, guys. Assume 22, 23. Last year turnover total is how much? Within 5 crore? Yes, 4.5 crore. So, can I opt for QRMP in the current year? Yes. So, in the current year, I am opting for QRMP. Sir, when I am going for QRMP, is it mandatory for me to go for QRMP for all the three registration? Obviously, for all the three states, I would have taken the registration. Yes, three minimum registrations are there for me. Yes. So, now, for all three, should I opt for QRMP? No. Guys, we have already learned that under GST, return filing is state-wise or registration-wise. So, for each state or for each registration, you will file returns separately. 
Now, when you are opting for QRMP, you have a choice. Assume, sir, I want to choose only for Karnataka and Tamil Nadu QRMP, whereas for Andhra Pradesh, I will file monthly return only, sir. Yes, you can. You can do it. Or no, sir, all three QRMP. Okay. No, sir, only for Karnataka, I want to file QRMP. You can follow whichever you want. Let's check your aggregate turnover in the last year. Is it within 5 crore? If yes, in the current year, QRMP registration wise, you can choose. Clear up. For few registration, you can choose QRMP. For few registration, you can file monthly returns. Hope you guys got it. Okay. Sir, what are the due dates under QRMP scheme? <coughs> invoice are to be furnished in invoice furnishing facility for the first two months of the quarter. Guys, whenever I have opted for QRMP, QRMP, I will file monthly return. Sorry, I will file the returns quarterly. Whereas, Pay the tax monthly, monthly payment. Clear. Now, I will file my GSTR 1 along with GSTR 3B quarterly. But some of my recipients in urgent, they want to claim the credit immediately. Now, assume I have made supplies in April. So, for April, May, June quarter, when will I file the return? July. But my recipient can't wait till, till then. In that case, for first two months of any quarter, that is in my example, April, May, whatever supply I have made to registered recipient, whatever supply I have made to whom? Registered recipient. I can give the details of that using invoice furnishing facility. This is only when I have supplied to the registered recipient and is very in urgent to claim the credit. In that case, Yes, I can give the details in invoice furnishing facility. The rest all information, I can give it in my GSTR 1, which I will file monthly. Sir, what about the last month of the quarter, sir? That is April, May, June. June is the last quarter. Na? So, whatever supplies I have made for June, I can give it only in GSTR 1. I cannot use invoice furnishing facility. Clear? Huh? So, invoice furnishing facility information can be given only for the supplies made for the first two, two months of any quarter. Even assume Jan, Feb, March quarter. So, for whatever supply I have made in Jan and Feb, I can give the details using invoice furnishing facility. That to the supplies made to home, only registered recipients. Because, because only then, if the recipient is registered, only he can claim the credit. Now, if recipient is not registered, he cannot claim credit. Why urgent? Aram say give the details in GSTR 1 only. Okay. So, invoices are to be furnished in invoice furnishing facility only for the first two months of any quarter guys what is the date sir what is the due date to uh, give the details in invoice furnishing facility it is between the first day of the succeeding month till the 13th day of the succeeding month simple guys for april it will be from first to may to 13th may for me it is first june to 13th june clear sir july sorry june Please give it in GSTR 1. You cannot use invoice furnishing facility. Okay. Sir, what is the due date to file GSTR 1 quarterly? 13th day of the month succeeding each quarter. That is for April, May, June, 13th July. Then for July, August, September, 13th October. For October, November, December, 13th January. For January, February, March, 13th April. Okay. For payment of tax. Sir, when should we pay the tax? For the first two months of any quarter. It is 25th of the month succeeding that quad, uh, that month, guys. Okay, 25th in simple, 25th of next month. Only for the first two months of each quarter. For April, 25th May. For May, 25th June. Whereas for July, it is the due date of GSTR 3B. Clear? Same way for Jan, 25th February. For February, 25th March. For March, the due date of GSTR 3B. Clear? So, for the first two, two months of any quarter, it is 25th of next month. Whereas, for the last month, on or before the due date of filing GSTR 3B. Clear? This is for payment, guys. Yeah. First two months of the quarter, we thought 25th of next month. Then, for the quarter, that is last month of the quarter, before the due date of furnishing GSTR 3B for the quarter, what is the due date to file GSTR 3B? 22nd or 24th of the month succeeding the quarter. That is for April, May, June. It is either 22nd July or 24th July. 
and 22nd or 24th depends on the state where you have registered guys sir are we supposed to remember the states see now my regular class and all i have given for which all states it is 22nd for which all states it is 24th sir are we supposed to remember in my point of view not so important for exams guys but still it is good to know at least some important states please know it who knows ICA we cannot predict them sometimes so better to know at least roughly clear yes if by chance if you don't know exactly sir 22nd or 24th better write like that so 22nd or 24th of the month succeeding the quarter depending on where under which state he has obtained the registration you can write like that okay yes is that clear so what is the due date to file gst at 3b on or before 22nd or 24th guys and one more thing guys whoever is opting for qrmp they have two modes of payment one is fixed sum method where the tax amount will be fixed based on what taxes you have paid in the past or the another one is self assessment method either of the two methods you can choose to make the payment whenever you have selected for or whenever you are opting for you are mp clear so these are some important due dates under the qrmp scheme next section 46 and 47 default or delay in furnishing the return section 46 and 47 notice to return defaulters section 46 a notice in prescribed form that is gstr 3a shall be issued electronically to a registered person who fails to furnish return under section 39 that is normal return or section 44 annual return or section 45 final return or tcs statement under section 52 guys the notice would require the registered person to furnish the return within 15 days sir what if he doesn't file the returns within the due date what is the late fee he will file the returns late but including the late fee what is the late fee sir section 47 delay in filing any of the following returns by the respective due dates attracts late fee statement of outward supply under section 37 that is gstr1 returns including returns under qrmp scheme under section 39 guys there under 39 there are various returns important return is gstr 3b but there are other returns also gstr 5 7 8 everything is covered under 39 guys okay sir next final return under section 45 that is when once your registration is cancelled then section 52 TCS statement. See, for TCS statement, provisions is contained in section 52 only, which talks about TCS guys. Clear? Huh? Yes. Quantum of late fee will be how much? 100 rupees for each day of delay or 5000, whichever is less. Means 5000 is maximum. Okay, sir. And this is only for the return filed in GSTR 5. 5A is for, guys, 5A I told you is not a part of your inter syllabus. Even 6 is for input service distributor is not a part of your syllabus but i have just mentioned here this late fee is applicable when you have not filed which return within the due date if you have not filed the following returns within the due date then this is the late fee okay now whereas for others they have made some changes and all we will see yeah so if you have filed to file the gstr 5 5a 6 or final return under section 45 or tcs statement under section 52 within the due date then the late fee is this much. Sir, what about the other returns? They have rationalized, guys. Means to some extent, they have tried to reduce the late fee. What is it? We will see. All these are amendments, guys. Whatever we will see from now, please be careful for your attempt. It is an amendment. Yeah. Too much noise. Actually, it is hitting my head here. But still, somehow I will try to finish it quickly. <clears throat> Rationalization of late fees for delayed filing of forms GSTR 1, 3B, 4, 7 and 9. Okay. So, rationalized means to some extent they have tried to reduce it guys. Interest, uh, late fee burden. What is it sir? The late fee can be waived off partially or fully by the central government as per section 128. Okay. Central government has that power. Late fee payable under section 47 for CGST Act who fail to furnish GSTR 1 or 3B by the due date, whether they are filing monthly or quarterly. If they don't file it within the due date, what is the late fee, sir? Guys, I have given the interest, uh, sorry, late fee both. Okay, 500 is total. 250 CGST, 250 SGST. So, whatever I would be reading is total. In your exam, accordingly answer. If they just ask late fee, you can give total 500. 
that is 250 plus CGST 250 SGST. Like that you can ask. If they have clearly asked only what is the C late fee under CGST, your answer should be 250. Something like that. Clear? So wherever I read late fee, I would be re reading it the total amount, which means half of it will be CGST, half of it will be SGST, guys. Clear? Yes. Sir. Registered person who have nil outward supply, that is zero outward supply, he has not made anything. Still, he should file nil return, but he has not done it. Or whose total amount of tax payable in the GST of 3B is nil. Sir, there is outward supply. I have a credit. I have claimed it. So, my GST payable is nil because I had a credit. Even in that case, you have to file the return, but not nil return. Regular return you have to file, but you have not filed within due date. In that case, what is the late fee? 500 rupees. So, whatever late fee I have given is together everything. 500 is total, 250, 250, what I have already explained guys. So, 500 or 20 rupees per every day during which such failure continues. That is 20 is per day, whichever is less. Okay. Next, registered person having an aggregate turnover in the preceding financial year. Okay. Means who is not covered in the above two cases guys. In simple, you are supposed to pay tax in your GSTR 3B. There is some tax to be paid through electronic cash ledger in, his, in your GSTR 3B. In that case, we will see what is your last year turnover, preceding financial year turnover. If it is up to 1.5 crore, then 2000 or rupees 50 ru for every day, whichever is less. More than 1.5 crore, up to 5 crore. Then it is 5000 or 50 rupees for each day, whichever is less. Then, sir, what if it is more than 500, 5 crore? Guys, all three will not come, any one, depending upon your preceding financial year turnover. If it is more than 5 crore, then 10,000 or rupees 50 for each day, whichever is lower. Okay, sir. Next, this is for GSTR 1 and 3B, guys. Okay. Next, sir. Late fee payable under Section 47 of CGST Act by the registered person, composition taxpayer, who failed to furnish GSTR 4, that is annual return, by the due date. What is the late fee, sir? Registered person for whom the total tax payable is GSTR 4 is nil. Sir, he has not throughout the year, chances are very less. Guys. Throughout the year, he has not made any supply. So, the tax payable on his outward supply is nil. And guys, on his outward supply, he has to pay tax. He cannot even adjust the input tax credit. So, that means, if he's in his GSTR 4, if tax payable is nil means, he would have done nothing throughout the year, where the chances are very less. Agree? Assuming he has not done what is the late and you were supposed to file the returns, sir, at least nil return you have to file, but not file. In that case, late fee would be 500 rupees or 20 rupees for every day, whichever is less, guys, till you file it. Registered person other than those covered above means your output tax, some amount was there as per your annual return. Clear? Huh? In that case, 2000 or 50 rupees for every day, whichever is less, guys. Okay. And wherever we have seen the late fees, guys, that is like, for example, assume, sir, 20th was the due date. So, late fee will start from when? 21st. So, there are like 50 rupees per day, 20 rupees per day. Na? So, for how many days it will be counted till you actually file the return? Assume I file the return on 28th. So, from 21st to 28th, including both the days. 21st also you have to include, 28th also you have to include. Charge late till 28th. Clear, that is the date till you file the returns. Next, a registered person who fails to furnish the annual return under section 44, that is GSTR 9, by the due date, is required to pay a late fee as under. GSTR 9, that is annual return, guys. What is the late fee, sir? There are different scenario here. Registered person having aggregate turnover of up to 5 crores in the relevant financial year. First, what is relevant financial year? Relevant financial year means the year for which there is a delay in filing the return. Guys, assume, sir, I am supposed to file the annual return for financial year 23-24. Within what time? 31st December 24. But I have not filed it. In that case, late fee, late fee will start from 1st January 25. Agree not? Till when, sir? Till I actually file my annual return. So now, while checking the turnover, we have to check it for which year? For which year annual return I have not filed within due date? 23-24. Already the turnover for that will be ready now. At least before 31st December, turnover for 23-24 you will already have. Yes. So, in that case, check the turnover for the year in which 
you are supposed to file annual return not preceding financial year it is straight away 23 24 that is the year for which you are supposed to file annual return but not filed within the due date okay if it is up to 5 crore then 50 rupees per day or 0.04 percent of the turnover in the state please be careful with the percentage 0.04 percent of the turnover in the state or union territory whichever is lower sir what if it is more than 5 crore more than 5 crore up to 20 crore turnover in that case 100 rupees for each day or 0.04 percent of the turnover in that state or union territory whichever is lower then registered person whose turnover in the relevant financial year is more than 20 crore big shot in that case 200 for every day or 0.5 percent of the turnover in that state or union territory and even 0.5 percent of the turnover and all we have to take for which year sir financial year 23 24 turnover only whichever is lower guys easy yes sir bit challenging to remember these figures and all guys but <clears throat> somewhere i feel here it is easy for you to remember this one 500 here 20 rupees per day then 2000 again 50 rupees per day then 5000 50 rupees per day 10000 50 rupees per day so your 50 rupees per day is standard you just tell okay based on the turnover up to 1.5 crore means 2000 more than 1.5 up to 5 crore 5000 up to 5 crore 5000 more than 5 crore double 10000 whereas per day 50 rupees standard Whereas here it is 500 or 20 rupees per day. Clear? And wherever I have read the late fee, it is total, guys. Half of it will be CGST, half of it will be SGST. So please be careful in the MCQ, they may give some challenging question where they may tell. They may ask clearly, what is the CGST late fee or SGST late fee? Please give accordingly, guys. If they just ask, what is the total late fee to be paid by the person? Then you have to take total amount. Clear. Same way, guys, TDS rate, TCS rate and all we have discussed. Okay. Per, uh, CGST how much? SDST how much? Total how much? Clear. Like 1%, 1 plus 1% 1 or 0.5%, 0.5%. If they ask only CGST, please accordingly answer. If they simply tell what is the rate of TDS to be deducted, what is the TCS rate to be collected, please give the total rate. Clear. Yes, sir. Huh. Next. The total amount of late fee payable under section 47 by any registered person required to deduct tax at source under section 51 for delayed filing of GSTR 7 shall be as follows. 50 rupees for, for day or 1000 rupees, whichever is lower, guys. Whichever is lower. So, return part we have done with. Section 48 talks about GSTP, that is Goods and Service Tax Practitioners. What is it? Very easy topic, guys, actually. Section 48 provides for authorization of an eligible person to act as an approved goods and service tax practitioner. A registered person may authorize an approved GSTP to furnish information on his behalf to the government. Means if I am a registered person, I don't know anything to do under GST. I have to file return. Once I am registered, I have to pay tax, file the returns and all. But I am abu dabu, don't know anything. In that case, I have to appoint one person who will act on behalf of me. That is nothing but GSTP. So, GSTP would be a qualified person to do all the things necessary under GST, guys. So, in that case, I have to go to my GST profile and assume you are acting as a GSTP. I will choose you as my GSTP. You are like an authorized representative for me. So, whatever I am supposed to do under GST, you will be doing it on behalf of me. But if by chance, if you commit any mistake and all, I will be held responsible. I have to make sure that I am choosing the trusted person. Yeah, the manner of approval of GSTP, their eligibility conditions, duties and obligations, manner of removal and other conditions relevant for their functioning have been prescribed in the rules 83 and 84 of CGST rules. Okay. And who should be the GSTP and all guys based on qualification, few people based on experience also they can be qualified, but they have to pass the exams. So that and all we have already seen, you guys can just go through it, not so important, but still at least have an idea, if at all if there is any question asked, you should be able to manage it, clear that qualification and all. GSTN provides separate user ID and password to GSTP to enable him to work on behalf of his clients without asking for their user ID and passwords. 
they can do all the work on behalf of the taxpayers as allowed under GST law. A taxpayer may choose a different GSTP by simply unselecting the previous one and then choosing a new GSTP on the GST portal. Clear? So on my profile, I can choose. Assume you are not doing proper work. Assume your friend is practicing, is doing good. So can I unselect you and select that, uh, your friend? Yes, I can do it. I have that right. Then, sir, what all activities? Now, assuming I have selected you as my GSTP, what all you can do on behalf of me? A GSTP can undertake any or all of the following activities on behalf of a registered person, if so authorized by him. So, if I have authorized to you to do the following activities, yes, you can do it on behalf of me. What are those, sir? Furnishing the details of outward supply, furnishing monthly or annual or final return, making deposit for credit into the electronic cash ledger, that is the de amount deposited to the cash ledger, furnish information for generation of EVA bill, furnish details of chalan in the prescribed form, file an intimation to pay tax under the composition scheme or withdraw from the state scheme, file a claim for refund and file an application for amendment or cancellation of registration. What we have learned in registration chapter. All this you can do on behalf of me, provided I have authorized you to do it. Also, allowed to appear as an authorized representative before any officer of the department, appellate authority or appellate tribunal on behalf of such registered person, provided he is enrolled as GSTP under Rule 83. Now, assume GST department has sent me a notice to come and personally visit them or attend their questions. In that case, can you do it on behalf of me? Yes. Furnishing returns through GSTP. When a registered person opts to furnish his returns through GSTP, such registered person gives his consent in the prescribed form to any GSTP to prepare and furnish his return. Before confirming the submission of any statement prepared by GSTP, ensures that the facts mentioned in the return are true and correct. I should make sure that whatever details you are giving in my return is correct. It is my responsibility. Later, I cannot tell. So, GSTP did it. I didn't know that. So, if by chance, if he has any given any wrong information, I cannot take a protection telling I didn't do it, sir. Because I am the one who have selected you, na. So, I have to make sure that whatever details you are giving is correct as per my business activities. Thus, the responsibility for correctness of any particulars furnished in the return or other details filed by the GSTP continue, continues to rest with whom? Registered person. On whose behalf such return and details are furnished. Yes, guys, finally we are done with the marathon session. So the revision notes is almost for 85 pages. Guys, I am done with my work. Now it's you. You have to perform, you have to study, use, make use of all this and make sure that you are scoring really good marks. I have done whatever I can do it, guys. Here, my target was to complete the marathon in 25 hours. 25 hours. But actually, it has gone up to, including DT, it has gone up to approximately 28 hours. But still good, guys. 3 hours, I know I have done more. So, it is more work for me. Still, I feel somewhere that I have done justice. I have tried to cover everything, maximum provision, including the amendments and all. So, please make use of it and if possible, watch it again and again. If not all the chapters, whichever topics you feel is challenging or interesting or wherever you are feeling that you are getting confused, please watch those parts again and again, guys, so that you will have more clarity towards it. Fine, guys? Yes. So, you know, talking just to a camera for more than like 25 hours or 28 hours is not so easy, guys. Yeah, but still, I have tried to do my best. I have tried to shout and especially there were a lot of disturbances here, especially when I was recording indirect tax due to some reconstruction work going on here. But still, I have tried to overcome that and I have completed finally. I am happy for whatever I have done. So you should also be, make sure that you should, you will be happy with your own performance and preparation. Guys, I am definitely, I am very sure that you guys will do it. Please make sure that everything, whatever is there, you will make use of all the resources and make the best utilization of it and clear the exams. And some of you, I know, maybe you would have already written it in November or previous to that. Maybe you were not able to clear it due to any reasons. It's fine, guys. This time you are going to do it. This attempt will be yours. 
don't worry good things will take time and ca is one of that so ca sometimes will take time some of you might not be able to do it in one attempt but still okay don't lose the confidence now it's high time for you to give your 100 percent definitely you get the result what you deserve yes guys so even on the examination days how you have to prepare i already told you i had told for three days you have to watch seven 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 hours so now make it eight 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 hours because the hours as i guess somewhere it has gone up to 28 hours both put together direct as well as indirect tax guys fine yes so please do let me know once you guys get your results i would be more than happy to hear from you so get in touch you can get in touch with me on linkedin or instagram or social medias and if there is any feedback which you guys would like to give it to me i am always open guys please do give it i will be happy to consider it and all the very best for your exams guys do well